the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe, the famous private detective of Murder, My Sweet and The Lady in the Lake, created by Raymond Chandler, brought to you on the air by Pepsodent, and starring MGM's dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste, New Pepsodent with Irium. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. It's preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is a favorite three to one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other brand they tried. These families, three to one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, families, three to one, say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. Now, Van Heflin in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Hollywood after midnight is like any other city after midnight. Night moves in and the city becomes hushed and stealthy. The nightclubs close up one by one, but now and then the police whistle and the prowl car siren serenade the sleeper. If you've got any cop in you at all, you get on edge and you have to get dressed and go out and walk it off to relax. Well, I was relaxing past the Swank Carlton Hotel on the Sunset Strip about 1 a.m. when all of a sudden, recess was over. Hey, Marlowe. Hmm? That you, Marlowe? It was George Millar, the quiet-spoken night clerk of the Carlton, hailing me from the doorway, probably to Mucha Melacrino. No, I was wrong. Hey, look, Marlowe. Uh, you're very busy right now. Why, Millar? If I may be as cagey as all that. We've got some got some trouble on the eighth floor. Where's Curly, your fearless house deck? Tonight he has to have a hangover. And what's the beef on floor eight? King Leopardi. You know him? King Leopardi? Oh, that's the sweetest trump of this side of Gabriel. Is he tenting here tonight? Yeah, he's in the corridor on the eighth floor, dressed in yellow pajamas and his trumpet. <laughs> There's a girl with him. And they put him on a jam session. Well, suppose the king rejects my diplomatic notes. Well, uh... Get her off, but only if you have to. Okay, thanks. But a guy with such an ear for music ought to listen to reason. All right, I'll be down in five minutes, Mara. All right, King, the party's over. Hey! Were you addressing me, peasant? I said wrap it up, can it? Put it on ice. The show is over. Ha! Ah. Conk him, King. King Kong! That's what he is, King Kong! Let him have it, King. Then fair to a nosy house dick. As follows. <laughs> All right, now look, yellow pants. Wrap up your bugle and buzz off. Now hit the grit. Oh, you're tougher than a 40 cent steak, aren't you? Well, this will make you soft and tender. Here! That old boy, King, hit him again for me. All right, hit me with that trumpet, will you? Okay, King. Ooh. <gasps> right, now, come on, get up, get dressed, and get out. How can he? He's out cold. I'll be glad to pack for him. And you get back to your room, too. Listen, copper, I don't have to do get anything. Get going, sister. Come on, jump. The door to room 815 was ajar. I went in and began tossing a lot of that yellow silk that the king liked so well into his suitcases. 
Something at the small desk stopped me. Tucked under the corner of the desk blotter was a note. It was assembled from words and letters cut out of newspapers and pasted on a telegraph blank. It said, Ten grand by Thursday night, Leo Party, or else. Her brother. I slipped the note in my pocket and went out in the corridor just as the king staggered past me into his room. I could get an infection from the dirty look he gave me as he slammed the door after him. The door two suites away opened a crack and then shut again very quickly. I went over and knocked. Beat it, copper! I want to talk to you. I don't want to hear from you. Okay, here I come, sister. Ready or not? I'll blow you down, so help me. I'll let you have it. Lay that pistol down, babe. Come on, Get out come on. you pick up weight you didn't count on. And what would the little girl be doing with a twenty-five automatic, I wonder? A girl needs protection with insects like <laughs> you around. Look, what's your name? Little Bo Peep. Okay, but what does little boy blue with a horn mean to you? I admire his work. Do you know King Leopardi? No. Well, what are you doing in a place like this? I can tell you can't afford it. What's your angle? I won a soap contest. All right, baby. You want it that way? What are you going to do? And we'll make a phone call. It won't cost you a nickel. Hello, desk. Millar? It's Marlowe. I'm calling for the lady in room 811. She's checking out. I had a little trouble up there, Millar. Your two noisy guests will be checking out any minute. Okay? Oh, well, I... Uh... Hate for things to happen on my shift. Well, the king bopped me with his bugle and the girl had a gun. Gee, nice people. Yeah, how come you put a floozy like that girl so close to the king? Well, I didn't. Another Quit thing. The day man did. Look, there was a receipt for rent to Miss Marilyn Delorme on the telephone table in her room. Well, that wasn't the name she gave Quillen. Apartment 211, Ridgeland Apartments, Cord Street, L.A. She lives right in town in a cheap neighborhood, but she checks in here at a price she can't afford and gives a phony name. Now, Why? Why? Cord Street, where Marilyn Delorme lived, was Old Town, Arty Town, Crook Town. It was afternoon when I got off the cogwheel car that climbs the steep hill to where the Ridgeland apartment sat on the top of Bunker Hill. I went up dim, dusty stairs to apartment 211, and I tapped on the door. There was no answer, so I tried the door. It was unlocked. The room inside was dim with stagnant gloom. Marilyn Delorme was in. I didn't talk to her, though. I didn't think she'd want to make much conversation with those blue bruises about her throat where she'd been strangled. I got out of there fast, whipping off doorknobs like Uriah Heap polishing apples for his boss. I found King Leopardi at his job at the Club Belvedere. He was relaxing at a table in the bar with a kind of a girl commonly referred to as a knockout. She looked tall and her hair was the color of a brush fire seen through clouds of dust. I pulled in my chin and then walked over to the table. Hello, Leopardi, old maestro. You remember me? I'm sorry, I can't say that... Why, you... Dirty keyhole snooper. King, please don't start anything again. You left a certain little note in your hotel room last night. Get out, night. time a dozen. That wasn't all. That dame with you I last night. I said beat it. King, sit down. Beat it and take this with you. Well, there's not much snap in that punch, King. Would you like to try it again? I, uh, have had some drinks. I'll see you later when I'm okay. See you later, too, Dolores, after the floor show. I'm, uh... I'm sorry, Miss... Uh, Sit Miss... down. You've made us conspicuous enough as it is. Now, wait a minute. Sit Look, down. Get... Uh-huh. All right, thanks. Well, that's what I get for being a little gentleman and letting him pepper me without a comeback. No, he's always spoiling for a fight. Uh, the king just can't control his dukes, can he? You better have a drink. All right. Coke with bitters. <laughs> that's what I love about Hollywood. You meet so many eccentrics. <laughs> yeah, but you see, I'm the kind of a guy who starts with a short beer and wakes up in Shanghai with a full beard. <laughs> <laughs> is this on me or is it on you? 
Well, that depends. Well, how champagne? Mum's cordon rouge, shall we say, huh? It's on you. It's on me. Mm-hmm. Coke with betters. <laughs> how did you get to know King Leopardi? Oh, I just happened to throw him out of his hotel last night. Oh, how's detective, huh? No, no, I'm filling in for a friend. Philip Marlowe, private investigator, is the general tag. Oh. How did you happen to get to know the king? I once sang in his band, but not for long. Uh, well, then, look, tell me, uh, would it be hard for a woman to get to him? Only if he was surrounded by a wall of fire. If the woman had a gun. Why? Well, I found this threat note on his desk last night. It asked for $10,000 or else, and is signed, her brother. Well? <laughs> well? Yes. A woman with a gun could get to him, and everybody would give her a great big hand. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll skip that Coke and Bitters and say good day and thank you, Christabel. The name is Dolores. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Gurry. Kioza. Dolores Kioza. Oh, Kioza. Fare thee well, Miss Kioza. <laughs> Formal, aren't you? <laughs> so long, Dolores. So long, Philip. If I hear of anything, I'll toss it your way. The evening papers carried a squib about Marilyn Delorme found strangled in her Court Street apartment. That was all dead end. Until about one o'clock in the morning when the telephone started having hysterics on my night table. Yeah. Philip. This is Dolores. Dolores. Dolores? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Would you sure. come over to my place right away? 2412 Renfrew Street, below Fountain. Hey, wait a minute. It's I a solid bungalow court. Mine is the last one in line. But sure, but wait a minute. Well, what's the matter? Dolores, look, well, what's the matter? King Leopardi is here, too. King Leopardi? He passed out of my den. It's absurd, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's absurd. And it'll cost you 20 bucks. All right, but hurry. Please hurry. All right, I'll be right over. Phone calls in the dead of night. I should have been a midwife. Oh, come in, Philip. I'm sorry I woke you at this hour. That's okay. I always get up around this time anyhow to take my bitters and answer phone calls. Where is he? Uh, may I... Have a cigarette? Sure. Thanks. Right? Where did you say it was now? In my den. Oh, Philip. Philip, he isn't drunk at all. Did you really think he was drunk? He's dead. What? The king is dead. Long live the... With my... Gun. <laughs> well, good for you. The lady wins the large cutie dog. Hey, come on, let's go and look at him. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. It's preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. Families all over America say New Pepsodent is their favorite three to one. The Paul A. Thompson family, Summer Street, Stanford, Connecticut, preferred New Pepsodent on every single count. The Thompsons say... New Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer New Pepsodent over any other toothpaste they tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say New Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Thompsons and other families who compared New Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We 
We continue with The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mayor. Producers of The Huckster, starring Clark Gable. Delora showed me to the den in the back of the house. Crumpet man, King Leopardi, was lying on the studio couch, large, smooth, and artificial looking even in death. A small Mauser automatic hung loosely in his right hand. There was a bullet hole in his golden yellow sport coat right over his heart. Dolores, is this your gun? Uh, yes. Some of them gave it to me once. I, I don't even know how to use it. Oh, no. Oh, I don't expect you or anyone to believe uh, me. Don't expect anything. Just tell it. Well, I, I, I was out late. I sing at KFQC on a late 15-minute program. Agatha and I got home about 11.30. Who's Agatha, the cat? My maid. Mm. I came into the den for some liquor and fizz water and found him like that. I sent Agatha home so she wouldn't find him. Finally, I thought of calling you. Well, he got in here. How? I don't know. Were you ever in love with him? The king never loved anyone. I ask if you loved him. I hated everything about him even better to tell the cops that is, but Copacetti. I can't help it. It's the truth. Dolores, look. <laughs> Go on out in the other room and buy yourself a drink. I want to be alone here with tall, dead, and handsome. Go on now, huh? After Dolores had taken her white face out of that room, I could work better. I went through the king's pocket and found his key ring. One key fit very nicely in the lock of the back door. I went to the living room where Dolores was huddled against the arm of the Davenport trying to become a part of the pattern. Dolores, how long has Agatha been with you? Two years. Hmm. Did you ever steal anything from you? Small things, that's all. There are nylons now and then. I didn't mind why. Well, she sold a key to somebody key to this apartment. Oh, what's the difference, Philip? We're wasting time. I'm done for as a nice person. They'll think it was a lover's quarrel and I shot him. Or that he shot himself over me. Well, you don't die from the latter, though. Your reputation does. And I care about what people think of me. Yeah. Well, that's what makes me for you again, lady. Thanks, Philip. Now, let's suppose you give me a description of Agatha and tell me where she lives. I want to talk to her. Tonight. <laughs> I drove down Brighton Avenue looking for the house Dolores had described to me. All at once, I slammed on my brakes. In the driveway of a vacant house stood a small coupe. Dolores had described Agatha's car, and that was it. And Agatha did not live in an empty house. I got out and walked up the gravel driveway and looked into the car. And then I got back in my own car and drove until I found an all-night drugstore. I phoned Detective Lieutenant Ibera. Hello, Ibera. Write this down. Brighton Avenue, 3200 block, west side. Driveway of empty house. Car parked with dead woman in it. When alive, answered to the name of Agatha. Strangled. I went back to the Carlton Hotel where it all started the night before. Quillen, the head day clerk, was on night duty. That surprised me a little bit. It was 2 a.m. and very empty, very quiet in the lobby. I was fine. Well, if it is Marlowe, the old clues man. A good, good morning. And tripe like that. Hello, Quillen. Look, how come you're on duty? Miller went on vacation this a.m. His brother has a cabinet crest line on the Arrowhead Road. Well, I didn't even know he had a brother. Now you know. Well, then, look, how come an old hotel man like you registers floozies like that Marilyn Delorme on the same floor with people like King Leopardi? What? You heard me, mine host. I didn't register the girl or Leopardi. Millar did. What? You heard me. Well, why was the room between their rooms empty last night in times like these? Well, Millar had it marked on change. 
plumbing out of whack or something. Why? Oh. Well, here's why. A lad with a pass key could have gone into that room and then unlocked the two connecting doors. And then you could have run a bus service between the girls' room and Leah Party's. What are you driving at? That girl in 811 had a gun and Leah Party had a threat letter last night. Now, here's what I want you to do. Call the hotel where Leah Party's staying now and ask if he's there. Why? Because. Good enough? Best reason in the world. Wife always uses it. Wait here. In about three minutes, Quillen came back and leaned on the counter again. Leoparty isn't there. I talked to a guy in his suite who was almost sober. He said Leoparty got a call about 11 from some girl. What girl? Well, he didn't know. But Leoparty went out preening himself. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Colin. Anything to do with that brawl you had with Leoparty here last night? No, all in the spirit of boyish mayhem. Oh, that, uh, that 815 has a jinx on it, you know. Girl shot herself there two years ago. What? A girl shot herself yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, you said that, but what girl? I don't know what her real name was. Look here, Quillen. I want to see your hotel files of that day two years ago and all the newspaper clippings about it. Come all on. All right, all right. Let go of my arm, physical culture. I'll get the keys to the record room. I read the hotel files of that day two years ago and I read the newspaper clippings of that suicide in 815. Then I asked Quillen just where George Millar's brother had his cabin in the mountains. It was just getting light when I pulled up at the cabin, high against a growth of dagger pine and cedar. Smoke was curling from the chimney. Someone was awake. George Millar himself opened the door. Oh, Marlowe! Well, gee, it's good to see you. How'd you ever find us up here? How about some bacon and eggs? The answer in my brief Marlowe morning manner is yes. Oh, well, that's well, uh... I'll wake up my brother and we'll all eat together, huh? You don't have to wake me up. I'm up. Oh, oh, hello, Garrett. Who's your friend, George? Oh, Gaff, this is Philip Marlowe. You've heard me talk of him. How are you, Marlowe? Gaff Talley. That the name? Yeah, my brother. That's his fighting name. He used to be a heavyweight boxer. Fighter. Boxers dance. Fighters fight. Oh, well, uh, let's get coffee started, huh? Marlowe's hungry. Yeah, say, I'm, I've had a busy night. King Leo Party's been bumped off. Uh, bumped off? Lowbrow for killed. Vernacular for murdered. The king is dead. Though. Uh, where? Uh, how did... In a girl's apartment. Nice girl, too. The old suicide gag. But it could ruin the girl. Oh, gee, that's lousy. I... Yeah. Yeah, but it won't work. It was murder. What makes you think it was murder? Well, Gaff, the way I cased the job, the kill was supposed to have been pulled in his room, 815, at the Carlton Hotel, night before last. Uh, is that a fact now? Yeah. I spoil it by giving the king the merry heave hole before the girl in 811 could get to him. Didn't I, George? Uh, I guess you did, Marlowe. Yeah. Of course, it would have been poetic justice if King Leoparty had been killed in the same room where a girl committed suicide two years ago. Registered as Mary Smith. Usual name, Eve Talley. Did you hear that, Gaff Talley? Eve Talley. I heard it, Marlow. So we had a sister named Eve. Shot herself in 815 at the Carlton. So what? So, George here told me that Quillen registered that professional gun girl in 815 night before last. Oh, no. George registered her. So? So George kept the room between the girl and Leah Party vacant. When everything was quiet, he had opened the communicating doors, and Marilyn Delorme would walk into the king's room, muffle her twenty-five in a pillow, and shoot the king in his sleep. How am I doing, boys? Fine, Marlon. How am I doing? Uh, Gaff, put away that gun. I'll bet you even checked on 118 Cord Street. Mm-hmm. I found Marilyn Delorme strangled. She knew too much. For a few bucks, you boys got Agatha to call Leah Party last night from the radio station and pretend she was Dolores with an interesting invitation. The king always had a yen for Dolores, and he came running. You shot the king before Dolores came home and left him in her den. Then Gaff got rid of Agatha. She knew too much, too. Leah Party was the worst kind of a rat, my lord. We loved our sister. She fell for him, and he threw her out. She killed us. Now, what would you do, Marlowe? With... Take his gun, George. Don't get between us or behind him. His forty-five goes right on through. Uh, oh, 
have to take your gun, Marla. Yeah. Well, always treat it like your own, won't you, George? Got it, George? I've got it. Stand out of the way. Does it have to be this way, Gaff? Yeah, it has to be this way. Sure, George and Gaff, the avengers of innocent girlhood in their righteous indignation. Shut up, Marla. Lynch, mobs, tar and feather merchants, and other laws unto themselves take notice. George and Gaff, they wrote the book. Say your prayers, big mouth. Hey, Gaff, there's been enough killing. Get out of no, the No, Gaff, I won't. I swear I'll let you have it. No, to. Gaff! I'm warning you. Goodbye, Gaff. <laughs> I'm... I'm sorry, Jeff. I had to do it. George. He's dead. So I had to do it, Jeff. I, I just had to... You understand, don't you, Marlo? Yeah, yeah, I understand. He was a killer. He killed three people. He wasn't going to kill a fourth. I wanted to finish Leopardo out in the open and take what came, but Gav tried to do it cute. I didn't know Leopardo was dead until you told me, Marlo. I... I believe you, George. Yeah. Is your gun back, Marlo? It shoots fine. <laughs> I put in a big pitch for George at headquarters. After all, he hadn't killed anybody except Gaff, and that was in self-defense and in defense of an unofficial copper named Marlo. He won't go get off scot-free, but... He won't inhale cyanide either at the taxpayer's expense. After I talked to Ibarra at headquarters, I telephoned Dolores Chiosa. I didn't give her the sort of details, but just told her not to worry that she was in the clear. Philip. Oh, thank you, Philip. I'm so relieved. I'm so grateful. I'm so thirsty. Well, come on over then. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, is this fiesta on you or is it on me? Why? Well, I mean, do I drink... Coke and bitters or cordon rouge? It's on me. <laughs> All right, then. Champagne it is, baby. But look, let me bring the glasses, huh? You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the new mystery series, Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Van Heflin will return in just a moment. Men, here's an important announcement. News about a sensational hair tonic discovery. It's trim hair tonic made by Pepsodent. For the first time, science has created a hair tonic with pure virgin olive oil. There's no finer hair and scalp conditioner. Yes, because it contains pure virgin olive oil, trim hair tonic conditions your scalp as it grooms your hair. Get new trim hair tonic during the big one-cent introductory sale at toilet goods counters now. Two 60-cent bottles, $1.20 value, only 61 cents. Ask for trim hair tonic with olive oil. Now, concerning next week's show, here is our star, Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe crouched in the darkness of Beverly Glen and waited for those footsteps to come closer. And then all at once, the sandman hit him without bothering to remove the sand from the sandbag. And when Marla woke up in the morning, his wallet and his gun were gone. And he was wanted for murder. Tonight's story was adapted by Milton Geiger from The King in Yellow by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at the same time to another exciting mystery on the adventures of Philip Marlowe starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here, Johnny. Well, George, I'm really glad to talk to you. Oh? Why do you say it that way? Because every insurance case I handle for that company of yours pays me a nice fat fee. And right now I can use a little extra cash. Well, now, Johnny... So tell me all. What's Floyd's of England upset about this time? Well, I'm not sure. Uh Uh-oh. Here we go again. But, Johnny, I just received a transatlantic telephone call from Paris, France... For a man who wanted to contact you but didn't know where to call you. 
And he identified himself only as Le Chagri. Ah? Uh, Le Chagri. It's French, Johnny. No. And I believe it means the gray cat. Yeah. And George, the name fits him. You know him, then? His real name is Dumarsac. He probably knows more about the dark alleys and back streets of Paris. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah, and about the people. In other words, the underworld. What did he call about? He mentioned the Blue Madonna. The what? It's a painting, Johnny, a small oil painting by a modern artist named Vincent Bardot. It's owned by Mr. Kingsley Holland down in Philadelphia. Yeah? It hangs in the Gavin Galleries, and we've insured it for $12,000. Well, what did he have to say about it? Only that you're to call him. His number there in Paris is uh, Orleans 57722. Uh-huh. That he has some very interesting information for you about that painting. Oh, sure. That he'll be glad to give me for a price. Exactly. I can't for the life of me figure what his interest is in it. If there were anything amiss, I'm sure the gallery would have called me. George, if you knew that character as well as I do, you'd okay my expense account without even looking at it and be willing to pay me that big fee I was talking about. What do you mean? Want to make a bet? What kind of a bet? I'll give you odds of ten to one that whatever's hanging in that gallery down there in Philadelphia is not the Blue Madonna. What? Now, look, Johnny, good heavens. George, I'll be talking to you. Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Blue Madonna matter. Expense account item one, $12 even for a phone call to my underworld contact in Paris, France, a man by the name of Dumars Sac, who calls himself the Gray Cat. Oh, oui, Monsieur Dollar. This is your old, your very dear friend, Le Chagri. Very dear friend, huh? Now listen, you telephone George Reed that you have some real hot information about a painting his company insured. Ah, oui, Le Madonna Bleu. What did you call the Blue Madonna? Okay. How much do you want this time? Oh, monsieur, you touch me to the quick. Well, one might think that I slave and suffer and risk my life on your behalf only for money. How much, de Marsac? Say, uh, one thousand dollars. A thousand? Look, if your info's worth anything, I'll send you a check for 50 bucks. 50 bucks? No. Uh, 900? Okay, I'll make it 75. But, monsieur, uh, 750? How about an even hundred? 500. Two. Four? Three, that's final. Oh, please. Uh, 200? Okay, 200. Oui. Eh? No. It's all settled. 200 bucks. Now, what about the Blue Madonna? Ah, uh-huh, yes. It is now here in Paris. Yeah, where? In the shop of Monsieur Dubesson on the Rue des Pas de les Moules. Dubesson? Huh. You sure it isn't just a copy that he'll try to foist it off on some wealthy sucker? <laughs> Dubesson is a crook, an evil crook, but he is an honest one. Oh, sure. Yes, and he knows the works of art. Also, he's very clever. To get his price, he will wait until the real Madonna is discovered missing. If it really is, that's what I'll check on now. And then you will you will send me the $500... My very dear friend. Two hundred, remember? Ah, oui, oui, I cheated myself. But, monsieur... Yeah? uh, Suppose I could find out who smuggled the painting into him, eh? Fine. That would be uh, worth a lot to you, no? Say, a thousand? We'll see. I'll be talking to you. (laughs) Item two, 420. I phoned to my old pal, Foster Harmon, down in Sarasota, Florida. Told him I'd pay his fare if he'd grab the first plane out and meet me in Philadelphia at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. I knew that if anybody could identify the genuine painting, he could. Item 3, 940 for my own transportation to the city of brotherly love. Item 4, 950 cocktails and dinner for the two of us there at the Bellevue. Yes, the Blue Madonna is one of Vincent Bardot's best-known works. I don't think there's another living artist who could so effectively use various shades of just one color. But uh, what about it, Johnny? Well, first thing in the morning, I want you to come along with me and take a look at it. It's in the Gavin Galleries, isn't it, up on Walnut Street? Yeah, at least it's supposed to be. Supposed? Now, all I want you to do is take a good look at it, then reserve any comments until after we get out of the place. 
Thanks. That's all. Well, but Johnny, Meantime, I... Meantime, I want to check with the owner of that painting. The telephone directory gave me Kingsley Holland's address. Item 4, 620 for a cab to a small apartment house out in West Philadelphia. Holland turned out to be... Well, I'd say he was about 30, short, lean, and nervous. With the surly expression of a man who feels the world hasn't done right by him. Yeah? You mean you're interested in buying the blue banana? Well, it uh, it all depends, Mr. Holland. Uh-huh. Uh, look, Dollar, uh, that's what you said your name is? Yes, that's right, Johnny Dollar. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Uh, well, anyway, listen. Yeah? That gallery's got a price of fifteen oh eighteen thousand on it. But if you want to buy it direct from me, and right now, I'll give it to you for twelve. Save yourself a few thousand bucks, and it'll save me having to pay them there 20%. But if you've already commissioned the gallery to sell it for you... So, I'll tell them I changed my mind, that I want to keep it. Then when they find out that I've sold it, well, let them try and catch up with me and collect. Because me, I'll be right back in little old gay Paris. Back in Paris? Sure, I'd be there still, only I ran out of money. 12000 huh? That's exactly what it's insured for. And that's what they appraised it for when I got it from my uncle's estate. With all his money, what does he die and leave me with but a lousy painting? Well, do you want it? Uh, let me think about it. I'm uh, staying at the Bellevue Stratford. Sure, sure. Just don't tell them at the Gavin Gallery about our little deal. Huh? But those crooks don't know won't hurt it. Crooks? <laughs> you think for a minute all that stuff they've got laying around the place is genuine? But the Blue Madonna is. You're sure? Huh? What do you mean by that? Just uh, stick around, Mr. Holland. Any reason why I shouldn't? I don't know. Is there? Now, wait a minute, Dollar. I'll be in touch with you. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. Donald! Donald! I'm out here on the back porch, honey. Oh, there you are. Why on earth did you choose a time like this to clean your hunting rifle? We're due at the Jamesons at 7. I'm ready, honey. All I have to do is wash my hands. I'll finish this tomorrow. Uh, be with you in a jiffy. Donald, come back here. Ah, oh, now what's the matter, Reba? Are you going to leave this hunting rifle right out here in plain sight? Nobody's going to bother it. The kids are asleep and we'll be gone. I don't think our babysitter will bother anything. She's got her homework to do. Those are famous last words if I ever heard them. Donald, don't you realize that accidental death by firearms... Rank second only to deaths from fall, fire, and poison. Oh, but the kids are in bed. Well, sure they are. But what if our six-year-old Marshall Dillon should wander out to the kitchen for a drink of water? You know, he'd love to play with his gun. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, please put it away under lock and key. Yes, dear, yes, right away. And for heaven's sakes, take those shells, too. You know, many accidents happen when bullets are thrown into a fire or hit with a hammer. Those things are dangerous. You ought to know that. I know, honey. I, I guess I just wasn't thinking. The unloaded gun and ammunition lying around the house is even more dangerous than itchy-fingered hunters. Statistics prove that. Okay, there. Everything is safe under lock and key. Now, you still angry with me? Oh, Donald, I don't want to sound like a nagging wife, but... My dear, you have every right to reprimand me. Me, a non-commissioned officer. I should know better. But that's the way it goes. We, we forget. That's why there are accidents in the field, out hunting, and in the home. We all know better. We just forget or get careless with firearms. Well, come on along. Let's get over to the jam. Okay, dear. Now, this won't happen again, believe me. You know, I wouldn't have started to clean that rifle if you hadn't taken so long to get dressed. But you sure did a good job. Oh, you look beautiful. That's my Donald. That's my Donald. <laughs> Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Blue Madonna Matter. At Kingsley Holland, the owner of the painting recognized my name. I thought so. And if a switch in that painting had been made and he knew about it, well, I'd do well to look out for him. Yeah, the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that whatever hung in the Gavin Galleries was not the Blue Madonna. Item five, another six bucks for a taxi back to my hotel. Item 6, 580, breakfast the next morning for Foster Harmon and myself. By 10 o'clock, we were at the Gavin Gallery. He's looking at a pretty modern, but I must say, beautiful painting. It's amazing, Johnny, amazing. The most extraordinary... 
Well, I, I just can't believe it. Can't believe what, Foster? That it's the real thing or just a good copy? Oh, good morning, sir. Uh, that's just I'll it. You see? I've helped these gentlemen. Johnny... Hold it, Foss. Uh, <laughs> that painting, you know, is a genuine Bardot. Yeah? My name is Johnny Dollar. This is Mr. Foster Harmon. Gentlemen, I'm Arnold Gavin. Um, you're uh, interested in buying the Blue Madonna? If this is really it. Uh, Johnny, listen. Wait, Foster. Uh, what is the price of it, Mr. Gavin? Uh, 20000 Mr. Uh, Dollar, did you say? Yeah, but, uh, wow. Haven't you got a Bardot that's a bit cheaper? His Laconic Lagoon is priced at 10000 Holy. <laughs> well, how about a copy of this? Oh, Bardot has never allowed his works to be copied. Johnny, listen. Yeah, Foster, it looks like this stuff is too rich for our blood. No. Come on, let's go back to the Bellevue Stratford. No, listen. Uh, perhaps there's something else that might interest you. No, I'm afraid not, but thank you. That's quite all right. Now, uh, uh, well, uh, look, suppose I come back later. Johnny, listen. Come on, will you? Yeah, I'll uh, see you tomorrow again. Now, Johnny, just uh, take it easy. Well, Foss? It's a fraud, Johnny. It's a copy. I'm sure of it. Hey, hey, hey. Did you say that blue Madonna's a copy, mister? Yes. Wait, Foss. Well, I thought you were looking at it kind of funny there in the gallery. Yes, sir. It's a fraud. Foster. Uh, you don't mind my asking, uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Foster Harmon. Harmon? Har from the John Ringling Museum down in Florida? That's right. Well, then you ought to know. Now, just a minute, mister. Say, uh, aren't you Johnny Dollar, the insurance investigator? So what? Who are you? Me? Well, I'm Roop Alloway of Transworld News Service. News Service? Oh, fine. Yeah, I'll see you, boys, and thanks a lot. Well, Foss, it looks like you opened your mouth and stuck my foot in it. Well, I'm sorry, Johnny, but what I said is true. That blue Madonna is an imitation, a phony. That much I already knew. At least I was pretty sure of it. But don't you see the amazing thing? Well, Johnny, that copy is so perfect, so exactly in the style of Vincent Bardot, even to little things, little idiosyncrasies that even the finest copyists couldn't match. Certain minute details about an artist's work are as distinctive, as impossible to copy as a man's own fingerprints. Yeah. Well, what I'm trying to say is that if I didn't know every brush mark on the original... Okay, Foss, forget it. Forget it? Hey, listen. Kingsley Holland, the owner, and I wouldn't trust him for a minute, I think he knows who I am. If so, and if he knows that painting is just a copy, well, he's pretty sure to figure out what I'm doing here. Johnny, he must know it's a copy. If he gave it to the galleries to sell. Perhaps. Or maybe the switch was made after it was hung there. Then what you're saying is that either one of them could be responsible for the fraud. That's right. How well do you know the Gavin Galleries? Well, they're not very big. You could see that for yourself. And, of course, they're rather new in the business. I think I'd better get a rundown on this Arnold Gavin while we're waiting at the hotel. Waiting? What for? Well, you, you plant a couple of seeds. You hope that one of them will sprout. I'm afraid I don't understand. Foss, I told both of them who I am in the hope they'd guess at why I'm here. I also gave them reason to suspect I think that blue Madonna's a phony. Well, I'm afraid that I may have led Arnold Gavin to feel that way. Same thing. I also made it very plain to them that I'm staying at the Bellevue Stratford. In other words... Good heavens, Johnny, if you mean what I think you do. Yeah? Like what, Foss? You think that one of them, the crook, will come to the hotel and try to... Try... Well, don't you see, Johnny, knowing that you're on to him, he, he might try to kill you. Can you think of a better way to bring him out in the open? Johnny. Come on, let's get back to the hotel and wait. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said, every individual in society has certain powers rights, and privileges which no other individual can justly abridge or destroy. Those words were written by Noah Webster, the man who compiled America's first great dictionary. Mr. Webster knew that if the country which he had seen come into being were to succeed, the rights of the individual have to be protected. Each person is entitled to certain basic rights, powers, and privileges which must not be taken away because of the whim of someone with greater power. In the United States, the individual is important regardless of his wealth, power, or position. The importance of the individual is closely linked to the American tradition. Remember the words of Noah Webster. They are part of your American heritage. 
the rights and privileges of the individual must be preserved. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. After all, there was no reason to drag Foster any further into this mess, although I knew he began to see it through. So I paid him for all his expenses, that's item 7, 151 even, and sent him on back to Sarasota. Item 8, 10 cents for a phone call to Sergeant Jerry Hawkins of police headquarters. About mid-afternoon, he called me back. Boy, did you ever start a riot. Well, what'd you find out for me about Gavin and Holland? Well, Holland's just a lazy kid that's been trying to live off his relatives all his life. And Gavin? Okay, so far as we know. But listen, you seen the papers? No. The story about that phony painting is on every wire service in the country. All you can see in the headlines is that name Bardot, and I don't mean Bridget. Johnny, you and that Foster Harmon ought to collect a publicity fee. Are you holding Gavin or Holland? Well, what on? Sure, the boys have questioned both of them, but unless we can show some evidence that one of them pulled the switch. Johnny, you got any ideas? Yeah, Jerry. Suddenly, I think maybe I have. Well, then start talking so I can make a pinch. No, I don't think you will. What do you mean, if you know who did it? Well, I didn't say that, but, uh... Jerry, I've got a hunch, a real potent one. And if it's right... Yeah? Well, read tomorrow's papers. Huh? Item nine, half a buck for an evening paper and a tip for the bellboy who brought it up to me. Yeah, the sergeant was right. This was the most free advertising any artist has had in years. Prices on genuine Bardot's were skyrocketing. As for the fake blue Madonna, I put in a fast call for Paris. But before the operator could get it through... Yeah? Arnold Gavin, Mr. Dollar. Well, Mr. You Gavin... See, do you see what has happened? Have you seen the papers? I sure have. And the police have closed my shop, my galleries. Can you blame them? But don't you understand? I've had offers of up to 30000 for the Madonna. I've received wires offering me nearly 20000 for the other Bardot, uh, the, the real one. No kidding. Well, I'll show you how much I'm kidding. I've cabled Bardot to paint some more for me, paint anything. Don't you see, after all this publicity, we'll make a million. So it was you that rigged this whole thing, huh, Gavin? I, Mr. Holland? Why, of course not. Sure, to raise the price of some of your lousy paintings. But how can you say that? You who gave me that copy. Expert, huh? You trying to tell me you didn't know that was a copy? No. It was only this morning when the authority from Sarasota, uh, when I called in the people from the museum here in Philadelphia. Uh, do you know what they said? What? And it better be good. They said the only one who could have made that copy... Wait a minute. The only artist in the world who could have... Possibly... Hold it. Hold everything. Holland, you said you got that penny from your uncle's estate. That's right. It was willed to me. Where did your uncle get it? Why, for... Well, listen. I'm listening. Dollar, that Madonna was smuggled into it. Smuggled? That's right. But by whom? Well, believe it or not... I think I can tell you who. And if this is my call to Paris, well, maybe I can even tell you where he is now. Johnny Dollar. This is your dear and faithful friend, Le Chagrin. Good. Now listen. And for the information I can give you this time, oh, oh, you will have to pay me a vast sum of money. You're about to tell me that the Blue Madonna was smuggled into Paris by none other than the artist himself. This? By Vincent Bardot. Exactly. So that should be worth it, but how did you know? All right. All I want to know now is where is he? You know. <laughs> Not in Paris. Where is he? For a hundred bucks? A hundred and fifty? Three hundred. Oh, for that much I'll find out for myself. Goodbye. No, no, no. Okay, two hundred or I hang up on you. Well, only for you, my best, my oldest friend. Where? He is aboard the plane for the United States. I might have guessed it. He has the Madonna Blue with him. He received the cable this morning. Great. I'll send you a check. You hear any of that, Mr. Gavin? Holland Bill. Yes, but I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, I sure don't. Then maybe this call will help you. Headquarters? Sergeant Jerry Hawkins. Yes, sir? Sergeant Hawkins. You can have the boys in New York pick him up or wait for his plane to arrive here in Philadelphia. Johnny! If you're sure you really have any charges against him. What? Yeah, he's on his way in from Paris. The guy who painted the copy of the Blue Madonna. Or maybe this is really the original over here. Huh? Well, at any rate, he'll have the other copy with him. So do you want to tell the papers or shall I? Look, will you make sense? Oh, and his name is Bardot. Bardot? That's right, Vincent Bardot. Well? You, you mean that he... that he painted two of them? Sure. 
with probably something like this in mind. But I can't and believe... And look, look what it's done for him. Put him on the map. Anything he paints now will net him a fortune. And I don't think you'll suffer particularly either, Mr. Gavin. Well, no. As for you, Holland, well, you'll get a lot more than you thought for that painting of yours. <laughs> Man, what a fast... Sure. But you know something? What is it, Hmm. I just wonder if Le Chagri was in on this thing with him from the beginning. Le Chagri? So help me, I wouldn't put it beyond him. Sure. Sure he was in with Bardot. And probably collecting plenty from him. Anyhow, the insurance company is not anything. But I hope they'll be a lot more careful the next time they insure a painting. Any so-called original. Expense account total, including 400 for Le Chagri, the hotel, and the trip back to Hartford, $620 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were G. Stanley Jones, Forrest Lewis, Harry Bartell, Joseph Kearns, Bert Holland, and Byron Kane. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Three Times a Sinner. Lydia Hunter stood alone in the kitchen, watching the coffee bubble in the electric percolator. She knew Gerald would want his coffee when it was over. He always did when anything excited him. And she reasoned quite correctly that nothing excites a man more 
and being told by his doctor that he's going to die. The attack had come in the early evening while Gerald was seated at the organ playing a Bach fugue. The music had suddenly stopped. She'd run from the library into the study to find him unconscious on the floor. She'd call Dr. Farmer and then had made Gerald as comfortable as possible until the doctor arrived. Everything Gerald could expect from his dutiful wife. She stared down at the coffee, bubbling in the glass top of the percolator, waiting. Then... That was just like him. The examination was over and he was back at the organ again. She filled his coffee cup and hurried to the study. Ah. There you are, Lydia. Just in time to celebrate Dr. Farmer's prophecy of my death. Oh, and coffee. My obedient wife is bringing me my coffee. No coffee for me, thanks, Lydia. I must be going now. But it's raining, Doctor. You see, Richard... I've implied to my wife that I'm dying, and she immediately goes into a report of prevailing weather conditions. Tell me, Doctor, is Gerald just being dramatic, or is there something seriously wrong? Gerald is a sick man, Lydia. And I don't recommend too much of that coffee. Oh, nonsense. Coffee's my mainstay. Then it's true. Oh, Gerald. Oh, Gerald. Oh, come, come, Lydia. <laughs> Dry those crocodile tears. They stain your makeup. Furthermore, you know you're deliriously happy. Why, just think... I can slip off at any moment now. Don't talk like that, Gerald. It may take years, old man, if you take things easy. Cut out drinking and smoking entirely, of course. Well, I've got to be running along now. I'll see you to the door, Doctor. Oh, really, Lydia? Don't you think you can find it after all these months? We don't keep changing around, you know. Good night, Gerald. Remember, you have as many years as you want. It's up to you. Of course, Doctor. It really is serious, Richard. Nothing to be alarmed about. No vigorous schedule or anything like that, though. He can't bear a quiet routine. He'll have to, poor beggar. You sound sorry for him. I am. And I wish you could make your pity sound more convincing, Lydia. Oh, he never believes me anyway. He's always been like that. Look at the rain. Yes. When am I going to see you again? Soon. That's all? Just soon? He's suspicious enough as it is. He's bitter and hurt. You've disappointed him as a wife. Perhaps through no fault of your own, but he is disappointed and bitter. Oh. That can make a man unscrupulous. So be careful. I don't understand. I won't say any more, Lydia. Just be careful and be honest with him. Take good care of him. He needs you and you owe it to him. Good night. Good night, Richard. Richard! Yes? I love you. Oh. Yes, Mrs. Hunter? I didn't know you were here, Martha. Were you going? Mr. Hunter told me I might go, ma'am. Well, I'd rather you stayed a while. You made him say that. I don't know, ma'am. I'd better see him. Well, Lydia... That was a long farewell. Why did you tell Martha to leave for the night? Is it difficult for you to understand that I might like to be alone with you? But surely Martha... Martha has a perceptive eye and a very sharp ear, Lydia. You'd be shocked at the things she knows. Interesting creature, Martha. She has a sort of uh, feudal loyalty to the master of the house. You haven't drunk your coffee, Gerald. Lydia, since you and I are not even friends any longer... Would you consent to a divorce? Leave you now. After Richard's diagnosis tonight? That was important to you, wasn't it? Why, of course. It was important because now you know that soon, perhaps even tonight, you'll be a wealthy widow, free to marry again. Gerald, must we go on talking like this? No, not at all, my dear. But I know that you're awaiting my death. Oh. And that makes me feel as though I were loitering. I don't want to borrow time, a few weeks, a few months. I don't want to borrow your affection, kisses you don't mean, a few soft words of phony solicitude. Oh, really, Gerald? I don't see why I have to I don't stand want here to and borrow listen. anything, my dear. And I have a way. Gerald! Where did you get that bottle? It, it's marked poison. Yes, it's quite a coincidence. It is poison. What are you going to do? You mean, what have I already done? As you see, there's precisely half a bottle. 
While you were gone, I poured the other half of my coffee. I'll never taste it. It's supposed to be like adding sugar. All I have to do is lift it to my lips like this and... <laughs> oh. uh, I was hoping you'd stop me. You realize what will happen if I drink this, yet you stand there watching, letting your little dreams multiply. Well, I won't disappoint you, my dear. I shall drink it. Like that. And sail off happily on a requiem of Bach. Yes, a requiem, Lydia. Appropriate for the occasion. Tested in the crucible of time. You can hardly believe it, can you, Lydia? Here it is, happening before your very eyes. You hardly know what to think. All you can do is stand there, speechless, staring at him as he plays on and on. Then... It's happened. At long last, all those wretched years are over and he lies there slumped across the keys. You stifle an impulse to laugh. You've got to be shocked, Lydia. You've got to call Martha and go through with it. Martha! Martha, come quickly! What's the matter? Something has happened to Mr. Hunter. Is he ill? Oh, I'm afraid it's more than that. He's dead. I know it. Please, please, Martha. You've got to get hold of yourself. Oh, so soon. The doctor no sooner told him. Please, than... Martha, please. please. Come on. Please. <laughs> oh, here they are. My servant and my bride. My servant weeps bitter tears over my corpse, but my wife, oh, hers have been lost. The woman who does not blush also does not cry. My dear, you have disgraced your sex. <laughs> With the prologue of Three Times a Sinner, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Today being April 1st, I'd like to bring you this timely warning. April showers bring May flowers, but they also bring accidents. Here's what I mean. Of the deaths caused by autos, one out of five occur when roads are wet or slippery. One out of five when driver's vision is obscured. Fortunately, precautions can be taken to help prevent these two types of accidents. For instance, tires that are worn smooth tend to skid more readily. But a deep, heavy retread job, the kind signal gasoline dealers are prepared to give your tires, will restore their grip on the road, help you stop more quickly. And if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, signal gasoline dealers will install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. So next time you're at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers, have your tire tread and your windshield wiper checked. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is prepared for any kind of weather. And it may help save a life. Possibly your own. And now back to the whistler. Gerald had his little joke, didn't he, Lydia? Watching you out of the corner of his eye as he slowly raised a cup of coffee to his lips, putting it down for a moment to tantalize you a little more, raising it again, chuckling to himself when you couldn't keep the eagerness from showing in your face. Yes, Lydia, it was Gerald's little joke. He's made a fool of you, hasn't he? Forced you to show your hand, to come right out and tell him you want him to die. The next morning at breakfast, you're tense and silent, watching Gerald munch happily on his buttered toast as he reads the morning paper. Uh, have some more coffee, Lydia, darling? No. Oh, come now, dear. It's perfectly all right. <laughs> Made it myself. Not a drop of poison in it. Will you be quiet? <laughs> oh, Lydia, Lydia. You're such a comfort to me in my last hours. The beautiful, dutiful wife offering peace and consolation to her lord and master in his declining days, giving freely of her strength. I've had all I can stand, Gerald. Now, that's enough. 
Very well, my dear. There's a half bottle of poison on the shelf in the medicine cabinet. Oh, here. Let me butter you a piece of toast. I'm not hungry! When are you going to kill me, my dear? Oh, uh, pass me the marmalade, will you? Thank you. Gerald, why did you do it? You, um, didn't answer my question. When are you going to kill me? I... I can't stand this any longer! Sit down, Lydia. There. That's better. <laughs> I'm very happy about last night, you know. Yes, it brings things right out into the open. I've known for years that the only thing you wanted was my money. Awfully good marmalade, won't you have some? What did you do with a half bottle of poison that's missing, Gerald? I poured it into the fireplace. Still half left, though. Ought to do the job quite nicely. I signed for it at the pharmacy myself, if you're wondering. Told them it was for the moths. So, you see? It's all ready for you, Lydia. Any time you feel in the mood. What do you want me to say, Gerald? Well, nothing, Lydia. Very well. I'll go. Where? I have an appointment at the hairdresser's. Oh, um, Lydia. Yes? Give Dr. Farmer my regards, will you? I tell you, Gerald was tempting you, Lydia. But why, Richard? I don't see... By pretending to be dead, he gave you five minutes of being a widow. He wanted you to enjoy that feeling. At the same time, he's shown you how simple it would be to kill him. Practically put poison in your hands. Now he wants you to kill him with it. He wants to die, don't you see? No, I don't. It's very simple. He wants that death on your hands so you'll die with him. Oh, I can't believe that. Not even of him. You'll hang on until you're desperate. But be careful. Don't let him trick you into it. Into what, Richard? Murder, darling. Murder. So you go home, Lydia, and determine to wait him out. He can't last long. There's no point in thinking about it anymore. Time will take care of everything. Get your mind off it, Lydia. Don't think Murder, about it darling. anymore. Murder. Murder, darling. Murder. The words keep Murder, coming back darling. like the thought of a new toy to a child. And you can't surrender like a child and turn to thoughts of other new toys. Murder is the only toy you want, isn't it, Lydia? As the days pass, it keeps returning unconsciously. The bottle on the shelf in the medicine cabinet, half full, bought in Gerald's name, flaunting Murder. its power at you every Murder. day. Murder, darling. Murder. And finally, the night comes when you can't resist it any longer. You go into the medicine cabinet and take the bottle, hold it tightly in the palm of your hand, and walk back into the kitchen. When the coffee's done, you pour a cup and add the contents of the dark little bottle. Uh, no sugar, Lydia. Gerald has told you the poison is sweet. Now, a little cream. That's it. You're ready now. The bottle is in your pocket, empty. You're ready for Gerald playing on the organ in the library. Ah, well, Lydia, is that really my coffee, or... Some silly substitute. It's coffee, dear. You haven't had any in such a long time now. I'm sure Richard couldn't object. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> By George, I wonder if I'll recognize the taste. Of course you will. You know... What? I don't think I have a taste for it anymore. Oh, not that. The moment after your first sip, you'll be clamoring for more. Habit's funny, though. Once you've broken it, it's lost. Friendship, marriage... Coffee. All the same. Oh, aren't you joining me? No, Gerald, I... I've been too nervous lately. Mind if I go ahead? Please do. What's uh, making you so nervous? Well, I, I don't know, Gerald. The past few weeks have been rather strange. Mm -hmm. Maybe the awful weather, eh? Well, cheer up, my dear. Spring's on the way. Your spirits can improve overnight, eh? I suppose so. Well, here goes. Good Lord, woman, what are you trying to do, kill me? 
kill you. What are you talking about? Oh, this is hot, Lydia. It's hot. Oh. Shall I cool it down for you? No, no. Oh, no. What's the trouble? Oh, it's my heart again. It's acting up tonight. Coffee might be bad for it anyway. Shall I call Dr. Farmer? Oh, don't be so anxious. I just better let this cool for a while. Gerald. Huh? Your coffee's getting cold. Oh, oh yes. I forgot all about it. I say. Now, what is it? This is sweet. You sure you haven't put too much sugar in it? Oh, it's just your imagination. Hmm. I suppose. That does taste good. Now, my dear. Yes? You may put the empty bottle on the organ. What? That will make it look like suicide. If they don't find the bottle by my side, you'll be suspected of murder. Go on, put the bottle on the organ. I'm going to play for a while as I wait for it. So you know. And you're not at all embarrassed. Not the faintest sign of a womanly blush. <laughs> you're the worst kind of sinner there is, a deliberate one. You sinned when you married me for my money. You sinned when I tried to commit suicide and you didn't attempt to stop me. And now you've sinned again because you tried to kill me. <laughs> Do you honestly think, my dear, that anyone three times a sinner can escape punishment? In a few moments, you'll be dead, Gerald. Perhaps. What do you mean? The sweetness of the coffee betrayed you, my dear. I knew when I first tasted it, it was poison. But you drank it anyway. It is suicide, Gerald. You knew all the time. Oh, you foolish woman. <laughs> did you think that that was poison I'd left so conveniently in the medicine chest? Well, of course I did. Martha emptied the bottle weeks ago. I told her to replace the contents with syrup to see if you'd chance another attempt on my life. Well, you came through very nicely, my dear. <laughs> well, Lydia, he's trapped you again. But why? Why, Lydia? He wants you to die for his murder. You're sure of that. He wants to let you go through all the motions time and again, only to be frustrated at the last moment. He wants to build you slowly into a rage that will lead you to a crime of violence and a sure conviction. It's clear now, isn't it? Somehow you manage to keep calm, to appear unconcerned as he sits there, playing on that infernal organ. You, uh, you don't look disappointed, Lydia. Why? Why aren't you disappointed? A minute ago, you thought I was going to die. Now I tell you that I'm not. You aren't disappointed. Why? Why aren't you disappointed? That smile, Lydia, why are you smiling? Wait a minute, you... You, you, you found out about the syrup, didn't you? You... You discovered it wasn't poison, didn't you? Lydia, answer me. Answer me! Your coffee was too sweet, wasn't it, Gerald? Was it sugar? Or did you put real poison in it? Come and tell me, Lydia. There's a strange look in your eyes, Gerald, darling. It seems to be getting stranger by the minute. Sugar doesn't do that, does it? Lydia! You're taking a new tack, aren't you, Lydia? There's no poison in the cup. But there's a new, deadlier one that you hadn't counted on until now. The poisonous power of suggestion. He actually believes he's dying. And you're making the best of it. The real poison is sweet, Gerald. Remember? You're lying, Lydia. You, you didn't do it. But I did. Did you actually believe I'd let you make a fool of me again? When, when did you buy it? Yesterday. I should have known. Getting hold of you, Gerald, inch by inch. No. Here's the bottle. Here, I'll put it beside you on the organ, just Lydia, as you said. Give me that bottle. Come to me. There. Yes, it's, it's empty. Good. Good. What? I, I told them you were trying to poison me. Gerald, what do you mean? 
The police, dear. The police. Well, Lydia, for once you're a step ahead of him. So he told them you were trying to poison him. You can't resist now. You've got to laugh about it. Relieved, free at last. Gerald slumped over the organ keyboard, dead. So much simpler now. Death of a stroke. No poison, no suicide. No prying medical examiners. Uh, Just one thing, Lydia. The bottle. That would cause suspicion, wouldn't it? When there's nothing to be suspicious about. So you take the bottle from Gerald's hand. Go down into the basement and crush it to tiny bits with an axe. There's nothing left now but a few fragments of glass. Then at long last... Yes? Richard. Richard, darling. Lydia, what's up? You must come at once, dear. Gerald is dead. When? Ten minutes ago. Lydia, you didn't... Of course I didn't. He died of a stroke, Richard. Oh, you must come at once. I'll be right over. Good. And Richard? Yes? I love you. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about those big red and yellow signal billboards you've been seeing that tell you you now go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. Unfortunately, there isn't room on those billboards to tell the rest of the story, the finer performance in new signal gasoline that makes this good mileage possible. Here's what I mean. New signals quicker starting naturally saves gas. Signals smooth, fast pickup saves gas. And signals effortless anti-knock power that sends your motor purring up the steepest hills saves gas. So you see, the features in gasoline that make driving a pleasure are the very same ones that add up to more mileage. That's why we say your speedometer is the best proof of gasoline quality. If you want the tops in performance from your car, the logical place to find it is the new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. You're free at last. For the first time since you and Gerald were married, you're genuinely happy. You want to shout it from the housetops. Tell the world that Gerald is dead and you're free. That all his cruel, cunning, and practical jokes got him nowhere. That the trap didn't work. You almost wish Gerald were alive for a moment. Just so you could tell him. But instead, you must sit quietly in the living room in your black dress and wait for Richard Farmer to finish the examination. What a day. I can imagine. We'll have a drink in a moment. I could use one. Are you finished? Yes. Simple deaths can be just as troublesome as suicides and murders, you know. I can imagine. Lydia. Yes? Lydia, has it occurred to you that Gerald might not have died from a stroke? Of course not. Why? He might have committed suicide. Why, that's impossible. I was with him all last night. You didn't leave him? No, not for a moment. We talked quite a bit. But he might have slipped something in his coffee while you weren't looking. Oh, don't be absurd, darling. Please don't try to make a suicide out of this. I remember everything clearly. He clamored for coffee. I made it for him. He drank it, and soon after, he had the stroke. Why don't you want to let it go, then? The medical examiner from the police department. What? He was the man in the gray suit. Police? What are they to do with uh, Lydia, this? he's analyzed the coffee cup and found it contained poison. But Richard! Martha! Martha! Yes, ma'am? Martha, Martha, tell me. About that bottle of poison in the medicine chest. You emptied that bottle, didn't you? You replaced the poison with syrup. I... 
I don't know what you mean, ma'am. I never touched the bottle. Martha! Martha, you... you... What's the matter, Lydia? He did it! It was a trick! Lydia, dear, don't worry about it. Everyone knows it's suicide. You just didn't see him pour the poison into the cup, that's all. And if he didn't leave the room, as you say, then the empty bottle must be somewhere in the room with his fingerprints on it. The bottle? That's all the evidence the examiner says they need. Just the bottle, don't you see, dear? Lydia. Lydia, what's the matter? You look white as a sheet. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal Dealer. This program produced by Gordon Hughes with tonight's story by Robert S. Brody, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the whistler's strange story, Terror Stricken. Fear can become a terrible thing. Gangrenous, disintegrating, warping, twisting, gnawing at a man's mind until he's conscious of nothing else but its presence. That was the kind of fear that took hold of Benjamin Reynolds. And oddly enough, it was the natural outgrowth of the very thing that started him on the road to success. There was a trial, an important trial. There were big names involved, particularly the name of Andrew Miller... The accused. And at that trial, ten years ago, young Benny Reynolds, investment clerk, just out of college, became Benjamin Reynolds, 
star witness for the prosecution. And uh, he was a good witness. Investment bankers in San Francisco and Wall Street in London glanced at the headlines and commented that this time, because of Benjamin Reynolds, Andrew Miller and his crowd were washed up for good. They were right. Order, please. Order in the court. Will the prisoner face the bench? Andrew Miller, you have been found guilty of the charge of grand larceny. I therefore sentence you to be confined within the state prison for a term of ten years. Bailiff, remove the prisoner. You dirty rat, Reynolds! I'll get you for this! Yes, Benjamin, that was the big break. Overnight, you became the banker's champion, the man who almost single-handedly broke up the Miller crowd. Today, just ten years later, you're head of the rental investment company, a pillar of the community. It's a nice morning as you sit at the desk in your private office, looking at reports. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Joan, will you send Mr. Barton in, please? Yes, sir. 46,000 Allen account. Well, that can't be right. Gross commissions, chargeable... Oh, wait a minute now. I know that's wrong. You wanted to see me, Ben? Uh, yes, Ralph. Uh, these figures, are you sure they're correct? Of course, I prepared the statement myself. Oh. Well, things like this don't do my heart any good, Ralph. Uh, sit, sit down, will you? Oh, sure. I'm sure there must be a mistake somewhere. I don't think so. But of course it's possible. Well, suppose you recheck them, eh? Just to be sure. Well, that's a big job. I'd have to go through all the records for the whole year again. I wouldn't ask you if I didn't think it was important. Well, uh, perhaps I ought to call in the Monroe Auditing Company. No, I'll do it, Ben. No use taking on that expense. Well, all right, if you can have it by next Monday. Otherwise, I'll have to call Monroe. I've got to have those figures for the director's meeting. I'll have them for you. Uh, by the way, Ben, have you seen the papers? Yes, I glanced through them at breakfast. Did you by any chance see this? Huh. Oh, yes, I missed that. Among those released from state prison today is Andrew Miller, convicted ten years ago of grand larceny in a trial that caused worldwide comment in financial circles. <coughs> remember him? <laughs> what do you think? I remember what he said when the judge sentenced him. Yeah. Does it make you a little nervous, Ben? I mean, just knowing the man is on the loose again? Oh, I doubt very much if Andy Miller will do anything that will send him up again. <laughs> Still, you never know, do you? No, Benjamin, you never know, do you? Andy Miller wouldn't think of making good on his promise. Or uh, would he? Somehow you can't concentrate. Find yourself thinking about it, wondering, walking to the water cooler in the corner of your office every five minutes... Wiping perspiration from your forehead until your handkerchief is soggy. And the next morning, it's worse as you answer your morning mail. Your order for 100 shares of consolidated power and light at the market, thereby acknowledged and... Say, uh, that was consolidated, wasn't it? I think it was Southern California Edison. Oh, yes. Uh, make it Edison, then. And uh, will be executed immediately, virtually yours. Let's see. We took care of McDonald. And, uh, what's this? You rat. I'll get you, and don't forget it. Why, she had the nerve to sign it. What's the matter? Where's the envelope to this thing? Why, Vera takes them off and... Get Vera in here right away. Well, she's out on an errand for Mr. Barton. All right, then, get Barton. Yes, sir. And don't forget it. Andrew Miller. Of all the cross I... You sent for me, Ben? Yes. Take a look at this. Hmm. Same words he used at the trial. That guy must be crazy. He signed it himself. What do you make of it? I don't know. Didn't lose any time, did he? I think he's trying to bluff you. Or maybe he didn't write it. Oh, he wrote it all right. <clears throat> I don't know. It's pretty fantastic after ten years. But in view of the threatening tone, I'd certainly check to see if it's genuine. Yes? yes? Vera's here, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, send her in, please. Well, we'll see what she knows about it. He 
want to see me, Mr. Reynolds? Yes. Uh, Vera, did you notice this letter in the morning mail? Well, I don't read the mail, Mr. Reynolds. I just open it and put it on your desk. I've instructed them not to read company mail, Ben. Oh, of course. Well, I might remember it if I saw the envelope. Yes, Mr. Reynolds? Have the wastebasket containing the envelopes from today's mail brought into my office, will you? I'm sorry, Mr. Reynolds. The janitor emptied all the wastebaskets an hour ago. Oh, very well. What are you going to do now? Well, I... I guess there's nothing I can do but call the police. With the prologue of Terror Stricken, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If you've been reading the new car ads, and who hasn't, you've no doubt noticed the emphasis that's being put on increased mileage. 25 to 30 miles per gallon from some of the new models. Now, why do you suppose this is? Is it because folks today are interested in making dollars go farther? Well, partly. But even more so, they're interested in the increased engineering efficiency which makes that greater mileage possible. Yes, and right there you have the reason why Signal Oil Company is so proud of the fact that you now go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. You see, Signal's improved mileage is the result of increased power, amazing new power. The same power that gives new Signal gasoline quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. That's why we say, look to your speedometer for the final measure of gasoline quality. You'll find that the super-powered new gasoline that gives you peak performance is also the gasoline that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal gasoline. And now... Back to the Whistler. Well, Benjamin, there was a price tag on that testimony you delivered so efficiently at the trial of Andrew Miller ten years ago, and you're beginning to pay for it now. The police don't help much. All you can do is swear out a warrant for Miller's arrest and leave the rest up to them. They can't do a thing about that weak heart of yours, stop it from pounding every time someone comes to the door, and they can't bring your appetite back or help you to sleep at night. It's later than usual when you arrive at the office next day. Ralph Barton's busy on the books as you go into your office. Hang up your hat and go over to the water cooler for a drink. <clears throat> I guess I... Help! Help! Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Help! Dr. Crane's in the next office. Get him. Hurry. Oh, yes, sure. Right away. What's going on here? Mr. Reynolds, what's happened? He came in when he called for help. Get a doctor. Sarah's already gone for one. What's keeping her? There's a doctor right down the hall. She should be back in a minute. That isn't soon enough. Oh, but it takes some time. Don't you realize every second counts? Oh, here she comes now. Right in here, Dr. Crane. Stand back. Stand back, yes, please. Yes, yes, give him room. Doctor, uh, is it serious? Hmm. Can't tell yet. Looks very much like some form of poisoning. That was a close call, wasn't it, Benjamin? When you leave the hospital that night, you're still weak. Positive now that Miller means business. The police report that afternoon. Poison in the water cooler. Just enough to knock a man out. No fingerprints. No way of knowing how Miller could have entered the office without being seen. Nothing they can tell you except to carry on, as usual. For the next two days, you find yourself waiting for it. Tense. Expectant, but nothing happens. And you begin to relax a little. To believe what the police lieutenant said about Miller being too smart to try it again. Perhaps they're right, Benjamin. Perhaps what you need is a change. A dinner out with your wife, Sally, at a restaurant on 6th Street. Ben, dear. Ben. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Sally. I, 
I was thinking. Oh, please try and forget it, darling. Oh, the whole thing's ridiculous. The man wouldn't have to take a chance like that. Oh, there must have been a mistake at the bottling company or something. Of course, dear. Now let's forget it, huh? But you're as fidgety as a cat. No, I'm not. But I am hungry. Ben, do you mean it? <laughs> of course I do. Why? Oh, because you've hardly touched your meals the last few days. Oh, well, let's order, huh? I'm starved. Well, what do we start with? Well, what about a shrimp cocktail, hmm? Wonderful. <laughs> then, uh, mixed green salad? And a sirloin for two. Medium rare. <laughs> Oh, oh, darling, are you all right? Hey, I'm, I'm the manager. Are you hurt? No, no, I'm, I'm all right. It, it, it missed me. See there in the, oh, in the wall? Oh, good Lord. Well, I don't know how that Who it... did it? Oh, I don't know, sir. I, it came from over there somewhere. Well, don't stand there with your mouth open. Call the police. Well, of course, right away. Come on. Come on, Sally. Uh, Let's get out of here. Oh, darling. Well... Whoever fired that shot meant business, didn't he, Benjamin? Your heart's pounding like a trip hammer again as you walk out of the nightclub. The hole in the wall was six inches from your head, and that's awfully close. Your heart almost stopped, didn't it? You're terror-stricken. You jump at every sound. And then you wonder why Miller doesn't come right out and kill you. But you remember he's had ten long years to plan his revenge. No... Sudden death would be too easy. He wants to make you suffer. Of course, sleep is out of the question. Even the powders the doctor gave you have little effect on your frenzied nerves. You imagine all kinds of things as you lie there in bed. Ben. Yes? Ben, why is he trying to kill you? Please, Sally, let's not well, talk about it. first the poison water and the trip to the hospital, then that shot tonight. Yeah. Oh, but Ben, the, the police will catch him soon. He can't... Catch. I... I just hope it's soon enough. Oh, sure. oh, oh that's the door. I wonder who in the world... Oh, no, lie, lie still, darling. I'll get no, it. No, no, no. Oh. I'll get it. Right. Yeah. Hold your horses. I'm coming. Oh. What do you want? What do I want? Yes, that's what I said. What do you want? I'm calling for the remains of the dear departed. Are you drunk? No, I, I don't think so. N now, look, it's cold here at the door. Uh, hurry and state your business, please. I did. I was sent to call for the mortal remains of... Man alive, will you talk sense? I haven't time for foolishness. This is 1620 Runyon Avenue, isn't it? Yes, it is. Then it's the right place. Who sent you, anyway? The Gold Hills Mortuary. Now, do you understand? No, I don't. There must be some mistake. The party on the phone was very explicit. He said 1620 Runyon Avenue, the remains of the late Benjamin Reynolds. That's not funny, mister. I, I'm Benjamin Reynolds. Oh. Now, get out. Get out of the body of Benjamin Reynolds. We'll give you a very black eye. I, oh, what's going to happen next? How much more can you stand, Benjamin, before your heart gives out completely? You can't eat. You can't sleep. You almost jump out of your skin at the slightest sound. Miller is getting his revenge. He must be enjoying it immensely. Sally makes you rest all day Sunday, but you're still befuddled. You can't even talk straight anymore. You stutter. Monday morning, you decide to walk to the office. You want to try to think... Yes, that's it. Walk and try to think. Look out! Officer! Officer! That blue sedan tried to run this man down! Hey, hey! What's going on? The guy in the blue sedan tried to run over this man! Are you hurt, mister? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm, a, I'm a, all right. Here, the devil you say, you shake him like a leaf. Oh, soon, soon as my nerves quiet yeah. down, I... Them that saw it seemed to think it was a deliberate attempt to kill you. Yes, I, I think so, too. Uh, any idea who might be trying to kill you? Sure. Andy Miller. Yeah, okay. Uh, now I've got to make a report of this. Uh, what's your name? Ben... Benjamin Reynolds. Benjamin Reynolds. Oh, you better see a doctor, Mr. Reynolds. You're, you're in bad shape. I, I'll be all right. Yeah, i better send you home in a cab. Uh, you're in no condition to walk. Uh,
Another close call, and you're scared almost to death, aren't you? You wonder how much longer your heart will be able to stand it. Not much longer now. You tremble so violently you can't even light a cigarette. Even at home, you can't sit still. You pace the floor back and forth all day long until finally night comes. You can't sleep. You toss and turn. Yes, the days are bad, but the nights are filled with terror. Who? Who's there? Ben, dear. I said, who's there? Oh, it was nothing, honey. Oh, oh. What's that? What's that? Oh, stop it. Who are you? Why don't you answer? Oh, it's only the shutter. Oh, Ben, don't be so jumpy. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yes, of course. Oh, only the shutter. It was only the shutter, wasn't it, Ben? But all the noises in the night have a sinister meaning, haven't they? After what seems like hours, exhaustion finally takes over. And you've just fallen asleep when... <laughs> oh. Uh, who's, at the, who's at the door of this house? Ben, dear, don't huh? be frightened, darling. It's not the door, it's the phone. Oh. Oh, oh the phone. Yes. Who oh, the devil can that be? I, I'll give them a piece of my mind. Hello. Is this Benjamin Reynolds? Y- yes, it is. What's the big idea of calling me at this hour of the night? Don't you know? No, and I don't care. Oh, yes, you do. You got a letter the other day, Remember? Andrew Miller. Why, how'd you guess? <coughs> I'm going to get you, remember? Say, 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 wait a minute. You haven't much time left to live, wait. Reynolds. It's coming tomorrow. But, but, hello? Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hung up. Oh, Operator. Uh, trace that call quick, please. What is your number? Uh, Morningside 1024. On hurry, please. One moment, please. Oh, hurry, hurry. What number did you call? I didn't call any number. They called me. Do you know the other party's number? No, I don't. That's why I asked you to trace the call. Please hurry. There is no one connected with your number now. I know, I know. They hung up. Can't you hurry? I want to trace the call that was connected with this phone. Please. I'm sorry, but after the other party has hung up, it is impossible to trace the call. No. Oh. Very well. Say, I wonder. I wonder if my hunch. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Hello? Hello, Barton. This is Reynolds. What the deuce makes you call me at this time of the night? Barton. Andrew Miller called. He he said I haven't much time to live. Is that so? Yes, and I'm at my wit's end. What can I do? He's coming here, Ralph. Lord knows what he'll do to what me. What do you mean he's coming there? Well, he just told me. Mm. <clears throat> you can't take this much longer, Ben. Why don't you call the police? Well, I've called the police a dozen times. I tell you Miller's too clever for them, Ralph. Then there's only one thing to do. Get out. Well, yes, but he'd follow me. He, he knows where I... He hasn't I'd... checked me. Now, look, it's out of the question for you to stay there under the circumstances. I'll be over in the morning, and we'll go up to my cabin for a few days. You've got to get a complete rest. Yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Ralph. I, I've simply got to... And listen, there's someone tipping that guy off on your movements. This time, make sure. Don't tell anyone where you're going. Yes, yes, but, but what about Sally? Tell her you're off on a business trip or something. Uh, yeah, that's it. The convention starts tomorrow in Cedar City. If necessary, you can call her later from the cabin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, all, all right, Ralph. I'll pick you up in front of the signal station at Runyon and Broadmoor tomorrow morning at 8, right? Right, right. How much farther, Ralph? About 14 miles. Hey, the old heart's banging away again. Doctor said 6,000 feet was my limit, you know. Well, we'll stay pretty well under that boy. Oh, good. Boy, oh, look at that view. You can see all the way back to... Oh, what's the matter? So that's strange. There's that car again. You don't suppose he's following us, do you? Oh, probably one of the natives. I don't know. Wait a minute. You 
You don't think Miller... You're sure you didn't tell anyone where you were going? Well, positive. I, I will have to call Sally later, though. Yeah, sure. Hey, here's the spot where I always stop. You can get a good view clear back to the valley. How about it? Oh, great. Up this way. Yes, kind of steep, I... Better take it easy. Now, there's a level spot up here at the top. Well, you, you go ahead, Ralph. I gotta watch myself at this altitude. Ah, get that air. You know, this is what I needed. Mountain air, sunshine, quiet. Hey, where are you? Up here. Come on. Huh? This is a real inspiration, Ralph. How'd you think of it? You mean this? Whew. I, I mean getting away from everything like this. One sniff of that air and a fellow forgets he ever had any worries. And look over here. Hey, now, hey, now take it easy. <laughs> kind of close to that edge, you know. Look, Ben. 1,500 feet straight down. Yeah, I'd just as soon stay back here if you don't mind. What's the matter, Ben? Afraid? No, just sensible, that's all. You know, funny thing about me in high places, it seems You to... ought to be afraid, Ben. That's where you're going. 1,500 feet straight down. <laughs> Well, that's good, 50. You're... You're serious, aren't you? I'd hate to have you call in the auditors, Ben. I was afraid that was it. There was something wrong with those figures. Yes, there was. But I learned something from Andy Miller. You're not going to be around to testify. You're going to have a dizzy spell... And they're going to find you 1,500 feet down there on those rocks. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, here's news about one of the first of the new post-war developments to make driving safer and more restful. You know how our bright western sunshine glares off pavements and off the windshields and polished chromium of other cars, causing eye strain that makes you squint and get headaches? Well, during the war, the Army and Navy used a new principle of glare control. It's called Polaroid. And unlike old-fashioned colored filters that darkened everything and changed the colors of flowers and scenery, Polaroid is as clear and colorless as your own windshield. But look through the Polaroid, and presto, all glare is gone. Now, here's the good news. This same Polaroid principle has been made into a visor for your car, and they're for sale for the first time on the Pacific Coast at your signal dealers. The Polaroid visor snaps onto your present visor in a jiffy. It's smart looking, and it flips out of the way when you're not using it. If it's sunny tomorrow, drive into your signal dealers for a demonstration. When you see the wear and tear it saves on your eyes, my bet is you'll want to buy one of these Polaroid visors now to make your summer driving more pleasant. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Benjamin, you seem to be in a tight spot. Just the two of you there, alone at the top of the cliff. Barton, staring at you, white-faced and tense, his fists clenched at his sides. And oddly, you find yourself struggling to keep the smile inside you from showing on your face. It's probably only a few seconds, but it seems like an hour that the two of you stand there, silent. Then... Listen, Ralph. You hear that? The car? Yes. They won't stop. Sure he will. That's what they came for. What do you mean? There's a detective and two patrolmen in the car, Ralph. They followed us all the way from town. You're lying. You'd better restrain yourself for a minute and see. Of course, you could pull it off now if you wanted to, Ralph. But it'd be kind of foolish, wouldn't it? The embezzlement charge will put you away for only four or five years, with perhaps a few more for attempted murder, but if you go ahead and... <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> you did it again. What? <laughs> that. It's a habit of yours, Ralph. Every time you're about to say something important, you clear your throat. <clears> throat> like that. That's why it hit me between the eyes last night when you called me and said... 
I'm going to get you. Remember? Come on, Ralph. Let's walk down to the road. We'll save the policeman a few steps. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Walter Jensen, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Hey, look, boss. Look at this. An ad in the Star Times, out of town newspaper. Yeah. Box 13, Adventure Wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> well, this looks like the right answer, Tony. Yeah. I think I'll write a letter to Box 13. The letter was postmarked from a city in Nevada. It came airmail, special delivery to Box 13 and me. It sounded like a great chance to grab a change of scenery and maybe a little fun. <laughs> fun? Brother, how wrong could I be? Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Triple Cross. Just run an advertisement in the Star Times, one that reads, Adventure Wanted will go any place, do anything, and see what you get. A lot of them can be interesting, like the one I listened to Susie read. The one that came airmail, special delivery from Nevada. And clothes is enough money to buy you a plane ticket to Los Maros. You want adventure? All right. Come to Los Maros. Register at the Paradise Hotel. Wait in your room until you're contacted. And that's all it says, Susie? That's all, Mr. Holliday. There's not even a signature, even. It's what's called an ominous letter. What kind of a letter, Susie? Ominous. Uh, you know, that means it's not signed by anybody. The word you mean is anonymous. Oh, but you could be right after all. Well, Susie, lock up the office and look for me when you see me with a new plot and a nice tan. A new plot and a nice tan, I said. Hmm. I got the plot, but the tan almost turned into a beautiful white pallor, the kind that goes well with lilies. The plane trip was smooth. The trip from airport to the Paradise Hotel was nice and easy. And the hotel itself? Well, it was the only one I could remember that looked like the ads in the travel folders. Oddly enough, there was a room reserved for me in my name. Okay, somebody checked and found out who I was. I explored the suite thinking maybe I'd get a lead on what this was all about. But it was just a fancy set of rooms, all newly decorated. 
I sat down, and then about a half hour later... Come in. Message for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Who gave this to you? A man, sir. What kind of a man? What do you look like? Oh, just a man, sir. Oh, I see. A head, two eyes, nose, two ears, and a mouth. <laughs> that is description. Yes, sir. That's exactly what he looked like. Good. But not knowing when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did he ask for an answer? Uh, no, sir. He just told me to bring the envelope to you. Will that be all, sir? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, thanks. Well, two $100 bills and a message that said, buy a red carnation in a flower shop and put it in your lapel. After dinner, go to the casino roulette table, buy $200 in chips and put them on number 18. If you win, walk away, wait 10 minutes and put half the winnings on number 22. After you play, wait in the casino. <laughs> So, with a carnation in my lapel, I bought $200 in chips and walked to the roulette table. There weren't many players. It was a little too early for the big crowd. So, I waited a minute and watched the play. Took a look at the croupier, but I might as well have been in Timbuktu. He didn't give me a tumble. Okay, the best way to see what was going to happen was to see. I shoved the whole 200 on number 18. One or two of the other players placed bets, and then... No more bits, please. No more bits. Number 18, red and even. Your chip, sir. The croupier shoved the winnings across to me. I I watched his face. If he had any expression, it was on the soles of his shoes. Well, maybe $7,000 win was coming around here. I left the table, sat down, and did a little problem in arithmetic, which figured out to be... One hundred and twenty-six thousand dollars. That's what I'd have if number twenty-two came up. And brother, it looked from where I sat as though it would. The ten minutes went by, and I walked back to the table. Waited until the wheel stopped. Number sixteen, red and even. Place your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Slowly, I shoved 3,500 in chips to number 22. This time, the others around the wheel did look. 3,500 to 35 to 1. Then the wheel began to slow up. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. No more bets, please. That croupier was as cold as the floor of a mausoleum. Somebody dropped a pin, and I heard it hit the floor. A white ball clicked, clicked, clicked its way until... Number 22, Black and Even. Your chip, sir. I cashed in the chips, and there I sat, with $126,000 tucked away in my inside coat pocket. Somebody had that wheel fixed for a killing. I began to wish I was back in my office. I didn't like it. A crooked play. Why? Why? Who? I made up my mind to go to the owner of the place and wash my hands of the whole thing when... Oh, there you are, Mr. Holliday. I've been looking for you. I have a message for you. Yeah? Well, it's verbal this time, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what is it? You're to go into the bar and wait. Is that all? Yes, sir. The same man gave you this message? Yes, sir. Did he still have a head, two eyes, a nose, and two ears? <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. All right, here you are, kid. Oh, thank you. You know, if this keeps up much longer, you'll be able to retire my tips alone. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Will that be all? Uh, how much did this character give you to forget what he looked like? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. And a smart boy like you should have taken a good look the second time. Huh? Especially since I asked about him after the first message. Oh, he was big, dark, a little mustache, and had a little white scar over his right eye. Will you take $5 for that information? That's all right, Mr. Holliday. No charge for that service. Hmm. Good boy. I'll see you later. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. I walked toward the bar, wondering what was coming next. I didn't like that fortune burning the cloth in my pocket. The bar was like my suite. Fancy, rich, and expensive. I climbed up on one of the stools, and the bartender came over. And... Yes, sir, may I serve you, sir? Got any ginger ale? Yes, sir. What with, sir? Oh, by itself. Just a glass of ginger ale. Just a ginger ale? Oh. 
You see, I like the bubbles. <laughs> Champagne has bubbles, too. Ah, uh, but they're still around the next day. Just a ginger ale. Yes, sir, of course. Excuse me, is someone sitting here? Hmm? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Ginger ale. Thanks. The usual, please. Okay. Yes, sir, may I? You got a light? Of course. Thank you. Don't mention it. Here you are. Thanks. Why do you drink ginger ale? I like it. Why do you drink martinis? Same reason, I guess. <laughs> it's a brilliant conversation, isn't it? Well, I've heard better. You're not very friendly, are you? A uh, boy scout is always friendly. And does good turns. So I hear. Do you want to be helped across the street? <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. I took a good look at her. There was something scared looking about her. She was nervous. Well, so was I because the minutes were passing and I still had that money. And I wanted to get rid of it. But I wondered about the girl, whether she had any part in this. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She picked up her bag, reached for a lipstick, and then... Oh, oh, clumsy. So it's true what they say about women's handbags. You get the stuff on the bar, I'll pick up the kitchen sink off the floor. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Did the powder spill on you? No, it's all right. Yeah, here you are. The, the mirror didn't break, did it? Nope, you're still good for seven years more. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I told you I was a good boy, Scott. You have a nice smile. Want a toothpaste commercial to go with it? No, don't be nasty. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just as nervous as you are. I... Let's talk about something else. She chattered away. It really is I listened with half an ear. Once in a while, threw in a yes or a no. And the clouds began to gather. The mirror at the back of the bar went back and forth. The people got bigger and shrank the midgets. Somebody drove a plane through my head. Buzzed around and made a bad landing on my brain. And... Oh. There you are. Feeling better now? <sighs> oh. You'll be all right. Just lie there. Take it easy. Sure, I... Hey. Hey, I'm in my room. Of course. We brought you here. We? I'm the hotel physician, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what happened? And just a fainting spell. Nothing serious. Fainting spell? What are you talking about? They're fainting spells. Your wife told me you get them. My what told you what? No, no, no. Just my bag. Whose wife said what? Your wife. She's got to have a prescription filled. Now, listen, Doc, I... Hand me my coat, will you? Yeah, it's better if you lie here. It's better okay. if you hand me my coat. Give it to me. Oh, very well. There you are. What's the matter? Was my wife in this room? Of course. She came up with me. Uh-huh. Doc, what would you do with $126,000? What? A hundred? <laughs> That's an odd question. <laughs> what would you do with it? I don't know. Because I haven't got it anymore. Now, back to Triple Cross. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, 126,000 in the red. If it was meant to be taken from me, then somebody was working it the hard way. Sure, the girl slipped something in my ginger ale when I picked up the stuff that fell out of her handbag. She took the money. All right, I want to know more of it. I was going to head for the nearest exit, running, not walking, when... Come in. You Holiday? Yeah. Do I know you? Call me Tony. I'm the guy who wrote the box 13. Oh. All right, goodbye, Tony. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. We're playing 20 questions. Let's skip the other 18, Tony. I got a big one left. Where's the dough? You tell me. Give it to me. Well, I didn't like him. I didn't like the gun he was playing with either. And I didn't like the little white scar over his right eye or the little black mustache. I was willing right then and there to cross him off my friendship list. But I told him what happened. It's a great story. Ain't heard one like it since I read fairy tales. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. You got no regard for your health, Holiday. 
Look, Tony. I'm leaving this place You'll now. You'll be too heavy to carry out if you take one more step. That's better. Now, what kind of a frame is this? Once more, you tell me. I played a crooked wheel downstairs. I don't like that. You got adventure, didn't you? I don't want anything that's crooked. Now, look who's talking. Who was the girl? Believe it or not, I never saw her before. What did she look like? I don't know. Yeah. Ever try to take a good look at anyone in that bar downstairs? It's too dark to even see a lighted match. You're smart, Holiday. The game with the girl is neat. Awful neat. You get the dough, play doggo. Act like the girl slipped your mickey. Later she turns up with the dough and you two split. Now talk sense, Tony. I didn't know why I came to Los Morris in the first place. I didn't know how I was going to get that money. How would I have time to dream up that frame with a girl? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Halliday, maybe you're telling it straight. Okay. Now can I go? No, no. You get that money back first, then you can go. I don't think I'll stay for the ninth inning, Tony. The game has not started yet, but you get that dough. How? That's your problem, but get it. Look, Tony, I'm backing out of this. You know I can go to the sheriff. Oh, no, you won't. Because there'll be a tail on you from now on up. One move like you're going to the law. Understand? Okay. Okay, I get it. And there'll be somebody in this room to see that you don't use the phone. You'll be covered like a pool table, Holiday. What if I can't find the girl? What if I can't get the money back? The boss will be awful mad. And? There are worse places than Los Moros to spend a lifetime. If you live. Ever have one of those dreams in which you try to run away from something and can't? Well, this one, with my eyes wide open, was really something. Tony and I went downstairs. Two other characters detached themselves from chairs when Tony nodded at them. Brother, I was covered. It looked hopeless. With Tony not far behind, I asked the doctor if he'd ever seen the girl who said she was my wife. Well, there was no dice there. Then I remembered something. I told Tony I was going back into the bar. Bar? What for? Now, look, Tony. Let me do it my way. I'm the one that's on the spot, so let me play it the way I want. Okay. I'll watch, and don't try for a quick steal, because the boys outside know who to look for. Go ahead. Thanks. What would I do without you, Tony? I don't know, because you're not going to be without me. Remember, I'll be watching. <laughs> yes, sir. May I serve you? Well, feeling better, sir? Well, much. Where were you when, uh... When I fainted. At the other end of the bar, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you were. It wasn't our ginger ale, sir. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just have a loose head, and when I shake it, it comes off. <laughs> May I serve you something, sir? Yes. An answer to a question. Well, what's that, sir? Who was the girl who sat down next to me? I don't know, sir. Oh, yes, you do. I beg your pardon, sir. Quit the sir business. You knew that girl. Why do you say that? Because when she sat down, she asked for the usual, and you brought her a martini. And you said okay when she asked you. What does that prove? The martini proves you knew who she was. The okay means she wasn't a guest of the hotel. No bartender as polite as you are would say okay to a lady guest. That makes sense? Why do you want to know who she is? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because I wouldn't want to see her in trouble. I'll try to keep her out of it. I won't tell you. Ever see a picture of Alexander Hamilton? Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, here's one. And funny enough, it's on a $10 bill. In fact, there's pictures on all five of these bills. Yeah. Her name's Kathy Lee. I think she has a place at the Las Palmas Courts. Thanks. Put these pictures in frames, will you? I found the Las Palmas Courts. And, of course, Tony behind me all the way. The name list in front said Kathy Lee lived in number eight. I looked around before I turned in the walk. Yeah, Tony was closer to me than varnish on a tabletop. I found number eight and stopped for a second. Looked for a phone line, but there wasn't any. I knocked at the door. No answer. I tried it again. Then I heard Tony whisper from the shadows. Try the door, Holiday. I did. It was unlocked. Tony coached from the sidelines. Go on in. I went in and closed the door behind me. It was dark. I decided to risk a call. 
Kathy. Kathy. Kathy Lee. She wasn't there. I fumbled my way to what felt like a dresser and a lamp. Turned it on and... What I saw made me turn that light off fast. What's the matter? She's dead. What are you talking about? You heard me, she's dead. You sure? Well, go in and look. You go back in and look for that dope. Go on. Now look, Tony, I don't know any more of this. That poor kid's dead, murdered. I want you to call the sheriff. No, you don't. I said you go back in there and look for that dope. You look for it. Leave my fingerprints all over the place. Now you go back in there and hunt. Don't be a sap. Whoever killed her took the money. Don't you see that? Maybe. But we'll play this angle all the way. Now stop talking and get in there. I hated to turn on that light, but I had to. I didn't look at her. I looked through the room. Then I found something. A plane ticket to San Francisco. Leaving that night. And a boat ticket for South America. They were in an envelope, but the information on the envelope said there would be two reservations. I put it back where I found it because I didn't want Tony to find it on me. And there was something else. A locket with a man's picture in it. I took it off his chain and shoved it in my pocket, and I left. Well, Helen Lee? It's not there. I told you it wouldn't be. Stand still. Back toward me. <laughs> a frisk, Tony? You don't trust me, do you? Shut up. No, I told you. Who killed her? Find that out, and you'll know where the money went. Come on. <laughs> What's so funny? How are they? Right now, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Tony was right. People at the casino saw me win that money, and somebody must have seen the girl with me. Then I got the Mickey. The money was taken. The girl killed. Who did it? Mm-hmm. Me, Dan Holliday. Because the girl clipped me for the money. Well, this was a beautiful frame. Any art gallery in the country would be proud to hang it. But I knew something Tony didn't. The plane and boat tickets. Two seats. One for Kathy and her murder. Somebody who left her tickets in her bungalow to make it look as though she was in on the $100,000 job by herself. Sure. Now her killer was taking a plane. In one hour. And a boat to South America. I could have told Tony, but I wanted to wrap it up myself. Besides, I wanted to get the whole thing to the law. On the way back to the hotel, I figured something out for myself. But I'd have to see the boss of the casino, and I thought I knew how to do that without Tony tagging along. The casino was full. I stopped. Tony stopped. What's the idea? What now? I've got to think. Up to your room. No. You want to get hurt? Sure, go ahead. Shoot me. Now. In front of all these people. You know, Tony, you, you wouldn't get ten feet. Smart, ain't you? Okay, what's now? I'm going to play blackjack. What? Want to watch? I sat at the blackjack table. I had as much interest in the game as Aunt Mamie back in Iowa, who never saw a deck of cards in her life. But I had an idea. And I played it for all it was worth. Look, uh, dealer. Yes? I didn't like that last deal. I beg your pardon, sir. I said I didn't like that last deal. Well, we'll return your money, sir. Never mind the money. Who runs this place? Hey, what is that guy trying to pull on over there? It? it worked. In three seconds, I was surrounded by muscle boys, and Tony was hotter than a New York sidewalk in August. But he couldn't touch me. A minute later, I sat across the table from the owner of the casino. I told him what happened, and when I finished, he stared at me and said, You're trying to tell me somebody let you win that money on my wheel? I am? You're crazy. The wheel's straight. But you know I won that money. Sure I do. Any time a hundred grand slides across, I know it, but... Uh... But this time it was fixed. The croupier was tipped I was to win. Wait a minute. Marty, send Frankie up here right away. Huh? Oh. Okay, forget it. What's the matter? Frankie, the croupier. Went off duty just after you won. It's not back yet. And he won't come back. Now, somebody planned to take the house this evening for that money. Somebody who couldn't risk getting it himself. So I'm the logical one. No one knows me here. 
I'd look like just another player. Later, Mr. Fixit plans to pick up the money and beat it. Who? Someone besides yourself who could get to the croupier and bribe him to fix the wheel. Got any ideas? Yeah. One. My partner. Well, that's it, then. It's got to be. But the girl, she doped you. That was a hard way to get the money from you. Listen, I've got an idea, but I'm a little cramped for room. Some of your partner's boys, particularly a guy named Tony, are glued to me. Get some of your boys to shake them off, and I'll bring that money back to you. How do you know where it is? I know. Okay, Holiday. Remember, fast play, and I'll find you if it takes the rest of my life. It's a deal. Now, uh, how about the boys? They won't follow you. Marty, that guy will leave my office. Some mugs are telling him. Stop him. Got it? Good. All right, Holiday. You're on first base. Go ahead. I was sure he'd be at the airport, and I wasn't wrong. He was sitting in the shadows on the outside. I walked over to him, and he looked up. Holiday. I thought you would be... Thought I'd be framed, huh, Frankie? What are you doing here? I've got a message from Kathy Lee. Kathy? She's... You ought to know you killed her. Ah, <laughs> you're crazy. Not only that, you've got $126,000 in that bag. $126,000 that looked like easy money. Shut up. That money doesn't mean a thing. It's the girl who counts, the girl who was willing to do what you told her to do. The girl you triple-crossed and killed after you double-crossed your boss who bribed you to fix the wheel. It's too bad you're so smart, Holiday. It's too bad you led with that right, Frankie. Somebody call the police to uh, come and clean this up. was... Oh, please hurry, Mr. Holliday. I, I want to hear the ending. All right, Susie, all right. What do you want to know? Well, how did you guess that Kathy Lee was the croupier's girl? Well, her locket had his picture in it. Oh, they should have given you the money as a reward. No, thanks, Susie. They can have it. But there's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. And that's? You didn't get a tan at all. You're just as pale as when you left. Oh, $126,000. A murder and a tan, too, she wants. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his new picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. Production supervision is by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. Please meet me at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon in front of the Mercantile Building. You can do me a tremendous favor, perhaps change the whole course of my life. I shall be wearing a brown gabardine suit, and I'll be carrying a far green suede. I'll be carrying a forest green suede handbag. That was all. No name, no initials. Just the letter. Well, it didn't sound like much of an adventure. Brother, but how I could have used a crystal ball in good working order. to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Look Pleasant, Please. Gee, Mr. 
holiday. Doesn't look particularly thrilling, but I guess it's like the old age. Huh? The what? The old age. You know, when somebody says something smart that means something different from what it says, only it's the same thing. Oh. Oh. On your next trip around the office, fix that one up, Susie. What? <laughs> Never mind. Just save up your adage. Okay? Okay. Hey, I can just make it to the mercantile building by 2 o'clock. So long, Susie. There were lots of people standing in front of the building, but only one girl in a brown gabardine suit, green hat, and handbag. I didn't walk up to her right away because, well, I wanted to take a good look. And what I saw was good. Maybe about 24, slender, lots and lots of brown hair that fell down from that cute hat in a nice way. Her clothes spelled money with two capital M's. Well, I walked over to her. Good afternoon. Oh, oh. I'm the man from Box 13. Oh, thank you. Look, I I know this sounds terribly foolish and silly, but I do want your help, Uh, Mr... Mr... Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, all right, Mr. Holiday. Do you have half an hour to spare? Well, the afternoon's young, and I can wear it away to an old age. That answer your question? Yes, it does. Do you photograph well, Mr. Holiday? Huh? Well, my baby pictures always turned out pretty good. Of course, that was a little while ago, and I... Look, I want you to have your photograph taken with me. Oh, is that all? Yes, that's all. Of course, I'll pay you for your time and trouble. Oh, no, no, no. My time's my own, and what trouble I get into is usually my own fault. (laughs) All right, Mr. Holiday. Uh, There's a photographer in this building. He's ready for us. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, Jones. Uh, Mary Jones. Oh. Do you know, Miss Jones, a writer often spends hours thinking of the right name for the characters in his stories. But here you come along and without batting an eye, think of a very unusual one. Do you have to know my real name? Well, I'll live without it, but I... Will you do it, Mr. Holliday? All right, Miss Jones. Let's go look at the birdie. The photographer was ready and it didn't take long for him to run off three shots. Miss Jones paid him and the two of us went back downstairs. Out on the pavement, I turned to her and I guess she read the look on my face. Please don't ask me why, Mr. Holliday. Goodbye and thanks very much. Well, before I could move my feet, she was into a cab and gone. <laughs> if this was it, I'd just chalk up the shortest adventure on record. There's nothing to do but go home and mark it off to experience. <laughs> yeah, that's where it should have stopped. The next morning, I walked into my office as usual and... Hey, 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 what is this, Susan? You could have told me. Told you what? I quit. You didn't trust me. Oh, Susie, will you stop? Oh, and the phone's been ringing all morning. Everybody wants to know about it. About what? Just answer the phone and find out, you... you. Careful, Susie, careful. Hello. Good morning, lover boy. Oh, Cling. Well, how's the police department? It's bright and early. It's not good to hear your voice. I call for information. Yeah, what kind? What about? Well, shall I wear my organdy hat and crepe machine badge? What are you talking about? What is the matter with everyone? For nothing, Angel Face. All's well with the world. And about 15 million bucks. Everybody's crazy. <laughs> yeah, everybody but you. Oh, nice going, Holiday. Nice going. Am I invited or don't you want cops? It might make the thing look bad, you know. In two seconds, Kling, I'm going to hang up on you. What goes? Don't you ever read the papers? Or don't you know what's going on in your life? Now, listen, I... Oh, go arrest somebody. <laughs> now, look, Susie, what's this all about? Look at the morning paper. All right, I'm looking at... Holy mackerel. She, she's awful pretty. Be quiet, Susie. Prominent heiress announces engagement to... Dan Holliday. <laughs> Dan Holiday, that's me. That, that, that's my picture with her. Sure it is. I've been framed. Oh, but you wouldn't frame a newspaper picture, would you? Marcia Jameson, 
beautiful heiress to Jameson Lumber Fortune announces engagement. You, you're, you're just a, a demijohn. Don Juan. Oh, one of the two. But you could have told me. I could have told myself. Susie, if that phone rings anymore, don't answer it until I get this thing cleared up. One way or another. Goodbye. I got Marcia Jameson's address from the society editor at the Star Times, and a half hour later I was ushered into the big library at the Jameson home. Sitting behind the desk was a youngish looking man. He rose to meet me as I walked into the room. Ah, oh, Mr. Holliday. I'm very happy to know you. Yeah, I wish I could say the same. I beg your pardon? Where's Miss Jameson? I've asked her to come down. Good. <laughs> I, uh, I suppose I'd better introduce myself. I'm Roger Jameson, Marsha's uncle and guardian. Oh, uh, she needs one. I, I don't understand. Well, that makes two of us. Suppose we pool our facts and get one good twisted story out of them. Mr. Holliday, you're acting very strangely. I must say that my niece's choice of a husband is, well, peculiar. All right, I'm peculiar. At parties, I'm a standout, but I'd like to... Dan, Dan, darling, how nice of you to come this morning. What did you expect? You, of course. You've met Uncle Roger? Yes, Marcia, we've met. Oh, I want you two to like each other. Oh, fine. I love everybody in the world, but well, I... Uncle Roger, could I speak to Dan alone, please? Certainly, Marcia. You'll stay for lunch, Mr. Holliday? No, thank you. Oh, yes, you will, Uncle Roger. Good. We'll have a long talk. Now, Miss Jameson. Why did you come here? Maybe you haven't seen the morning paper. Mr. Holliday, Dan, help me. I did. And I've got engaged. Look, Miss Jameson, I... Uh, Marcia. I don't know you that well. We just became engaged this morning. Dan, it's imperative that you act as my fiancé until after the 16th of this month. Well, what happens then? Oh, Dan, if you'll just do what I ask until the 16th. On that day... Uh, uh, yes... Come in. Lunch is ready any time. You are staying, Mr. Holliday. Yes, you'll stay, Uncle Roger. One more lunch like that, and I'd have had indigestion for the rest of my life. Uncle Roger was very curious about me. He asked a lot of questions, which Marsh answered. Then when I was ready to leave... Well, of course, Mr. Holliday, this engagement came as a complete surprise to me. I had no idea you and Marcia even knew each other. Well, I get around a lot, Mr. Jameson. And you'd better call me Roger, Dan. Yes, there's nothing like being friendly. Well, uh, I'm sure Dan has a lot of things to do this afternoon, Uncle Roger. We'd better let him go. Of course. We'll have plenty of time to talk about things, Dan. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Uh, Roger. Oh, thank you, Dan. You were wonderful. Yeah, superb, considering I didn't know where the ball was half the time. Oh, we'll wait until the 16th, won't you? It's five days from now. Meanwhile, what do I tell my friends? And where do I stack the wedding presents? You can always say we broke up. Uh-huh. And uh, I'll tell you something else, Dan. Can there be anything else? I, I almost wish the whole thing were true. Goodbye, Dan. And with that, I was left standing on the elegant steps of the Jameson Castle. Well, I could have put the whole thing on the line and cleared up the situation. It would have been easy. Just deny it. Tell the whole story. Or I could stay in the play and see what the score was. I walked down the stairs, then glanced back and looked up at a window and right into Uncle Roger's eyes... Before I could smile, he let the curtains fall back in place. Okay, that made up my mind. Curiosity killed a cat, they say. All right. Yeah. Well, Danny, welcome to the Star of Times. And what brings you into the morgue? Jonesy, I want to do some research. So you came to the right place. Oh, uh, congratulations. <sighs> Thanks. That's a lot of dough you're marrying. Yeah. Kind of sudden, wasn't it? Known her a long time? Jonesy, I feel as though it was just yesterday. Now, get me everything you've got on her. Huh? You're going to look up your own fiancé? Yep. What's the idea? Kind of silly, isn't it? Well, it's your business. I can put my fingers right on the stuff you... 
You got much? All here. Matter of fact, I was reading about her this morning. When I heard you were marrying her, I did some work. And? Well, on the 16th of this month, she comes into about 15 million. What? Yeah. But she has to be married by then. Oh. Uh, how come? Her father's will says so. If she doesn't marry by the 16th of this month, this year, her 15 million goes to, uh, oh, uh, Roger Jameson, uncle. Oh. Uh -huh. You didn't know? I don't know a lot of things. What else have you got, Jonesy? She had kind of bad luck before. Yes, what kind? Engaged twice before, and uh, both her fiancés had accidents. Bad? Yeah. Dead? Well, if they weren't, they had an awful dirty trick played on them. What? They were buried. <laughs> Back to Look Pleasant, Please. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, there I was, all wide-eyed and innocent, engaged to marry a girl whose last two fiancés had lots of bad luck. For myself, I wasn't anxious to inherit any of that. But I had to find out a little more. So I went back to the Jameson place. The butler recognized me and let me in without announcing me. I walked down the hall and heard voices in the library. Ordinarily, keyhole listening would have been out, but, well, I heard my name. The door was open, so... I tell you, Dan, we'll go through with it. Oh, Dan. Dan, first name already, huh? Oh, don't be silly, Charles. I, I've got to convince everyone he is my fiancé. Well, what if he backs out before the 16th? He won't. What makes you so sure? I know. Oh? Oh, don't be stupid, Charles. I'm not stupid. I'm just careful. Darling, darling, you know better. Well, I... All right, Marsha. Now, you'd really better go, Charles. After all, you... As I say in Alice in Wonderland, curiouser and curiouser. I was wondering about it when Charles came toward the door. I backed away and ducked into another room. Well, where is Dan now? I don't know, Charles, but you'd better get back to the office or Uncle Roger will miss you. All right, darling. Bye. I'll tell you when and where we can meet again, sweetheart. Uh, you know, I'm fussy about uh, these things. Oh, who the devil is... The name's Holiday, Charlie. I'm engaged to Marsha. Well, how did you get in? The front door. It works. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Charles, kissing another man's betrothed. Well, I... Uh, now, look, Dan, I... I... Oh, you, you go on, Charles. Dan, I want to explain something. I could stand it. Now, look, Holiday, I... Go on, Charles. Oh, very well. I'll see you. Will you come into the library, Dan? But I've got a book. Oh, please, I owe you an explanation. Okay. All right, go ahead. Well, Charles is... Charles is the man you love. Is that the line you're hunting for? Yes. All right, that's the first I'll leave out of the bottle. The rest should be easy. But it isn't. You see, Dan... Your life's in danger. Yes, I gathered that from the things I read a while ago. You, you read? Yes, the newspaper files. Oh. Dan, if you want to, you can back out. Uh-huh, I know. But maybe I'm more than a little curious. But you... You know about... About my two fiancés. Extinct. Uncle Roger killed them. Or had them killed. And Uncle Roger knows nothing about Charles? No. The aforementioned uncle thinks I'm fiancé number three in order of appearance. Uncle tries to put a block on me while Charles goes for a touchdown, right? Oh, you make it sound so brutal, heartless. Got any other words for it? You and Charles live happily ever after. I don't. All right, all right, you can do as you please. I was going to, to ask you to go through with it, but I can't. <laughs> so before I left, I promised Marsh I'd stick it out another day. Okay, I'm a sucker. But if Uncle Roger was going to toss a curve, I'd at least be waiting for him. But before I went any further, I called on Lieutenant Kling, told him I was up. 
He was very sympathetic. <laughs> oh, what a story. <laughs> <laughs> it strikes you funny, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I want to know is, was there anything that might have tied the uncle in with the deaths of Marcia's fiancés? Uh, no. You're sure? Sure I am. When I read about your uh, engagement, I remembered her name. And? Those deaths were accidents. And the uncle? Clean. Look, Clean, maybe he's smart. Yeah, it could be. There are lots of smart people in the world. Oh, but I'm not one of them. Is that it? Look, Holiday, I warned you that someday your box 13 routine would land you in a slippery spot. Okay, it's up to you to keep your footing. Cling, suppose, just suppose I leave with my chin and Uncle Roger takes a poke at it. Would that open up the other two cases? Well, sure. All right, maybe I'll do it. Holiday. What? I, uh, well, uh, look, uh, take it easy. Why, Lieutenant, you sound concerned for me. I'd miss having to hold your hand every once in a while. Well, what are you going to do now? Call on Uncle Roger and make like a sucker. Well, Dan, sit down, won't you? Thanks, Roger. You know, it's going to be quite a treat seeing Marcia married. Yes, after two unhappy beginnings before. Oh, you know about those? Marcia told you, I suppose. In a way, yes. Mm-hmm. You, um, you wanted to see me about something, Dan? Oh, just a social call. If you're busy, I can... Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave anyway. You know, Roger, it's very strange. Strange? What is? You haven't asked me anything about myself. I don't have to, Dan. Meaning? I've been very busy since this morning. You see, I have quite a bit of influence. Connections, so to speak. And uh, they told you what? <laughs> Who you are, where you live, what you do for a living. Dan, how much do you love Marcia? I'm going to marry her. You have quite a good income, so it's not the money you're after. Obviously. Dan, I'd give anything in the world to see Marcia happy. We, well, we practically grew up together. There's only ten years difference in our ages. You see, my brother was 20 when I was born. Oh, I see. Marcia is my only living relative. Oh. Then I understand your concern for her. I'm glad you do. I want to show you something. Miss Claridge, bring in the Jameson estate papers, will you? Thank you. What's that for? Dan, you write mysteries, among other things. Consequently, I think you have a, a suspicious mind. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I'm Marsh's uncle, trustee of her fortune until she gets married, which must be by the 16th of this month. Now, surely in one of your stories, you must have written about a guardian who misappropriates funds, embezzles? No, I never have. <laughs> well, it doesn't really matter. You see, I... Uh, the estate papers, Mr. Jameson. I thought I asked Miss Claridge to bring them in. Oh, well, she was busy, and I was on my way past anyway. All right, Charles. Thank you. Oh, um, Charles, this is Dan Holliday, Marsh's fiance. Dan, this is Charles Crane. How are you? Fine. Uh, congratulations. Thanks. Is that all, Mr. Jameson? Yes, that's all. Thank you. All right. Here are the papers. I think you'll find every penny accounted for. Everything in order, Dan? It looks like it. <laughs> We're going to get along, Dan. Get along beautifully. I wonder for how long. If Uncle Roger was planning on making me number three on his head parade, he was playing it smart. Oh, he was smooth. Mm-hmm. So smooth that I'd stayed at the hotel that night. If Uncle Roger knew where I lived, I might have visitors. And of course, I didn't sleep much. There was a lot of thinking to do. And it added up to something funny. The next day was Saturday, and it came in handy because Uncle Roger's office was closed. And I wanted to see something there. I called on Marsh and told her. Maybe she was a little surprised. Why do you want to go through the files, Dad? I've got a hunch, Marcia. Maybe Uncle Roger didn't show me the right papers. For the estate? Yeah, that's it. Have you got a key to the office? I can get one. And one to the files. Mm. Get them for me, will you? 
Say, uh, where's Uncle Roger today? Oh, on a yacht anchored outside the harbor. You're to go there tomorrow night. Why? He's arranged an engagement party. Danny, if you don't want to go, if you want to back out now... <laughs> Nothing doing. I'm beginning to like this. All right, Marcia, give me the keys. <laughs> Getting into the office was easy. I went to the files marked Jameson. Yeah, the papers were there all right. But not the set Uncle Roger had shown me. These were different. What little I knew about finance showed me some fancy juggling had been going on. I was checking them carefully. A neat round hole appeared in the file case alongside my head. I ducked behind the case and peeked around just in time to see the outer door to the office close. Somebody with a silenced gun played play pigeon with me. So Uncle Roger was on the yacht, was he? When I got back out on the street, a storm had kicked up. I took a cab back to my apartment and phoned Marcia. She didn't answer. The butler said she had gone and Uncle Roger was on the yacht. Late in the evening, I received a note from Marcia. Dan, I'm terribly frightened. Uncle Roger insisted that I come to the yacht tonight. I'm writing this note from my cabin now. I know something dreadful will happen, so please, if you can, come at once. There are speedboats at the dock to take you off. But be careful, Dan. Be careful. It could have been a trap, but I compared the writing on this note with the first letter to Box 13. Oh, it was hers, all right. Careful. Neat. Precise. Okay, if this was a showdown, might as well get it over with. When I got there, the yacht was pitching and rolling like a bad bronc with a burr under his saddle. That all-day storm hadn't let up a bit. Then I, I was on board, but nobody was in sight. There was one cabin with a light inside. I went to it, opened the door. Holiday, what are you doing here? Visiting. I don't understand. Didn't Marcia tell you the party was tomorrow night? I like to be early for appointments. Where is Marcia? What's the matter with you? She's not here. Oh, yes, she is. Have you gone crazy? Not yet. Sit down, Uncle Roger. Oh, all right. You know, Uncle Roger, I... I don't like being shot at. I don't know what you're talking about. Where is Marcia? Cut it out, I... I... Yes? What were you going to say? Well, what's the matter? Have you got a gun? Gun? Yes, but... Get it. Aren't you... Get it fast. It's not here. It's always in this desk drawer. Is this what you're looking for, Uncle Roger? Charles, what are you doing here? And you might ask him what he's doing with your gun. It is yours, isn't it? Well, it looks like it. <laughs> you don't think I'd kill you with my own gun, do you, Holiday? Very neat, Charlie. Very neat. But the crew... Just two crewmen aboard. The rest won't be here until tomorrow. And that storm is convenient. <laughs> Lots of noise. <laughs> Something funny, Holiday? Yeah. Yeah, you are. You think you're going to get by with this, don't you? Is there anything to stop me? What is this all about? If this is a prank... Oh, no, Roger. Not a joke. Definitely not. Charles and Marcia had it all planned very neatly. The accidents to her other fiancés gave these two beauties the idea. Charles fakes another set of papers to look as though you were embezzling and... What? Yeah, yeah. They make it look as though you can't afford to have her married by the 16th because if she doesn't marry, then the estate goes to you. And you're killed with my gun. That's it. And you're killed the same way. Charles muscles up this cabin to make it look as though there were a struggle. And All I... right, Holiday. Second guessing. Oh, no, Charlie. I'm not so dumb. I... You see, I called the police before I came aboard. You see, I guess... You're a liar. You couldn't know. Oh, but I could. Marsha's note gave it away. Marsha's note? Uh-huh. The note she was supposed to have written aboard this yacht. You see, her handwriting was neat, precise, careful. Charlie, uh... Ever try to write a neat hand on a pitching, rolling yacht? Can't be done. So I knew she wasn't aboard. And there was only one reason she'd want to get me here. To work this frame and... Oh, hello, Lieutenant Clay. Lieutenant Clay. Oh, had the gun. Holiday, is he... 
Yeah, Charlie's gone bye-bye for a little while. Call the police in here, Dan. I... Where are they? Are you kidding? Lieutenant Kling is probably saving his Betty by. May I? I gotta sit down. Susie, they weren't satisfied with $15 million. They wanted Uncle Roger's money, too. Which they would have had if that frame had worked. Uh-huh. Hey, what are you doing? What do you got there? A new camera. It's got a wonderful gadget on it that lets me get in the picture. All I do is press this button and... Oh, here, I'll show you. We'll bo- both down the light. See, like this. And then... Oh, no. Not again. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Russell Hughes. And original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. John Beale played Roger Jamison. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salute, your health and your. Roma toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. To introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma brings you as star Mr. Peter Lorre. The suspense play which stars Mr. Lorre and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called Back for Christmas. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Back for Christmas and with the performance of Peter Lorre, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Yes, Maria. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Oh, uh, just doing a little digging. And why, may I ask, have you chosen this day of all days to dig up the cellar floor? Oh, I thought because the weather has been so damp, this would be a good time to plant that little <laughs> devil's garden I told you about. Devil's garden? Whatever nonsense is that? <laughs> Don't you remember that was my little joke about it? You see, uh, I've managed to get hold of the spores of several unclassified wild orchids. In a wild state, they bloom under damp masses of leaf mold. The South American Indians call them devil flowers because they appear to bloom under the ground. Well, I'm sure the South American Indians would be very interested if you succeed in growing these ridiculous flowers under the cellar floor. <laughs> Whom else it will interest, I can't imagine. Oh, what's that? Terrible 
horrible smell. Oh, that's the lead mold. Uh, chemically identical with the earth blanket. They grow under in a wild state. And I want to get these started before we close the house. Do you realize that we're sailing for America a week from today and you've made no oh. arrangements whatever? Unless you call digging a hole in the cellar making arrangements. I certainly don't. Devil's garden, indeed. <laughs> Sometimes I think you're going soft in the head, Hubert. Oh, I, I suppose it is inconsiderate of me, you see. And I've been wanting to try this experiment for a long time, but uh, with all those lectures and seminars at the university, there, there never seemed to, uh, to be enough time. Well, there certainly isn't any time for it now. I suppose you've forgotten I made an appointment for you at the barber's this afternoon. Oh, oh, must I shave my beard off, Hermione? I thought we'd been through all that. Of course oh. you must. They don't wear beards in America. It's bad enough you're speaking with that accent. They'll probably think we're Germans as it is. Oh, I should think it would be quite easy just to explain that I'm Swiss. Now, Hubert, don't be argumentative. Mm. Go and get your jacket on and do as I tell you. Yes, Hermione. And don't forget to take your umbrella. It looks like rain. Yes, Hermione. And don't look so put upon, Hubert. Someone has to plan things in this house. Never even get to the university in time for your lectures, much less make arrangements for a trip to America. I know, but, but what about my specimens? There'll be plenty of time to plant your precious devil's garden when we get home from America. We're not going to be gone forever, you know. We'll be back here for Christmas. Yes, of course. Back for Christmas. I'd forgotten. We'll that. try to remember it. And if you can't do that, just do as I tell you. I've been making the plans in this house for 20 years. And mm. if there's any digging to be done, I'll manage that as well. You understand, Hubert? Yes, Hermione. Good. Now, you have just uh, 20 minutes to clean up this mess down here and keep your appointment at the barber's. And when you finish there, I want you to come straight home. All right. Oh, oh, oh. I, I wanted to stop at Miss Markham's and pick up some books I ordered. Well, all right. But don't loiter there the whole afternoon moiling over those old books the way you usually do. Now, hurry and clear up this rubbish. Get rid of that smelly stuff. And no more digging, mind you. No more digging. <laughs> I'll show her. I'll have my devil's garden, and if I... No more digging, eh? No more digging. Oh, 15 men on a dead man's chest. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! And a bottle. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening, Miss Markham. Why, it is Professor Schumacher, isn't it? <laughs> Do you like me better this way? You look ever so much younger without the beard. Twenty years at least. Twenty years? Oh, you'll be glad to know those books you ordered have finally arrived. Twenty... Oh, yes, the books. Let me see. The, phy the Phytotomy of Phalloid Gametophytes mm -hmm. and uh, Coniferous Shrubs of North America. Those are the very ones you ordered, good. aren't they? <laughs> yes, thank you. You're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Schumacher? Well, not, not many young ladies in bookshops would go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. Why, you're not old, Professor Schumacher. Really, you look... What do I look like? And besides, I adore botany. It's my particular hobby. Oh, really? You've never told me that before, Miss Markham. Well, I was afraid to. You mm -hmm. looked so imposing with the beard and all. Oh, <laughs> Oh, uh, Miss Markham, uh, forgive me if, if this sounds foolish, but since talking with you today, I, I feel that shaving off my beard is the most important thing I've done for 20 years. Oh, yes. it is. I, I, I'm sure it is. For 20 years. I'm, I'm so sorry that I've been so distant with you all this time. Oh, there were times when I almost spoke up. Oh, really? Times when you came in here tired after a day with your students at the university. You seemed so alone. The way I'm alone in the world. Alone. I'd like to have asked you to stay a while and talk with me, but some way or other, I... I always wind up giving you your change and letting you go on your way. Say, you... you're alone in the world? Since my father died. Oh, Miss, uh, Miss Markham, did, did you never think of marrying? My father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who seemed to measure up to what he led me to expect of men. Uh, Miss Markham... Oh. <laughs> It's been so long since anyone called me by my first name. Uh -huh. I'd like you to, if you want to. Oh. It's Marion. Marion. Oh, how nice. Marian. And and yours? Well, uh, Hubertus. <laughs> but it, but in English, Hubert sounds better. Huh? How long have you been alone, Hubert? Alone? I knew you were a widower. Of course, I. The first time I saw you. A widower. I, I can think. always tell. There's, there's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. Hmm. A sweet sadness, I think, when when he's been married and then a lost. A widower. 
I never thought of it in quite that way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have been talking like this, I suppose, but I've often wondered what she must have been like. Your wife, I mean. Hermione? <laughs> Not an easy woman to forget. Very strong. I was managing things. The house, my wardrobe, my friends. Even when we dined at a restaurant, she even then ordered my food. She was always managing things. Her whole life managed herself to death. Poor woman. She must have loved you very much. But she needn't have put herself out so. It's plain to see you don't need things managed for you. No. You need companionship, I think. Someone sympathetic with your work. But the last thing on earth you need is a manager. How well you put it. The last thing on earth. Operator. Operator, are you there? I'm still waiting on that call to Salisbury. Well, put them on quickly. Hello. Is this Paul Holton, sons? It's Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. Did you receive my letter? Good. Now, remember, we'll be back for Christmas and I want the job done without fail. What's that? No. No, I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything. Send it to me in New York as I instructed you, addressed in my name, of course. Yes. I've already put them in the mail. You'll get them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, here you are, Hubert. Where have you been? Oh, backstairs. I dismissed the servants. Dismiss the servants? Mm-hmm. But I've asked some friends of mine into a farewell lunch and go and tell them it's a mistake. Well, uh, I'm afraid it's too late now. They've packed and gone. You have messed things up properly. How many times have I told you to leave things to me? I make the plans around here. Yes, Hermione. You have to do better than this when I plan the trip home or we'll never in the world be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Well, supposing I, I were offered a professorship in one of those wealthy American universities. Nonsense. Americans care nothing for botany. Well, Luther Burbank was an American, wasn't That's he? That's different. What have you ever done except muck around in the dirt with a lot of roots and tubers? Well, they asked me to lecture, didn't uh, they? All right. All right. Now, there's no use getting yourself in a state about this, Hubert. No doubt this extra money will come in very handy when we arrive back, back for, for Christmas. Back for Christmas, I Precisely. Know. No good to make a joke of it. Heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, Hermione. And as you've been so foolish as to dismiss the servants, you may empty the ashtrays and straighten up this room while we're waiting for the guests to arrive. Mm. I'm going in to have my bath. Call me when they get here. Marion? It's Hubert. No, no, darling, no, nothing is wrong. Oh, my plans are the same, uh, unless, unless you have changed. No? We'll meet in New York, then, and be married there. Oh, I'll explain to you why later. Y you just have to trust me. Yes. <laughs> yes, my darling. You what? I'm so sorry, I can't talk any longer. Yes, I'll meet you in New York, without fail. I'll feed the same, my liebchen. Talking on the phone just uh, now? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, Hermione. Whoever was it? Oh, <laughs> Freddy, Freddy Sinclair. But didn't I hear you say something about meeting somebody in New York? Uh, why, yes. Uh, uh, Freddy said he might possibly get over there before we even leave. And, and I said, of course, we'd meet him there if he decided to go. <laughs> that seems very peculiar. But then all of your friends are peculiar. <laughs> yes, Hermione. And just look at your jacket. Have you been digging in that cellar again? Yes, Hermione. Well, there's no need for it. You can't possibly get that devil's garden thing finished before we sail for America. Go and change your clothes before the guests arrive. Oh, never mind. I see somebody coming up the walk now. Go and let them in. Yes. Uh, Hubert. Yes? Look out the window. There's Professor and Mrs. Goodenow, but who's that with them? Well, who... Uh... <laughs> Precisely. Freddie Sinclair. Peculiar, you should have been talking to him on the phone not three minutes ago, and now here he is. Yes, isn't it? <laughs> oh, but then, as you see, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. Not half so peculiar as you. Digging in the cellar the very day we leave for America. Just look at yourself. And now that I think of it... Yes? 
Oh, never mind. Uh, go and let them in. Oh, uh, you were going to ask me something, Hermione, about uh, the hole I'm digging in a cellar. Good heavens, stop rolling your eyes about that way. One would think you were digging a grave down there instead of a storage bin. Yes, Hermione. What's that? I said yes, Hermione. Father, open the door and please stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I have said it for the last time. A professor of botany, his loving wife, and an oblong pit in the cellar. Just the right size for his botanical specimens, his devil's garden. With these ingredients for a story of a perfect crime, Back for Christmas by John Collier and starring Peter Lorre, the Roma Wine Company closes the curtain for a moment on another breathless study in suspense. In this brief intermission in the play, it's pleasant to think about the holidays. Not everyone celebrates the holidays against a background of snow and pine trees. Somewhere south of the Gulf and the Caribbean, in a gracious home surrounded by palm trees and the warm sun, you might find holiday dinners ending this way. One moment, please. Our North American guest wishes to propose a toast. Yes, mis amigos. I drink a toast in gratitude to you for your gracious hospitality and the enjoyment you've given me, an American so far from home. It is only a fair exchange, my friend. This wine in which you drink your toast, it brings enjoyment to us from your country, from America. It is Roma wine made in your own California. Yes, and when you choose the wine for your holiday table, remember this. Only a few wines are so fine that many countries of the world import them. And among these greatly enjoyable wines are the wines of Roma. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Yet here in America we are truly fortunate. For we may buy Roma wines at a very low cost. Since we don't have to pay import duty or costly shipping charges. So serve Roma wine with pride on any and all holiday occasions. Serve Roma, too, for everyday dinners. You can afford to. Ask your dealer tomorrow for your favorite Roma wine, America's largest selling wine. But before you buy wine, buy war bonds. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Mr. Peter Lorre in Act Two of Back for Christmas, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That last afternoon, pouring tea out for a few friends who had come in to see her last-minute farewells, she kept reiterating it. Now, mind you, Hermione, don't let those Americans lure your husband with one of their fat university jobs. We absolutely <laughs> must have you with us for Christmas. He shall be back, I promise you. Well, it's not absolutely certain, of course. <laughs> you, but now, what do you mean, it's not certain? Of course it's certain. After all, you, Miss Old Boy, you've contracted to lecture for only three months. Oh, that's quite right, but then, uh, of course, anything may happen. Hubert adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would decide the day, the very day, mind you, before leaving for America to dig a great hole in the floor of the cellar. In the cellar? Yes. He's going to put some unclassified wild orchids down there. A devil's garden, if you please. It sounds so mysterious. That's Hubert, though. It's really quite simple, however, once you find out what he's up to. Now, take that telephone call he put through to you a few minutes ago, Freddy. Uh, To me? Of course. (coughs) Now, Hubert wanted to surprise me about your plan to meet us in New York next month. Wasn't that why he called? To ask you not to mention it? My dear Hermione, Hubert couldn't possibly have telephoned me within the past hour. I've been walking in the park since three. He didn't telephone you? Well, how could he? This for my going to America. No, 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 no. no. Come, Freddy, come. You may as well confess. (laughs) Hermione has just found me out again. But Hubert's old chap, I really do. You see what a poor liar Hubert makes. He's red as a beetroot. (laughs) Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Professor? Stringing poor Hermione along like that. And as for you, Freddy, 
I'm furious you said nothing to us about going to America. But, but look here, old girl. I've been trying to tell everyone here oh, that I'm... Oh, stop the nonsense. The game's gone on long enough. Besides, we must start getting ready. Now, it was marvelous of all of you to come in to say goodbye. And don't worry about Hubert's little jokes. I will bring him back for Christmas. You may rely on it. <laughs> They all believed her. For years, she had been promising me for dinner parties, garden parties, committees, and the promises had always been kept. This time, they would not be. I had seen to that. The servants were gone for good. The farewells all said. I had time to the minute how long it would take to fill in a hole in a cellar. My devil's garden... Upstairs in the bedroom, I undressed and put on my old bathrobe. And then I I opened the door into Hermione's room. Oh, uh, uh, Hermione, uh, have you a moment to spare? Of course, dear. I'm just finished. Oh, then, uh, will you come in here for a moment, please? There's uh, something rather extraordinary here. Oh, good heavens, Hubert. What are you lounging about in that filthy old bathroom oh. for? I told you to put it into the furnace. Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it today. Yes, really, I will. I well, high time. Now, what is it you want to show me? Oh, here, here, in the bathroom. Uh, just look, who in the world do you suppose dropped a gold chain down the bathtub drain? Nobody has, of course. Nobody wears such a thing. Then what is it doing in here? I don't see anything. Well, look. I'll hold this flashlight here for you. If you, if you lean right over, you can see it shining. It's deep down. Oh, such a lot of nonsense. Just as well. Well, I don't see it, Hubert. Well, go on looking, Hermione, in just a moment. Hubert, I absolutely refuse... Hubert, what are you doing? Take your hands off my neck. I will, Hermione. Just as soon as I've finished the arrangements for my trip to America. What are you talking about? You thought you were the only one who could plan things, didn't you? Didn't you, Hermione, huh? Oh. Well, I've been making some plans of my own this past week. In exactly two minutes and 16 seconds, you'll be dead. <sighs> you see... You see, I have planned it very accurately. You'll never get away with it. Oh, I thought you would say that, Hermione, but I will get away with it. You won't mind the smell of the leaf mold down in a cellar when I take you down there today? <laughs> yes, that is where you are going, Hermione. Oh. Right into my devil's garden that annoyed you so much. My friends all expect me back for Christmas. They do. If they don't hear from me, they'll start asking questions. No, they won't. Because you'll write them letters, Hermione, on the typewriter, as you always do. They'll be signed H in that neat, correcting way. You always sign your notes to your friends. Yeah. Let me up now. No! It won't work, Hubert. You were never any good at planning Oh, things. but I have changed. I have learned from watching you all these years. The lecture people in America. They'll expect you to be traveling with your wife. I will be traveling with my wife, but not my present wife, Hermione. Hubert! It won't work, I tell you. That pit you dug in the cellar... Oh, it will work. It'll serve its purpose well. Hubert! No, no, I'm sorry, dear. This thing has to be done exactly as planned. <gasps> you have just five seconds to say your prayers. Hubert, you must listen. The cellar, it... Don't do it, Hubert! Hubert! Yes, Hermione! Oh, uh, uh, Stuart? Yes, sir? Oh, uh, my wife, she's in this post. She, she'll be taking her meals in our stateroom. For the whole voyage, sir? Yes, for the whole voyage. I trust your wife is feeling better this morning, Professor Schumacher. A, a little. Uh, not yet well enough to leave her cabin. Oh, what a shame. Oh, Professor Schumacher. Yes? Here's a copy of the radiogram you sent for your wife last evening. Oh, thank you. I'll just check it over a bit. Oh, but, but look, look here. Why, what's the matter? Did the typist make a mistake? No, no. <laughs> it's nothing important. She, she can correct it later. For a moment, I had a feeling that Hermione 
I'd be leaning over my shoulder again, correcting what I had written as she always did. I had written a radiogram to Professor Goodenough and his wife. Haven't been out of my cabin the whole beastly trip, Hubert well. Now, doubt, we'll be back for Christmas. But the operator had left out the W and, and it read, No doubt we'll be back for Christmas. Exactly what Hermione would have written. Well, the rest of the trip was uneventful. Marion and I met in New York just as we had planned. Just as we had planned. Oh, uh, uh, Professor and Mrs. Schumacher, uh, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you, sir. Boy, take Professor and Mrs. Schumacher's luggage up to their suite. You know, Mrs. Schumacher, you're quite a surprise. Oh? Your letter reserving the rooms was so thorough. I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person, oh. frankly, ma'am. <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, we're just married, but I... My letter reserving the rooms. Oh, oh. I wrote the letter, my dear, and, and I signed it Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. <laughs> Just a joke. What a cunning old fox you are, Hubert. <laughs> now that I think of it, I... Oh, uh, I almost okay, forgot. Yeah. There's a letter for you, Mrs. Schumacher. That's peculiar. I wonder who on earth... Oh, uh... well, we'll yeah. soon find out in good time. Come along, darling. Oh, we are keeping the boy waiting. Come oh. on. Nothing like a cold, brisk shower to put a man to rights. <laughs> Hubert, this letter. Oh, yes, the letter. Oh, uh, dry my hair, will you, darling? Please. It seems to be a bill of some sort from a building contractor in, in Salisbury. Oh, really? Oh, bother. Dry your own hair. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Uh, uh, let's see this bill or whatever it is. It's very puzzling. Hubert, you were a widower, weren't you? I mean, mm -hmm. Hermione isn't still alive. I'm a... Good heavens, no. <laughs> well, let me read that. Mm-hmm. Dear madame, this is to acknowledge your order to together with the keys to your house in Launceston Place. How a man had no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in a cellar, but apparently he changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. What is it, Hubert? How a man will begin digging tomorrow and, and their job will be completed in ample time for your surprise... Christmas present to your husband. We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Schumacher will be pleased at the results of our work on his devil's garden. Very truly yours, Paul Holtzans, contractors. What does it mean, Hubert? It means... means that Hermione... Is right. I will be back for Christmas. I will be back for Christmas. I will back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Yes, Hermione. And so closes Back for Christmas. Starring Mr. Peter Lorre, tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we shall hear again from Mr. Lorre. But first, just a word that seems appropriate. One of the world's oldest customs is the Christmas toast. And traditionally, down through centuries of war and peace, the Christmas toast has been drunk in wine. This year, when the glasses are filled and raised once again, we know that in every home the toast will be to a speedy victory and a speedy return of those we love. And before we set the wine glasses down, let us all resolve to do everything within our power to help make that toast come true. Let us resolve to help supply the weapons of war by buying even more and more war bonds. Let us resolve to face our own inconveniences without complaining. And above all, let us resolve that when this war is at last over, each of us will exert all our effort 
to see that future Christmases truly express peace on earth, goodwill to men. This thought, together with our very best wishes of the season, is the Roma Wine Company's Christmas message for you, its friends, here in America and throughout the world. This is Peter Laurie. Thank you for listening to our suspense play this evening, and I know you're looking forward to next week's show as I am. It is called uh, Finishing School, and its subtitle might be the famous quotation, The female of the species is more deadly than the male. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time, for Margot, Elsa Lanchester, Janet Beecher, and a distinguished all-feminine cast in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Harry, it's been a long time. What's on your mind? John, I have a case for you involving several of our very important clients. Good. Then it ought to pay me a nice big fee. I'm not sure about that, John. Of course, we'll pay your regular expenses and your regular commission. But no extra fee? I don't know. You, huh? Uh, That is to say, it all depends on what you're able to, shall we say, uh, unearth. Something or someone, Harry. Uh, What? You said unearth, didn't you? What facts you're able to ascertain is what I meant. Oh. So what about these very important clients of yours? John, they have disappeared. Oh, well, then maybe unearth is the proper term. What? What have the police got to say about them? You did call in the police, didn't oh, you? Oh, yes, but they gave up years ago. At least Years in the case... ago? That's right. At least in the case... Now, wait a minute, Harry. You say they disappeared years ago. Well, some of them... But now, all of a sudden, you expect me to be able to... What did you say the extra fee will be on this case? I told you, it It all all depends. depends. Exactly. Yeah, on whether I'm able to literally dig them up for you. You know where they're buried? John, this morbid so-called sense of humor. Okay, Harry, okay. I'll be down to see you. And you might have a good, strong shovel ready and waiting for me. John! Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the cask of death matter. Expense account item one, thirteen forty, train fare and incidentals, Hartford to Philadelphia. I went by train since Harry Branson didn't seem to be in a hurry and I enjoyed a look at the countryside this time of year. It was a little afternoon by the time I reached the office on Walnut Street and sat down to talk with Harry. But I thought I impressed the... Old sober-sized Branson hadn't changed a bit since the last time I'd seen him. And he still looked as though he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. However, now that you have finally arrived, suppose I get right to the point and tell you what this is all about. Well, you said on the phone that some of your policyholders have disappeared. Uh, Yes, and you must understand this, John. Yeah? In accordance with Pennsylvania law... In a case of a mysterious disappearance, and I'm sure you're familiar with the mysterious disappearance clause that's part of all our life insurance contracts. Well, if you mean, did I ever read the fine print on one of your policies, the answer is no. You should sometime. The fact remains that when the insured disappears and fails to return or otherwise be accounted for by the end of seven years, when the company has received no proof the insured is still alive, the company then presumes the insured to be deceased. Do I make myself clear? Uh, keep talking, Harry. It simply means that at the end of seven years, the full amount of the insurance is then paid to the beneficiary or beneficiaries, whichever the case may be. So? So, seven years ago, a Mr. Wilbert Davis of Goshenville here in Pennsylvania mysteriously disappeared. Now his beneficiary is demanding payment of the insurance. Naturally. So why don't you pay it? We shall. 
But in checking through the files, I've suddenly discovered that his was only the first in a long series of mysterious disappearances. There have been a total of eight, all within a relatively small area, and of recently increasing frequency. When was the last one? The fourth of last month, Mr. Charles Moody. Charles Moody. Where? In the little town of Kirkwood, New Jersey. And the police have found no clue as to what might have happened to him? None whatsoever. One in Goshenville, Pennsylvania. One in Kirkwood, New Jersey. Where were the others? Two in other small Jersey towns, two here in Pennsylvania, and two down in Delaware. Hmm. Any, uh... Any relationship among the beneficiaries? None. That is, none that we know of. Why do you ask that? Uh, I just wondered if some one person was killing them off to collect the insurance. No, the beneficiaries are all widely separated individuals, so you can dismiss any possibility of murder. Harry, in a case of this kind, that's the one possibility I never dismiss. <laughs> Harry's secretary put together a comprehensive list of the people we were concerned with. Their names, addresses, beneficiaries, and so on. In my room at the Bellevue Stratford that evening, I went over it carefully. All of these people had disappeared from their homes in small communities. All of them had been in their 60s, had been widowers or bachelors. As for the beneficiaries, they were scattered about all over the country. Early the next morning, I paid my hotel bill. That's item two, $18 even for the room and a couple of meals... Then spent item three, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I drove first to the little town of Kirkwood, New Jersey, from which a Mr. Charles Moody had disappeared just about a month ago. I stopped to make inquiries at the general store. Thank you, Miss Peterson. I'll see you next week again. Now, uh, as you were saying, Mr. Hurley? Yes, Mr. Dollar, I certainly hope Mr. Moody shows up again. Your fine man. Fine man. Used to come down here at the store for a quiet game of checkers now and then. And uh, the police have no idea where he might have gone or why. Yeah, well, I guess I'm about the only police we have here in Kirkwood. Oh? Of course, I notified the state police. And I presume they're still looking for him. Just, uh, what happened, Mr. Hurley? Just took the bus into Philadelphia one day and, well, that's the last we heard of him. Do you know anything about the beneficiary of his insurance? Yeah. Let's see. According to my list... Uh... It's your nephew, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Charles Moody. Lives out in California. Yeah, Mr. Moody always felt that he was the most deserving of his relatives. Left him everything, huh? Well, the insurance and his money, yes. You know, I know because, well, I'm the only lawyer here in Kirkwood and I made out a will for him. You say just the money to his nephew. Except for his wine cellar, all his property will go to the town. Wine cellar? Yes, if Mr. Moody doesn't come back or if he's proved to be dead, the wine cellar will go over to a man over in Philadelphia. Had themselves a sort of a, a gourmet club, I guess you'd call it. I see. But now tell me... You know, I kind of wish he'd have willed me that wine cellar. <laughs> oh, you should see the collection he has there from all over the world. Yes. German I... wines and French and Italian. Yes, I'm sure. Swiss, what? Hungarian, Now, Mr. Hurley, champagne. is there anything else you can tell me that might help me to find him? How about his friends? Everybody was Mr. Moody's friend, Mr. Dollar. But as I started to say about those wines he had... So I checked out all of Mr. Moody's friends there in Kirkwood and ended up with no more information than I got from the storekeeper. But you know something? If I had had sense enough to realize it, I'd have gotten plenty from him. He had given me a real key to the disappearance, not only of Mr. Moody, but of the seven other people on the list. And what a key. Yeah, to what turned out to be one of the weirdest cases I ever handled. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Cask of Death Matter. <laughs> Item five, 4270, traveling expenses, food and lodging for the next two days. I drove my rental car to Pitts Grove and Malaga, New Jersey. Armstrong and Mount Pleasant down in Delaware. Then Hickoryville, Pennsylvania, Goshenville, and the nearby town of Mill May. I contacted not only the local police, such as they were, but dug up the lawyers who'd written wills for the missing men. And by doing so, I learned a strange, intriguing fact. You see, my last contact was there in the village of Mill May with the one lawyer in town. Yes, Mr. Dollar, if my client, Mr. Frederick Burton, fails to return by the end of seven years, your company will have to pay the insurance. As for the rest of his estate... Including uh... a wine cellar? Yes, a very excellent one. Its contents will go to a friend of his who lives in Philadelphia. A Mr. Edward Alden Pulley. Yes, that's right. 
How did you know? Well, I've been doing a little poking around these past couple of days. You understand, of course, that's only if we receive some definite evidence of Mr. Burton's death. Or if he fails to return before the seven years is up and therefore legally is presumed to be deceased. Do you know anything about this man, Polly? No, I don't. It seems they had a sort of epicures club. Do you know who the other members of it were? Uh, well, Mr. Burton told me who they are sometime before he disappeared. Uh, if you'll just give me a moment, perhaps I can recall their name. Hey, want to check them against this list of mine? Yeah, if you like. All right, let's see. Mr. Frederick Burton, that's your plan. Yes. John L. Wakeman over in Hickoryville. Mm-hmm. Wilbur Davis in Goshenville. That's correct. Harmon Phillips and Ralph Hunter from down in Delaware. That's right. And finally, Charles Moody, Nathan Norwood, and William Harnell over in Jersey. Uh, your list is quite correct, Mr. Dollar, except for one omission. There was another? Uh, Mr. Bradford W. Turner. Do you know where he lives? Yes, in the little town of Alloway here in Pennsylvania. That is, if he hasn't disappeared. Yes, I... Good heavens. Do you mean to say that all the others... Well, I know, of course, that Mr. Burton did, but... Do you mean to say that all the others on that list have disappeared, too? Yes, sir. And I'm going to find out about this Mr. Turner right now. In the town of Alloway, did you say? Well, yes, it's about 18 miles north of here. Okay, sir. And I'm very much obliged uh, to Mr. you. Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Do you really think there can be some connection between these disappearances and the fact that all these men have willed their wine collections to this Edward Alden Poley? What do you think? Wait a minute. Had I told him the others all willed their wine collections to Poley? Or had he just come to that conclusion? Or what? Hmm. Anyway, I drove due north to Alloway. The one large, rather nice home belonged to Mr. Bradford W. Turner, the man whose name was not on my list. So I hoped that he was still here in the land of the living. He was, and he turned out to be a very fine gentleman, despite his preoccupation with vintage wines. Oh, Mr. Dollar, a little order of epicures has not been very active since several of the members have all disappeared. But not you or Mr. E.A. Poley. I was just preparing to make the trip over to Philadelphia to pay a visit to Mr. Poley. Oh, Mind telling me why, Mr. Turner? Not at all, sir. Not at all. I happen to have an excellent wine cellar. Yes, I rather guessed that. Oh, but it's nothing compared to that, Mr. Polis. Edward is younger than I, younger than any of us. But his vast labyrinthine cellar is a veritable treasure house of rare and priceless vintage. I see. Now... Even I haven't seen the full extent of it, but... Oh, if only I could get hold of some of that ancient, rare Amontillado he has so often told us about. Promised you'd show us so many times. Up until now, I've not had anything worthy to offer him in exchange. Ah, but now, I've acquired a bottle of very old and very fine Medoc, a de Graf. So I shall take it to him in the home. You know... You talk as though this wine collecting were the most important thing in your life. Oh, it is, sir. And with Poli, it's an almost overpowering passion. It is his life. The kind of man who'd kill his own mother for a bottle of wine, huh? That's not the jest you may think it is, Mr. Dollar. Which is why I wonder if this bottle of fine Medoc will be enough. Mr. Turner, you're not taking it over to him. I beg your pardon. I am. Now, look here, Mr. Dollar. I've been awaiting this opportunity for years. Yeah, and you'd probably give just about anything. You are right, sir. I would. Your life? Every one of the old men who disappeared had been a nut on the subject of wine collecting and had provided in his will that his cellar was to go to a Mr. Edward Alden Poley. You know something? When I talked to Poley at his home in the old Germantown section of Philadelphia, I decided he was the biggest nut of all and possibly a dangerous one. It was an old house and a big one. It must have been one of the original Philadelphia mansions. As for Poley himself, well, I'd say he was a man of about 50. He was short and heavy set, and his face... Well, his face reminded me of a bird of prey. Very thin, with a long, aquiline nose. His eyes were far apart and almost beady. In spite of his shortness, he seemed to almost hover over things, including me. As he led me into the library, his eyes kept glancing at the package I carried, and there was a kind of inner glow in them. I could think of only one thing. Madness. 
dollar. Dollar, did you say? That's right. Johnny Dollar. I see. Oh? I mean, it's a very unusual name. I, uh, <clears throat> can't uh, help but uh, admire this library, Mr. Foley. Only the best. I must have only the best, Mr. Dollar. Yes, it, it looks so. Nothing, no one must stand in the way of my having the rarest, the finest of everything. Sometimes it takes years, Mr. Dollar, but sooner or later I get what I want. I notice you have a lot of the works of Edgar Allan Poe. The greatest writer who ever lived. I am fortunate to bear the same initials. What? Oh, yeah. Look there. First copies of his works. And look there. The manuscript of one of them. Of the... Well, it, it has to do with a certain wine. Yeah, I see. Which brings us to what you have there. Well, it's a famous old Medoc, uh, Mr. Poli. A de Gras. It's age. The vintage. Let me see. What? Well, sure. Yes, yes. Look at it. Well, I only brought it here for your opinion. Huh? Oh, but I must have this. I must have... I'm afraid that's impossible. Oh. We shall see. Perhaps we'll make an exchange. I have in my vaults an old, a rare, a priceless Amontillado. Uh, come, Mr. Dollar. A cask of Amontillado, huh? Eh? What was that? Nothing, sir. Lead the way. He did... Yeah, he sure did. Through a hidden door behind a panel in the wall. Instead of using a flashlight, he took along a sort of torch, a flambeau, I think you call it, that gave off an evil, oily smell that stained the passageway with smoke. He led me down a long, winding staircase between the walls. Then finally we came to the vast wine vaults deep underground. This was really something out of Edgar Allan Poe. It was cool and damp with great drops of water slipping down the old stone walls. On one of them was a motto. Nemo me impune la quesit. I'm afraid my Latin is a little rusty. No one dare seek to best me with impunity. I, uh, yeah. But uh, now the Amontillado... A little further. Are you a mason... A mason? A little joke, Mr. Dollar. You see, I am. He pulled a small trowel out of the inner pocket of his coat, then laughed <laughs> strangely. <laughs> sure. The cask of Amontillado, just like in the story by Edgar Allan Poe. The dark, damp wine vaults, that motto on the wall, the trowel. And this madman was living the park. No wonder his friends had disappeared, because each of them had had some priceless wine that he wouldn't part with. That is, until... The next vault, Mr. Dollar. A large crypt with niches in the wall. Some of them blocked in, others empty, waiting. There I'll introduce you to my friends who are gathered there. Your friends? Of the order of epicures. They, too, have brought me wines for my collection. Davis, Norwood, Harnell, Hunter, Phillips, Wakeman, Frederick Burton. Those names. Even my old friend, Charles Moody. You killed them, didn't you? Killed them? You brought them down here. Let me see the bottle of de Gras. You promised to show them the cask of Amontillado. Yes. Then buried them here in one of these crypts. Yes. But, Mr. Dollar, you must not keep our friends waiting. Yeah. There's the mortar and the bricks. And the Amontillado? In the niche behind you. A mortar box. A hole for mixing in that shovel. Yes, the shovel. And with it, you join my friends. Oh, no. This isn't the way the story. The eight men who disappeared, yeah, they were all buried behind the bricks and mortar that walled up eight of the niches in that deep underground vault. Funny, I completely forgot to look to see if there was a cask of Amontillado in that cellar. Edward Alden Poli, when the courts get through with his case, I'm sure he'll be committed to an institution for the rest of his life. Yeah, I told you in the beginning, this was the weirdest case I ever tackled. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, 101.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I run into a girl who is fabulously rich. And because of it, fabulously poor. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Forrest Lewis, Bartlett Robinson, Farley Bear, and Marvin Miller. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Pepsodent presents Philip Marlowe, Hollywood's famous private detective created by Raymond Chandler. Philip Marlowe, tough, cynical, private eye of Murder, My Sweet, the sardonic, case-hardened detective of the Brasher Doubloon, the Lady in the Lake, and the Big Sleep. You've seen him in action in all of those top-flight mystery pictures. Now, in order that you may continue to enjoy this exciting mystery series, Pepsodent brings you the adventures of Philip Marlowe on the air with a cast of noted radio players. And starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with Irium. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. It's the three-to-one favorite over all other toothpastes. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three-to-one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with other toothpastes at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three-to-one over all other brands they tried. These families, three-to-one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Angeles that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair, make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends up in a fight, and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I opened the door and closed it from the outside and locked it and went out to get a beer before I went up to my apartment. Uh, fill her up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlowe. Marlowe. Marlin is a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey. Hey, you bartender. Come in on the ride. That drunk again. What'd you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Make it snappy, yeah? Be right with you, sport. I gotta draw this man a beer. Crying out loud, these stumble bums have come in here. You got another customer, Bacchus. Hey, bud. You seen a lady in here lately? A lady? Tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Nobody like that's been in. All right, straight scotch, fast. I left my engine running out there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
This slick-looking, sarcastic guy stepped up to the bar and drank his scotch whole. And he stopped. The drunk was grinning at him. And then without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke curled. Very little. All right, you other guys. Don't move. So long, Waldo. All right, don't move, you two. Oh, Waldo. But I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. All right, get on that phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. Not too late. Drove away with this dead guy's car. Uh, Maybe he ain't dead. He's dead, all right. Where's your phone? This is for the police. The prowl car boys were there in about five minutes. Waldo was out of business, all right. And nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's tall, brown-haired, pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about nine o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a tall, brown-haired, pretty girl in a bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. I said, excuse me, I'm in a hurry. Now, if you'll be good enough Look, to step out... Look, you better out of... not go outside in those clothes. Just what do you mean by telling me what... This isn't a make. You're in trouble. Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you in those clothes. But I haven't done anything that... I'm in room 41 across the hall now. I never collected an etching in my life. All right, I'll go with you. I'll go. I got to my room and rustled up some scotch and soda and brought the girl her glass. She had a small automatic in her hand. It jumped up at me. And her eyes were full of panic. I put down both glasses on the table slowly so that I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, maybe this wind has got you crazy, too. Don't move. Be careful, don't move. A man just got shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket like yours. What did he look like, this man? Tall, 5'11", slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter... Dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you earlier tonight to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? Used to be my chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? Why? Listen, he asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell them. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal? Fifteen thousand dollars. Oh, it's peanuts. But it wasn't the value... It meant something to me. The man I love gave it to me, and now he's dead. He was a flyer shot down over Germany. I'll go back and tell my husband that. He probably hired you. He did? How much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. He's a hydroelectric engineer. I'll have you know that my husband oh, is one of the... Oh, skip it. I'll take him out to lunch sometime and have him tell me himself. And about Waldo... Whatever he had on you is dead stock now, like Waldo himself. You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, sister, he's dead. Dead, dead, dead. Lady, he is dead. Oh. I scream and I'll give you two black eyes. I'm not going to scream. Who will that be? There's a dressing room behind that door. Hide there. Don't... Now, don't argue with me, do it. It's all right. went to the door making a loud yawning sound. The backs of my hands were wet. I opened the door. Without a gun, that was a mistake. I certainly knew the gun I was looking into, a 22 target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head and the flat, shiny eyes and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I, I backed into the room. And Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. 
What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan pen. How is he? Dead. <laughs> I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeeper and me talking. I told him my name, where I lived. That's how, pal. I said, why? I skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. Oh, you're pretty tough at that, ain't you? But you're slamming off, pal. All right, but you could get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else. Oh, yeah, sure. Is this better? Is this such all right? Uh, just so it is in my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun. The door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her iris. She, she was scared. She had her gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She'd try to make the door scream either way. It'd be curtains for both of us. You scared, mister? You worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy, and her horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Go on, say the word. Well, don't take all night about it if you're if you're going to do something about it. Why not, pal? I like this. Well, suppose I yell. Go ahead, yell. Go ahead. Put up yeah. your hands. Hey, the... look. Oh. Thanks, sister. Thanks. That that buys me everything I have is yours now and forever. You flatter me no end, lady. I only punched him. All right, now get out of here while I call the cops down on this killer. Yes. yes good night. Good hey, night. Hey, wait, wait. Leave that Bolero jacket here. It mocks you for the cops. Oh, yes. Here. Okay. See you again? Why? Oh, I don't know. No, I guess not. After all, who am I to be the rival of a dead flyer? I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. <laughs> Yeah? You mean me? Yes. Please. Oh, you. Again, huh? Get in. I must talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters, huh? Yes. Well, I went down there with the law and gave them the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thank you. You saved my life, so no one knows a thing about you. Well, incidentally, neither do I. Well, my name is Mrs. Frank Bosley. 212 Fremont Place, Olympia 24596. Is that what you want? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, why did you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Pearls? Yes. Pearls, too, huh? All right. Tell me about the pearls. We've had a murder and a beautiful mystery woman and a sadistic killer and a heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets, and there weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? Uh, it's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do in this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? He moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Mm, great, a sort of an amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, it's getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. You could have brought him along. You could have sat in the back seat working out a problem in hydroelectrics while... Well, what? Well, I didn't have any answers. They wouldn't sound cheap or just ridiculous or from the sophomore class in repartee. I had an unlit cigarette in my hand. I threw it out of the window. I took a hold of her and kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. I wasn't always that way. Only since Johnny Dalmas was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them perfectly matched with the diamond propeller clasp. 
I'd have loved them if they'd been wooden beads because he gave them to me. I love Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand that? Hmm. What's your name? Lola. Lola, how did you explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband? I told him they were imitation, and I bought them myself. How did Walter latch on to them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina, Walter and I'd go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together, but that's all. But you confided in Waldo about this pearls. I was a fool. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you, or he'd tell Papa, huh? I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment? I suppose it's a lot to ask. No, sweetheart. Uh-uh. I've been paid. I'll go look. Wait here, huh? Has it gone long, Lola? No. Well? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. A man? Who? You know a man named Leon Valsanos? Not by name. I don't know. Mexican, South American, about uh, 45, small, iron gray hair, very neat, fawn-colored suit, wine-colored tie. No, I don't think I know such a man. Is he the one in Waldo's room? Yeah. What does he have to say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He's dead. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste... New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. It's the three-to-one favorite over all other toothpastes. It's true. With families all over America, New Pepsodent is the favorite three-to-one. The Farrell family of Evergreen Park, Illinois, preferred New Pepsodent on every single count. The Farrells say New Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer new Pepsodent over all other toothpaste they've tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Farrells and other families who compared new Pepsodent with other toothpaste they had at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler and starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro-Golden-Mare, producers of the Technicolor musical Fiesta, starring Esther Williams. I sat with Lola Barsley in her car listening to that jittery, infuriating desert wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling. Then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun and a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could use it. Someone? Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? It's been there for hours. It was there before I parked here to wait for you. Leon, the man in Waldo's room, came in that car, but according to the key containers he carried, that isn't his car. Whose car is it? Does it matter? Well, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the keys. A lady? Well, anyway, a woman, if you're going to split hairs. Eugenie Kolchenko. Hmm? In West Los Angeles? Never heard of her. Uh Uh-huh. All right, well, you go home now, huh? What are you going to do? Drive that flossy convertible around, wave at my friends, impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date.
Yes. What is it, please? Miss uh, Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes. What is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Now, don't be alarmed. I found it and I brought it home to you. Come in, please. It is a reward you wish. Shall we say... Snap out of it, dragon lady. Who was he? Who was who? The little guy, Leon. You loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? Oh, Oh, no, no. Oh, yes, yes. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, honey? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? The gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead. Darling, he's dead. Well, that's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Mm, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Mm-hmm. You told the police yet? Never do at once what can be deferred pending negotiations. Aesop. I might negotiate. Oh, peachy. What do you know, Marlowe? A man named Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happened to have the inside as to who he was, and when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leo Balsanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 in 20s on him, would he? No, but this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed at that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Mm. Is there a basis there for negotiations yet? Very well, Marlo. I'm a married man. There were certain unpaid bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But you told me I might charge to your account. All right, so I wasn't very bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the unpaid bill safely in my briefcase. Somehow this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon and gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's dough and was forced to kill Leon in the process. And then he went out to keep another date and accidentally walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down. And someone still has those bills. And I'm in for a divorce suit. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it. Yeah, that could be. The cops caught him. Oh. Oh. And the police have the briefcase. Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crime, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. Look, I've got a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me. Well, then that's what it'll cost you. Well, good luck. And, um, thank you, Mr., uh... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? My name is Frank Barsley. Bars... Barsley. Oh. What does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer? Yeah. How did you know? My voices tell me. Who? Darling, this man is manifestly insane. It's the heat, Miss Kolchenk. It's the Santa Ana. It's the desert wind. May I use your telephone? Someday I must tell you about Ibera. Salt of the Earth, Ibera, Detective Lieutenant over at Central Homicide. I phoned Ibera from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well-dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibera time to check my tip and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room, only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Well, I thought Waldo might have them up there. Hmm. Whose pearls were they? A lady's. Go on. Or they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Mm, yeah. What, yeah? They might have. Also a batch of unpaid bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Barsley? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, now, the police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They, they want to prevent or to solve crime, right? So? So I've got $500 for the police fund if those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. <laughs> Quit you, kid. No, no, it's a, it's a valuable necklace. Yeah. Yeah, it's your necklace. That's it. 41 pearls, perfectly matched diamond propeller clasp. That's it. That's the one. Take it away, Marlowe. On the level? Mm-hmm. Just tell me straight what it's all about, all oh, I ask. Sure, sure. Well, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills, a guy by the name of Barsley. Well, Barsley sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo killed Leon. 
and then stepped out and happened to get shot by that guy at the bar. Now, if Barsley's name stays out of the paper, I get $500, and that goes to the police fund. We'll keep him out. Well, now, I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. And as you say, Maro, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Well, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, she no, lives no, at... No, 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 Maro. Uh, you better take them to her. You see, except for the diamond propeller clasp on them, they're, uh, they're phony. Phony, but... It... All but the clasp, Maro. All but the clasp. <laughs> So the flyer, Johnny Dalmas, the great lover, had given Lola a string of fake pearls. Well, I didn't know how to tell her, but I called her up and told her to meet me at the beachcombers at two. I was going to slip her the bad news slowly. I'm glad you asked me to meet you here, Mr. Marlow. See, I... I had to have someone to talk to. Go ahead. Go ahead, talk. I'm listening. Now, Mr. Marlowe, now more than ever, I must... I must have those pearls. Why? Money trouble? Oh, no, no. It's just that everything's gone wrong. And this morning, my husband told me where to separate. Oh, I'm sorry, Lola. But if I had Johnny's pearls, it would be a link with the past and with Johnny. And all he meant to me. It's how a woman feels, Mr. Marlowe. I wouldn't blame you for not understanding. Well, maybe I do, though. So please, Mr. Marlowe, please. You'll try to find my pearls. Lola, look, I... Even if it isn't it... all of them. Any part of them. Any... Any single smallest one of them. It'll be Johnny's. Look, will you uh, meet me here again around 4 o'clock? I'll be here. Okay, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> There was only one earthly decent thing I could do. I took Lola's glass pearls to a jeweler and I had him take off the diamond clasp and put it on one of those strings of so-called simulated pearls that they sell you for three bucks, tax included. And I went back to keep my four o'clock date with Lola at the beachcombers. Well, Mr. Marlowe, anything new? Yes, the uh, police found some pearls in Waldo's car. They found my pearls? No, no, not not exactly. Not exactly? Well, Waldo was getting set to jip you, Lola. He had the diamond clasp of your necklace attached to a string of cheap imitations. And then he sold the real pearls. Oh, how... Oh. These are the imitations here. Yes. But it is my clasp. The clasp is real. Is that all right? Yes, it's the clasp that Johnny Dalmas gave me. Oh, of course, of course it's all right. Oh, that's swell. Thank you so much, Mr. Marlowe. Forget it. I won't. Not ever. Well, it's... Is this goodbye? Yeah, I think so. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas, Lola. If anybody ever bothers you again, though, well, let me know. Name's Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu and then I parked and walked out on a rock cliff jutting into the Pacific Ocean. Then I reached in my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. The gull swooped down on them and then flapped up again, screaming indignantly. The phony pearls had fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley, but they couldn't fool a seagull. I said to myself, to the memory of Johnny Dalmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once I realized that the wind had died. The Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the first of a new mystery series, Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lieber Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Have you tried, have you tasted the new Pepsodent toothpaste? 
Its lingering minty flavor is so fresh and inviting, families prefer it by an overwhelming average of three to one over all other toothpastes in a recent nationwide test. They said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, new Pepsodent gives you more invigorating irium foam. It sweeps dulling film away. No wonder it's the three-to-one favorite with families all over America. Get new Pepsodent with irium for your family right away. Tonight's story on the adventure of Philip Marlowe is based on Red Wind, written by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. It was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger. Heard with Van Heflin was Lorene Tuttle as Lola Barsley. And this is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at this same time to another exciting story on The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a bunco detail. A gang of petty swindlers has set up operations in your city. They're experienced, cunning. They work fast. Your job, get them. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, December 14th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain McCauley. My name's Friday. It was 10.35 a.m. when I got to room 38. Bunko Detail. Joe? Yeah, Ben. Joe, this is Miss Bergstrom. You talked to her on the phone last night? Oh, yeah, sure. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. How do you do? Glad to know you. Do you care to sit down? Thank you. I was downtown, so I thought it'd be just as easy for me to come in and see you. Did you bring those things with you, Miss Bergstrom? Here they are. Wristwatch. Pen and pencil set. Mm-hmm. Sure make them look nice, don't they? On the outside, yeah. Let me take the back off the watch for you. There. You can see for yourself, Sergeant. That's junk. Not worth 15 cents. Charged me $48 for that watch. Said it was wholesale. He wasn't making any profit on it. Told me he was doing it because he'd known Harry so well. Watch only ran for a day, then it stopped. How about the pen and pencil set, Miss? This is bad. Pen's just a shell, won't even write. Same with a pencil. I paid him $30 for them. Mm hmm. This engraving on the pen was love from Harry. That's Harry's boy is engaged to. That's how the man got me interested to start with. Came to my house and gave him to me. The watch and the pen and pencil. I said Harry had ordered them as presents for me. I see. I just had to cry when he brought them. Poor Harry. 
When did this man come to your home, Miss Bergstrom? Yesterday morning. Guess I should have been more careful, but I didn't think anybody would do a thing like that. What kind of a story did he give you? Well, he came to the door and told me his name was Spencer. He said Harry had ordered these things as presents for me. And Harry told him to deliver them to my house. Watch looked beautiful in the case. I didn't know anything was wrong. I see. Would you go on, please? He told me it was a special order. Said Harry had written him from overseas a week before. Harry was in the Marine Corps, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, he said he hoped the engraving was all right. The way Harry wrote, he wanted it in his letter. I just couldn't take it. I cried. This man, um, he pretended to be a close friend of Harry? Yeah. That's why I showed him the letter. One from the Marine Corps, but Harry being killed overseas. When did you receive that letter, Miss Bergstrom? Two days before, on Saturday. Harry's name was on the casualty list on Monday. Yes, we understand. What did the man do when you showed him the letter? He sympathized with me. Or he pretended to. I didn't think there was any trick. I didn't think anybody was that low. Pen and pencil set looked a little cheap, but I wanted them no matter how cheap they were. Harry's last present to me, that's what I thought. How did he broach the idea of money? Well, when he was ready to leave, he told me Harry had ordered the things on credit. He said he didn't want to mention it, but he wondered how he could get payment for the watch and the pen and pencil. Well, he didn't show you a bill, did he? An invoice listing the price of the watch or the engraving that was done? No. I didn't want him bothering Harry's mother or father at a time like this. I borrowed some money from my dad and paid him. Let's see, it's $48 for the watch... 30 for the pen and pencil center. Yeah. He gave me a phone number to call if the watch needed adjustment. And when I found the watch was a fake, I called the number. It was a Chinese laundry. They didn't know anything about it. You haven't seen or heard from this man since he left your house yesterday morning? No. Could you describe this man for us, Miss Bergstrom? What he looked like? Clothes he was wearing? What? It's right here. On this slip of paper, Sergeant. I wrote it all out for you. Mm, thank you. Well, you're not alone, if that's any consolation. There's an army widow out in Hollywood who was cheated on the same kind of deal last Friday. It's so cruel using a dead person's name to cheat you. Yes, ma'am. How could anybody get lower than that? They keep trying. Ben and I took Miss Bergstrom's crime report. The phony watch and pen and pencil set were booked as evidence. In the past two weeks, we'd received a half a dozen identical complaints from relatives or friends of lately deceased persons. The swindler or con man, as he likes to be called in his trade, gets the names of lately deceased persons from the obituary column or the military casualty list in the newspapers. And then he fixes up some cheap article of merchandise with appropriate engraving and calls on the friends and relatives of the deceased. He pretends to know nothing about the death of the person whom he claims placed the order for the merchandise. In almost every case, the friend or relative agrees to pay for the articles at some exorbitant price. For the con man, it's a lucrative racket. For the public, a vicious one. Wednesday, December 15th, Ben and I looked up an informant, a former con man. What do you think of it, fellas? Been in business for two months, doing fine. What do you think of it? Looks great, Judge. Nice setup. Finest baby laundry in South Los Angeles. That's why I advertise. Hey, you don't think that's too broad, do you? Oh, I don't think so, Judd. You got some nice equipment here. Baby laundry. How'd you ever get started? Father-in-law set me up with a loan. Says you got tired of me trying to sell him bum watches. Well, that's a good break for you, Judd. Say, you got a couple of minutes? We'd like to talk to you. Good sure thing. Come on back here. You okay? Fine, thanks. Yeah, I've squared away. Living a solid life. Not bad at all, you know. It surprised me. You ever see any of the old gang, Judd? Not much, no. Some of the old grifters look me up now and then, try to touch me, and I'll go. Hey, here you are. Pull one up. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, fellas, what can I do for you? Well, we'd like to know how close you got your ear to the ground, Judd. There was a gang of bunks in town. They're working hard. What pitch they using? They're working the old bits, the casualty lists. Thought maybe you might be able to help us. I don't know. How long have you been gone? Last couple of weeks. Had half a dozen reports on them. That's one thing they never could tap me for. Obituary racket. Lousiest racket there is. Can you do anything for us? I heard one little rumble about it. Four or five guys in the con mob. Is that right? We know that, Judd. Where can we look for them? 
Now, you know my position. When I quit the game, I quit. The only contacts I make are when some of the old boys come around for a touch. Well, how much have you heard about the game? Well, what I said, there's four or five of them out of the Middle West, I think. You got any idea at all where we could start looking? Well, I can start checking for you. Have you nailed any of them yet? I've got to find them before we can arrest them, Judd. Yeah, well, as I say, when I quit the game, I quit. But maybe I can take a few soundings for you. Can't promise you anything. I'm strictly on the up and up. Okay, Judd. You know where to get in touch with us. We'll appreciate anything you can do. Yeah, well, you'll help me plenty of times, fellas. Wouldn't hurt a bit to tab that punch. I'll walk out with you. Right. Well, I see you got all the machines going. Baby laundry business must be pretty good, huh? It's a staple commodity, fellas. Kids always need a fresh change. Just a minute. Yeah, look at this. Well, just look at the size of it. Yeah. <laughs> you ever see anything so small in your life? It's cute, huh? Yeah, what is it? New kind of soakers, I think. Let's see the label here, right? Yeah, Mother Greg Super Soakers. Kids thing, you should give me a wallet, you know. Hey, we might as well check the office while we're here, Ben. Can I use your phone, Judd? Yeah, right over there on the wall. You got change? Yeah, thank you, I have. Hall. 2572. 2572. Bunko Fugitive, Brian. Joe Friday, Tom. Anything doing? Yeah, Joe. I think we might have a lead on those bunks working the obituary racket. What do you got? They reached a woman in Highland Park. Where are you? Baby laundry. Oh. Well, it's a Mrs. Westerly. Her daughter was killed in an auto accident. Last night they came around and sold the woman a watch her daughter was supposed to have ordered. Also a necklace and pen and pencil set. Mm-hmm. $250. Usual junk. Did you talk to this Mrs. Westerly? Yeah, we took the report, the man's description, his M.O., the rest all match up. What's the lead? She watched the man when he left her house. Yeah? He got in a taxi cab. 10.30 a.m. While Sergeants Bryant and Ullery got out a broadcast on the suspect, Ben and I drove to the offices of the cab company where we contacted the special agent. He helped us check the way bills for the preceding night. On the way bill for cab 213, we found the trip listed. Starting point, the intersection nearest the Westerly home destination, a hotel on South Flower Street. We went to the hotel and interviewed the desk clerk. From the description we gave him, he identified the man as Fred G. Norris from Minneapolis. At least that's the way he'd signed the hotel register. The clerk told us Norris wasn't in. We had him show us Norris's room. In his suitcases, we found quantities of dime store costume jewelry, monogrammed, and two dozen cheap wrist watches and wallets and handbags done in poor quality imitation leather. Also a portable engraving set. The clerk told us that Norris was expected back shortly. We told him to say nothing to the suspect when he arrived. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout at the hotel, and we drove back to the office. 1 p.m. They told us Norris had been recognized from his description and picked up by Unit 17R on the way back to his hotel shortly before noon. Ben and I joined Sergeants Ollery and Bryant in the interrogation room where they were questioning the suspect. He looked about 40 years old, white, male American, about 6 feet tall, 170 pounds. He would admit nothing. Bryant kept questioning him. You're wasting our time in your own, Norris. Face it. You were playing a rough game and you lost. Now, how about it? You're going to feel pretty silly when you find out you got the wrong guy. Who do you work for, Fred? You can do what you want about investigating me. You have nothing to hold me on. There's no use wasting any more time. You got that list of victims. Yeah. These are the ones that tab Norris. Uh, thank you. A couple more here, Joe. Thanks, man. Miss Bergstrom there, please. Oh, this is Sergeant Friday, Miss Bergstrom. Bunko detail? Yeah, we picked up a suspect. We'd like to see if you can identify him. Would it be all right if we sent a card for you right now? All right, fine. Thank you very much. Bye. Look, I can't sit here all day. I have business to attend to. Quiet noise. He's on the phone. Hello? Miss Cronin there, please. This is Sergeant Friday calling, Miss Cronin. Bunko detail? Yes, ma'am. That's right. I'm sorry to disturb you, but we have a suspect in custody down here. Yes, ma'am? Hey, Sergeant. Could you come down to City Hall right away? Sergeant. Uh, would you hold on just a minute, please? Thank you. Yeah, Norris? You got me. 2.58 p.m. We informed the victims that the special show-up had been canceled. 
Then we called in the stenographer and had her take Fred Norris' statement. In addition to listing the crimes he committed, he also told us that there were six men in the Bunko gang besides himself. He gave us the names and descriptions of each one of them. He stated that they'd been operating in Los Angeles for the past four months. Norris said that none of them had ever met the leader of their Bunko gang. The only contact they had with the leader was through one of the older gang members, a man by the name of Wesley Fisher. Before Norris was taken to central jail for booking, he gave us the address of the house where he had been living with the other gang members. Norris's information on the suspects was checked through R&I. We got one mate, Wesley Fisher. He had one prior arrest two years before on a grand theft charge, but he'd been released for lack of evidence. 3.15 p.m., together with Sergeants Ullery and Bryant and two men from Metro Squad, we drove out to the address given us by Fred Norris. Turned out to be a neat-looking bungalow in the West Hollywood area. Take the front door, Joe. Yeah. Say, Tom. Yeah? You want to have Johnson and Brewer cover the back of the place, please? Okay, Joe. Maury and I will cover the side. Thanks. Let's go, man. Mm-hmm. Did you want to see the people who live here? Yes, ma'am. Do you want to check for the termites? No. I'm Mrs. Callahan, the owner. No, ma'am. We want to see the tenants. Well, I'm afraid you're a little late. Was that so? You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. Buy a pack. You'll find Fatimas now cost the same. Light of Fatima. Ah, that's different. What a difference. Yes, friends, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes, rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality, even to the appearance of the bright, clean yellow package, carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Wednesday, December 15th, 4 p.m. We made a thorough check of the house, which the six suspects had just vacated. We found nothing that would help us. We talked to the owner of the house where the suspects had been living. She told us that she'd rented the place furnished to them about three months before. She identified Wesley Fisher's mugshot, but she told us that he'd used the name of Charles Wilder. She also recognized each of the other gang members from the descriptions that Fred Norris had given us. She told us that while they were living there, the men seemed to keep odd hours and that they had a car. She told us that she'd taken the license number of the car the day the men moved in. The number was checked with DMV. It was registered in the name of Wesley Fisher, 1008 California Street. It's a transient hotel. The manager told us Fisher had moved about nine months ago. There was no forwarding address. We got out an all-points bulletin on Wesley Fisher, requesting that all occupants in his car be held for investigation of grand theft. Thursday, December 16th, 8 a.m., Ollery Bryant, Ben, and I met with Captain McCauley. Where are they getting all this junk they're palming off? Where's their source of supply? Mm, the guy we picked up, Norris, told us they brought a good supply of it out with him from the Middle West. That hotel room Norris had downtown, they were using that for a warehouse. They didn't want to keep the stuff at the house they were living in. How are they hitting? Any possibility of stakeouts? No, not unless we cover every name in the columns. You might have to try it. Something's got to be done. Look at these. Two more this morning. Straight out of the obituary column. Mm, took one family for $90. Another one for 60. How about that last run through the stats office? Help you any? He pulled some more mugs for us. I'm going to show them to the victims this morning. How about this Norris? You think he's come up with everything? We were up talking to him again at county jail yesterday. Didn't have anything new, Skipper. We dropped in at the sheriff's bunko detail. They've got one new case, same M.O. Description comes close to one of the guys. The victim was the father of a Navy flyer lost overseas. They sold him a gold watch chain that his son was supposed to have bought him for a present. Solid brass. The sheriff's men got anything new? We've been working pretty close with them. Nothing new. That's 
Excuse me. Bronco Fugitive, Captain McCauley. Can I talk to Joe Friday? Oh, yeah, hold on. You, Friday. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Joe, this is Judd. Can you meet me out of my place? What do you got? The name Wesley Fisher mean anything to you? 8.30 a.m. Ben and I drove out and met with Judd at his home. He was still in his bathrobe when he met us at the door. He told us he had an important appointment downtown at 9 o'clock and he was in a hurry. We talked to him while he shaved. Hope you fellas don't mind. Can't miss this date. Lining up some new business, you know. It's all right, Judd. Go right ahead. Yeah, I gotta move fast on these things before they cool, you know. Well, what you say with us, Judd? What's the story? Well... I don't know what it's worth. Brother Max called me this morning. You remember my brother Max, don't you? No, I don't think so. Now he works at the Pink Parrot Barn in South Maine. When you were in to see me the other day about those grifters you want, I gave my brother a tumble on it. Told him to keep an eye open. I have that towel, will you? Oh, yeah. Here you go. Thanks. They're all steamed up. <laughs> What'd Max come up with? Well, he's night bartender at the parrot, you know. Now, last night he spotted a couple of guys at the bar. Had some day-old newspapers. Uh-huh. They were sitting there with the papers turned in the obituary column. Checking off names, writing down addresses. Max is pretty sharp that way. Spotted them right off. Lousy razor. Does Max know these two men he spotted? No, not by name, but... He knew the one of them lived in the hotel next door to the bar. When the hotel night clerk came in for a beer, Max asked him about it. He tabbed one of the guys as Wesley Fisher. Did he have anything on the other man? No, the clerk told Max he doesn't live at the hotel, but he spends a lot of time there with Fisher. Well, had he seen Fisher and this other guy at the bar before? Yeah, Max has been in before. Got it lashed up a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Say, would it be okay uh, to contact your brother at his home, Judd? We sure. Wanna, we don't want to contact him at the bar. Yeah, sure thing. Get you dressed as soon as I'm finished here. He just moved. Uh, I don't know. Hope I didn't get you guys out here for nothing. We appreciate it, Judd. Looks good. Seems to fit. Had a hotel down there. It's a hang-up con, man. Angles are all there. Let's hope Fisher is. 8.53 a.m. We arrived at the hotel on South Main Street. We checked with the desk clerk who told us that Wesley Fisher had room 37. As far as he knew, Fisher was in his room. We got a pass key from the clerk and went up to room 37 where we found Fisher and another man. He identified himself as Raymond Breen, one of the gang members identified by Fred Norris. We also found a small supply of cheap watches and pen and pencil sets in Fisher's car. It was parked near the hotel. It was impounded. We took both suspects back to the city hall. We questioned them separately in the interrogation room. Breen was first, but he refused to answer our questions. He was taken back to the squad room, and Wesley Fisher was brought in. Sit down, Fisher. Thank you. Guess you know why you're here. No, I haven't the least idea. All right, then we'll show you. Do you know Fred Norris? Fred Norris. Name sounds a little familiar. Can't quite place it. He places you pretty well. He says he worked with you and Breen up till a couple of days ago. That's so? Yeah. Says he lived with you in that bungalow out in West Hollywood. That's so. Norris, West Hollywood. When was that? Two days ago, Fisher. Your landlady identified your mugs. She even had the license number of your car. What's it prove, gentlemen? Proves you're lying. You and Bring work together. You did work with Norris. You're part of one of the filthiest rackets going. Gentlemen, you're making a bad mistake. No, no, there's no mistake, Fisher. Your picture's been identified by at least a half a dozen victims. Now, you can go on playing coy all you want, but we can prove that the pen and pencil sets that you sold some of the victims are identical to the ones we found in your car. I haven't any idea what you're talking about. Believe me, that's the truth. You wouldn't know the truth if it followed you, mister. Now, look, maybe you're great at conning old men and young girls, but don't try to pass any of it here. Now, just a moment. No, you listen, you two-bit thief. I couldn't begin to tell you off of the rotten things you've been pulling off in this town for the past three months. That young girl who lost her boyfriend overseas, that widow out in Hollywood, the old man in Highland Park whose wife passed away. You must have felt pretty sharp cheating them out of a few bucks. Maybe you don't remember, mister, but we do and they do. You're going to pay for them. You all through? I'm through, Fisher. You're just starting. I have nothing further to say, gentlemen. You can talk to my lawyer. We'll give him your new address. Yes. County jail. 
Suspects Wesley Fisher and Raymond Breen were booked and transported to the county jail. Both of them were positively identified by the victims. Warrants were obtained for the three suspects, Norris, Fisher, and Breen. They were arraigned and held to answer at a preliminary hearing on several counts of grand theft. During the next two weeks and through the Christmas holidays, identical complaints of bunco operations continued to come in. Friends and relatives of lately deceased persons were still being victimized. The gang's operations continued as usual. There was only one change. The crime report showed that a woman was now operating in the obituary racket along with the male suspects. Christmas came and went. On New Year's Eve, Ben and I were assigned to standby duty. A few minutes before 8 p.m., we got a call from the county jail that Wesley Fisher wanted to see us. Went to the 10th floor of the jail interview room. I'm not going to take all the heat. They're in just as deep as I am. If they can't do right by me, I'll square it up myself. I'll tell you everything I know. Go ahead, Fisher. What is it? Her name's Betty McGraw. She's the one you've been looking for. The whole idea was hers. She planned it out. She got everybody together. It was her show. Where can we find her? 213 Foster, apartment 8. Wesley Fisher gave a complete statement of all his crimes and also implicated the other members. He told us Betty McGraw was his girlfriend. She'd come up with the idea for the obituary racket. She gathered the men together for the job, and it had been planned that she was to stay in the background. In case of trouble, she would furnish aid to the gang members in the form of bail bond money and lawyers. She received a percentage of the take from each of the gang members. We checked her through R&I. She had a criminal history dating back 11 years. We obtained her mugshot. 10.30 p.m. We went out to the address Fisher gave us. A maid answered the door. She told us that the McGraw woman was not there, that she'd gone to a New Year's Eve celebration at a downtown hotel. It was 11.15 when we got there. We identified ourselves to the special officer at the hotel and showed him the mugshot of Betty McGraw. He thought he'd seen her at the main bar. We started looking. Sure do pack them in. Yeah. Say, excuse me, please. Can I get through here? Thank you. Sorry. Excuse me. Hey, Joe, over this way. I think we can get through. Okay. Do you see her yet? No, they're jammed in there. I can't see a thing. But... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Can you see that at the end of the bar there? Sure. And the black red? Oh, yeah. That's her. Would you let us through here, please? Excuse me. Right. Yeah. right behind you. Is your name Betty McGraw? Is your name Betty McGraw? Sure, I'm Betty McGraw. I don't know you. Who are you? Police officer. We'd like to see you outside. Oh, boy. I'm Betty. This is where the party is. Right here. Let's go, lady. Outside. Is there a bar outside? I didn't know there was a bar outside. Okay, Ben. Come on, lady. I don't know you at all. Just trying to get through this. We'll have to wait. Yeah. Well, happy New Year, Joe. Yeah, same to you. Maybe next year we'll have it all. I don't know why. I always cry when I hear that song. No reason, I just cry. Yeah? Every year, I play it and I cry. No reason at all. You got one this year, lady. Come on. story you've just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 93, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. In the past few weeks, I've asked you to send me the names of cigarette dealers who are out of Fatimas. You see, the demand for Fatimas is so great that I want to make sure that all of you can buy them. So keep your letters coming. If you find a dealer fresh out of Fatima's, let me know and we'll have something done about it. Write your dealer's name and address on a card and mail it to me, Jack Webb, Post Office Box 951, Hollywood 28. That's Jack Webb, Post Office Box 951, Hollywood 28. Now for you, Mr. Dealer. The coming holiday season will find new thousands insisting on Fatima quality. So step up your order for Fatima's tomorrow. Get in on the increasing demand for the quality long cigarettes. The remaining members of the Bunko gang were apprehended and brought to trial. All of them, including the gang leader, Elizabeth McGraw, were tried and convicted of grand theft. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. (laughs) 
You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Coming up, We the People, then Screen Director's Playhouse on NBC. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the waterfront of Havana and to an underworld where men live and sometimes die by a bizarre code of their own. As Burnham Carter tells it in his exciting story, Night in Havana. Something was wrong. Halfway up the street of Pius Works that evening, I realized that something was wrong. None of the regulars were to be seen. Assuredly, something was wrong. But what? And then I remembered that since I had decided to live an honest life, it was really no concern of mine. As I came abreast of the Why Worry restaurant, I saw the Dutchman, Maru, who owned a cabin cruiser and who was, consequently, a man of some prominence in the smuggling trade. He was standing on the weighing machine near the door, slapping it with his big hands. Ah, ah. Tio. You have a penny? A penny? Hey, see, see, here. Thanks. Ah, 193 pounds. When I reach 195, I'll switch from beer to coffee. <laughs> when I hit 190, I go back to beer. <laughs> you like the rise and fall of the tide in Habana Harbor? <laughs> Two pounds of beer to go. If you're headed for the Cafe Mosca, I'll join you. Well, bueno, bueno. Hey, come along. Uh, Tio... Uh, Got a few dollars to lend me? I? Oh, I have not seen any money in weeks. I was hoping to find a purchaser for my gun this evening. Oh, Tio, you're, you're kidding. You're going to sell your gun? See? Si. How will you live? Honestly. <laughs> oh, Honestly, no. Maru, you? Please, please, you are attracting attention. Quiet, you have attracted oh. attention. Quiet. What, what, what? The police, the police, Lieutenant Molina, across the street. Oh, oh. oh here they come. Who's up with him? Sergeant Ortiz, newly promoted, very ambitious, and... Uh, uh, no, no, I missed the highlight game last night, Maru. I, I remained at home and read instead. You, stand where you are. Why, oh, it is Lieutenant Molina and Sergeant... Search this one, Sergeant. Nothing, Lieutenant. This one conceals nothing. You see, I lead a dull and peaceful life. I see that you do. Use your handkerchief, Theo. Your lips bleeding. They seem upset. Uh, I bear them no ill will. <laughs> they have a hard life, too. Uh, uh, is it still bleeding, huh? Yeah, yeah. You can doctor it at the cafe Moscow. Uh, they must have been told to get someone for something. You know, I held my breath during that frisk. I was afraid you might be carrying your gun. <laughs> I was. But when I saw them coming toward us, I... Put it in your pocket. Oh, you... <laughs> May I have it now, please? Here. Yeah. That is not what I would call honorable, Tio. Uh, Maru, there is so little honor in this world that one is just not able to toss it about indiscriminately. <laughs> Tell me, does my lip uh, look bad? Huh? Yeah, it's beginning to swell. Uh, Amalia will be very upset. Amalia? Who owns the Moscow? Si, si. We are betrothed. No. I <laughs> did si. not know that. Congratulations. Oh, gracias. Come, come, come. I, I buy you a beer. Come on. Step up to the bar. Uh, uh, later, later, Brad. Thank you. But now I must see Amalia. Tio. Tio, little one. Oh, I feel your lip. Oh, did nothing, Amalia. Nothing, baby. Police were in a petulant oh. mood. There is nothing. Oh, the police, yes. They were here. 
A lieutenant. Uh. Wait, he gave me his card. Yes, uh, Lieutenant Molina. Ah, uh, tell me, did he mention the cause of all this ill feeling? An American tourista, a very rich one, a very gay one. She has been robbed. Ah, I... Uh... And so soon after the police chief let it be known that American tourists were not to be robbed. Si. Ah, I, Amalia, what did she lose? Huh? An emerald. An emerald of great size. Oh. She had it in her purse, left the purse in the Cafe Diablo. Tio. Ah. You had nothing to do with this matter, did you? Ah. Oh, no, no, my fair one, nothing. I... Wish I had. You promised, Tio, you promised. Ah, I know, I know, but... Ah, Amelie, it's not easy to be honest. I would have been honest years ago, could I have earned money at... Little one, listen to me. Ah. After each of your transactions, they have kept you in the jail. Hmm. It is like my account books. One malefaction, one payment in jail. See. Si. Now you owe them nothing. There are no debts. But you have a debt. The mortgage of $2,100 on this cafe. Oh, let that be. Little by little, we shall pay it. But there is my pride to consider, my dove. To this marriage, you bring the cafe Mosca. I bring nothing. Ay, Tio. You bring your love. Is that nothing? Oh, in your eyes, it is much, see, but in the eyes of the bank, it's not. Uh, who is this American tourista who carries emeralds in her purse? Huh? Oh, uh, Mrs. Turner. She is here with her husband. They have great wealth. They came from Miami in their own cruiser. It is called the Seabird, and it is almost as large as Maru's. Hmm? Theo, promise me you will not become involved. Uh, I promise that if I do, it will be within the law. Oh, little one, I beg It will you. be within the law, I swear it to you. Uh, did Lieutenant Molina mention a, a reward? No. Hmm. He said that if I acquired information concerning the Emerald... I was to inform either him or Mr. and Mrs. Turner at the, oh, uh, yeah, the Hotel Flores. Ah. Well, perhaps it would be best to learn whether there is a reward and of a size sufficient to warrant time and effort. I am going to see uh, Senor Sterner Amalie. Tio, little one, I am afraid. Oh, there is nothing to fear. An honest man need never have anything to fear. Uh, let me have Lieutenant Molina's card, my dove. It may help me to impress the Americans. Yes? Uh, Senor Stern. Yeah. I, I am Lieutenant Molina of the Secret Police. In my car. Oh, oh well, uh, come in, Lieutenant Molina. Uh, tell me, is, is there another detective with that name? It seems to uh, me... Well, well, it is a common patronym, like in your country, uh, Smith. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, have you found the emerald? Uh, regrettably, senor, no. But I would like to talk about it. Well, I'll call my wife. She's the one who lost it. The knucklehead Lucille. Here I am. Don't yell so, ducky. Uh, this is Lieutenant Molina of the secret police. Ah, oh, it is a great honor, senora. <laughs> you see that, ducky? It's just by hand. I saw. Now, sit down, Lieutenant. You care for a drink? Uh, no, thank you. Not while on duty. Well, what's on your mind, Lieutenant? My wife and I have a dinner date It has tonight. occurred to us, the chief and I, that... Although we will, of course, eventually catch the thief, it will take some time. Uh, you understand, there are a thousand rat holes and rats of many nations and much cunning. We don't have much time. Mrs. Sterner and I are leaving Havana tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and that brings me precisely to my point. Uh, the matter of a reward. Oh, no, 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 no. Not another nickel. If I can't grease the wheels with 750 bucks, they just won't be greased. I'm a reasonable man, Lieutenant, but I'm no sucker. Of course you are not, uh, 750. Ducky, I'm sure the Lieutenant knows his business. If he thinks the reward ought to be boosted, then boost it. I want that emerald back. Now, look, Lucille, I don't... Would a thousand be better, Lieutenant? Oh, indeed it would, Senora. Then off a thousand, Ducky. <laughs> you see, Senor Stern, uh, whether I go between... Yeah, yeah, and... yeah, I know how it works. Okay, call it a thousand. A thousand dollars? It would not pay the mortgage on the Cafe Mosca, of course, but considering that virtue is said to be its own reward for being, it was handsome. I spent the next two hours seeking knowledge of the Emerald, but the activities of the police had forced the best of the regulars into hiding, and I learned nothing. And then, as I was walking along the street of souls in the old city, a voice spoke to me from the darkness of the gateway to the ancient convent known as 
El Corazón. Uh, Tio Martinez. Uh, your servant, senor. Uh, got a matter we'd like to talk to you about. We? Him and me. Oh, oh your pardon. I could not see your friend in the shadows. Uh, we got a mutual acquaintance. Georgia Young. G- Georgia Young? Oh, see, si, see. Si. I have not seen him since the profitable years of prohibition. Uh, before we left Miami, he said to look you up if we ever needed someone to work an angle. Uh, he gave us this letter of introduction. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, strike a match, please. Yeah. Ah, uh, a little closer, please. Uh, dear friend Tio, these muchachos are okay. I have a deal with them, just like in the old days, Georgie. Oh, well... Uh, you know my name. What is yours? Uh, Moore, Gus Moore. My name's none of your business. Oh, stop it, Leo, will you? His name's Leo Walsh. Uh, we only been here in Cuba a little while. Uh, you said that you needed somebody to work an angle. Yeah. We got a shipment on the Florida coast just beyond Key West. We want it brought here tonight. There's 400 rifles... Uh, please, please, please. I am not interested in the nature of your cargo. You tell me that you are importers, and that is all an honest man need know. Yeah. Uh... Is it George Young who provides you with the merchandise? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like in the old days. <laughs> uh, it can be done, gentlemen, but it will cost money, of course. Uh, $1,500. That's highway robbery. Let me rough him up a little. Stop it, Leo, will you? Okay, Martinez, 1500 Cash on delivery. Uh, half of it now. Uh, 300 bucks now. <sighs> I'm sorry, no. Well, that's all the cash we have. How do you propose to get more? How much is this worth? The, the American Tourista's Emera. Huh? <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, oh, just the ways of fortune. <laughs> I'm sorry you will not understand. You talk too much. <laughs> yeah, see, one of my great failings. I can fix that. Cut it out, Leo. Well, how about it? That rock's worth more than 1200 Oh, much more. But the question is, uh, what can one unload it for? Huh? Tell me, how did you acquire this, huh? Oh, a dame I picked up at a bar while the husband was dead drunk. Well? I will make the arrangements. You give me 300 on the emerald. Yeah, you get the 300 now as a binder. I'll hand you the stone when you've delivered. Very well, I agree. Now, you listen carefully to me. You will both meet me at the Cafe Mosca at 11 o'clock. Mm-hmm. We shall drive from there to, to a certain beach where we pick up the boat. Is that clear? Yeah. Uh, Leo will meet you. And you? Oh, I'm staying at the van. i got to make arrangements for the truck. I'll meet the boat when it comes back and hand over the emerald. Uh, just tell me where. Uh, the beach at Marianao. There's a dirt road. You cannot miss this. Now, three hours to Key West, 15 minutes to load, three hours back to Cuba. Mm-hmm. The boat will arrive at Marianao by five tomorrow morning. Is it well? Yeah. Uh, here's your 300. Uh, much thanks, senor. You know what I do to chappies who talk too much? Uh, stop it, Leo, will you? You'll meet at the mosque at 11. It will be my pleasure. <laughs> Well, is that coffee you drink, Maru? Oh, sit down, Tio, sit down. <laughs> yeah, it's coffee, all right. I hit 195 a half hour ago. Well, what's up? If you are not too busy tonight, there's a little shipment to be moved in from Key West. Oh, how much? A thousand dollars for you. And for you? Uh, only 100. Go on, what do you think? I'm stupid. Oh, you are a devil. One can hide nothing from you. Very well, I receive 150. Ah, you. Easy to deal. What time do we leave? Around 11. I'll have the boat ready just off Guanabaco. You know the dock, sir? Yes. Rings a thousand with you. I will give you the thousand tomorrow, soon after we return. Bring it with you, or we do not even leave. Well? I will bring it with me. Good. Have some coffee. Uh, no, gracias. It is necessary now to see Amelia. Until 11, then. Until 11. Theo, I was worried, little one. You were gone so long. Oh, I had much business to transact. Oh, Amelia, I am working on a deal. A very big deal. I... So big that I need a thousand dollars to swing it. Theo. Ah, see, see, I have 300 and I need 700 more. Amelia, will you lend it to me? I have but 800 in the whole world. Well, lend me seven. Oh, if this deal proceeds as planned, Amelia, you and I will be married this week, and then I shall settle down as an honest cafe keeper. Oh, Tio, for that I would give all the money there is. Where 
Where is this boat? I don't see it. Impatient, Senor Walsh. It's the end of the dock. A dock, he calls it. Some crummy dock. No, quiet, 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 please. Maru. Here, Tio. Ah. Captain Maru, this is Senor Leo Walsh. Uh-huh. Yeah. You uh, have some money, Tio? Here. One thousand dollars has agreed. Senor Walsh will guide you to the exact spot at Key West. And, gentlemen, I wish you both a good chance. Save your wishes for somebody else. You're coming with us. Uh, no, no. I make it a point never I to... say you are. So does this. <laughs> mm. I have a repugnance for guns between associates. And I don't trust people who talk so much. You're coming with us. Now get in. I shall do as you say. All right, now you, Skipper. Thank you. Some tub. You'll never see a faster one. How fast? Forty knots. All right, shove off. How come you're so quiet, Big Mouth? Oh, I was just thinking. I was thinking that the life of honesty contains almost as much interest as the kind I have formerly read. In just a moment, we will return to Escape. But first, a favorite program with CBS listeners who want to keep abreast of the times is the news report by Alan Jackson, broadcast every Sunday morning over most of these same CBS stations. Jackson is one of CBS's ace reporters who has covered important world events in New York, London, and Berlin. Now stationed in CBS Washington News Bureau, Alan Jackson brings you the news in a clear, informed manner that has become a CBS tradition. Remember to listen this Sunday to Alan Jackson and the News, a regular CBS feature. Tune in, tune in this fall, for the shows that you love best of all. Listen carefully, here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. And now back to Escape and the second act of Night in Havana. Three hours we were passing through the Florida Keys. Maru had no difficulty in following Senor Walsh's directions. There was a place where a finger of land got into the water, an old rum runner's landing base which I remembered well. A truck was waiting, and three men who came forward as we tied to the dock of rotting planks. Senor Walsh spoke to them briefly, and in ten minutes the heavy crates were on board and we were off again, clearing the land quietly at a low speed and then roaring into the open. Come on, pour it on, pour it on. I'm giving it full throttle now. Uh, Relax, Sonny. Listen, squarehead. You talking to me? Who else? I don't like for you to call me Sonny. I do it because you're so bright. How would you like a third eye? Senor Walls, Maru, enough, enough. Carry this as far as you please once we are on shore, but until then... Yeah, we will win to it first after we I led them to the squabbling and stretched out on the bench in the cockpit, my head on my arms, gazing into the sky. And soothed by the powerful hum of the engines, so steady that they were in themselves a sort of silence. I thought of Amalia and how soft and comfortable she was. And that we were both at the right age for marriage. Steady people who knew that what we had was worth a dozen romantic flights to the moon. And I thought of how now there would be a little money for the raising of the mortgage and the Café Moscow. And then I dozed. And then... What's the matter? How come you cut the motor? Shut up. Tio, are you awake? Do you hear it? See. Si. Where are your binoculars? Binoculars? What are you looking for? Coast Guard. Where are we, Maru? About two miles off the coast between Matanzas and Havana. Uh, I see them. They're to the west, about the same distance out. What is the time? Uh, 4.20. Sun will be up in less than two hours. Which way are they heading? I cannot... Well... There's a searchlight. They see us. They were tipped off. They were looking for us. Somebody talked. Martinez, shut up. It's radar. They're all so equipped. I have heard that. Uh, they come toward us. Dump the cargo. When they come, we've been fishing. No. Every set I got is tied up in those boxes. I said dump the gun. And I said no. We'll run for it. This boat's faster than that one. At this angle, they have us cut off from the open sea. If we go west, we pass Havana. If we go east, Matanzas. As soon as we move, the radio for help, we call. And I said we'll run for it. Now take the wheel, fat boy, and pour it on. But on. They're moving fast. I command here. No, you don't. This does. Get back to the wheel. Careful, Maru. Careful. He's frightened. Put away your gun, Sonny. Stand where you are. I said... 
Shoot me, will you? Enough, Maro, enough. His spine has cracked like a banana stall. Enough, I say. Gio. I hurt. I hurt bad. Uh, lie down here. Let me see. Uh, well? Ugly, Maro. Very ugly. Help me. It was a wheel. Yeah. Then uh, drop the dinghy and roll to shore. I try to make it back to Key West. Uh, you need care immediately. We'll both go to shore in the dinghy. But my boat, the Coast Guard... I will turn it out to sea and set the throttles. She'll give them a run for their money. But when they overtake us, they'll find the cargo. They know the boat is mine. One step at a time, Maru. <sighs> the moment we will do as I say. First we feed Senor Wars to the fishes. Then the dinghy goes over the side. Then you and I. I landed the dinghy only a short distance below the place where I left the car. Before 5.30, Maru was in good hands and I was at the Flores Hotel, knocking at the door of the suite occupied by Senor and Senora Stern. At that moment, I would have surrendered all thoughts of profit for this night's labor in return for assurance that only Amalia's $700 would not be lost. Uh, oh, Lieutenant Molina, this is a sweet time. I to... give you a thousand apologies, Senor. Only an emergency forces me to do this. We, we can't get your emerald now. Do you understand? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. But only I... we need your cruiser. You must come with me in your cruiser. And now, now, I assure you it is our only chance. There is no danger, Senor. Uh, all right, I'll get dressed. I'll be waiting for you across the street in the black touring car. You come quickly, wear dark clothes, bring the money. But quickly, senor, quickly. Where are we going? We are bound for the beach called Marianao. I never heard of it. As a wooden pier. It should be just about light enough to distinguish. We arrived here. Hey, you have brought the cash. Yeah, yeah. How much do I have to pay? Uh, the maximum, senor, $1,000. They would not do it for less, I am sorry. No, it's okay. I didn't think you could keep them down even to that. Uh, am I on course? Yes, si, si, exactly on course. Uh, we are almost there. I think that you had better give me the money now. Yeah, it's in my right hip pocket, Lieutenant. Help yourself. Ah, much thanks. Uh, senor, I am sorry that our original laxity in guarding the possessions of your wife has put you to all this trouble. Oh, forget it, forget it. It's one piece with the rest of the trip. I've had a lousy time. Oh, I am most sorry. We naturally prefer to have the tourist as love, Cooper. Oh, it's not your fault. I was mostly too drunk to see any of it. I have always tried. Uh, senor, there is more than a thousand dollars in this pocket. There... It's 1100 Oh, yeah, yeah. I meant to tell you. The thousands for the emerald, the other hundreds for you, for all of your courtesy and attention. Oh, regulations forbid me to accept, senor. But since it would be discourteous, much thanks. <laughs> hey, we are past Caminitas now, I think. Yes, uh, there is the dock tomorrow now. Hey, let me take the wheel. Huh? Hey, someone on shore is blinking a light there. Huh. Three times. I have noticed Hey, what are you doing? Heading out to sea? No, no, no. I will back in. So. And now comes the most important part, senor. Now, when I bring the boat to a halt at the dock, you must take the wheel and keep your hand on the throttle with the motor running. And when I say to you, now, you throw in the clutch and full speed ahead. Do you understand me, senor? Well, sure, but why? It's all arranged, isn't it? Si, si, it is arranged, and this is the most crucial part of the arrangement. Okay, whatever you say, Wilson. Ah. All right, you take the wheel. Now remember, keep your hand on the throttle. Now don't forget, easy. Uh, here comes my man along the dock now. Remember, when I say now. Uh, go ahead, let's get this over. Si. Uh, Senor Moore. Martinez. See, si, see, si. everything has gone well. Where's Watch? At the wheel. Oh, good. Uh, throw me a line to get my boys to start unloading. Uh, first, before you tie us up, we will conclude our affair, huh? You have the emerald for me? Oh, yeah. Here. Here, take it. Ah, good, good. Much thanks. Here is our cable. Make fast the ball, huh? Yeah, I got it. Now, senor, now! Lie down. Lie down on the deck. What? But quickly. You will not be surprised forever. Lie down. Stay there. Well, I don't understand. I think we'll soon be out of range. You'll lead an interesting life, Molina. (sighs) 
It has its moments. When I saw you handing the cable, I was sure I'd rip the stern off her as soon as I gave it throttle. Well, senor, I took the precaution to untie it on our side first. <laughs> ah, look, look, the sun is rising. Hey, senor, do you know of any satisfaction to compare with that accompanying uh, good job, well done? Three days later, I was sitting at a table in the Café Moscow with Maru. His wounds still troubled him, and he had lost much weight. Uh, a matter he was remedying as quickly as he could. Two more beers. Uh, better make it three. Visitor poaches. Oh. No, no, no. Don't turn your head. It's Lieutenant Molina. Oh, oh. they found my boat. Uh, you are ready with the story. It was stolen while I was ill. I know nothing of it. Bueno, bueno. I will testify to it. Uh, no, 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 Maru. I have lost my taste for reading. I now spend most evenings at the highlight games, and I find Captain that Maru? I'm... Maru? Yeah? The Coast oh, Guard has found a boat that belongs to you. Do you have so many that one may be lost without your feeling the necessity of reporting it? Uh, I've been ill. I've not been down to the harbor these three days. I have a question to ask. Hmm. Ask it, then. They found several large crates on board. They did? Do you know what we discovered in them? Uh, scrap metal. S scrap metal? <laughs> I use it for ballast. Uh, careful, beer. I uh, see, see, to celebrate my wedding, which occurs this afternoon. So I have heard. You are going to lead an honest life, Tio? See, si, see. Si, uh, I have been experimenting with it, and I find that it suits me. Well, keep it confidential. Otherwise, the budget for the police department may be cut to the bone. <laughs> Goodbye, Lieutenant. Go with God. You heard what he said? The crates contain scrap metal. I'm not surprised. <laughs> in the note my friend George Young sent to me, he wrote that he was in on a deal just like in the old days. Huh? Well, in the old days, he saw many a bootlegger barrels of whiskey would contain only water. Oh. <laughs> in that way, you see, he did not break the law and may be said to have earned his money honorably. As uh, I may be said to do, too. You call owning a cafe earning money honorably? Well, it depends on the clientele. Huh? And uh, in that respect, Maru, uh, perhaps it would be better uh, after the wedding, of course, if you took your custom elsewhere. Suppose I tell you that from now on I will be as honest as you yourself. Will you let me patronize this bar? Oh, gladly, Maru. But, uh, of course, I will be doubly watchful of the cash register. <laughs> Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Night in Havana by Burnham Carter, adapted for radio by Walter Brown Newman. Featured in the cast were Tony Barrett as Tio, Alan Reed as Maru, and Janet Nolan as Amelia and Mrs. Sterner. Also heard were Ted Von Eltz, Bill Conrad, Jeff Corey, and Jack Webb. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are tortuously worming your way inch by inch through a narrow pipe deep under the ground. Unable to turn back, not knowing what lies ahead. Possible death or escape. Next week, we escape with William Corcoran's grim story, The Blue Wall. Good night, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Young and old benefit by the Community Chest Red Feather Services. When you make your contribution this year, you will be helping to support the Boy and Girl Scouts, the YMCA, and the YWCA, child guidance clinics and day nurseries. So give generously to the Red Feather Services. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Bye.
Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. They said my son was killed in a drunken brawl. I know he wasn't. He was a good boy. He was murdered. Why, I don't know. If you come to 733 Winship Avenue... If you'll come to 733 Winship Avenue any time and listen to my story, I'll be grateful to you forever, Mrs. Catherine Daly. And that was the letter to Box 13. Just a few lines. But, brother, what those few lines led to. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13. I get some funny letters through Box 13. Some don't mean a thing. Others are from people who answer all the ads. But this one from Mrs. Catherine Daly. It had a real ring to it. I get so I can spot the letters from cranks and curiosity hunters. They're full of big phrases. It's the simple ones that count, like Susie said. Well, it's short, Mr. Holliday. Uh-huh. What are you going to do about it? Well, what would you do, Susie? Mm, well... You know, Susie, I don't know how you managed to get right to the point of things so quickly. Oh, it's easy. Mm. Okay, you talked me into it. I don't know what I'd do without you. I'd try to make myself indisposable. The word Susie is indispensable. What's the difference? None, I guess. All right, Susie, I'm on my way to 733 Winship Avenue. Mrs. Catherine Daly was a little woman, maybe about 50, 60. It was difficult to tell because gray hair was pushing hard against the brown. It was her eyes that got me. Maybe not too long ago they'd been able to smile. But now they were dead, lifeless. Something had been taken away from... from... Well, inside. She led the way to a little living room, furnished cheaply but neatly. She sat down, pointed to a chair for me, and then... Are you serious about that advertisement, Mr. Holliday? Well, yes, I am, Mrs. Daly. I I haven't any money. That is not much. I can afford something, if it's not a whole lot. Now, look, Mrs. Daly, I'm a writer, and sometimes Box 13 leads me to a good plot. You see, I don't take money because I get... Paid very well for the stories I get. You see, I used to be a newspaper reporter. Newspaper reporter? Anything wrong with that, Miss Daly? Arthur, my son, he was a reporter. Oh? What paper? The Evening Record. Your your letter said that your son was killed. He was. They said he was drunk, that he got into a fight in a cheap saloon. Arthur was never drunk in his life, and he hated fighting. That his picture on the table? Yes. In uniform. That's the Distinguished Service Cross, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Daly, start from the beginning. Tell me how you want me to help. I'm sure Arthur was murdered. Murder's a tough word, Mrs. Daly. Tough to say and tough to prove. But for a week before he was killed, he kept telling me that we could get out of this house soon, that he was going to make a name as a reporter. But he didn't tell you why. No. Then, the night he was killed, he got a phone call. From whom? I don't know. He hurried out, and the next time I saw him was when they asked me to come down and identify him. That's as much as you can tell me. It's every word. Mrs. Daly, this may sound brutal, but, but your son's dead now. Why would you rather have it said he was murdered? I want to show everyone he couldn't have died in that cheap, shoddy way. Well, that was that. I believed her. Maybe it was the way she talked. Maybe it was her eyes. I don't know. Anyway, I left her house with nothing to go on but what she had told me. And that was little enough. 
just that he was on to something would make a name for him as a reporter. Anyway, I went to see what Lieutenant Kling knew about it. About what, Harvey? About the kid that got killed in the saloon brawl. Well, that's what the records show. They show anything else? No, no, they don't. You know, I... I like you. Thanks. You can have the next dance. I'm serious. Okay, so you're serious. What about? You're not satisfied with the daily case either. What makes you think I'm not? Just the way you talk. You don't believe it's right. I believe what the witnesses in that dive said. The Daly kid got drunk. Somebody said something the girl he was with. Nothing bad, but Daly got mad and started swinging. And? Then he ended up in the red. You didn't arrest anybody? Look, we get a dozen calls a night from down at the hill places like that. Somebody's always getting pushed around, roughed up, killed. Some of the things don't even hit the newspapers. Run of the mill stuff. Sure, sure. But look, Kling, what kind of guys get killed in places like that? Bums, winos, characters who hang out in those joints. But not a kid like Daly. And you're an honest cop. What was that crack for? For a compliment. The Daly thing bothers you because you know as well as I do that something's wrong about it. Then you tell me. I'll try. Later. Now, look, Holiday. I'm not on the case anymore. Homicide's got enough to do without running down a fight in a saloon. But, uh... But what? But, uh, I don't like it. You're right. I knew I liked you. Okay, I'll marry you in the morning. The place you want is 183 River Street. Oh, nice neighborhood. You're right. The cops go in quartets down there. Thanks. See you later. And for the love of Mike, don't end up on the meat wagon like Daly did. Kling was right. It wasn't a neighborhood to raise kids or anything else. And the place I wanted was called the Riverview. Fancy name. Oh, a great place. I stepped over a couple of boarders spending the night on the doorstep and walked inside. There was a tinny piano played by a guy mechanically banging out a tune that its own composer wouldn't have recognized. The bar was set at the back facing the door. I went over to it. The bartender took a long, good look at me. I must have looked strange. I was wearing a necktie and a shirt. He walked over. Yeah? What's with, bud? Oh, yeah. Awful. You? Practically dead. Okay. Now that we know each other, what's on your mind? What do you got to drink? Arsenic. Want some? Straight. Water on the side. <laughs> Funny man, ain't you? Sure. Look, what do you want? A drink, maybe? No, you don't. That suit you got on cost maybe 150 The tie, five bucks. Any cook he comes in here dressed like you don't want a drink. All right. You in. Swell. Slumming, huh? No. Looking. For what? Last week there was a fight in here. The kid got killed. Arthur Daly. I didn't see nothing. My back was turned. Did you ever see the girl who was with Daly? I told you I didn't see nothing. Oh. All through the fight, you just kept your back turned. Yeah, I hate fights. Can't stand the sight of blood. That what you told the police? Same thing. Who are the witnesses? Look, when a fight starts in here, there ain't no witnesses. Everybody's blind. That makes it easy. You a friend of this daily character? Yeah. Yeah, a good friend. Uh-huh. I still don't know nothing. Now blow, mister. Out. Get it out. He knew something, all right. But he was clammed up tight. I left and walked up the street. I was close to the spot where I'd parked my car when I heard something. I stopped. Somebody was tailing me. Following me from the saloon. Okay, somebody didn't like me nosing around. I walked past my car. Just ahead of me was an alley, and pulling out of the alley was a truck... I walked a little faster. I got to the alley, skirted around back of the truck so my trailer would lose me for a couple of seconds. Then I stepped inside a doorway. It was dark. The truck pulled away. I waited. Then I heard the steps. He didn't know where I'd gone. But if he was going to pick me up again, he'd have to pass the doorway where I waited for him. Come here. Oh, oh. 
Lego. Lego, you hurt me. Shut up. Oh, please, mister, I ain't no crook. I, I wasn't going to put this thing on you. So you're telling me. I heard you talking to Barkeep back there. I wanted to talk to you, honest, that's all. You should have caught up with me before this. Oh, gee, mister, I didn't want anybody to see me, honest. All right, talk. Oh. You want to know something, huh? Come on, come on. What do you want to say? Well, honest, I might get in trouble. Look, I, I got to know I'll get something out of this, eh? So what you've got, and we'll see how much it's worth. Uh, maybe a fiver? Maybe. Go on, talk. Look, I could get in bad trouble. You are right now. Oh, all right. Oh, all right, make it a fiver. What do you know about Arthur Daly? I saw the fight. I saw the whole thing. Did you tell the police? Me? I don't get nothing to do with the cops. All right, tell me. This guy that was bumped, he didn't start the fight. Who did? A pug. Ex-pug named Billy Connor. The Daly guy didn't have nothing to do with starting it. It was a frame. Was Daly drunk? No, no, he had one drink. The girl slipped something in it. I saw her. She was a good looker, so I was watching her. Do you know her? Me? <laughs> Me know a thing like that? Nah. All right, well, here's your five. Now, keep your mouth shut, understand? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, maybe you'd like to know something else, huh? What? Well, mister, it ought to be worth something. I... All right, here. Oh, thanks. Uh, you ain't been out of the joint down the street more than a couple of seconds when the barkeep goes to the phone. So? I heard him tell somebody that you was nosing around. Mister, something tells me that you're in bad trouble right now. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had a few facts now. First, Daly knew something that might have got him killed. Second, the girl who was with him put something in his drink so he'd look drunk. Third, an ex-pug named Billy Connor started the fight. Why? The answer to that would put me on first base. So I asked around a little and found out that Billy Connor, a third-rate fighter down at the heels, suddenly came into money, and right after the fight in the saloon. I found him in a second-rate nightclub. You the guy that wants to see me? If you're Billy Connor, I'm the guy. Who are you? Knowing that won't make any prettier. Hey, you're a smart boy, huh? Maybe. But you're not acting smart. What? What are you talking about? You're making too much splash, Connor, the, uh... The boss doesn't like it. People might start asking questions about the money. The money you got for killing Daly. Me? Oh, no, I just started the fight. Then I ducked. Somebody else banged his head for him, not me. Ah, uh, that's the way it was, huh? Sure, you know. Who are you, anyway? Forget it, Connor. Wait a minute, fella. Why'd you say that's the way it was? Didn't you know? Sure, sure I know. You, you ain't from them. Come on, you dirty sneak. You, you a copper? Maybe. Think it over, Connor. Hard. I left him standing there with his mouth open. I thought I'd found out what I wanted to know. But Kling told me... Doesn't mean a thing. You can't prove anything, Holiday. What if I get proof? How? You've got the name and address of the girl Daly was with the night he was killed. And you want him, is that it? You could get hurt. Meaning you won't give me the girl's name? Meaning that if I do, you're on your own. I'll take that chance. Do I get a name and address? Eileen Simmons, 4674 Roberts Drive. And I hope you get more out of her than we did. I hope so, too. I didn't like walking up a blind alley with murder at my back and maybe in front of me. I got to the girl's home, a boarding house in a shabby section, and took a look at the mailboxes downstairs. While I was walking up to her flat, something tingled the back of my neck. Something that screamed a warning. I got to her flat. She didn't answer. Then I smelled it. Gas. I stooped down and one look at the crack between the door and the sill was enough. It was stuffed with newspapers. There was only one thing to do. Eileen Simmons wasn't going to talk to anybody. The room was heavy with gas. The window I broke let in some air. Scared faces stared in at the door. I smashed open, then I yelled at them. 
You call the police. Ask for Lieutenant Kling. Go on, hurry. I took a quick look around before I left. In one closet was a fur coat. And from what I knew about fur, this one took money to buy. It had her initials embroidered in the lining. But it didn't fit with the cheap flat. Well, I thought it was about time to make a trip to the evening record where Daly worked as a reporter. Some of the boys knew me, so it was easy to get to talk to Daly's editor. I don't know, Holiday. All I know is that Daly promised me a big story. Something he was working on. Now, look, Charlie. Any idea what it was? None. The kid was close mouth. Oh, but you must have some idea. Didn't he give you any hint? Just that it was big and would blow off the top of the building when we printed it. How long did he work for you? Oh, about six months, no more. What big assignments did you give him? None. Routine stuff, he didn't have enough experience. Just out of journalism college when the war broke. Mm -hmm. Went through it. Then served at the war trials in Germany. And in the six months with you, there wasn't anything important enough to get him killed, huh? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, let's see. We sent him on a routine assignment to San Carlito and... San Carlito? What's that? Just one of those little islands in the West Indies. The paper's doing a series on Latin American neighbors and we... Anything there that might have been the big story? You mean what he was talking about? Yeah, that's it. How long after he got back did he begin to talk about the something big? Hey, just about the same day he walked in here. Where's his desk? Just outside this office. Oh. All his stuff in there? Well, most of it. We were going to send it to his mother, but, well, you know how things are. It was too soon. We figured we'd wait. And... Come on, let's take a look. Just the usual stuff. What are these photographs? Never saw them before. Full face, profiles of men. You know them? Not from Adam. Oh, uh, Charlie, can I have these? Well, I don't know, Holiday. One ex-newspaper man to an editor. Come on, let me have them. Okay. I didn't see you take them. Uh, thanks. Now, mind if I go through the rest of your stuff? No, help yourself. I'll be at my desk. Right. I went through Daly's papers. There was one little notebook with an entry in it that read, Got to be careful. Never be alone. They won't dare make a try for me unless I'm alone. I've got proof on film. Photos of the men I recognize. Okay. So Daly's notebook gave me another lead. But where to? Well, maybe Daly's mother would know. I looked at my watch, but it was after midnight. So I figured it was too late to see her, and I decided to wait until morning. I wish I'd have gone right then and there. The next morning, I went to see Daly's mother, and I found her in the middle of an excited bunch of neighbors. When I got her alone, she told me what was up. There were burglars. They ransacked Arthur's room. Well, let's take a look. But there's nothing missing. Well, let's look anyway. They went through all the drawers. You didn't hear them? No, I slept right through it. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. Daly, what could they have wanted? I I don't know. There's nothing of value here. Look, uh, when Arthur came back from San Carlito, did he uh, bring anything with him? Why, I don't think so. A camera, maybe? His own, but he took that with him when he went. Now, Now, think hard, Mrs. Daly. Did he take any film out of that camera when he got back? I think he did. Yes, I remember. He hurried out with some film to have it developed. Where is it? I don't know. Did he get it back from the shop where he took it? I don't think so. I think he'd have shown them to me if he had. And the roll of film he took out of his camera is still in the shop. It must be. Mrs. Daly, we've got to find a check for that film. The kind you get when you leave film to be developed. Come on, let's look. We looked and looked and looked. No check. It began to seem as though whoever ransacked the room found the check, and if he had, well, the thing was over. After half an hour, we gave up. But there was still one more thing to find out. Mrs. Daly, would you mind taking a look at these photographs? Do you know any of these men? Why, I'm not sure. They look familiar, but... <gasps> His scrapbook, the one he brought back from the war. There are pictures like those in the scrapbook. Well, show it to me, will you? It's in my room, right next door. 
Here it is. Here they are, the pictures. But I don't see. I think I do. But I'm afraid to believe it. Look, Mrs. Daly. Whatever you do, stay with your neighbors. Don't be alone for a minute. I left the house, and the idea I had was buzzing around inside my head. If I was right, then the whole thing was fantastic. But the pieces began to fit together. Maybe I was thinking too hard. I didn't see the big black car that turned down the corner. I didn't see it until I was almost staring between its headlights. I jumped back and up, and the fenders of the car took the skin off my legs, and the car roared away. That big black buggy had my name for a license plate. It would have looked just like an accident. But it told me something. That whoever was doing the dirty work didn't have the check for the film. Because the proof of what Daly knew was on that film. And if Mr. Accident Maker had it, he wouldn't have risked another accident. I called Kling, got him on the phone. What do you want me to do? Check every Photoshop in the city for a roll of film mailed just before Daly was killed. How do you know he mailed it? Because he wouldn't have been fool enough to take it to a Photoshop. He knew they were tailing him, waiting to grab that film. So he mailed it. With a note that he'd call for it. Okay, I'll pick up the film. If I can find it. Oh, no, Kling, don't pick it up, please. But you just said you were... Kling, tell me where it is. Call my office and I'll pick it up. Look, you're asking for a cray breathe and you're doing it. If those babies are what you say, they'll cut your little pieces. You want them, don't you? Sure, but I don't... The only way to get them is to make them come after that film. And they won't call it headquarters for it, Kling. But they will try to get it from me. I waited. Finally, Kling gave me the word. I picked up the film and printed the little finishing shop. Kling had given orders that I was to have it. I got in my car, looked in the rear vision mirror, and saw a big black sedan pull in behind me. This was it. I couldn't spot Kling in the squad car he said would be handy. Maybe something held it up. I didn't know. I got to my apartment. The sedan pulled up behind me and parked. I walked up to my apartment, went over to the window, and saw a man get out of the sedan. He walked slowly and disappeared into my apartment building. I sat down with the film and prints burning a hole in my pocket. Then... Who is it? Mr. Holliday, I'd like to talk to you. I took one more look out of the window. The street was empty except for the sedan. No squad car, no clink. Brother, if ever I wanted to see that big guy, it was now. I walked to the door. Mr. Holliday? Uh Uh-huh. Who are you? My name is, uh, we'll say, Stefan. Okay, you're Mr. Stefan. So what? I shall be brief. You have a roll of film and some prints. I am a, a camera enthusiast. I shall pay you a good price for the film. Ooh, how much? <laughs> You're going to be reasonable. That's fine. Shall we say 10000 That's big money for a strip of celluloid. I am very enthusiastic about photography. You know, um, I like pictures myself. Especially pictures of some nice little Nazis who got out of Germany with a lot of money. Oh? You guessed, huh? Yeah, but Daly wasn't guessing when he recognized them in San Carlito. He wasn't guessing that San Carlito is a little island with lots of deserted coastline. Easy to land on. (laughs) Yes, very handy. And they paid well to escape the trials in Nuremberg. You just talked yourself out of $10,000. Oh, now that's very funny. You would have killed me anyway, as you killed Daly to keep him from spreading the story. (laughs) You're so right. Now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that gun didn't look nice. He had it right at my head. I sat still. Stefan came slowly toward me. The black hole in the barrel of his gun looked like the business end of a cannon. Then... Get the floor, Holiday! Come! At this particular minute, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. Then what happened, Mr. Holliday? Well, at that moment, Susie, Lieutenant Kling landed and took over. 
Sorry I drew it so close, Holiday, but I had to let Stefan talk a while. Yeah. But by the way, where was that squad car? <laughs> well, there wasn't any. The squad car would have scared Stefan away. I had to make it look safe. Boys and I were right next door. Had been for an hour. Now, he tells me. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's up to the Federals now. We're clean on this end. Gee, I sure... Oh, Mr. Holiday, you might have been killed. Oh, it's okay now, Susie. It's all over. But, but you might have been killed. And I like this job so much. <laughs> What'd I say? Very funny, Kling. Nothing, Susie, nothing. <laughs> Good night. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Justice is blind said the celebrated Mr. Dooley. And not only is she blind, but into the bargain she's also deaf and dumb and has a wooden leg. Ah, poor Justice. She certainly can't keep everybody happy all the time. In every case, someone must lose and someone must win. Therefore, someone is always fated to feel the sharp edge of that sword. You have exactly 60 seconds to live, my friend. Oh, please, please don't shoot him. Uh, don't be frightened. And don't lower yourself by begging this hoodlum for mercy. But he's going to kill you. You've got 50 seconds now, friend. He can't kill anybody. But he can't. If this is a dream. A dream? Furthermore, since it's my dream, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> mystery drama, Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. His name is Peter Perkins, but everyone calls him Peter Pumpkin. You remember the old nursery rhyme, Peter, Peter, Pumpkin Eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her? Or don't they have nursery rhymes today? Well, no matter. The whole thing falls apart anyhow, because while our hero's name may be Peter, he doesn't eat pumpkins. And while he has a wife, he does manage to keep her. Although why, I couldn't tell you. The Stacys are going to Europe. Martha and Frank just bought a car. And Emma got a new washing machine. Felice is having her face lifted. That's Hilda. Non-stop Hilda Perkins. She opens her mouth the split second she opens her eyes in the morning and she doesn't shut it again until she closes her eyes at night. Or so we may safely assume. But Peter doesn't listen to her. He isn't even there. Oh, he's there. He's eating his breakfast. But he's also somewhere else. How can one person be in two places at the same time? Listen. Take cover! Take cover, Perkins! Take cover! Yes, that's where Peter Perkins is right now. In one of his other worlds. Right now it's D-Day in Normandy. Get down, Perkins! Enemy machine gun up ahead! I'll work my way forward and knock him off with a grenade. Perkins, come back! You're crazy! Come back, Perkins! 
got him. I, I got him. Jennifer's getting a divorce. Do you realize Charlotte Hammond has worn the same dress to church four Sundays in a row? Uh, Hilda, listen, I, uh, I'll, I'll be home late for dinner tonight. Bob Howard is saying he'll run for town council. You see, they'll need my report. They want me to do the figures for the budget. I'm having lunch with Virginia. This is, this is something very important. I hope it doesn't rain. Me too. All that mud. Crawling around and all that mud. I need a volunteer. I'll go. You wait the last time, Perkins. I'll go again. Perkins, there are other guys in this outfit. I'm going. But you have to make your way through that minefield. So what? Nobody lives forever. Perkins! Come back! Come back! The Parkers haven't paid their grocery bill in three months. Uh, I I have to catch my bus. Are you still here? Come on in. Uh, uh, Mr. Benson? Uh? It's, uh, it's me. Yeah, it's you. Yeah. You're, um, uh, uh, Pumpkin. Uh, Peter Pumpkin. Uh, uh, Peter Perkins. Well, that's what I said. You want to see me? Oh, uh, well, I, uh... You what? Uh, first, I want to say that I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry? About what? I'm, I'm sorry I came in late this morning. Oh, did you come in late this morning? Uh, yes, Mr. Benson. I was standing on the corner waiting for the bus. Uh, but he just drove past. Uh, I guess he didn't see me. It happens sometimes. Uh, a lot of times. But uh, you're here now. Uh, uh, yes, sir. And I've got the figures. Uh, what what, figure, what figures are these? Uh, the figures that you said you needed yesterday. Uh, oh, oh, those figures. Yes, sir. Uh, and here they are. Ah, uh, well, uh, we don't need them anymore. We we don't? No, no, no. We decided not to go after that job. <laughs> uh, so you just go back to your desk and pick up your regular work. My my, my regular work? Uh, you must have plenty to do, oh, don't you? Oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, uh, yes, sir, plenty. Well, then, hop to it, Pumpkins. Uh, 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 Mr. Benson, my name is Perkins. That is what I said. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Miss Himmelfarb, uh, we have somebody working here named Pumpkins, uh, P -P Peter Pumpkins, something like that. Yeah, well, uh, can you tell me just just exactly what he does? Private Peter Pumpkin, front and center. Uh, sir? Uh, uh Private Peter Pumpkin. Uh, uh, my name is Perkins, sir. Private Peter Pumpkins, for heroism above and beyond the call of duty, you are hereby awarded the Good Conduct Medal. The, the, the what? By special order of the commanding general, it is my pleasure and privilege to hereby bestow upon you the Good Conduct Medal. The Good Conduct Medal? Oh, well, what, what kind of a decoration is that? The, the Good Conduct Medal? What, why, guys... Get that just for keeping their noses clean. Um, I mean a good conduct medal. For, for what I did, I should get the Congressional Medal of Honor. Not on your life. Oh, uh, okay, then. The Distinguished Service Cross. <laughs> Nothing doing. Well, then give me the Silver Star. No dice. Well, at least the Bronze Star. Forget it. I won't take less. Uh, you're not going to push me around. I got enough of that at home. And, and in the office. But when it comes to this, to this show, I run it. Do you? I decide what happens here. Uh, I decide. And what makes you think so? Uh, uh, because this is mine. Yours? Mine. This is my daydream. My reverie. It belongs to me. Uh, 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 who are you, anyhow? Who am I? Uh, I'll tell you who you are. You're a... Uh, uh, a figment of my imagination. Well, is that a fact? I made you up. Oh, did you? You do as I say. I'm getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. You are getting the Good Conduct Medal. Never. Take it or leave it, Private Pumpkins. The, the name is Perkins. Perkins. That's what I said. 
And I don't want to have any trouble with you. What do you mean, you don't want to have any trouble with me? Take off. Take off? I'm the one who tells you when to come and go. This is my fantasy. I'm the only one who can control... What do you but... mean, you're the only one? Are you saying that I don't have any rights? It isn't a question of... Look, look, I want the Congressional Medal of Honor. No. Why not? Because you don't deserve it. Deserve? Do you know what I had to do to get it? I knocked out an enemy machine gun position. I, I found a path through a minefield. Those were imaginary exploits. Well, all I'm asking for is an imaginary medal. You know, on serious consideration, the chief of staff said all you were worth is the good conduct medal. The, there is no chief of staff. There's nobody, nothing, unless I picture it in my mind. And you, it, it, you, Mr. Wise Guy, you're out of the picture. You know where I am now? Where? I'm in the ballpark. I'm at the plate. The count is three and two. The score is tied. It's the bottom of the ninth. Listen to the crowd. Mr. Wise, hit it, baby! Fuck it hard! You hear them? You hear them? They're all rooting for Big Pete Perkins. The home run king to win the World Series with one mighty swing of the bat. Are they? The pitcher goes into his windup. And now... As a hush of anticipation falls upon the crowd, here comes the ball, towards the plate. And home run Pete's bat uncoils into a mighty swing and... And... Strike me out! What did you do? What did you do? I didn't do anything. You struck out. You... You disgraced me. In front of 80,000 people, you disgraced me. Well, why is it my fault? Because you... you... Well, I want. You yourself said this was your dream, your fantasy. Didn't you say that you decide what happens? You and you alone? Yes, but... Well, is it my fault that you see yourself striking out in front of 80,000 people? Is it? It's my fault. Yes, because till now, I've occupied myself with sham heroics and, and meaningless trivia. Uh, now, I shall devote my energy to what is important to mankind. I'm in the operating room. And my patient is a great man of science who must live. He's on the threshold of a discovery that will absolutely save the human race. And yet, he, he lies helpless on the table. Victim of a mysterious malady. Needed here are the steel nerves, the delicate fingers, the icy precision of the greatest surgeon in the world. And here he is, the only man who can save him and humanity, Dr. Peter Perkins. Scalpel. Sponge. A doctor. Hold those retractors. Steady. Uh, Dr. Pumpkins. Uh, Perkins. Yes, that's what I said. Must you bother me at a time like this? Saline solution? Uh, but, Doctor... Yes, well, 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 what do you want? Uh, the patient is dead. He's what? Well, look for yourself, Dr. Pumpkins. He's dead. That's Perkins. Perkins. Perkins! <laughs> Will it be? I'll have the usual. The usual what? What? Uh, what I usually have every day when I come in here, uh, uh, just about this time. Oh, uh, you you come in here every day? Yeah, just after five o'clock for the for the last ten years. Oh yeah 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 that's right I recognize you your 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 name it's it's right on the tip of my tongue it's uh, um, uh, Perkins. Uh, Peter Perkins. That's right. Pumpkins. Perkins. That's what I said. And you you always order a... a ain't that funny? I, I know what you have. An extra sweet Rob Roy. Right, right. On the rocks. Uh, no, straight up. Well, that just goes to prove what I always say. <laughs> Be right with you, Mr. Pumpkins. Uh, uh, Perkins. Hi there. Hi. Uh, are you talking to me? <laughs> Would you like to buy a thirsty girl a drink? Well, uh, I... Uh... Thanks, Peter. 
Uh, how, how did you know my name? Oh, I have my spies. Really? Oh, truly. My name is Charity. Charity? Yeah, yeah, because my folks hoped I would grow up to become a very generous person. Oh. I do hope I haven't failed them. Uh, no kidding. How, how did you know my name? Oh, I come in here every day. I noticed you. You noticed me? Mm. For months I would come in here every day at five o'clock, just hoping for a look at you. Just praying that somehow we could meet, you know? Yes. And then uh, one evening, you just broke my heart. I did? Yeah, I, I happened to get a look at your left hand, and I noticed for the first time the wedding band. Oh. But I don't care. Do you? Well, I... Uh, I think you're the most wonderful guy I ever met in my life. Hey, uh, Mr. Pumpkins. Uh, uh, that's Perkins. Yeah, yeah, you ought to come on over here. You got a phone call. A phone call? Who, who, who would call me? Why don't you come over here and find out? Uh, uh, excuse me. Of course. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, hello? Hello? Save your breath. There ain't no phone call. Well, then why did you call Make me up? I believe you're talking on the phone, huh? Well, why? Because I'm trying to save your life, that's why. Wh what do you mean? That dame, that dame Charity, walk away from her. Walk away from her? You ever hear of Fats Vaganzi? Uh, I, uh, no. Uh, uh, should I? He's a number two guy in a mob. The mob? Yeah, yeah, you know what the mob is, don't you? Um, only by, uh, hearsay. Wait. Charity, she's his dame. He sees you even so much as talking to her, he's going to take you for a ride. Ride? Now, look, I'm the bartender in this joint, and he don't even like it when I ask what she wants to drink. Now, Pumpkins, you take my advice and beat it. Uh, uh, the name is Perkins. Yeah, well, you just hang around here with that broad for five more minutes, and your name is going to be Mud. <laughs> little Peter Perkins. You would think that information of this nature would make him faint away with fear, at the very least. You take our word for it. Mr. Fats Fergonzi is one of the toughest gentlemen in the underworld. And according to the papers, kills for just the sheer joy of it. So you would think that Act Two would have to open with Mr. Peter Perkins' precipitous retreat from the bar. You'll find out when I return shortly. Is not life a hundred times too short for us to bore ourselves? Asked Mr. Nietzsche. Well... One person who is never bored is our Peter Perkins. He has a system. When things get too dull in one life, he retreats into another. As we have seen, it's a rather simple trick, and anyone can do it. However, this time it looks as if there's going to be some action in his real life. Although, by what right does anyone define reality? Don't you understand what I'm telling you? You say she's the girlfriend of Fats Fergonzi himself. Oh, finally, finally. At last it's gotten true to you. The notorious gangster. Yeah, yeah, pal, you're catching on. And he's... He, he's insanely jealous. Oh, keep it coming, buddy. You're doing great. And he'd shoot me if he even so much as saw me sitting next to her. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Marvelous. Huh? Well, what, what, what? It's marvelous. What are you talking about? I've, I've never done better than this before. Pal, listen, listen, for your own good. No, 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 no. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. <laughs> Look at you. You seem to be frightened out of your wits. Because I can't afford to have anybody killed in this joint. And nobody's going to be killed. Hey, close me up for good. And nobody's going to be killed. Let me handle Fats for Gonzi. You handle Fats for Gonzi? Yes, yes. It's no problem. I got a nut here. A nut. Unless... That is, unless you really want to die. Uh -uh. The minute Fats Fergonzi walks in here... He's going to shoot you. No. 
Uh, I'll just punch him in the jaw. But you can't just... I can do anything. Anything. This is my dream. Dream? Peter. Uh, be right with you, baby. Okay, but you can't say I didn't warn you. Fats Fagonzi, number two in the mob. This is going to be a new one for me, too. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. That must have been quite a phone call. It was the president. Oh, your company? Oh, and of your company, too. It was the president of the United States. And he called you? Well, he had to call somebody. Oh. oh, I knew it. I knew you were a man of great importance. All my life, I've been looking for a man like you. You have? A man of quiet strength, of, of deep convictions. Well. Oh, the moment I saw you, I knew. Uh, oh, what did you know? Uh, I knew my fate. Your fate? I knew it was sealed. Uh, hold my hand. Uh, here, in, in public? And then let's let's go to someplace private. But when it's right, you know it. You know it at once. The electricity, the magnetism, they can't be denied. I love you, Peter. I love you. And... And I love you. Oh, then nothing else. Nothing else in the whole wide world matters. Charity, uh, this dream... Dream? This dream must never end. This isn't a dream. I'll make it last forever. I beg your pardon. Fats! Who is this alleged gentleman? Mr. Fats Fergonzi, I presume. Yes, my good fellow. You do presume. Charity? Oh, you see, Fats, Mr. Perkins here, uh, uh, mm, uh, Mr. Yeah. Perkins is an actor. Oh, indeed. Yeah, and he just asked me to rehearse some lines with him. He did? Yeah, you see, he's in a show. It's about to open, and he really needs... Well, I think you uh, have dislocated the timing, my dear. His show is about to close. No, Fats, don't. Put the gun away. I, uh, I see you're pointing that gun at me. Well, there's certainly nothing amiss with your vision, my friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, may I ask Why? I told her. I keep telling her. I cannot tolerate the sight of another man's arms around her. You cannot? No. I become infuriated. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to become accustomed to it. Oh? Tell me more. Uh, you see, my friend, you're just a punk. A punk? Yes. Huh. I'll have you know I was graduated from Princeton with honors. <laughs> And this was the best you could do with your education? Become a crook? I am neither a jot nor a little worse than many of my classmates who practice their thievery as lawyers, brokers, and bankers. Indeed, I enjoy their services. I shall tell you why you're a punk. There are those men who can create a false front. Uh, they put on things like uh, good clothes, good manners, uh, good speech... Uh, but that spirit, that spark that emanates from within is missing. There's nothing inside you. You're dead. No. You see, you labor under a misapprehension. You're dead. No, please don't. Uh, this punk? <laughs> he won't do anything. What? <laughs> see? <laughs> now... Shouldn't that take care of Brother Fats for Gonzi for a while? Hey, buddy, buddy, you better get out of here before he comes to. Yeah. And, uh, and now, my dearest Charity, uh, where were we before we were, we were so rudely interrupted? Now, listen, you'd better go. Go? Uh, uh, go where? I have no intention of allowing this dream to end. Dream? Yes, it's wonderful. <laughs> Why have I been wasting my time till now with all that other nonsense? Charity... You're what I've always wanted. Come with me. Peter, it was a lucky punch. He's going to kill you. Come with me. Hey, look, Charity, get him out of here. Get him out of here. All right, all right. Oh, you have such a, a lovely apartment. Uh, look, you have to let me tell you something. Just, just tell me one thing. Tell me that you love me. I... I let you come up here because you promised you'd listen. Just tell me that you love me. But, but I don't love you. Well, you will. 
in time. Peter, please. Please listen. You have to get out of here. Don't you understand? He'll kill you. Oh, he's already tried. Well, next time, he won't give you a chance to take him by surprise. He'll open the door and start shooting. All right, all right, all right. No problem. I'll see to it that he misses me. He'll see to it. Darling, how many times do I have to tell you that this is a dream? Oh, no, not again. This is real. It's the real world. It's not the wonderful, beautiful world of your imagination. It's the real, awful, terrible world filled with the awful, terrible people you, you want to get away from. And I'm one of them. Now, Charity, that just isn't true. How could anyone as beautiful as you be terrible? Oh, you know how. You've said it. I've said it. There are those people who put on a false front. Good clothes, good manners. And me, I have good looks. But there isn't anything else to me, Peter. There isn't. I don't believe that. Oh, please, believe it. I don't have the things that I know are important to you, like a, a heart, a soul. But everyone has a heart, a, a soul. Yeah. Well, as Fats would say, my heart is shriveled and my soul is withered. But he doesn't mind because his are too. No. No, I can't believe what you tell me about yourself. It gets worse. I wanted to kill you. You wanted to kill me? Maybe wanted is the wrong word. Uh, what's the right word? Well, I don't know if one word would describe it. Maybe I didn't care if I killed you. Maybe I should say it didn't matter to me if you lived or died, just as long as... Uh, uh, just as long as... What? Just as long as I would make fat jealous. Oh. That's all it was. You see, Peter, Fats has been... Well, let's say he's been taking me for granted lately, and so... I guess you must hate me. No, no. No, I love you. But I... I, I love you because you're making up a story. Why would I make it up? Because you're afraid for my life, and, and you want me to hide from Fats... But you see, darling, that doesn't exist. Oh, you poor guy. Believe me, I'm in control here. I say there is no such person as fat. Oh, I don't know what you've been drinking or smoking. I never have had more than one cocktail a day in my life, and I never smoke. All right, all right, sure, whatever. Okay, I, I did something wrong. I don't care. For a stupid, selfish reason. I must have been out of my mind. I, I, I put you in a position where you can get killed. But, darling... You're don't... interrupting. Don't. Now, somehow, for some reason, you seem to have an idea that this, this is a dream. It is. No. No. This is real. Now, you see that vase of roses on the table? What color are they? Uh, uh, red and yellow. Did you ever see colors in a dream before? Did you get out of here? Get out before it's too late. No, no, it's a dream. Look, what do I have to do to convince you? Charity, darling, let me tell you why this can't be the world of reality. But look, I know. Look, in the first place, if this were the real world, you would have never noticed me. Oh, but I would. I did. N no, Charity. <laughs> you see, this is the moment of truth. Uh, nobody ever notices me. I suppose there are those people who are seemingly made of glass. Uh, somehow the world doesn't see them. Uh, uh, simply looks through them. Oh well, I'm I'm one of those people. That that's why I have to create fantasies in which I'm someone important, uh, important enough to be noticed. Uh, uh, do you understand? But Peter, please. and you and you are one of my fantasies. A beautiful woman, and also a dangerous woman. Uh, you see, romance, sex, uh, uh, th th those things are always enhanced by peril. Uh, so I created Fats. Fats Fergonzi as your insanely jealous lover. Would I have dared raise a hand to Fats Fergonzi if he were really here? Oh, Peter, you've got it all wrong. Fats is real. <laughs> real? <laughs> An immaculately dressed, faultlessly groomed, ultra-sophisticated gangster who has graduated from an Ivy League university. And you say he's real? Oh, leave before it's too late. Fats is a figment of my imagination. Fats for Gonzi is also a bad penny. <sighs> he always turns up. It's too late. As our old friend Shakespeare might have said, send him not unshriven to his grave. You have one minute. Sixty seconds to say your prayer. Oh, Fats, Fats, please. Don't, don't, darling. It isn't necessary to beg this hoodlum for mercy. At the end of sixty seconds, he, not I, will no longer exist. As you can see, 
great deal is going to transpire in the next 60 seconds or so. But since all of it will be kind of a waiting game, why don't we profitably employ this little interlude to deliver some helpful suggestions from the good people who pay the freight. And then we shall return for Act 3, where a great awakening may be in store for all of us. is the scientific method? Well, it's based on the observation of events, of cause and effect. For example, we see the sun rise and we hear the rooster crow. Therefore, in our human wisdom, we say, aha, it's the rising sun that causes the crowing rooster. Well, now, suppose there are rooster scientists who also notice the same event at dawning. Wouldn't it be logical for them to assume that it's the crowing rooster that causes the rising sun? Just because we're able to settle the question by putting the rooster in a pot and having him for dinner doesn't mean we're smarter than he is, just stronger. Somehow, this little essay is related to our story. Please, Fats, don't shoot him. Don't, please. I believe we discussed the sequels that would attend any of your attempts at flirtation, my dear. Fats, it was all my fault. My friend, you have 28 seconds to live. So do you. I think your soul would be better served by prayers than by foolish bravado. In just a few more seconds, you will be no more. I shall will you out of my reverie. Like so. You're gone. Am I? I? I said you're gone. Well, I have the oddest feeling that I'm still here. That's please. I'll never do it again. Uh, be gone. Get out of here. My poor fellow. I'm sorry. Your time is up. Is it... Is it real? It, it can't be. I can assure you this will be completely painful. No, don't, please. Who's that? I don't know. Can this be real? Please. Keep completely silent. Answer it, Charity. I am not among those present. <laughs> Hello? Oh. Yes. Uh, n- no, he isn't here. Uh, no. I don't. No, I wouldn't know about that. Sure. Okay. Yes, I'll tell him. Bye. It was Clovis. Clovis? Yeah, you know, the number one, your boss. He is no boss of mine. What did, what did he want? I, uh, nothing. Come on, what did he want? Well, he had heard that, well, I'm quoting him. Yes. That some punk had slapped you around. Indeed. He said it was all over town. I see. And he had called to see if you had, and these are his words, knocked off the punk yet. And you replied? I, I said, No. You said no. Of course I said no. Look, if you kill Peter, you'll be playing right into Clovis' hands. You'll be arrested and tried and convicted for murder. That's how Clovis would like to get you out of the way. You are temporizing, my dear. You're trying to preserve this this little pipsqueak. Am I wrong? Everybody knows you're out to become number one. Everybody knows there has to be a showdown between you and Clovis. Fifteen witnesses saw you try to kill Peter back in the bar. You go to jail for life. And Clovis... Even a college man should be smart enough to see the picture. Yeah. All right, Pumpkins. His name is Perkins. Wait. Say, where, where is he? Huh? He's gone. He, he must have sneaked out while we were choking. Oh, Fats, you got to find him. Find him? For what reason would I need him? Oh, you can't let him run around loose. Why not? You mean you haven't been listening... Why do you think Clovis called to find out if you'd killed Peter? Why? Because if you don't do it, he'll do it. Clovis would kill him? He'd have it done. But why? Because you'll be blamed for it, don't you see? Oh. That's right. Oh. Look, we've got to find him. We have to protect him. Your life depends on it. And so you have come to me. Uh, yes, Dr. Critchick. 
Hmm. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, that means, uh, hmm. Uh, you see, Doctor, I don't know anymore. I, I, I don't know what's real and what's a dream. Ah. Uh, what does that mean, Doctor? Well, that means, ah. Uh, I'll tell you what happened. I lost control of my life. Mm-hmm. I, I think I know what that means. Uh, anyway, I lost control of my life in the world, the so-called real world. Oh. Uh, and I, I just felt myself sinking into nothing and, uh, and nowhere. So I started having these fantasies, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, in which, oh, oh yes, in which people really noticed me. Uh, I mean, I was a war hero, uh, a fantastic miracle worker surgeon, uh, an athlete, uh, the idol of the crowd. Ah. And then, uh, and then I lost control there, too. I even became nobody and nothing in my daydreams. Um, what do you think? I think you are crazy. What? I think you're crazy. Uh, uh, Dr. Fritchick, <laughs> what a thing for a psychiatrist to say. Oh, my boy, my boy, you must not take offense. We are all crazy. I am as crazy as you are. But you're a psychiatrist. Well, certainly, that's why I'm crazy. What's your excuse? Uh, I Look, I came here because I thought you could help me. Oh, that's why you came here. Oh, why, sure. I thought you'd come here because you wanted to help me. Uh, uh, but you are the doctor. So, must we be slaves to convention? Yeah, well, um, okay, okay, I see. What do you see? Um, nothing. Uh, tell me, tell me, what do you see? What do you see? I, uh, I, I, I see where I'd better be leaving. Oh, no, 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 please, please stay here. Uh, but, but, but I don't know where here is, uh, or what here is. You see, Doctor, I don't know if this is the real world or only a world that exists in my imagination. Uh, do you know? Oh, you fool. Nobody knows. Uh, uh, nobody? Now, see, now it comes out. Nobody knows. Oh, yes, yes, most people pretend to know. They are the so-called well-adjusted people. But it's all a fraud. A fraud? Oh, yes. It's all part of the Katzenstein phenomenon. The, 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 the Katzenstein phenomenon? Yeah, yes, because it was discovered by Professor Carl Philipp Emanuel Katzenstein. Oh. It's the theory of intertranscendental duality. It is. And it explains everything. Everything? Everything. It explains what is real and what is fantasy. Then explain where I am. Ah, alas, I cannot. Uh, uh, but you just said the, uh, uh, whatever it is, the... The, uh, the... Katzenstein phenomenon? Uh, it explains it. Oh, yes, yes, it does. But you see, unfortunately, I don't understand the Katzenstein phenomenon. You don't? No, you see, only one person in the entire universe understands the Katzenstein phenomenon. Who? Well, naturally, Professor Katzenstein himself. Well, then I must go see him. Oh, 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 but you cannot see him. Why not? Because he is in a lunatic asylum. Why is he in a lunatic asylum? Because he's crazy. Th crazy? Of course. I put him there myself. You what? I testified at his trial. <laughs> His trial? Yes, I was the alienist. And I said, this man is as crazy as a Cemex Lectularius. What? A bed bug. I said this as a sop to the layman. I don't know who has spread this, this slander about bed bugs. True, they are unpleasant. Uh, 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 but Dr. Critchick. What, crazy? The irony is they are perhaps the sanest insects in the entire animal kingdom. You mean you sent Professor Katzenstein to an asylum? And why not? Wouldn't he have done the same for me? Well, well what am I going to do? Do, do. Why, do the only thing a sane person can do. Pretend. Pretend? Pretend who you are and where you are at all times. 
Here he is. Pumpkins. Why, by, 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 it's Charity Fenris and Leander Fergonzi. Good evening, Dr. Krizik. Do either of you have appointments for today? Peter, we have to get out of here. Yeah, but you just arrived. Pumpkins, your existence is being threatened. Uh, but I... By Clovis. Clovis? The number one guy in the mob. But surely you cannot be referring to Clovis Sakamaroji. The same. He's also one of my patients. It's too late. He follows us here. Clovis is here, too. Oh, that's good. Let's have some group therapy. Down, down, down. Everybody on the floor. We are surrounded. Give him one of your guns. What do you think you can do? I'll go out there and knock him off. You're crazy. What? Uh, uh, say that again. You're crazy. Listen to Fats, Peter. Listen to him. But he isn't Fats. I'm not? No. You're the voice. What voice? The voice I always hear in my reveries. I know where I am now. It's just a daydream. <clears throat> give me a gun. No. I said give me a gun. No. Oh. Hand it over. You're crazy. You'll get killed the second you show your face. <laughs> so what? Nobody lives forever. But Peter... Clovis Sakamaroji. You two-bit hoodlum. I'm coming after you. Doreen Bibelacqua has the gout. Is that this morning's paper? Pearl Parker hit her mother-in-law. Yeah. Hey, look, see the headline. Unknown man destroys the mob. Percy Bilderbeck is taking ballet lessons. For some reason, the mob was surrounding the office of Dr. Maynard Ballantyne Critchick when suddenly a man raced out from the building and... Summer Spiegel Glass is trying to climb Mount Everest. ...and captured all 15 members of the mob. He turned them over to the police and disappeared. Who is the mysterious hero? Esperanza Smith found a shark in her swimming pool. Wait, 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 wait a minute. This, this isn't a dream. Her husband put it there. Do, do you know why? Do you? Because I never dream about you. Never. If, if you're here, this is the real world. This, this paper is real. This news is real. I did do it. Lester Langebard stopped smoking. I don't have to be afraid of anybody. Summer Fortescue stopped drinking. Yeah. And Hilda Perkins stopped talking. Uh, did you hear what I said? Uh, I, I, uh, I said Hilda Perkins stopped talking. I don't want to hear one more single solitary word out of you. Now, do you understand? I, 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 uh, well, well, uh, sure. Yeah, because if I do, I'm going to... No, 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 please. You don't have to do that. All you really have to do, just now and once in a while, is, is just notice me. That's what it's all about. Who was it that said... That a woman's mouth is usually filled with words because her heart is empty. And it can also be said that a man's mind is filled with silly dreams because his wife doesn't help him fulfill his most important one. Yes, a great many things can be said. And you can rely on me to say some of them when I return shortly. Once again, as we do so often, we were involved with dream and reality. And why not? Isn't that the basic stuff of our existence? As the philosopher said, life is a shadow play where light and darkness blend. And we are only permitted brief, blurred glimpses. And the curtain descends just as we think we have grasped the argument of the drama. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Bryna Rayburn, Arnold Moss, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. course of his detective career, Mike Shane has been called upon to track down escaped murderers, to find missing jewels, to recover stolen bonds and sensational diaries. But never before has he been asked to hunt for something 3,000 years old. In his office high in the Rust Building, Mike and his lovely assistant, Phyllis Knight, listen sympathetically to a worried little man, Dr. Frederick Wakeman, museum curator. Mr. Shane, these thefts have been going on at the museum now for two weeks. Some of the losses just wring my heart. You know how today people save the baby shoes of their children, even have them cast in bronze? Well, yes, but Then realize what it means to me to lose the baby sandals of the Pharaoh Ramesses the first. Why, I used to hold those tiny things in my hand and think back to the days when they patted around the royal court of Egypt. Yes, 3,300 long years ago. 3,300 years? Why would anybody steal baby sandals 3,300 years old? Unless they were fresh out of shoe stamps. That's yes. the baffling part of it. The thefts don't make sense. One time it's the court robe of a Chinese emperor. The next it's the original of a love sonnet of Shakespeare or the signet ring of a Russian czar. They're famous. If the thief tried to sell them in New York or London or Bombay, it would be known they came from this museum. In which case the thief would be caught. Sounds like to me the work of a pretty clever thief. Dr. Wakeman, do you suspect anybody in particular? No, how can I? It's bewildering. It's, well, It's a mystery. The museum is open every day, but we have very capable guards. I believe the thefts occur at night, when only two watchmen are on duty. Any signs of uh, somebody forcing in a door or window? No, none that we can recognize. Hmm. But it's got to stop, Mr. Shane. It's got to. I'm responsible, and there are people who will take advantage of my failure. Even in a museum, one can have enemies, huh? This is what I want you to do, sir. Hmm? Come out and look over the museum with me. Perhaps spend a few nights there. Well, that's quite an order, Dr. Wakeman, but I guess we're game. How about it, Phil? Certainly we are. All right. Then if you would meet me at the museum tonight in my office, say, about 8.30. Your office at 8.30? Okay, but it's only fair to warn you, Doctor. Every time I go out on a job lately, I seem to wind up with a corpse. Really? Oh, (laughs) then you won't be disappointed. You'll find six corpses. Six corpses? Yes, in the mummy room. Oh, Mike, there's something really ironic about tonight. Mm? For years I've worked with you, tried and begged and coaxed you to go to the museum with me, and it takes a crime to break you down. Well, I can't think of a better reason. Well, I'm excited about it. This case is so different. Imagine sitting up all night with Egyptian mummies and things. What atmosphere? Uh Uh-huh. Well, right now I'm more concerned about the atmosphere collecting on our windshield. It's starting to rain and I forgot to get those windshield wipers fixed. Mm, A night in the museum. A rainy night in the museum. That's even better. Dr. Wakeman, to the contrary, I doubt anybody will try to swipe anything tonight while King Tut is entertaining us. Do you think we'll have to hide in a sarcophagus or or whatever they call it? Sarcophagus, yes. (laughs) Well, yes, this is the museum. Ooh, hug your coat, Angel. There's a wind with this rain. All right. Ooh, it's a spooky-looking old building at night. Uh Uh-huh. Only one light showing. Probably in Wakeman's office. 
I ain't got nobody. Well, right on time, according to the clock in the tower. Not very cheerful sounding, is it? What do you want? Well, uh, we have an appointment with Dr. Wakeman. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told me about you. Come on in. Thank you. All right. Follow me. Yes, sir. Mike, that room right ahead, that strange green light all through it. Egyptian department. Mummy room. Oh, it looks so uncanny. Are are we going through it? Yeah. Shortcut to the curator's office. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice layout of mummies. Reminds me of the morgue. Ooh. Hey. Hey, Phil, slow down. Oh, I... Mike, that that mummy standing up, it moved. Oh, don't be silly. That's a god. And and you talked about hiding in a sarcophagus. Curator, (laughs) Thomas. Go right on in. Thank you. Sure, sure. Well, looks like Dr. Wakeman isn't here. He's probably around him. Mike. Yeah? That big chair with its back toward us. Yeah, tobacco smoke coming up from it. Uh, Dr. Wakeman, I... Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, I didn't hear you. I I was reading this manuscript. Oh, I didn't see you, young lady. I beg your pardon, being in my shirt sleeves. I was drying my coat on the radiator here. Ought to be dry now. Yeah, just a little wet, but no matter. Good heavens, is that clock on the desk right? Yes, it's 8.30. I'd better phone Wakeman's house and find out what's keeping him. Get me Wakeman. Hello? Arthur? Uh, this is Cameron. What's holding up Wakeman? Uh, Mr. Shane is waiting here in the office. But he told me to be here at 7.30 and I'm still waiting. Oh, yes, that's possible. All right, Arthur. Uh, that's the young professor who lives with Wakeman. Said he left for the museum at 7. He lives just across the street. Well, he must have stopped somewhere else first. Yeah, that's what Arthur said. I'm curious, sir. How did you know my name was Shane? Oh, Wakeman told me about you on the phone. I'm Professor Cameron, one of the governors of the museum. Oh, I see. Well, I'm glad to know you. And this is Miss Knight. How do you do? How do you do? I hope you people can help poor Wakeman. He's all upset about this trouble in the museum. I suppose that's what he wanted to talk to me about tonight. I've wanted to see your exhibits for a long time, Professor. (laughs) I'm not the Egyptologist here, but antiquities have been a hobby of mine most of my life. I'll be glad to show you anything I can. Oh, perhaps this is Wakeman. No, it's Arthur. Hasn't he come in yet? Wakeman? Not yet. Uh, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight, this is Professor Arthur Arthur Behrens. He's the man you want to talk to about Egyptology. I'm glad to know you, Professor. How do you do? I don't understand it. The guard just told me he hadn't seen Wakeman all evening. He must have gone out again. Well, a little wait won't hurt us. Uh, Pardon me. Do we have to suffocate while we're waiting? It's awfully stuffy in here. Do you gentlemen object to fresh air? Oh, I'm sorry. I've been smoking my pipe. (laughs) Well, I'll open the window just to crack. (gasps) What's the matter? Good heavens. Wakeman. (gasps) Hanging behind the curtain. Get him down, quick. Wait a minute, Professor. We've got to see if he's still alive. What difference does that make? If he's dead, we've got to leave him there for the coroner. He's dead, all right. Oh, how could he be so foolish, so foolish? You think it's suicide? What else? Of course, look at him. I just did. San Francisco Police Department. Give me the inspector of homicide. We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis and their adventures in just a moment. Here's a tip if you're worried about excess carbon in your engine. Just drive into any Union Oil station and ask the Minuteman for Triton Motor Oil. Why? Well, nearly all carbon formed in engines comes from the motor oil and not from the gasoline. Now, there's a wide variation in the amount of carbon different oils form. So it's logical to buy the oil that forms the least carbon. And that's where Triton comes in. For Triton, and this is a proved laboratory fact, contains less carbon-forming elements than any of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, Triton cuts costly carbon. The reason is that Triton is refined by Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent process, a process that removes harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur, leaving a pure 100% lubricating oil. 
an oil that will safely lubricate your car for many hundreds of miles and give added protection against excess carbon. Your engine deserves that protection. You can buy Triton at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Mike and Phyllis have located the missing Dr. Wakeman, curator of the museum, hanging from a curtain rod in his own office. The inspector has arrived on the scene and questions Mike and the two museum professors. Now, just a minute. Mr. Shane says it's murder. Professor Barron says it's suicide. I can't be positive it's suicide, Inspector. But I know that Wakeman was a very morbid man and terribly affected by these museum thefts. You mean he may be linked in with them? When he saw the things closing in around him, he chose the one way out? No, no, I didn't say that. Inspector, just so you don't fall for a phony suicide deal, take a look at that rope. Uh Uh-huh. See what you mean, Mike. The heads of the rope are all flattened in one direction. It couldn't be suicide. How could that possibly tell you? Because we make a study of such things, Professor. When a person is dead before he's hanged, the killer has to haul the body up into place. When the murderer pulled the rope over that curtain rod, the pressure going over the rod flattened all the hairs on the rope. But who would kill Wakeman? Unless, perhaps, the thief who's been stealing from us. Obviously. We'd better question the guards and check up on any clues of burglary. Dr. Wakeman said he couldn't find any clues after the earlier thefts. But he made a list of stolen articles. Now, if we looked at them, we might get an idea of the type of thief. I'm afraid you'll have to forget that. Wakeman kept the list in the big safe there. But he was the only one who had the combination. Well, let's see. It's unlocked. We kept some of our most valuable items in that safe. You and Professor Cameron better take inventory. Hmm. Everything looks in its place. A chapter from the Gutenberg Bible, the Greek medallions. Carelessness, carelessness. Wakeman never put anything twice in the same place. What's wrong? This papyrus, any fool can see it's a prayer scroll of the Fourth Dynasty, but the marker says Egyptian Book of the Dead. Or he just filed in the wrong container. Ah, here's a list of stolen articles. May I see it, please? Mm-hmm. Two blue porcelain vases, Ming Dynasty. Jeweled Arabian sword, gold scabbard... Two miniatures, Napoleon and Josephine, set of Egyptian... Napoleon and Josephine? Hey, there's a point. Cameron, you remember how Mr. Bradley fought with Wakeman when Wakeman wouldn't sell those miniatures to him? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about Richard Bradley, the lumberman and art collector? Yes, a creature wholly without culture who buys rare and beautiful works merely to flaunt the power of his money. Oh. But, but a man with millions wouldn't descend to stealing? Well, I'm not so sure. Bradley offered Wakeman $20,000 for the miniatures of Napoleon and Josephine. Then he upped it to $25,000. Yes, I remember. He was bidding against that art dealer, that, that Francois Lys. Yes, and when Wakeman wouldn't sell at any price, Bradley got so furious he threatened him. He said he'd come down here some night and slit Wakeman's throat and take the miniatures anyway. Oh, I'd discount that. Bradley is notorious for his bad temper. Still, we can't overlook it, Mike. We've got to follow all leads. Sergeant. Yes, Inspector? We're going to call on Mr. Bradley. Nobody is to leave this building till we get back. Hmm. So Wakeman is dead, eh? Well, well, perhaps now I can do business with the museum. What time did you say he was killed? We didn't say, Mr. Bradley, but we think between 6.45 and 7.30. Well, that's lucky for me. With my feeling toward Wakeman, you might be coming here to accuse me of his murder. But at that hour, I happen to be eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. Well, I ask why you're so bitter toward Wakeman? number of reasons. Do you realize I offered Wakeman a quarter of a million dollars to build a new wing on the museum, and he and his board of governors turned it down? Yeah, turned it down, yes. Merely because I wanted my name chiseled over the doorway. Would another of those reasons be, Mr. Bradley, that Wakeman wouldn't sell you two miniatures of Napoleon and the Empress Josephine? Yes. Twenty-five thousand dollars offered him. And I believe when Wakeman refused to sell, you threatened him. And said something about coming down and slitting his throat to get those miniatures? (laughs) Yes, I said that. Anything else you want to know? We ask these questions, sir, because those two miniatures were among the articles stolen from the museum. Well, I hope you find them. And when you do, let me know. I'd still like to buy them. When we find them, sir, we'll have the murderer of Dr. Wakeman. I may be able to put you in the right direction. Mm. Yeah. Let me take a look out of the window. Yeah, I can see the light in his store. It's still open. It's down just a block from this apartment. Who? An art dealer, Francois Lise. 
Yes, I think he would be a very interesting man for you to question. Thank you, sir. If we need any more answers, we'll be back. You know, Mr. Bradley may be a big shot in this town, a millionaire and an art collector. But his heart doesn't pump blood. It's vinegar and arsenic. Yeah. Awfully anxious to pack us off to Francois Lise. Mm-hmm. And that alibi of eating dinner at the Mark Hopkins. I think the sergeant better double check on that. You kiddies are a suspicious crew. Now, why would a millionaire commit a murder for two useless miniatures? Well, we can continue this discussion some other time. Here's Mr. Lee's gallery. You are looking <laughs> for something, yes? Oh, Yes, we didn't see you. It's uh, it's like this. My friends here and I are redecorating an apartment. It's to be in the French style, and I... Uh... <laughs> so? Uh, what kind of an apartment are you decorating? Perhaps a cell at the police station? Hmm? Uh, what? <laughs> you are Monsieur Shane, the detective. This is Monsieur Inspector of the police and the young lady. She is Mademoiselle Knight. You have come here to ask me about my poor friend, uh, Dr. Wakeman. Alors, it is a great pity. But... But... uh, How did you know? It is simple. One of the guards at the museum, Monsieur Olson, he telephoned me about the murder. So now you come to my studio to look for stolen property. Très bien. My studio, she is at your command. Well, this isn't exactly what we expected. You see, there is no need for apology. You will pardon if I go. I am promised to see Madame Van Allenhaven tonight, and uh, perhaps to buy her library. Yeah, but hold on. Uh, Just a minute. Uh, When you have searched my studio, if you will lock this front door, please. Au revoir. Well... Hmm. Well, of all... You've the... come to my studio for look for stolen property. I am happy to have you. Yeah, that's what's wrong, mm. Inspector. Mr. Lees is too free. He knows there's nothing here. If he dealt in stolen goods, he was very careful not to store them in this studio. Mike, let's go after him. He's going to tell us a few things. Wait a minute, Inspector. He's already told us something. A guard at the museum named Olson telephones him that Wakeman has been murdered and tells Lees about us. What for? Yeah. Lee and the guard must be working this together. Maybe, but that's what we've got to find out. And I know how we will find out, Inspector. We are going to search his studio. For what? I want a cardboard box, some wrapping paper, and a shipping label. Then, back to the museum as fast as we can go. The sergeant's got Olsen in the next room, Mike. You ready for him? Yes, Inspector. Yeah, now look. This is the way we'll work it. On the desk here, we've got the box all wrapped and uh, addressed to Richard Bradley. Mm-hmm. Now, inside, we've planted a Chinese vase that we borrowed temporarily from the museum. We'll call in Olsen. We'll tell him we've found this box at Lee's studio. And then when he recognizes it as museum property, we hope he'll get rattled and confess. Right. Huh? Okay, kids, let's begin the act. Olsen, in here, please. Olsen, we just got back from a little trip downtown. In uh, looking through the studio of an art dealer, Francois Lee's, we ran across a package, this box here on the desk. Well, what about it? We'd like you to read the label on it. I don't get what you're driving at. All right, Olson, I'll read the shipping label for you. To Mr. Richard Bradley. Well, suppose we see what's inside the package, huh? Here we are. Well, very pretty. It, like, it's a vase. A rare Chinese vase, Olson, from this museum. Why, how... How do you... It was one of the things stolen from here, Olsen. And we know who stole it. We know. Now are you going to talk? No, no. No, I didn't take that. He never told me anything about it. You admit you stole for Francois Lee. <laughs> Look out, Phil! He came through the window. I... I... Didn't take... No, 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 no. Oh! Right through the heart, Inspector. Sergeant! McCarthy! Cuban! The side door, Inspector. Come on, this way. Holy jumping. It looks like it is. Francois Lise. No, no, no. No, let me go. You are wrong. Inspector, we caught him running for his car. We got his gun. It's still warm and one of the chambers is empty. No. No, you do not understand. But we do, Mr. Lise. You were afraid the guard would talk and you killed him. But you were just a little too late. He confessed that he was working for you. All right. Yes, yes, I... 
I admit, I kill Olsen, but not Dr. Wakeman. No, no, never. We let a jury decide that. Inspector, shall I call off all the boys now? I wouldn't do that, Inspector. This case is not closed yet. What are you talking about, Mike? We've caught the man who killed Olsen, but the man who murdered Dr. Wakeman is still at large. We've still got one murderer to catch. In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, the radiator on your automobile plays a definite part in the economical operation of your engine. Like other parts, it needs some attention now and then. You see, the small honeycomb cores and water pipes of a radiator are easily plugged with rust, dirt, and scale. When that happens, the water circulation is impaired, the temperature gauge shouts danger, and the engine loses efficiency. That's why, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. And the quickest way to do that is to have your Union Oil Minuteman clean your radiator with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale and rust right out of choked water lines. Then, with this foreign matter flushed out, the clean water can circulate rapidly and the engine stays cooler. Remember, your Minute Man can flush the radiator while you wait. The cost is nominal, and you'll benefit with cooler summer driving. You can get Union Radiator Service wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Mike is certain that the capture of Francois Lys does not solve the murder of Dr. Wakeman. In the office of Dr. Wakeman, the inspector argues the point with Mike and Phyllis. I'm sorry, Mike. I just don't get your reasoning. Lise admits he and Olsen were robbing the museum. He admits he killed Olsen to cover up. Then why do you accept his denial that he killed Wakeman? You just gave me my reason, Inspector. Lise will be convicted for one murder. It will make no difference to him to confess the second killing. That's why I think he's telling the truth. In other words, Mike, you think the second killing occurred tonight merely because of our investigation of the first killing. Correct, Angel. Okay, right. suppose you're right. Maybe Olsen killed Wakeman. They're both dead. One murder cancels out the other. No, Inspector, no. The murder of Dr. Wakeman was very clever, too clever for Olsen to have thought of. Mike, you must have something in mind. I have. I was just thinking. When we first started out tonight, we found that safe over there unlocked. Dr. Wakeman wouldn't leave it unlocked with constant thefts going on around here. Do you think the the murderer made him open it? Well, let's have another look inside that safe. Huh? There's a lot of valuable stuff in there. If we could find it... Wait a minute. That papyrus. The Book of the Dead, remember? Yeah, sure. The professor said it was kept in the safe. Yeah, the young one. Baron said it was misplaced. That's what he said. Now, I'm no expert on Egyptology, but I do know that the Book of the Dead is an extremely rare old papyrus in delicate condition. Now, if you were going to steal it, what would you put it in? How would you carry it? Well, I see a half dozen long metal cylinders in the safe. I suppose you'd carry it in one of them. Okay, let's check them. Mm, all of them are labeled. Prayer scroll of Imshet Sup. Yeah. And record of Noble's War. Hey, here's one with no label. It's bigger. All dusty and dirty. What? Let me see that. Oh, it's even got cobwebs on it. But the safe itself is almost antiseptically clean. Inspector. Yeah. Look at these spots. They're all over the cylinder. You know what made them? Mm, water spots. <laughs> yeah, water. And I'll bet you the papyrus inside this tube is the Book of the Dead. Okay, Inspector, get everybody in here. Why, yes, Mr. Sheen, that's the Book of the Dead. We always keep it in the safe. Yes, as I said, Wakeman must have misfiled it. Uh, Professor Barron, you told us you were studying this papyrus just the other day. Yet now we find it in an old, dusty container. Well, I don't know why that would... All the other papyrus cylinders are perfectly clean and bare labels. Where did this dirty, unlabeled container come from? It must be from the storehouse, a building away out back of the museum. Are there a lot of uh, spiders out there? Spiders? Naturally, it's an old building. All right. I'll tell you exactly how Dr. Wakeman was murdered. This evening he opened the safe for somebody who wanted to look at the Book of the Dead. 
The only thank you he got was to be strangled to death. Then the killer hung the body behind the curtain so it wouldn't be discovered immediately. The murderer needed a special carrying container for the papyrus. So he went out to the storehouse and got one and came back. Time was running short. So, temporarily, he tucked the papyrus back in the safe, hidden in the new container. It was almost 8.30. He knew Miss Knight and I were due in the office. So he calmly sat down and pretended to be reading. That's when we walked in on you, Professor Cameron. Oh, why, why, preposterous. I, I never heard of Professor, such a thing. Professor, you told us that you came into the museum at 7.30 and spent the whole hour here in the office reading and smoking. It didn't start to rain tonight till almost 8.30. Yet when we came in, you were drying your coat on the radiator. Well, I... That doesn't mean... It means everything, sir. This papyrus cylinder has more than dust and cobwebs on it. It's got spots. Water spots, rain spots. Spots that were collected at the same time you collected them on your coat when you came back from the storehouse after you killed Wakeman. And as final proof, Professor, all four of us here can see wet cobwebs stuck to the back of your trouser legs. Does that convince you, Professor? Yes... Yes, I... I thought I was so careful that no one could prove... That's what every murderer thinks, sir. But the murderer is always wrong. He always makes some little slip, some little mistake. Tonight you made yours. Well, kids, there's my car parked across the street. Now, say good night and thanks again. Oh, come on, Inspector. Follow us over to Phil's apartment, huh? She'll fix us some coffee and sandwiches. Well... No, I'll do better than that. I'll try out a new spaghetti recipe on you. Spaghetti? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. There goes my waistline again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. I'll meet you at the apartment. <laughs> okay, okay, Inspector. We'll see you later, then. <laughs> Mike. Yes? You know I still don't get it. Why would Professor Cameron kill a man just to own an Egyptian papyrus that he could borrow any time he wanted to? Now, it seems no motive for murder. Well, it seems silly to us, maybe. Yeah. But you remember... Remember how sentimental Dr. Wakeman got about those baby sandals of the pharaoh Ramesses? Mm-hmm. Well, Cameron felt the same way about the Book of the Dead. But Cameron was uh, inherently dishonest. Yes, I suppose so. Cameron buried himself in his work. He isn't married, didn't play golf or dance or go to movies, didn't have any fun at all. Ah, that's dangerous for any man. <laughs> now, well, what are you giggling about? It sounds like a perfect description of Mike Shane. Oh, 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 oh no. No, there's a difference. I uh, may not be married. No. May not play golf or dance. But. I've got you, Angel, and I do have fun. again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. Here is a message from our government. It's been a long time since there were any new cars, and naturally we're all excited about them. But let's not forget that it'll be many months before new automobiles are on the market. That means that we still have a pretty serious job taking care of our old cars. More and more cars are junked every day. That places a mounting burden on public transportation facilities that are already overtaxed. Now, a few simple conservation measures will help you keep your car rolling. Join a carpool. Check your tire pressures every week. 
and have tires recapped in time to save the casings. Have your battery checked regularly and make sure your car is regularly and properly lubricated. Take care of minor troubles before they become big repair jobs. Drive slowly. Speed increases wear. Remember, your car has to last till victory and then some. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company brings you Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell in... Dangerous Assignment. Over here. Here I am with the boat. Swim over this way. Here, let me help you, I bought. Give me your hand. Come on. You set the charge of natural glycerin? Good. And no one saw you leave the ship? Ah, right on schedule. The ship goes to the bottom, and only the two of us know the location. <laughs> and now... Wait. Wait, no. No, put down the knife. No, 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 no! Oh! Three ships sunk in two weeks, Steve. And the last one cost the lives of six passengers. But, Commissioner, why send me halfway around the world just because three ships were sunk? Steve, those ships carried U.S. rehabilitation supplies. I see. Now, as usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Here's your press credential, Steve. Your passport and plane ticket. Ruth, did you say plane ticket? You take off in two hours. Now, look, I was figuring on a little deal. Now, can't it wait till tomorrow? No, it can't wait. And that's another <clears throat> thing, Steve. On this assignment, there's to be no women and no gambling. It's strictly business, dangerous business. Okay, Commissioner. All right, Steve. Your first stop in Saigon is the Malayan Star Lines. The manager's name is Bravon. You've got your assignment. Get going. <laughs> You've seen him in The Great McGinty, as Major Devereaux in Wake Island, as Trampas in The Virginian. Now, here is our star, Brian Donnelly, in another two-fisted portrayal as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. The time now, the place, Saigon, inscrutable city of the Orient where the ancient and the modern rub elbows in the narrow, crowded streets. Saigon, city of intrigue, of shadows, of forgotten men, of danger. Mr. Bravant, I believe you're in charge of the Malayan Star Lines here in Saigon. That is correct, Monsieur... Mitchell, Steve Mitchell. I'm a foreign correspondent. I just flew in. I'd like an interview. There's not much of which to talk. Three ships of our line sail for Singapore. The first night out, an explosion, they're gone. Just like that, huh? We oui, just like that. Could uh, I take a look at the passenger list for those three ships? Certainly. I have them on my desk. Thank you. You don't carry many passengers. Only a few. Any survivors? From the first sinking, none. From the third sinking, also none. How about the second? One. Who is it? An Englishman named Dixon, the cook. Is he around anywhere? I'd like to talk to him. Aran, tell the Englishman Dixon to come to my office. Most of your crews have been with the line quite a while. It is the exception rather than the rule, monsieur. Out here, one must take what men one can get. I see. What kind of cargo were your ships carrying? That is the mystifying part, monsieur. Here are the cargo lists. 
As you see, the melee and star lines carry American rehabilitation supplies, teak wood, spices, rubber, the usual. This uh, teak wood, I notice all of it comes from the same place. Yes, the plantation of Monsieur Surat. It is inland, up the Saigon River. Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Brevant? Uh, oui, yes. Uh, this gentleman is Monsieur Mitchell, a journalist. Nice to meet you, sir. Hi. Uh, Mr. Brevant tells me you're the only survivor from the second sinking. Oh, I'm the only one from any of them. That makes you pretty lucky, doesn't it? <laughs> lucky ain't off of it. Look, uh, did you notice anything unusual aboard your ship before the explosion? Well... I was back aft, getting a breath of air before turning in, I was. And I noticed a silhouette of a small boat in the moonlight. Off our starboard beam, she was. And running without lights. Without lights? That's right. Anything else? I didn't have time to notice anything else, mister. Because just then there's a sheet of flame. The whole ship goes up in the air, and the next thing I know, I'm holding on to a spar in the water for dear life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Have you any idea what your ship's position was when she went down? Near as I can figure, we was in shoal water close to Polo Condori. That is an island a hundred miles off the coast of Indochina, monsieur. But, of course, it is but a guess. We have no way of knowing the exact location. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the information. I think it ought to make a good yarn. Do you intend to remain here in Saigon long? Well, that depends. I'd like to talk to Mr. Surratt, the plantation owner. Do you know where I might find him? There is a gambling casino just down the street, monsieur. If he is in Saigon, he will be there. Good. I'm beginning to feel lucky. I am certain you will not lack for games of chance in Saigon, monsieur. I personally find gambling a bore, but it would seem I am in the minority. Yeah, I guess you are. Well, thanks for the story. I'll see you around. Hmm. He's an inquisitive gent, ain't he, Mr. Brevon? Yes, he is indeed. Newspaper chap, is he? That is what he said. Dixon, tell Aran to answer my telephone for me. I'm going out for a while. Sixteen. Red. Event. Sorry, monsieur. You lose again. Look, this game is slow death. Haven't you got something with a little more action in it? And uh, Monsieur will perhaps prefer the dice table downstairs. That's a thought. Thanks. Oh! oh I beg your pardon. Oh, no, it is my fault, Monsieur. <laughs> Let me pick up your chair. Well, you are most kind, Monsieur. It was very clumsy of me. As a matter of fact, I bumped into you deliberately. It was the only way I could think of to meet you. Monsieur has a ready wit. All bets down. If you're looking for something to tack on after the monsieur, it's Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. They call me Leanna, monsieur. They picked a nice name. Well, here are your chips. You pick up my chips and my luck with them. You must allow me to buy you a drink, huh? You see, I am superstitious. Good. So am I. And having a drink with you is suddenly a superstition of mine. <laughs> Let us go to the bar. Leanna. Leanna. Well, I should have known you wouldn't be alone. It is only my brother, monsieur. Oh, where are you going, Leanna? It is all right, Matihiga. I am sure the American will take good care of me. Uh, monsieur Steve Mitchell, my brother, Matik. Hello. Oh, your servant offended. Dear Matik, you play some of my chips now while we have our drink. Come along, Steve. You uh, live here in Saigon, Leanna? For the most part. But I am restless. I travel a lot. Tomorrow night I leave for Singapore. Oh, I guess my luck hasn't changed after all. I will not be gone long. How are you going to Singapore? I travel by tramp steamer. It is not so boring. Oh, not on the Malay Star Lines. Why, yes. Ah, here we are. Sort of crowded right here. Why don't we move down to the other end? Uh, there all is right. room here. I will move over. Oh, thank you. No trouble, sir. No trouble at all. What will you have, Stephen? Bourbon and... Hey. What is it? I just saw someone I know, Leanna. Uh, excuse me just a minute. Of course. Be back in a minute. I will order the drink. Well, my dear. He seems interested in the Malayan star line, sir. You think he is involved? It is possible. Very well. I will proceed on that assumption. Boy, come here. We oui, with you? I want a message delivered for me. <laughs> Uh, 
Good evening, Mr. Brevant. Huh? Oh, Monsieur Mitchell, is it not? Have you written your story yet? Not yet. I'm a little surprised to see you here at the casino. When we talked this afternoon, you told me gambling bored you. It does. But I do find interest in observing gamblers, monsieur. Particularly when high stakes are involved. Oh? Monsieur, I congratulate you on the speed with which you have made yourself acquainted in Saigon. What do you mean? Did I not observe you conversing at the bar with Surat? Surat? The stout gentleman. You mean the guy who was standing next to me? The one with the face like a toad? <laughs> Your description does not flatter him, but it is accurate. Hmm. Well, thanks, Surat. I'll see you around. Undoubtedly, monsieur. I'm sorry I took so long, Leona. Oh, it is quite all right. Well, here is your drink. Thanks. Say, uh, what happened to the guy who was next to me here, the one who moved over to make room? Huh? Oh, I do not know, Steve. I was not noticing. Hmm. Surat. Is that his name? Yeah. Well, cheers. Cheers. We should Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Over here, boy. You are a busy man, Steve. <laughs> I seem to be. Monsieur Mitchell? Yeah, what is it? Uh, you are wanted outside, monsieur. Oh, by whom? Oh, he not give name, monsieur. But he say, quite urgent. Okay, here. Oh, thank you, monsieur. Lana? I know, I know. You will be gone but a minute. Yes, I will wait for you. Mitchell Effendi. Who are you? You are Steve Mitchell? What do you want, a calling card? Yeah, I'm Steve Mitchell. I suppose you tell me why you got me out here. I am Dalai. I suggest that we walk, Effendi. Oh. You always suggest with a gun, Dalai? When it is necessary, Effendi. Come. Mind telling me where we're going? Certainly not. Right around the corner here. And into the alley. Cozy in here. And dark, it can be. Wait a minute. Looks like we've got company in here. It is but my friend Banjak, Effendi. Oh, hello. What's the matter? Is he bashful? He cannot speak. His tongue was removed by force some years ago. But he is strong and willing. Banjak. Why, you... That. Reminder from Banjak will serve to open the conversation. Look, I don't know what this is all about. To be brief, Effendi, you have information which I require. The locations of the three sunken ships. The ships? You think I know where they were sunk? Banjak. Look. Perhaps that will refresh your memory. How can I tell you the location when I don't know them? Again, Banjak. I tell you, this wasn't going to do you any good. I don't know where those ships were sunk. Very well. If you intend to be stubborn, you may proceed, Banjak. I told you not to resist. Well, if you think I'm going to stand here and let this big ape make mince meat out of me. Very well, Effendi. It is a pity the Effendi bleeds so easily, Banjak. But I must not deprive you of extended enjoyment. You may kick him. I will tell you when to stop. The National Broadcasting Company is bringing you Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell in the second of an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment. The time, the next morning. The place, a luxuriously furnished bedroom in a spacious villa near Saigon, overlooking the sea. Oh. Ah, you are awake at last, Fendi. Ah, uh, you can call it that. Well, hey, wait a minute. You're Leona's brother, aren't you? Matik. 
Your servant, Effendi. Look, would you mind telling me how I got into this harem? <laughs> you are in the house of my sister, Liana. How did I get here? Well, Liana became worried when you did not return to the casino last night. We went outside to look for you and found you crawling out of the alley badly beaten. So we brought you home with us. You are all bloody. How do you feel now? All bloody? Hey, help me out of this mink-lined cradle, will you? Oh, of course. Where are my pants? Hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. It was I who put you to bed. And here are your pants. Thanks. Where's Liana? Swimming in the ocean. Come. You can see her out the window. Hey, she's quite a swimmer, isn't she? Does she always swim out that far? Oh, yes. Every morning. Well, I'm not that ambitious this morning, but a dip would do me good. Quiet, a, a swimmer yourself. <laughs> Thanks. That water made me feel almost human again. Any cigarettes around here? Ah, uh, right here on my robe. Hey. Here you are. <laughs> hmm. You, uh, you look much better than when we found you last night. You know, you've taken awfully good care of me, Liana. Why? Why? Oh, perhaps. Perhaps there have been. So many places, many times, many men in my life. And with me, it, there's always been the same. But then last night, I saw you. And I knew you were something different. How different? <sighs> does, does that make your bruises feel better? It helps, you know. That's a kind of medicine I could get addicted to, Liana. Perhaps. Perhaps when I return from Singapore, there will be more time to become addicted. Maybe. When do you sail? A day tonight. On the Malayan Queen. I guess my luck's still no good. <laughs> okay, look, I gotta go back to my hotel and pick up a change of clothes. But anyway, I'll be down to see you off tonight. How'd you get in here? I am Surratt. I learned you were registered at this hotel, so I took the liberty of waiting here in your room. Quite the liberty, wasn't it? When occasion demands it, the courtesies must be omitted. What's the occasion? I will be brief. Mr. Mitchell, I will assume you are a man who is interested in money. That's a safe assumption, Surratt. I believe you're in possession of certain information which is of value to me. Here we go again. Sir? Look, you happen to know a couple of cutthroats named... Dylai and Ben Jack. Ben Jack's a big lug with no tongue. Dylai, Ben Jack, I have not had the pleasure of their acquaintance, sir. Oh, it's no pleasure, believe me. Sir? I'll skip it. Now, what's this about certain information I have? I will not waste words. Ten thousand American dollars for the location of the sunken ships. Ten thousand? Means a lot to you, doesn't it? You've been shipping teakwood on the Malay and Star Line, haven't you? From my plantation up the river, sir. It is a matter of record. I didn't know teakwood was that valuable. I repeat my offer. Ten thousand American dollars. Uh, I'll have to have a little time to think it over, Surratt. I cannot grant you much time, sir. I'm sailing tonight on the Malay and Queen. You have until 7.30 this evening. Okay. I will expect your answer before sailing time. Until then, good day, sir. Uh, Mr. Bravant, please. I am sorry, sir, but he's gone. Gone? Yes, sir, on a business trip. He is sailing in half an hour on the Malayan Queen. C could you get word to him that... Uh, uh, never mind, I'll call you back. Come in. 
Mitchell. Dixon, what's the matter? A knife in my back. What happened? Malayan Queen, ready to sail. Yeah, I know. I saw someone go aboard that was on the other ship. You mean the ship that was sunk? Yes. Who was it? Followed me here and stabbed me. Who stabbed you? I... <sighs> Dixon. Dixon. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Mitchell, but I don't leave the bridge until we're out of the channel. That's okay, Captain. I'd like you to look at these credentials. They'll explain who I am and why I'm aboard your ship. Hmm. You're investigating the recent sinkings. Yes, Captain. A couple of people seem awfully interested in the location of those sunken ships. I'm kicking an idea around that maybe there was something pretty valuable aboard them. Hmm. What would it be? I don't know. Are you carrying the same sort of cargo on this ship that was on the others? Yes, as far as I know. Another shipment of teak wood from Surratt's plantation? There is. Also, some American rehabilitation supplies. Hmm. Tell me, could those rehabilitation supplies be salvaged after they were sunk? Oh, no, no. The water had ruined them. Hmm. Captain, suppose you wanted to sink a ship and recover something from it later. What? Where would you sink it? Well, I, I suppose in shallow water. Yeah. Now, what's the first shallow water we'll be passing through tonight? Well, yeah, let's see. We'll pass through the Diablo Shoals a little after midnight. Depth there is only 15 fathoms. I see. Is that the passenger list on your desk? Yes. Here. Yeah, looks like the gang's all here. Ravant, Liana, her brother Matik, and Surratt. Captain, I need your full cooperation. Why, certainly. What is it? I'd like you to order these four passengers to be in Brevant Stateroom three hours from now at 11 tonight. Brevant, I demand an explanation of this, being hauled up to your cabin like a common criminal. But, Monsieur Surat, I am as much in the dark as you. I do not think it necessary to point out that this may cost you my business, Brevant. If you would only tell us the reason for all this, Effendi Brevant. Matik, I am sure there must be a good reason for all this. If we are but patient, we will learn what it is. Here is the man who is responsible, Monsieur Mitchell. Steve! Hello, Liana. Matik. Your servant, Effendi. Good evening, sir. Surat. Apparently, you forgot our appointment, Mr. Mitchell. I didn't forget it. I had a couple of other things to take care of. Perhaps, sir, you'll be good enough to explain what this is all about. Sure, I'll explain. I'll make it short. I think one of you is responsible for the sinkings of those three ships. You are joking, Steve. Sorry, Liana. But, but to suggest that I could have anything to do with it. You're a good swimmer. I'm afraid I'll have to count you in. Oh, it is so ridiculous to think that I or my brother could be involved in such a thing. You make a serious charge against us, Effendi. I know. This is an insult to my long years of service on the line. Perhaps it is a serious charge as far as the others are concerned, Mr. Mitchell. But to suspect that I am involved is ridiculous. Much valuable teak wood of mine was sunk with those ships. Yeah. And maybe it's more valuable than I thought at first. What do you mean by that, sir? I'll let it ride for the time being, because I've got another piece of news for you. Of course, it isn't really news to one of you. What do you mean, Steve? There was a ship's cook named Dixon, survivor of one of the sinkings. Tonight, he saw one of you come aboard. He recognized you as being on that other ship. So whichever one of you it was, killed him to shut his mouth. I assure you, this is the first of these ships I have been aboard, sir, and also the last. One of you four is the killer and dynamiter. That person has a bomb planted on this ship and plans to dive overboard before the explosion. And that explosion is due for about midnight, 45 minutes from now. Steve, this is ridiculous. Is it? Just keep your eyes on that clock, all of you. Nobody's going to leave this cabin for the next 45 minutes. We're going to sweat it out together, just watching that minute hand creep around to midnight. Eleven thirty. Anyone feel like talking yet? Really, Mitchell? Really, what? Haven't Ravon? you carried this silly joke far enough, Steve? There is only one way to prove he is mistaken in his suspicions, Liana. That is to wait. Can't we get a little air into this cabin? It's so infernally hot. You know something, Surratt? It's going to get a lot hotter. (laughs) 
Seven minutes to midnight. We reach shallow water in about ten minutes. That means ten minutes before the ship gets blown up. Anybody's tongue loosening up? Surratt? I demand to be released from this pest hole. Bravant? You must be insane. Liana? To think I once considered you... Yeah, so... yeah, save the romance. Matik, how about you? You feel like talking? When one knows nothing, one can say nothing offended. Okay, keep watching that minute, Anne, hmm? stand this any longer. I've got to get out of here. You've got to let me go. So you're the one, Surratt. No, no, no. You must believe me. I would be the last one in the world to blow those ships up. Why? Surratt! There's, there's gold hidden in those crates of cheek wood. Surratt, you fool. He was only bluffing. Now you have told him. You haven't told me enough. Keep talking. Oh, I, oh. I have nothing more to say. Look, Surratt. Three ships have been sunk on account of this. Now open up. Start talking. No, no. I... You better talk before I beat it out of you. Now spill it. All right, all right. During the war, an air raid, a ship carrying gold bullion steamed up the river to escape. But it was sunk near my plantation. I think I can take it from there. You recovered the gold, and this is the way you've been sneaking it out of Indochina, huh? Hidden in crates of teakwood? Yes, it was Liana's Shut idea. Shut up, Surat. Right. But someone must have found out about the gold and has been sinking the ships. Yeah, in shallow water so they can get the gold later. Fendi Mitchell, now that we know Surat is guilty, you will please allow me to leave. I have a headache. Mitchell, it is almost midnight. Yeah, nobody's leaving until I find out who's mined this ship. But Fendi Mitchell, you I... keep looking at your watch, Matik. Why? Matik... Matik, what is the ma- Matik, you didn't. You did. You put the explosives on this ship, too. You were going to jump overboard and leave me here, you fool. Where'd you plant it, Matik? Where did you plant it? Let me out of here. You're not going anywhere. The nitroglycerin will explode in two minutes. Matik, you sank those ships. You and Liana betrayed me. Very well. Surratt, put that gun away. Surratt! 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 And for you, Liana. Grab that gun, Bravant. Wait, wait, wait. Matik, where's the nitroglycerin? Where is it? Oh. Surratt, you jughead. You killed the only man who knew where it was hidden. We've got a minute and 50 seconds to find that nitro. Genius. Any ideas, Bravant? Matik could not have put it below decks. Men are stationed all over the ship. It must be in this cabin. Come on. Come on. Lock. Get back, Bravant. Wait, wait. Take that side of the room. I'll take this. All right. It's got to be in here somewhere. It's got to be. There's nothing over here, Mitchell. Wait a minute. Listen. There's something kicking. Uh, yes, yes, I hear it. Under the bunk. Look, that black suitcase. Easy. Throw it overboard. Throw it overboard quick. Yeah, I've got to get out of the way, Bravant. I've got to get it over the rail. Hurry, Mitchell, hurry. Only a few seconds more. It will explode. Throw it as far as you can. You don't have to tell me that. Hit the deck. Uh, Mitchell. Are you all right, Mitchell? Yeah. Except that I'm about five years older, Captain. Whew. That was close. Yeah, too close. Probably buckled if you were the ship's plates. Yeah, well, you better put Surratt under arrest. You can turn him over to the authorities when the ship reaches port. Yeah. Chances of getting the gold that's already been sunk are pretty slim, but there's probably a lot of it still at Surratt's plantation. The government can check that. Mitchell, allow me to say I have never seen one so calm in the face of danger. All the time we were waiting in my cabin after I realized what your plan was, my heart was in my throat. You think mine wasn't? It was choking me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at me, Bravant. I look like a fairly intelligent guy, don't I? Well, yes, of course. With a normal assortment of brains. Certainly. And a reasonable amount of common sense. But of course. And will you tell me something? What is it? Why did I ever get myself mixed up in a job like this? You have just heard the second in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif and directed by Bill Karn, with music by Bruce Ashley. Be with us again next week at this same time, when Brian Donlevy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. <laughs> This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC.
the National Broadcasting Company. I felt low, very low the night I set out searching for the girl with the strange hazel eyes. The fog which hung over Los Angeles didn't help. And I felt even worse when I found her. For by then I had death on my hands. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Barlow, we bring you tonight's gripping story, The Persian Slippers. One of those thin, chilly fogs had sneaked in from the Pacific and had hung vaguely to the streetlights along the Sunset Strip. It was a kind of a fog that you could see through, but everything was out of focus. It made you start wondering what you were going to do when you were 90 and you were all alone. I'd have liked to have spent the night in a room full of noisy extroverts playing charades. But instead, I had to eat a quick dinner and drive up into the secluded Hollywood Hills to meet a guy. A guy who had nothing but trouble on his mind. When I pushed the buzzer, I had the feeling of wishing I was someplace else. Carl Delaney himself opened the door. He was grim and brusque and to the point. Marlowe? That's right. Come in, Marlowe. I appreciate this. You're coming up here after business hours, I mean... I wouldn't have asked, except, uh, well, perhaps I've waited too long as it is. Sit down. Thanks. Waited too long for what, Mr. Delaney? Thirty-six hours ago, my wife disappeared. Marla, you've got to find her for me. Find her just as fast as you can. Wait a minute. Disappeared, you said. Would you mind playing that part back a little slower? Norma simply walked out that door, got in her car, and drove off to get hold of herself, as she always does when we've quarreled. And always before, she's come back in an hour or so. This time... This time she simply didn't come back, is that it? Look, Mr. Delaney, I could... You'd uh... better let me finish before you do anything. Lately, my wife has been brooding over something, something serious that she refused to discuss. I've caught her crying several times, and she's not a woman given to tears. Marlowe, I'm sure that unless we move fast, when we do find her, we're going to find her dead. Suicide? Yeah. <laughs> With his thick, blunt hand, Delaney reached for a color portrait lying face down on the table and gave it to me. I looked and saw the face of a dream. A beautiful dream with strange hazel eyes and soft black hair. I felt Delaney watching me as I glanced up in time to catch the fading end of a very ugly expression on his face. I handed the picture back to him and he laid it on the table again, face down. Then he took me upstairs to Norma's room. It was a nice, frilly room, typically haunted by elusive, sweet smells. There was only one incongruous note. What was the horoscope doing on her desk? From the looks of a picture, I knew that Norma was attractive enough that she didn't need to look to the stars for her future. A horoscope? Yeah, you know how women are. Marlowe, will you find her for me? Well, I'll try. My rate is $25 a day plus expenses. And remember... You hired me to find her, not bring her back. Fair enough. You just find her. I'll be satisfied. Hmm. I'll need a starting point. Were there any phone calls or letters or anything that might be a lead? What about friends? We have no close friends. Norma always stayed to herself. Wait. Uh, there was a phone call yesterday from, uh, Madame Jeanette, I think it was. Who's that, a dressmaker? I haven't any idea. She wanted to speak to Mrs. Delaney. I told her Norma was out, and she asked that my wife call her when she got back. That's all there was to it. Anything else you can tell me? No. Uh, no, it's not much to go on. I don't see I can do, Mr. Delaney. I'll be here all night, Marlowe. Call me if you need anything. Yeah, I'll do that. Good night. I drove back through the persistent fog to Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, it was 9.30. I knew it was going to be like tracking a hummingbird through the petrified forest by the bent twigs, but I got a classified directory and I started digging. I checked the hairdressers, the manicurists, and the milliners, and I was just about to start on the interior decorators when I remembered the horoscope on Norma's desk. I quickly turned to the personal consultants. Yeah, there it was. Madame Jeanette. 
Her establishment, located in a dubious neighborhood south of Olvera Street, turned out to be a tacky cottage set back next to an alley. It was as dark inside as out. I was pounding on the door like a vampire at sunrise when a newsboy came up the path. Looking for Madame Jeanette? Yeah, yeah, you know her? Sure, she tells fortunes. Says I've got a great career line. You want to see it? Not right now, thanks. And I'll say for her that she's a sound sleeper. Maybe, but not so early as this. About this time, she's always hanging around that bar on the corner. Tonight, she's throwing a farewell party in there. Farewell party? Who for? Herself. She's leaving town. Oh, thanks a lot. Here, kid. Gee, a buck. My old man will swear I've been shooting crap again. Give me another one, Charlie. Not every night I say goodbye to my dear old neighborhood. Muscatella, Jeanette? Yeah. Did I say dear old neighborhood, Charlie? I think you did, Jeanette. Must have had one too many then. Because of all the low, flea bitten row of shacks I ever lived in, this is the new low. Ah, oh, Jeanette, that's no way to talk. You hurt my feelings. Pinky. There ain't nothing like a little beer to soothe her feelings. <laughs> yeah, you said it. Jeanette, can I have another? Huh? Yeah. Charlie, give Pinky another. But this is his last. The last? I thought you said it was a farewell party. Hey, you and all your dough. This dough's to get me out of this rat trap of a town, see? It's the last I want to see out of it in all my life, see? Yeah, 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 Another must see. tell, Charlie. Uh, hold on a Jeanette. Hey, what'll it be, mister? Something just a bit drier than Muscatel. Say, Scotch? It's on me, mister. It's my party. Well, well, this is indeed a pleasure. You're the Madame Jeanette, aren't you? Yeah, why? You're all of 20 years younger than what I expected. Probably the life I lead. Hey, wait a minute. Why should you be expecting anything about me? I don't know you. Perhaps not, but I know you. From where? Oh, you're more famous than you think. Your reputation is spread far beyond Olvera Street. In fact, it's gone up as far as the Sunset Strip, Madam Jeanette. No kidding. How would you kid a fortune teller? Don't you know all, see all, and tell all? Well... And judging from that Spanish shawl, your Hungarian skirt, and those embroidered Persian slippers, I'm beginning to think your fame is not only local, but international. Say, you're <laughs> beginning to make me feel like I shouldn't be giving up this racket after all. Giving up fortune-telling? No. Yeah. I'm leaving town on the midnight train. Gonna spread my talents all over the East, and I'm not coming back. Don't tell me your crystal ball has laid a golden egg. So to speak, yeah. I come into some lettuce. Suddenly. That's always nice. Well, I guess it means you won't be interested in the few paltry dollars I'd intended to spend with you. Hey, can I have another beer? Shut Jeanette? up, Pinky Blow! Ah, oh, just a... Traveling lady can always use a little extra moolah. What was it you wanted, bud? I'm looking for someone. Norma Delaney. Norma De... I'm afraid I don't know anybody by that name. I'm afraid you do. What's your angle? Who are you, anyway? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Some private dick you must be to have to resort to fortune tellers. Come on, Jeanette. Look into your crystal muscatel. See if you can spot Norma Delaney. I told you once. I don't know the name. Now, blow. Just a minute, dark eyes. Hey, Charlie. Yeah? This bird's crabbing my party. What kind of a joint is this, anyway? Lady can't sit here and have a farewell party without being insulted by every jerk that drops in. Well, mister? I haven't finished my drink yet. You got pockets, ain't you? Just pour a drink into one of them and take it along. You ain't finishing it here. Charlie reached under the bar for his pick handle, so I left without pursuing the subject further. But I knew Jeanette was lying right in her purple lipstick about Norma. I walked back to my car, lit a cigarette, and spent a few precious minutes trying to decide whether or not to break into her place and snoop. Then I caught the shadow of a figure slipping up on me from behind. I turned. Oh, wait, wait, don't swing, Mac, don't swing. It's only me, Pinky. I, I was in the bar when you was talking to the madam. That tight wad, Jeanette. Yeah, I saw you, so? She did something the minute you left. <laughs> I figured you might like to know what it was. That all depends. Well, I, I thought it might be worth something to you, like a saw, maybe. Come on, you no, spill it. Wait a minute, spill wait, it. wait. If it's any good at all, it's worth a five and no more. Oh, all right, all right. She, she made a phone call. Who to? What'd she say? Nothing. Just some swear words in Spanish. 
the line was busy. <laughs> but I, I kept my eyes open and I got the number. All right, let's have it. If you can still remember it. Oh, I can remember it easy. Uh, five of first, huh? Here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the number was Crenshaw, 1929. <laughs> Don't you get it? <laughs> like the year of the big crash. <laughs> Thanks to the thirst of an underweight lush, I wasn't at the end of my rope yet. I drove as far as the nearest drugstore, dropped a nickel in the slot, and died. Crenshaw, the year of the big crash. Hello? Hello, let me speak to Norman Delaney, please. I'm afraid you must have the wrong number. Look, you, I'm trying to locate Mrs. Delaney. I suggest you help me. How did you get this number? From a client, Mr. Carl Delaney. But that's impossible. Let's stop sparring. We can save each other a lot of wear and tear if we get together and talk this over. Maybe you're right. Yes, that sounds sensible. I'm at the Beechwood Apartments, number four. Check. I'll be right out. Mr. Uh, Pierre Gillum, it says here on the door. Yes. Are you the man who called? Uh-huh. Philip Marlowe. Come in, won't you? You said you were looking for Norma Delaney, Mr. Marlowe. Tell me what's wrong. Has anything happened to her? Well, her husband seems to think she might have killed herself, but I have a hunch that you might have something interesting to oh, say. No, poor kid. Poor Norma. Well, I'll tell you what I can, Marlowe, but it isn't much. Oh, I'm all ears, and I'll sit. Thanks. Well, I was in love with Norma once, briefly, a long time ago. She was a wonderful girl, but her husband was insanely jealous. Mm -hmm. Even though she hadn't loved him for years, he refused to give her up. He even threatened to kill her first. Oh? Norma and I realized that serious trouble lay ahead, so we parted. Good friends. And I haven't seen her or heard from her in months. I buy it all but the last line. You have seen or heard from her, and recently... I'm not going to argue that. I've told you the truth. You can take it or leave it. I leave it. I suppose we both put our cards on the table. You lied to me when you said Carl Delaney gave you my number. I know because Madame Jeanette called me shortly after you did. Touche. But uh, why did she run to call you at the mention of Norma's name if you two broke up months ago? And incidentally, how did that ersatz oracle Jeanette get mixed up in this in the first place? That is a long story, Marlowe. Good, I like long stories. I'll bet it begins just for a lock. Norma and I went down to Olvera Street once to have our palms read. Yes, that's exactly how it started. <laughs> Madame Jeanette was an unusual woman, a, a character, you might say. Uh -huh. Well, we became friendly with her. Norma got quite sentimental about her. One day we made a sort of uh, pact. If ever either of us was in trouble and needed the other, we'd go to Madame Jeanette or get a message to her. She would notify the other. And... So when I walked in asking for Norma, the madam assumed she was in trouble. Right, right. Called me immediately because she herself was leaving town in less than an hour. I know. Well, Mr. Gillum, it's all very interesting, but it's getting me no place. Thanks. If I need you oh, no, again... Oh, uh, wait, Marla, don't go. Hmm? Uh, I know a lot of details about Norma that, uh, that I'm sure will be helpful. Uh, for instance, she, she drives a Nash Coupe, a powder blue. Powder blue coupe, huh? Thanks, that'll help. Oh, and, and uh, she has a fondness for white gloves. Wears them quite often. I see. Well, I better get more. No, no, uh, wait just a minute, Marlowe. I've got to go. Now, listen, Marlowe. I told you I was in a hurry. Now, take it easy. Stick around a while. Get away from that door. Well, just who do you think you are? Come busting in here, prying, asking questions, you dirty... Oh! You asked for it, Gillum. Right. Oh! You got a left, too, huh? So have I, brother. <laughs> Gillum sprawled all over his coffee table as limp as a five-cent salad. Outside, I glanced at my watch. Madame Jeanette's train left in 40 minutes. I ran through 22 bucks worth of red lights getting down to a cottage because I was sure Gillum's attempted stall was tied in with a departure. But I couldn't figure out why. That is, I couldn't until I switched out my lights and coasted to a stop in front of her place. Then I saw it. Half hidden in the shadows back of the house sat a powder blue coupe. I got up on the porch close to the front door and listened. Jeanette was talking to a woman. I couldn't catch what they were saying, but one thing was certain. 
The woman was Norma Delaney. All at once I realized the talk had stopped. That was my cue. I shoved open the door and went in. Jeanette sat at a table alone, facing me. Well, Mr. Marlowe, you've returned. What is it this time? I'd like my fortune told. Yeah? Now, listen close, gumshoe. I'll make this a short and snappy reading because I'm catching a train in 15 minutes. There's a woman very close to you. In fact, she's right behind you, sucker. What? No! When I finally opened my eyes again, nothing changed. It took me a long time to figure out that the lights were off and it was dark. I climbed up the table leg hand over hand and switched on a lamp. Jeanette's house was absolutely quiet. I had caught a glimpse of a white glove holding what is known as a blunt instrument just before I dozed off. And that reminded me what I was down here for. I wobbled through the kitchen and out the back door, but the powder blue coupe was gone. It was 12.15. My head and the fog both had gotten a little thicker. So I just stood there, useful like a ping-pong ball in a bowling alley. It was the sound of footsteps that finally moved me, and the newsboy was back. Well, hi again, mister. Did you ever get a hold of Madame Jeanette before she left? Yeah, yeah, but not tight enough. Say, a blue coupe left here a few minutes ago. Did you see it? Nope, I did. Gee, I'm sure sorry she went away. She gave me a buck tonight, too. Said she was coming into a fortune. Uh, you and your career like... Say, what's that down there, in those weeds? I don't know. It looks like some kind of a shoe. Yeah. Yeah, it is a shoe. Yeah, see? What do you know? A Persian slipper. I took the slipper along as a souvenir for my scrapbook and walked back to my car, trying to fit Norma Delaney's lovely hazel eyes in with that crack on the skull. But I couldn't. Between throbs of my headache, I figured Pierre Gillum was why Norma had dropped in on the bottom so close to train time. I decided to go back and ask him. Gillum was as reliable as a two-headed quarter and just as tricky. So when I got to his apartment, I pushed the buzzer, stepped back, and braced myself. But there was no fight left in him. He opened the door in his robe, fingered the mouse I had given him, and grinned. Oh. <laughs> so you found your way out by yourself. Uh-huh. Say, Gillum, what was so important about Norma seeing Madame Jeanette just before a train left? I don't know. Uh, you know enough to try to keep me here to delay me? Why? Oh, Marlowe, I did that for old time's sake for an old friend. Jeanette asked me to hold you here until midnight, and I tried my best. <laughs> Obviously wasn't good enough. Well, that's all I know about it. I see your phone is off the hook, you know that? Yeah, I took it off. It's given me nothing but trouble tonight. I hereby wash my hands of this whole business. I'm going to bed. And I hope to sleep. Good night. <laughs> I envied him and left to call my client, Carl Delaney. He said he'd be in all night, but the phone kept ringing and ringing and no one answered. I suddenly got a very creepy feeling. And Twenty minutes later, I pulled to a stop at that small but elegant house. The lights were on and I saw the powder blue coupe in the garage next to Carl's big black sedan. I ran up the steps. The front door was ajar, so I went in. I found Carl Delaney in front of the fireplace. Face down on the floor, dead. There was a handbag on a chair. I opened it. Compact cigarettes. And a key to room 340 in the Bradford Arms Hotel. No identification. That color portrait of Norma was standing up on the table this time. And those searching hazel eyes seemed to follow me all the way to the telephone. Lieutenant Ibarra speaking. Phil Marlowe, Ibarra. There's a dead one at 1077 Hollycrest Road. Named Carl Delaney. Murdered. I'll be right out. I hung up the phone and then the hair on my neck crawled as I heard the unmistakable sound of a woman's heels on the floor upstairs. I ducked behind the door as the heels clicked down the steps. And then she entered the room. (laughs) 
Norma Delaney was lovely. As lovely as a picture. She moved calmly and deliberately. Put a note on the table, picked up the handbag. And then turned to face the door I was hiding behind. You can come out now, Mr. Marlowe. Hello, Mrs. Delaney. You can call me Norma now. And if you're thinking of using your gun, perhaps you'll be good enough to read this note first. Here. To whom it may concern, I, Norma Delaney, purposely and with premeditation, shot and killed my husband, Carl. It is beyond me to express how deeply I hate him, and since I must pay for this and cannot endure a public spectacle, I shall take my own life within the next few minutes. Now look, Norma, no guns. Easy, Marlowe. I'll kill you if necessary. But it would be so pointless now. I'm free at last, and I want to spend a little time left to me in my own way. Norma, if you'll listen to me, Stay just back. a minute. Tonight I made my only friend, Madame Jeanette, happy. And I killed a man who needed killing. Something good, something bad. So I'm quitting, even up. What do you propose to do with me? You mustn't try to stop me, Marlowe. See that closet? Mm-hmm. Get inside. And careful how you move your hands. Turn around to the wall. That's it. Marlowe, I'm sorry I had to hit you with Jeanette tonight. Goodbye. <laughs> took three shots to smash the lock on that closet door. I heard her driving away just as I got it open. In spite of what she'd said, I couldn't let her kill herself. I ran outside to my car. One glance under the hood was all it took. There was nothing left of the wiring but loose ends. I ran into the street and a miracle happened. The first time in my life, a taxi in Los Angeles when I wanted it. I'm sorry, fella. I'm going to call. Skip it. This is an emergency. Hey, wait a minute. You Police can't... Police business. A girl is driving up the road in a blue coupe. we got to catch her before she kills herself. Let's go. I think I saw taillights just then. Yeah? Can't you go any faster? Not on these curves, brother. i got a wife and kids. Okay, fella. We'll be at the top of the hill when we can get around the next bend. We should spot her then. Yeah, you can see the whole road down the other side. Here we are, mister. This is the top. But I don't see her. Where is she? Hey, wait a minute. Stop here. Turn off your motor. This is haywire. I don't get it. We were gaining on her, and now she just disappears. What's that? A motor. That side road we passed. That's it. Hey, look. Look! saw the awful sight for just an instant. A powder blue coupe with a woman crouched over the wheel. It shot out of that side road, crashed through the guard rail, and fell end over end down into the gorge. By the time we got to the hole in the fence, the wreck was an inferno. No, no use trying to get down there. The whole hillside will be on fire in another minute. I guess she pulled over here into this side road and waited for us to go by. And we did. Yeah. Sandy here, too. So wonder she didn't get stuck. What's the matter? There's something buried here in the sand. One of her tires ran over it. What is it? Why, it's... It's plenty, brother. Come on, turn that hack of yours around. Let's get off this mountain. I just found the answer to a lot of questions. That you, Marlowe? Yeah, Lieutenant. We found the body and the wife's suicide note. And one of the boys spotted that fire up on the hill. What is it? Car went off the road. An accident? Or the suicide? Just a little of both, Ibarra, but we'll talk later. Right now, we got to go to the Bradford Arms Hotel on the double. And please, no siren. The Bradford Arms was a three-story walk-up. And when we got there, Ibarra stationed one man in front, sent another to cover the back, and we started up the stairs. We had reached the second floor when we saw him on the landing above. Kill him. He spotted us at the same time and turned back fast. There, Marlowe. Who's that? That's our boy, Ibarra. Up here, Gillum. Let's go. There he goes. He's heading for the fire escape. Second lieutenant, he's all yours. I got business the other way. Hey! Hey, you stop or I shoot! Hey, 
Room 336, 38, ah, 340. Pull over now, you better drop the gun. Please, it's been neat so far. Don't mess it up. Come on, beautiful, drop it. That's better. Well, Marlow, I got him. I had to wing him to bring him down, but here he is. And uh, the lady must be... Uh... Yes, Lieutenant. The lady is Norma Delaney. The girl who wanted to kill her jealous husband and then commit suicide, but didn't want to die doing it. So she used someone else's body, Madame Jeanette's, which was a logical choice because Jeanette was blackmailing her. Thus, two vultures with one stone, leaving two lovebirds free to fly away together. Right, Norma? Didn't you give Madame Jeanette money so she'd leave town and tell everybody she was going away? Yes, I did. That way, the body wouldn't be missed, huh? Yeah. Isn't it pretty? Oh, lay off, Marlowe, can't you? Okay, Gillum, okay. Ellie Barra, I've got a sour taste in my mouth. I think I'll go home and goggle. Anything else you need? No, I guess not, Phil. I've had all that's necessary. Uh, wait. Just one thing. How do you get inside this setup? How do you find out it was the dead Madame Jeanette who went over the cliff instead of the very much alive Mrs. Delaney here? Well, Jeanette had on a pair of Persian slippers, Lieutenant. One fell off down at her cottage where Norma murdered her and put her in the trunk of the car. The other one fell off in the sand of that side road when she took Jeanette out of the trunk and propped her up behind the wheel. <laughs> it was lucky, Barra. Just dumb luck. I took a walk later. A long walk. All by myself. Through that thin, empty fog in the dark, empty streets. A pair of hazel eyes and a pair of Persian slippers went round and round in my head. And for some reason I kept thinking, a pair of Persian slippers has two soles, two heels. And it's hard to tell just exactly where the one becomes... Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore, and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, The Persian Slippers, Virginia Gregg was heard as Madame Jeanette, with Larry Dobkin as Pierre Gillum and Louis Van Rooten as Carl Delaney. The additional players were Gene Bates as Norma Delaney, Gil Stratton Jr. as the newsboy, Frank Richards as the barkeep, and Tony Barrett as Pinky. Detective Lieutenant Barrow was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again next week at the same time when Philip Marlowe says... Sounded good, real good. A weekend at Malibu, expenses paid with a cash bonus thrown in. But that was before I knew about the henchman, the redhead, and the corpse. These three and a white Panama hat ruined it all for me. The big star-studded array of CBS Sunday shows starts tonight. One, two, three, four, five top entertainment programs that make listening to your CBS station a happy habit. One, Cabin B-13... The popular dramatic show by John Dixon Carr, renowned mystery writer. Two, the new Electric Theater, guest starring Henry Fonda tonight. And regularly starring Helen Hayes, first lady of the theater when she returns from London. Three, Our Miss Brooks, the hilarious comedy success starring Eve Arden. Four, Lum and Abner, a brand new half-hour show of smiles and chuckles with the merchants of Pine Ridge. Five, Strike It Rich. The sensational quiz show with a heart to wind up the sparkling parade of entertainment. Mystery, drama, comedy, excitement tonight over most of these CBS stations. And next Sunday, the first broadcast in the new season for two of radio's greatest stars, Amos and Andy. Yes, Sunday nights are great on CBS. Check your local newspapers for program times. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Instant Ralston and Regular Ralston, the hot whole wheat cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Commander Corey, at the controls of the Terra 5, pilots the ship close to a strange, disc-shaped object floating above the planet Venus. Cadet Happy is on the disc in a spacesuit, reporting to the commander by spaceophone. Can you make anything out of those instruments and controls, Happy? No, sir. They're nothing like you'd find in a spaceship or artificial satellite. And besides, they're not even connected. The disc seems to be defying gravity. Don't touch anything, Hap. These wires are just hanging loose. Looks like they've been yanked away from the... Hey, Commander, what's wrong? The disc is falling. Falling toward Venus. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure... In the Claw of Venus. Hi, Space Patrollers. Captain Dick Tufeld here. You got a riddle for you this morning. You ready? Here goes. What can you see out of, but nobody can see in? The answer? Easy. The new sensational Monoview Outer Space Helmet. It's a whole foot high, slips on right over your head, and rests on your shoulders. Yes, sir, it's a neat, complete disguise. And wait till you get your first look through that special one-way eye plate. It's like magic. You're whisked right out of this world into a strange, purple, glowing planet. You see everything clear as day, but tinted with a weird purple glow. And what's more, the Monoview Outer Space Helmet has a gleaming red and jet black lightning flash hood. And swell, real-looking oxygen tanks and breathing tubes printed right on. But best of all, this helmet is yours for only 25 cents and a box top. Now, gang, here's how you get it. Just buy a box of Good Hot Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant or regular Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer is good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. And now, here's a special Space Patrol flash. Immediately following today's adventure, Commander Corey will announce the name of the grand prize winner in the Name the Planet contest. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure in the Claw of Venus. Commander Corey's space battle cruiser, the Terra 5, skims low over the mountains of the planet Venus. Controlled by Cadet Happy, sensitive infrared beams reach through the heavy, dark mist to feel the shapes of the craggy peaks below. Toward the east, eerie blue flashes of lightning signal the approach of a storm. With his eyes on the viewscope screens and a bank of instruments, Buzz Corey threads the needle-nosed ship through its hazardous course. We're nearly there, Happy. The probe beam should be picking out Charn's tower any minute now. We sure got a break from that storm, sir. We'll be right on top of him before he knows we're coming. Unless one of his men tipped him off. Even if they did, he wouldn't have time to dispose of the stolen zolonite. I hope not. But to prove our case, we've got to find more than five pounds of zolonite on Charn's premises. Five pounds? Well, a hundred pounds were stolen from Saturn. I know, but zolonite is so rare that the government knows the location of every bit of it. Not counting the stolen supply, of course. Well, then Charn has five pounds of it legitimately. That's right. Well... Commander, isn't that a tower up there ahead on the side of the mountain? That's it, Hap. As we land, we'll not lose any time getting out of the ship. If Sean does have the Zolanite, we're in for trouble. Near the summit of a mountain, Sharn's tower rises into the mist, dwarfing two squat stone buildings huddled at the base. In the top chamber of the tower, Gaston Sharn barks instructions to his assistant, Richard Durant. Durant, did you hear what I said? Uh, what was that, Sean? I said 10,000 volts. What's the matter with you today? Oh, it's that storm. I don't like working here in this kind of weather. It makes me nervous. Afraid of thunder. I thought you were supposed to be a scientist. It's not the thunder, it's the lightning. And here we are in this tower with all this apparatus. 10,000 volts, Mr. Durant, if you please. All right. 9250, 9500... Ninety-eight hundred. Look out! It's too much. I warned you. The circuit's overloaded. Well, put in a heavier coil. What's that? 
It's a spaceship. It's landing. I told you we'd get into trouble. How do you know we're in trouble? Look, it's a space patrol ship. The Zolanite. We'll have to hide it. How can we hide it? It's already inside an endurium shield welded to an endurium platform. But, Sean, what'll we do? Go down and meet them. Keep them out of the tower, if possible, and try to keep that guilty look off your face. They probably aren't looking for Zolanite anyway. But what if they are? I know my rights, Durant. You just keep your mouth shut and let me do the talk. Hurrying down to the living quarters in one of the low buildings adjoining the tower, Gaston Sharn hastily spreads several technical books on a table and then settles himself in a chair in an attitude of leisurely concentration. A moment later, Durant greets Buzz and Happy and leads them into the study. Well, gentlemen, this is a welcome break in a monotonous day. Yes, sit down, won't you? No, thanks. Your name is Sharn, isn't it? Yes. And uh, you you must be Commander Corey by your insignia. Yes. I'll get right to the point, Sean. I have a warrant from the Venus Justice Department authorizing a complete search of your premises. I'm afraid I don't understand, Commander. A search? What for? Sean, a hundred pounds of Zolanite was stolen from the government freight depot at Saturn City. A hundred pounds? <laughs> well, I didn't know there was that much Zolanite in the universe. How much do you have here? Oh, uh, about five pounds. Happy, hand me the Zolanite detector. Yes, sir. Here you are. Now, let's see what we can pick up. It's working all right, Commander. Of course it is. Five pounds of zolanite is enough to set up quite a reaction. It's true. It could be five pounds 20 feet away or a hundred pounds 400 feet away. How about it, Sean? Can you move 20 feet and produce your zolanite? Mm, perhaps the storm has some confusing effect on your detector. Very unlikely. Judging by the indicator, we'll find some zolanite up in your tower. Let's have a look. Cut the detector half. Come on, Sean. Very well, if you insist. You and Durant lead the way. Very well. Through this door, gentlemen. This corridor leads to the tower. Look out! I'm Open rockets! struck by lightning. I told you, I told you, Sean. Get a grip on yourself, Durant. You're not hurt. Yeah, if you'd been uh, hit by lightning, you wouldn't be able to brag about it. A bolt hit the tower, just like I said it would. Well, we're not hurt. We'll go up and investigate. No, no. The tower is damaged. What if the lightning strikes again? Commander. Uh, yes, Hap. That flash must have put the Zolanite detector out of commission. See, it isn't picking up a thing. That's strange. You didn't get a shock or a burn, did you? No, sir. You better not risk the elevator after that bolt. We'll use the stairs. I'll go first. Happy watch Durant and Sean. The lab is right through that door, Commander. Smoke and rockets. What happened to the roof? A bolt of lightning blasted out the whole top of the tower. Yeah, and it wrecked the floor, too. It's lucky it didn't collapse. I, I don't understand it. What do you mean, Durant? That huge endurium platform, it's disintegrated, vanished, just like it never existed. Hmm. The walls are seared, but there's hardly any trace of molten metal. Strange. Happy, try that detector again. Yes, sir. It's working, sir, but it's sure a low reading. It's probably picking up this small fragment of zolanite. Yes, that's zolanite, all right. Which proves that your detector is working, and in turn proves that I do not have the stolen 100 pounds of this stuff. Yeah, it looks like the lightning destroyed all our evidence, Commander. And in that case, I should appreciate it if you gentlemen would leave... So I may silently contemplate my tragic loss. All right, Sean. There's nothing I can do now but watch your step. Next time it'll take more than a bolt of lightning to save you. Come on, Happy. Returning to their ship, Buzz and Happy head back to Venus City. Doggone it, sir. That storm couldn't have done Sean a bigger favor if it had it made to order. Space control, Venus City calling all spaceborne traffic using approach lane 3, level 7. Emergency warning. An unidentified object has been reported hovering at a distance of 17 DUs over Venus. Ships approaching in lane 3, level 7, use caution. This disc-shaped object last reported hovering over the following position. Get this happening. Yes, sir. Latitude 15 degrees, 23 minutes north. Longitude 97 degrees, 2 minutes, 15 seconds east. Altitude 17 DUs. Space control, Venus City out. I wonder what it is, Commander. Whatever it is, it should be removed. Have you checked its location on the chart, Hap? I'll have it in a second, sir. Uh, it's uh, just about here. Oh, that's right near us. Yes, sir. Turn on the space phone, Hap. Right. 
Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Space Control, Venus City. Commander Corey to Space Control, Venus City. Space Control, Venus City, go ahead, Commander. I'm checking on your report of this unidentified object. What's being done to remove it from the space lane? Nothing as yet, Commander. Colonel Yeager is waiting for a report from Space Platform Observatory Number 2. They're trying to identify the object. You said it was disc-shaped. How big is it? About 20 feet in diameter and quite thin and flat. There's no sign of rocket power or any other force. It's been over that same position on Venus for more than an hour. It just seems to hang there. And that's all the information I have, sir. All right, Space Control. Inform Colonel Yeager that I'm going to investigate this object. Corey out. All right, Hap, we'll have a close look at this thing. Get your spacesuit on in case we have to attach a line and tow it out of the space lane. Moments later, Buzz and Happy bring their spaceship close to a gleaming metal disk. They circle it at a velocity just high enough to counteract the gravity pull of the planet Venus, 17 DUs below them. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. It's not under power. There's no sign of any rocket burst. And it's certainly unmanned. Yeah, the disk is too thin for anything larger than a dog to be inside it. I wonder what that stuff is on top. Uh, some sort of electrical equipment, maybe? What's it connected to? See those cables dangling? Commander, uh, since I've got my spacesuit on, why can't I board that disc and examine it? Well, all right, Hap, but watch your step. Skillfully, Buzz matches the velocity of his ship to that of the strange disc as Happy stands in the airlock with the outer hatch open. Carefully, Buzz maneuvers the Terra 5 closer to the disc. And Happy crosses over. I made it, sir. I'm on the disc. Remember, Hap, this isn't outer space. If you slip here, you go down. And 17 DUs is a long way to fall. I'll be careful, sir. I'll drop back so I can see you better through the nose port. Can you make anything out of it, Hap? Not yet. But somehow I get the feeling that this whole object is part of something else. What makes you think that? Well, the bolts and brackets on the disc. It looks like it had been fastened to something and pulled loose. And these controls, they're nothing like anything you'd find in a spaceship or artificial satellite. And besides, they're not even connected. Well, don't touch them, Hap. Never can tell. These wires are just hanging loose. It looks like they've been yanked away from... Hey, Commander, what's wrong with the ship? You're moving away. It isn't the ship, it's you. The disc is falling, falling toward Venus. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, Space Patrollers. Captain Twofeld again. Right now, I'm in the mail room at Space Patrol headquarters. You hear that? That's our stamping machine pounding away like mad. Just listen to those packages going down that mail chute. Man, oh man, it seems like just about every Space Patroller in the universe wants one of those terrific Monoview Outer Space helmets. There are hundreds, no, thousands of orders coming in. Say, how about you? Have you sent for your helmet yet? The one and only Outer Space helmet you can see out of, but nobody can see in. The wonderful helmet with honest-to-goodness-looking oxygen tanks and breathing tubes printed right on it. The sensational helmet with the gleaming lightning flash hood and specially constructed outer space ear plates. The helmet that's just like the one Commander Corey wears. Now, to get one, just buy a box of Good Hot Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents and an instant or regular Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol... Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Now, space patrollers, if you've already sent away for your Montevue Outer Space Helmet, you may have to wait a few extra days. You see, we've been getting so many orders, the Space Patrol mail room is swamped and working overtime to get them out. So you better hurry now, because this offer soon ends. Send for yours today. And remember, stand by, space patrollers, for the name of the grand prize winner in the Name the Planet contest in just a few minutes. <laughs> And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure in the Claw of Venus. Returning from the remote mountain laboratory of Gaston Chain, who was suspected of stealing a supply of rare, valuable minerals, Zolonite, Buzz and Happy rose high above the surface of Venus to investigate a strange, disc-shaped object that unaccountably remained suspended over one position on Venus. Donning his spacesuit, Happy stepped from the airlock of the Terra 5 onto the disc to examine it. He touched a dangling piece of wire. There was a flash, and the disc sharply responded to gravity, falling toward Venus, carrying Happy with it. As Commander Corey hastily maneuvers the spaceship, Happy drops away with rapidly increasing velocity. Happy, can you hear me? Yes, Commander. I'm going to try to get you off that disc before you fall into the Venus atmosphere. Happy, how much space between you and the airlock? 
about 50 feet. Have we matched velocity? Yes, sir. Uh, the ship and this disc are falling at the same rate. I'm going to pull over closer. Guide me. That's it, Commander. A little more. More. Hold it. I can reach the airlock now. Okay, climb aboard. I'm going to have to pull out of this trajectory, and I'm going to try to take the disc with us. Apply magnetic holding field. Yes, sir. It's in the field, sir. We've got it. I hope we can hold it on a sharp pullout. It's an awful strain on the hull of the ship. I'm afraid it's too late. It seems a shame to cut it loose. Check the infrared viewscope, Hap, to see where the disc will land if it continues this trajectory. Yes, sir. Ah... Uh... It'll land in the Venus Sea, or along the coast, somewhere in the Gartoga Mountains. Commander, what's that? I just turned on the Zolanite detector. Something must be wrong. There's no Zolanite around... Hey, on the disc. Right. We'll try to make the disc land where we can recover it again. Cut magnetic holding field. We'll track it in the viewscope and see where it falls. Keep it centered half while I level off. Yes, sir. I don't get it, Commander. Zolanite out here on that disc? Well, how did it get there? Remember that hole in the roof of Sharn's Tower? Yeah, the lightning. Wouldn't you say that hole was the same size and shape as the disc? Why, well, yes. <laughs> then that disc was in Sharn's Tower. It's the Endurium platform Durant said was disintegrated. Oh, that's why we didn't see any molten metal. The whole platform shot up through the roof. But well, what made it stay suspended 17 DUs above Venus? The tremendous voltage in that bolt of lightning produced some peculiar effect on the Zolanite. And it nullified gravity. It's the only explanation. Maintained the momentum of Venus's rotation on its axis, but soared upward till it reached a point of equilibrium. A new force. Wow. Uh, think what that'll mean to space travel. Hey, we've got to recover that disk and, and have some experts check it. Yes, but first I want two particular experts to check it. The men that accidentally discovered this new force. Charn and Durant? Right. When they see the viewscope microfilm of that disk and learn where the object landed, I think they'll get just a little bit... Several hours later, Sharn and Durant sit watching the Interplanet News telecast. The strange disc-shaped object that has been hovering over Venus has crashed. Mm, turn that up, Durant. Yes, Sharn. The pilot of a space patrol ship sent to investigate the gravity-defying disc reports that the object suddenly descended toward Venus, mm. landing on the coast of the Venus Sea in the Gartoga Mountain region. Because of the difficulty of recovering the object, the space patrol will delay further investigation for several days pending the arrival of a team of experts from Saturn. Now, here is a portion of viewscope microfilm taken from the space patrol ship sent to investigate the disk. Look, Durant, you recognize it? It's the Endurium platform from the lab. This is the mysterious object that now lies in the area known as the Claw of Venus. And now, items from the universe of sports. Put it Today off. in Mercury Stadium... I've got to act quickly, Durant. What do you mean? We've got to get to the Claw of Venus and recover the Zolanite before those space patrol scientists get there. But sure... Don't you... argue. You realize we're the only ones in the universe who know that Zolanite can neutralize gravity? I don't like it. It's dangerous. Don't be a fool. We can control high voltages. Quick now. Get some cutting tools. Then we'll blast off for the Claw of Venus. Miles away, where huge breakers of the Venus Sea batter at the bluffs, a gleaming disk of endurium lies embedded in shattered rocks on the shore. In a small cave nearby, two men in space patrol uniforms wait patiently. I think they'll fall for it, Commander? I think they will, Happy. Not only to get the Zolanite back, but to protect themselves. Charn knows that if we find the Zolanite, we can prove this endurium platform came from his lab. I hope they come pretty quick. Tide's coming in. In a few hours, this will all be underwater, including the disc. Yeah. Hey, Commander, you hear that? It's a ship. Coming in for a landing on top of the bluff. It must be Sharn. From their vantage point in the cave, Buzz and Happy watch Sharn and Durant make their way down the steep cliff and start to work. What did we lug that electro welder down here for? When we get the Solonite out of the container, I want to seal things up a little, just to confuse the experts. Well, I'm in favor of getting the Zolanite and heading back to the ship. The experts will know this disk has been tempered, but just from the marks of the Atomo torch. They might think the metal was fused by air friction in the fall. After all, it dropped 17 to you. All right, Sean Durant, drop those tools. Corey. Uh, Happy, take Sean's glass gun. Yes, sir. And give me that Atomo torch, too, Sean. Why, of course. Here. Why, you... Slug them, Durant. 
Sharn, let go of that torch. <laughs> Come on, Durant. Run for the cliff. But we can't this far. Let's finish them up. They're still conscious. Corey's got his ray gun. Come on. Keep behind the rocks and run for the cliff. Halt! Stop where you are. Halt! We're safe. Up the cliff to the ship. You've still got your blast gun. We can pick them off. Then get to Zola and I. Why use a blast gun on Corey and the cadet when we can get the same results another way? Halt! When we're past that first ledge, we'll blast the cliff with a gun. That'll leave Corey with a, a perpendicular wall to climb. Hurry, Durant. Keep after them, Happy. Yes, sir. I'm still dizzy from the crack in the head with that Atomo torch. But I bet I can outclimb those two rats any day. Happy Duck, Charm's aiming his blast gun. <laughs> Smoking rockets, Commander. Look what he did. He blasted that overhanging rock. And there's no handhold, no foothold. Just a sheer cliff. And there they go, the rats. Commander, what are we going to do? The tide's coming in. We can't scale the cliff, that's certain. In a few minutes, the waves will be smashing us back against the cliff. We don't have a chance. Wait, I think we do. A long chance, but it's worth a try. Come on, let's get to the disc. To the disc? Yes. Do you remember what you touched up there when the disc started to fall? Well, yes, sir, that broken wire dangling from the panel. I accidentally brushed it against the endurium, and there was a flash, and I felt like I was going down in a fast elevator. Apparently, you discharged electricity that was stored in the Zolanite circuit, a charge that made the Zolanite resist gravity. Now, if we could restore that charge, perhaps the disk would rise again. But, Commander, what can we charge it with? There's an electro-welder Sharn left behind. That generates considerable current. As much as a bolt of lightning? No, but perhaps we don't need that much. Well, it's worth a try. It'll mean taking the electro-welder apart with the Atomo torch and rewiring it to the connections on the disk. Let's get to work. Swiftly, Buzz and Happy work with the tools. Then, as the surf begins to surge around them, Buzz makes a final connection and they stand in the center of the Endurium disk. All right, Happy. Take it easy. Start the electro-weld generator. Very low at first. Nothing's happening, sir. Give it more voltage. Steady now. This takes hold suddenly. Maybe the circuit was wrecked when the disc landed on the rocks. Hey, it's beginning to move. I can feel it. Look, we're rising. Hold it, Happy. Hold it right there. We're a few inches off the ground. I'll get off and give the disc a shove toward the cliff. And we can ride up the face of the cliff and jump off at the top. Hey, that's right. It wouldn't be much good to us if just suspended in empty air. It's hard to move, Hap. Why is that? It's weightless now. As far as Venus gravity is concerned, it's weightless, but it still has its mass and inertia. Now it's moving toward the cliff, sir. The inertia will carry it the rest of the way as we ascend. All right, Happy. Increase the voltage slightly. Here we go, sir. Hold us steady, Hap. We're rising fast enough. Well, we made it. Yes. I wonder if Corey's got his feet wet by now. Uh, let's walk down to the edge of the cliff a ways. We can't tell from here. All right. After all, we should shout goodbye before we blast off. Why shout? We're right here. Uh, no. Let's get him, Hap. It'll be a pleasure. I think that'll take care of him. Frankly, I'm sorry. It's over so soon. I guess they don't have much fight left after that climb. Oh. How did you get up the cliff? On your gravity disk. You you worked the gravity disk? That's right, Sharn. Uh, the idea came to the commander like... Uh, like... Uh, like a flash of lightning. An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Smoking rockets, I must be getting space happy. I'm seeing double again. Hey, who are you guys anyway? A couple of twin giants from Jupiter or uh, or twin space pirates from Pluto? Well, we can see you, Cadet Happy. Yeah, clear as day. Yeah, but I can't see you. Hmm. I know. Because you've got your Montevue outer space helmets on. Pretty neat, huh? Got oxygen tanks printed right on our helmets and big red lightning flashes on the hood. Pretty keen? You betcha. More than a foot high. Covers up our whole hips. Nobody can tell who we are. Yep, you're real space patrollers, all right. Sure are. But jump in Jupiter, who are you anyway? Oh, come on, tell me. I'm Space Patroller Donnie Smith reporting, sir. 
Space Patroller Johnny Smith here, sir. <laughs> well, you guys sure had me fooled, that's for sure. And say, Space Patrollers, how about it? Why don't you send for your own swell new Monoview Outer Space Helmet? You know, you just buy a box of good hot Ralston, then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and the instant or regular Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis 1, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis 1, Missouri. Get going right away, today. And now, Space Patrollers, here's the big news. In just two seconds, Commander Corey will tell you the name of the grand prize winner in the Name the Planet contest. Commander Corey here. The name of the grand prize winner, the space patroller who wins my giant rocket clubhouse with a big motor truck to pull it and $1,500 cash is... Ricky Walker. Ricky Walker of 315 Wagner Street, Washington, Illinois. Congratulations, Ricky. And space patrollers, be sure you're listening next week for more exciting news about the winners of the Name the Planet contest. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. At the end of a secret cavern on Saturn's eighth moon, a strange spaceship waits for the precise instant to blast off. Buzz and Happy, helpless at the point of a deadly heat gun, are forced down the cavern toward the ship. Hurry up, both of you. There isn't much time. Listen to us, Zobanek. These people or creatures or whatever they are, they've got some hold over you. Sure, Zobanek. You'll be sorry the instant the ship blasts off. I know what I'm doing. You'll be sorry if you aren't aboard. You mean you'll use that heat gun on us? I won't have to. That's the first warning. If we're not aboard that ship in three minutes, we'll all be finished in that rocket blast. Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Exiles from Denebola, when Instant Ralston and Regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Debray. Other players were Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, Bela Kovach, and Dick Beals. Dick Tufeld speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Instant Ralston and regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! <laughs> This is Dick Tufeld in Los Angeles with the story of one of the fastest planes in the world and a word from the man who test flies it, Joe Lynch. It's North American's Air Force F-86D Sabre Jet Interceptor. Speed well over 700 miles per hour. Wingspan is 37 feet. Length 41. Cruising range 500 miles. Now by special tape recording made at International Airport, a well-known test pilot of the Sabre, Joe Lynch. The D is a one-man interceptor, so when you fly it, you're really on your own. That's why I see to it that I'm in good condition all the time. And one way to stay in good condition is by eating a good breakfast cereal, like rice checks or wheat checks. They're just packed full of energy, and they taste well. I think you'll like them, too. No other cereal puffed or flaked contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. So take a tip from Joe Lynch, George Welch, and other top test pilots. Make your cereals rice checks and wheat checks. <laughs> Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story in your local ABC television station. Consult your local newspaper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Rice checks and wheat checks. The bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present... Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, a saboteur has just escaped from a locked compartment aboard the Terra 5. Now, with ray guns drawn, Buzz and Happy are searching the ship. He still must have that special spacesuit on, sir. At least it wasn't in the compartment. How did he get out? Smash the door. Oh, tough customer. Now, there he is. After him, Hap. Hold where you are, I'll fire. He's heading for the weapons compartment. This'll stop him. <laughs> 
Wow, that ray gun never even phased him. That suit, he's completely shielded. Come on, we'll have to tackle him. He's in that compartment with all the weapons. All right, Halcorn, come out of there. Come and get me. You'd better have something better than a ray gun, because I can drop you if you take another step. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure, The Test of the XK-3. <laughs> One bowl of rice checks. Here you are, Commander. Thank you. Me, I'll have wheat checks. Hi, Space Patrollers. This is Commander Corey. And Cadet Happy, having ourselves a top breakfast with our favorite cereals. Checks. Rice checks and wheat checks, Space Patrollers. Tops for taste. Terrific tasting out of the box or out of the bowl. Smoking rockets, they're delicious. Checks are tops for size. Size just right for easy eating. You know something, Space Patrollers? That neat bite size makes checks taste even more delicious. Right, Hap. And gang, a good nourishing breakfast with checks is tops for get up and go. Official Space Patrol get up and go, just like the commander has. So go get them, Space Patrollers. Checks, rice or wheat, in the red and white checkerboard packages. With a picture of me or the swell picture of Cadet Happy on the outside and the free Space Patrol trading card inside. Say, Commander, how about another bowl of checks? This time, I think I'll have rice checks. Make mine wheat checks. <laughs> And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the test of the XK-3. Commander Corey faces the problem of capturing Valmer Castro, a criminal whose already clever mind has been transformed into a superintelligence by means of an ingenious brain sensitizer. But as far as the public is concerned, the escaped crime genius is of minor importance compared to a coming race from Pluto to Neptune to test a new space drive for interplanetary flight. Even in Space Patrol headquarters on the man-made planet Terra, the race seems to have taken priority over the search for Castro. In the central office, Buzz Corey focuses a pinpoint tracer beam on a gigantic space chart as Cadet Happy looks on. This will show you the relative positions of Pluto and Neptune, Happy. Yes, sir. They're in opposition to the sun. Right. They're as far apart from each other as they can ever get. Nearly 7 billion miles, or more than 250 million DU. Wow, that'll be some race. Mm -hmm. It's the longest straight line distance between any two relatively stable points in the solar system. Yes, sir. But if the distance is the object, why not race the two ships clear around the orbit of Pluto? Uh, that may come later, huh? But if the XK-3 performs the way we think it will, no further test or demonstration will be necessary. Well, then you think the XK-3 is sure to win. Well, it's too early to be certain about something as new and revolutionary as the new space drive, Happy. Well, from what I hear, nobody but a lot of old fogies think the Atlas stands a chance. Well, I wouldn't call a man an old fogey merely because he puts his faith in something that's been proved dependable. The Atlas has covered billions of DUs with the standard drive. I'd sure like to be aboard the XK-3, Commander. No one is going to be aboard either ship. Each will be robot controlled. Oh, to keep the human element out of the contest, huh? At the present stage, the XK-3 space drive isn't shielded against radiation. Oh? If the test is successful, shielding will be installed, but it'll be pretty expensive to shield a unit that probably will have to be pulled apart anyway for a checkup. All right, Happy, suppose we forget about the race and settle down to work. Huh? And that means Volmer Castro... Any leads on him yet, sir? Well, we're checking on his past associates. Yeah, but now that he's got his super brain, he'll probably get himself a new gang. Crook's more in keeping with his high IQ. That's undoubtedly what Castro wants to do, but it'll take time. Smart as he is, Castro can't go it alone. He's wanted by the space patrol. He'll need help. Obviously, no honest man will help him. So he'll have to contact some of his old gang. Right. The doctor's cerebroscope didn't put facts or knowledge in Castro's brain. It only made his brain more able to use the facts that are already there. Right now, he'll use that intelligence to gratify his old selfish motives and weaknesses. Well, uh, what are his weaknesses, sir, outside of stealing? That's what we want to find out from his former associates. Let's contact Captain Damon and see if he's picked up any of Castro's old gang. Elsewhere, in a small community on the planet Mars, Balmer Castro seems entirely unconcerned by the fact that he is number one on the space patrol list of wanted criminals. His penetrating eyes never leave those of his visitor, a tall, burly spaceship technician named Grant Halcorn. You understand, Halcorn? You leave at once for the Pluto test base. Your traveling instructions are in this folder. Well, look, Mr. Casco, I, I don't know about getting inside the base. It's all been arranged. We'll have no trouble if you keep your mouth shut. Once you're aboard the XK-3, well, you know what to do. I suppose they make a check of the ship before blastoff. Of course they will. But they won't be looking for stowaways. Not in that gear compartment, smack up against the space drive unit. Now, they'll be too interested in checking instruments and controls. I'm worried about that spacesuit, Mr. Castro. Doesn't seem like much protection. It's been thoroughly tested. 
You'll have done your work and be out of the ship before a harmful dose of radiation has a chance to penetrate. Yeah, if I can stand the exhilaration. That suit's awful bulky. Suppose I can't move to the escape hatch. The XK-3 won't be given high acceleration until the flight's well underway. By that time, well, you'll have made the necessary adjustments to the robot controls to prevent acceleration. Mm, sure. And then I bail out as a ship crosses the Jupiter orbit. That's right. Your jetpack will be sufficient to give you a trajectory away from the XK-3's vector. And I'll pick you up. Okay, Mr. Castro. I got this, Halcorn. I've got a considerable sum of money on this race. The XK-3 is the heavy favorite. If the Atlas wins, I'll have 10 million credits to set up my organization. Now, don't worry. The XK-3 won't stand a chance. Naturally. Two days later in Space Patrol headquarters, Boz and Happy checked through data Space Patrol agents have supplied on Castro and former members of his gang. On the huge space chart, two small lights, one red, one green... Move with agonizing slowness sunward from Pluto. Despite the temptation to watch the progress of the race, Happy diligently checks the reports. What a bum this guy Castro is, Commander. Even his pals can't trust him. Here are six guys who've told our agents that if they even saw Castro again, they'd bust him in the jaw. Well, they might have said that just for effect. Did any of them say why they were angry at him? Yes, sir. They're all sore about the same thing. Castro made bets with them and then welched when he lost. But he always collected when he won. Hmm. Very interesting, Happy. Very interesting. We've just learned something quite useful about Castro. We have? Yes. He's a gambler. Yeah, and very unsportsmanlike. I'll notify our undercover men to keep an eye on suspected big-time gamblers. They'll need cooperation from local authorities on that. Gambling is out of space patrol jurisdiction. Well, some guys will gamble on anything. I know a mechanic who's betting on the Atlas. Imagine a guy who's supposed to know something about spaceships and he bets against the XK-3. Well, perhaps out of sense of loyalty, Happy. You know how fond you can get of a spaceship, whether you fly it or help repair it. Well, he's one of those old fogies who doesn't like anything new. <laughs> we must have a lot of old fogies in the universe, Happy. A lot of intelligent people think the Atlas will win. People must be crazy. The odds are 20 to 1. And look at the chart, sir. The Atlas blasted off ahead of the XK-3, and already the XK-3 is gaining. The race has just started. Neptune is still millions of DUs away. Uh, well, the only way the Atlas can win is for somebody to fire a space torpedo into the XK-3. Well, if you're worried about somebody blasting the XK-3, forget it. I have assigned patrol ships from every planet to guard the race vector. Oh, the lucky guy that drew the assignment for Terra. Uh, who got it, sir? Happy, uh... I volunteered to patrol the terror sector, and now you'd like to go along? Would I? Smoking rockets? I I mean, uh, well, yes, sir. Well, there's plenty of time. The lead ship isn't even to the Saturn orbit yet. Yeah, the Atlas is leading. Uh, but I bet the first ship we see is the XK-3. Here it comes, Commander, and right on vector. Yes, fairly close to schedule, too. Adjust the view scope sensitivity control hat. Let's see which ship it is. Oh, it's the XK-3, of course. What else could... Hey. Commander, it's the Atlas. Why shouldn't it be the Atlas? It blasted off first. It's the total elapsed time that determines the winner. Well, yes, sir, but the way the XK-3 was gaining at first... I'll check with Pluto. Vanacori aboard Terra-5 calling Pluto Space Control, XK-3 robot testing section. Cory to XK-3 testing section. This is XK-3 testing section. Go ahead, Commander. The Atlas just passed Terra Patrol segment of the test vector, approximately on schedule. Yes, sir. We've been monitoring the Atlas control section. The Atlas was thrown off a vector by meteors outside the Saturn orbit. Velocity was reduced, and vector changed to avoid meteors. The Atlas is now back on plotted vector, but behind schedule. What about the XK-3? We are having trouble, sir. What kind of trouble? Well, Colonel Balcom thinks it's the space drive. Acceleration hasn't developed as it should. Could it be the robot controls? No, the colonel doesn't think so. The new space drive responded perfectly beyond the limit of previous tests. But now there seems to be a uh, dampening off, as the colonel expressed it. And you can't compensate by adjusting the robot controls? We'll try that, Commander. The trouble showed up near the Jupiter orbit. We are in complete control here on Pluto, except that the space drive seems to choke itself off. The colonel described it as a self-limiting function inherent in the drive force. Acceleration is becoming deceleration. But I would be glad to relay any suggestion to the colonel. Colonel Balcom is in complete charge of the XK-3. There are no suggestions. Corey, out. Of all the rotten luck. In his private cruiser, Valmer Castro carefully adjusts his space phone receiver to a prearranged frequency while holding a vector some distance from that of the test course. 
I'll go into Castro. I'll go into Castro. Castro here. Keep your transmitter power as it is. I can read you. Uh, if you got a fix on this ship, I'm going to bail out. I've stuck with this crate too long already. Now, there was a reason. The Atlas was delayed by meteors. I didn't want the XK-3 to gain an advantage because of that. Uh, she's choked down now, Chief. The more they try to accelerate her from blue to control, the more she'll slough off. Good. Bail out. I'll pick you up. Listen, I'm only a speck in space. The momentum of the ship will carry me forward. I can mentally compute your trajectory when you leave the ship. And don't worry. I may have to hold off until patrol ships are out of range. I've got it in the view scope, sir. The XK-3. But it might as well be a century-old tub the way it's blooping along. I can't understand it, Hap. There's nothing in the short test of the XK-3 to suggest trouble like this with a new space drive. Somebody in Pluto robot control is goofing up. Oh, that's unlikely, Hap. Any defect in a robot control system would show up in the self-analyzer, the self-monitoring system. And you know as well as I. Hap, look at the viewscope screen, number three. Smoking rockets. What is it, a baby meteor? I don't think so. At any rate, it's receding from us. No meteor was ever that shape. Get a vector on it, Hap. Yes, sir. Hey, am I nuts? It looks like a man. A man in a space suit. You're right. Line him up in the vector computer, quickly. Well, what in the name of Jupiter's moons is he doing out there? Now, I've got it, sir. Unless he's changed course with a jetpack or something, this is the way it lines up. His vector would cross that of the XK-3. Yes, sir. But backtracking the XK-3 vector, the ship and the man were at the intersecting point at the same instant. Uh, either they came mighty close to a collision or... Or the man's trajectory began at the ship. In other words, he was aboard the XK-3. But that's impossible. Nobody could survive the radiation from the power unit. It's completely unshielded. I'm changing vector. We're going to overtake that man. Get into a spacesuit, half, and then into the airlock. Get ready to pull him aboard. In a few moments, the Terra-5 has adjusted its forward velocity to match that of the man in the spacesuit. In his own spacesuit, Cadet Happy waits in the airlock with the outer hatch open, ready to pull the man into the ship. Now the strange Voyager floats rigidly like an inflated toy a few feet from the open hatch as Happy directs Commander Corey by space phone. I've got him, sir. I'm pulling him in. Uh, careful. Is he armed? No, sir. He's got a new type of space suit. Thick metal. It, it looks like a... Uh-oh, my radiation indicator's clicking like mad. This guy's as radioactive as a ton of uranium. Get him after the decontamination compartment quickly. Following Commander Corey's orders, Cadet Happy takes the unresisting captive to the decontamination compartment, thrusts him in, and turns on the radiation neutralizers. Half an hour later, at the commander's request, Happy goes back aft to investigate, then rushes to the control compartment. Commander, he's gone. He, he's got out of the compartment. What? It's empty, sir. He must be hiding further aft. I'll cut on to automatic control. All right, come on. Have your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. He must still have that special spacesuit on, sir. At least it wasn't in the compartment. How did it get out? It smashed the door. Uh, but the radiation must have been neutralized. The decontaminator was off automatically. Uh, there he is. After him, Hap. All we are, I'll fire. Commander, he's heading for the weapons compartment. This will stop him. Wow, the ray gun never even phased him. That suit. It's completely shielded. Come on, we'll have to tackle him. He's in the compartment with all those weapons. All right, come out of there. Come and get me. And you better have something better than a ray gun, because I can drop you if you take another step. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Dick Tufel with news from Edwards Air Force Base, Murak, California. I've got an interesting story for you this morning about one of the most unusual-looking planes in the sky today, the XF-92A, designed by Convair Aircraft San Diego. Now, in just a second, I'm going to introduce you to the Air Force test pilot on that plane, Major Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound. But first, I'd like to tell you a few things about the XF-92A. It looks exactly like a triangle. It's often called the flying triangle. Wings are swept back at a severe angle, 60 degrees. Top speed of this Air Force interceptor is about 700 miles per hour. Service ceiling is over 45,000 feet. And it takes some doing to test fly a ship like that. You need energy, plenty of it. And to face the risk involved, you need steady nerves. And now let's hear what a real test pilot has to say about it. Meet Chuck Yeager. Let me tell you what it takes to be a test pilot. To start with, I have to be in good condition. That means get plenty of rest, plenty of exercise, 
good food at every meal. For breakfast, I like a cereal that really tastes good and has plenty of energy. Like rice checks and wheat checks, right, Chuck? Yes, checks are the cereals that are tops three ways. For taste, for size, for real get up and go. So make sure you keep yourself ready for action the way famous test pilots do. Pick your cereal for flavor and for energy. Today, get rice checks and wheat checks. And remember, they're tops with America's top pilots. <laughs> And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, the test of the XK-3. Buzz and Happy, patrolling the Terra segment of a test race vector between Pluto and Neptune, discover a man in a spacesuit, hurtling through space on an angle from the course of the XK-3. Buzz suspects the man has been aboard the robot-controlled XK-3, but does not know that he is Grant Halcorn, hired by Valmer Castro to sabotage the experimental ship. When Halcorn escapes from the radiation decontamination compartment, Buzz and Happy fire their ray guns at him, but with no result. Halcorn reaches the weapons compartment of the Terra 5 and threatens to shoot the space patrolman if they move. You might as well put up those ray guns. They won't penetrate this suit. If you come a step closer, I'll put you both to sleep. What'll we do, Commander? This ray gun will work on both of you, even through the cadet suit, and you know it. Well, what are you going to do? All right. Step out and let's talk it over. There's nothing to talk over. Just keep your distance, Commander. Just who are you, and what are you doing aboard the XK-3? Oh, you figured that out, huh? Well, I don't think there's any harm in telling you now. I'm Grant Halcorn. I was just making sure that the XK-3 wouldn't win the race against the Atlas. Who are you working for? What makes you think I'm working for anybody? Because really smart men don't run risks of radiation burns, even in shielded suits. The smart boys hire chumps like you to take all the chances. Now, is that so? Now, who would want the new spaceship drive to fail? Someone interested in standard drive ships? Maybe. No, Halcorn. Anyone in the industry would realize that one failure wouldn't stop progress. The only one who would benefit would be a man who would bet heavily against the favorite. In other words, a professional gambler. A gambler who refuses to take chances. Someone like Balmer Castro. All right, Corey. I haven't got time to listen to you. Get moving, both of you. I hit it right, didn't I, Halcorn? I said shut up. Go on. Move forward. You too. So smart, Corey. Well, this time you're up against some real brains. Hold it. Yeah, it's in this compartment. Never mind, I'll look myself. Yeah. Empty. In you go, Commander. Go on! Yeah. That'll hold Corey. Now, you, cadet, you're coming up forward and show me how to work your space phone. I've got to contact a certain party. All right, cadets, stand right where you are. If you move, I'll put you out cold with a ray gun. Got it? Sure, sure, big shot. Alcorn to Castro. Alcorn calling Castro. Castro here, go ahead. I'll make it short, Chief. Aboard Corey's flagship, the Terra 5, but don't worry, I'm in charge. You telling the truth? Sure. Commander's locked up in the compartment, and the cadet's here at the business end of a ray gun. Now, here's what I did. I'm I not thought... interested in details. We haven't much time. Head for Jupiter's fourth moon. You know the place I mean. Yeah, you bet. Land and come aboard. And we'll blast off for Venus and wait there until my men collect the bets. You'll collect, all right. The Atlas is sure to win. I know. Now, change vector for Jupiter Moon Number 4 as quickly as you can. Castro out. All right, Chief. So the commander was right. You are working for Castro. Shut up and take those controls. Head this ship to Jupiter Number 4. Now, don't try any cute antics. What's that? The meteor alarm? Yeah, I don't know. Smoke on rockets is the air system. There's a leak in the hull. Uh, where? Uh, check the indicator. There, see where that red light's flashing? Yeah, yeah I see. Well, where's the damage? In compartment three. We, we've got to get there quick. Well, take it easy. It's airtight, isn't it? You and I have got spacesuits on. Yeah, but Commander Corey's in there. He hasn't got a spacesuit. That's his tough luck. Uh, look, Halcorn, if you bring the commander into Castro alive, uh, isn't that going to boost your stock? Yeah, that's right. Well, then hurry. If we act quickly, maybe we can save him. All right, get going. Here's compartment three. Close your face piece. Okay. Come on, open the door. Hurry, Halcorn. We've got to work fast. Yeah. Hey, where's Corey? Where'd he go? Uh, drop that 
Henry, gun house corner. Drop it. I've got him happy. Raise his face, please. Yes, sir. And sit on him. He's hard to handle. All right, Halcorn. Just relax. Now, take it easy, oh. Halcorn. There's no hole in the hull. Oh, that's a relief, sir. But what set off the alarm? The thermostat in the bulkhead. The thermostat? But it'll only sound an alarm if it registers excessive cold or heat. It was heat that did it have friction from rubbing my belt against it. Let's get Halcorn out of that spacesuit so it'll be easier to handle. And we'll get him up forward. And Halcorn, if you know what's good for you, you'll talk. That's the straight truth, Commander. Castro's waiting for me on Jupiter's fourth moon. First, I'd like to restore the XK-3's robot controls to normal. Uh, there's nothing you can do about that, Corey. The XK-3 must be virtually in free fall by now. We take all the acceleration we can stand, we can overtake the XK-3 and correct those instruments. How can we locate the XK-3? Pluto Space Control is probably broadcasting periodic reports. Check that frequency. I'll get into Halcorn's shielded suit and be ready to go aboard. By the time Buzz has donned the heavy, cumbersome spacesuit, Happy has obtained a fix on the XK-3. It is still hurtling on toward Neptune at a steady velocity, but of course losing ground to the still accelerating Atlas. With Happy at the controls and Halcorn securely bound, the Terra-5 gains steadily on the XK-3. Then Commander Corey steps into the airlock, ready to transfer to the robot ship. With the space phone transmitter at low power, Happy contacts Buzz. We're alongside, Commander. Ready when you are, Hap. Apply magnetic holding field. Yes, sir. Airlock's joined, sir. Very good, Happy. I'm going aboard. Everything okay, sir? Yes, Hap. I'm at the robot instrument panel now. Can you fix it, sir? Yes, but I'd defy anybody to figure out what was wrong if they didn't know exactly what Halcorn did in here. He's made adjustments that gradually cancel out the control impulses from Pluto. I didn't think Halcorn was that bright. He just followed instructions. Castro is the genius. He's figured out the right combination to dampen the controls. Something that wouldn't happen by accident once in a million times. Wow. I've about got it reset, Hap. It'll take several seconds to build up the balance, which is lucky. It'll give me time to get back to Terra 5 before the space drive takes hold. I'll be ready to cut loose, sir. Do it the second I give the word, Hap. There. That's the last setting. Stand by. Standing by, sir. I'm in the airlock, Hap. Disengage holding field. Okay, sir. Smoking rockets. The XK-3 really took off. Are you okay, Commander? Yes. I'll go back to the decontamination compartment and neutralize this radiation. You set a vector for Jupiter's fourth moon. Following the directions of Grant Halcorn, Cadet Happy skims low over the surface of Jupiter's moon number four. Suddenly, below them, in a crater, Buzz and Happy see a private space cruiser. A few moments later, inside the cruiser, Valmer Castro watches with grim satisfaction as a figure lumbers across the floor of the crater in a bulky spacesuit. Then, as he hears steps in the airlock, he draws a ray gun and holds it behind his back. Well, Halcorn, raise your face piece and get out of that suit. It must be very uncomfortable. Hello, Castro. Corey! Hold it. Don't move. Oh, come now, Castro. A man of your intelligence should know that a ray gun can't penetrate this shielded suit. It might work at close range. You better hold it, Corey. I warned you. Hand over the gun. All right, Casper. Get into a spacesuit. I'm taking you aboard Terra 5. And get this simple fact into that super brain of yours. One false move and I'll... Castro, get that suit off, and we'll put you back aft with your friend, Halcorn. Prepare to blast off, Happy. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, what's so funny, Castro? Well, just amused. You know, when I'm discharged from the center, I'll be free of what you call my criminal tendencies. But I'll still have my superior intellect. I hope so. And I'll have more than that. I'll be a very rich man, Corey. And what will you be doing? Still risking your neck while every crook in the solar system hopes you'll break it. Frankly, that's what I like. But what makes you think you'll be a rich man? From the money I've won on the race. I can still collect, you know. Happy, get the Neptune Space Control Channel, will you please? Yes, sir. 
Bulletin NY-459. Repeating for all space patrol units. Neptune City Space Control. The robot cargo ship Atlas has just landed at the spaceport completing a non-stop flight from Pluto. See what I tell you, I won. The Atlas arrived just two hours and 15 minutes after the XK-3 broke all what? records. It's impossible. The XK-3 with its new space drive roared into victory despite a long delay that gave the Atlas a 10 million DU lead. Official figures of the XK-3's record run will be released at 0900 Universal Star Time. Neptune Space Control out. It, it can't be. I don't believe in gambling, Castro, but this is one bet you're going to pay in full. Ready for blast off, sir. Fire rockets. Fire rockets. Up, ship and away. In just a moment, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure brought to you by Nestle's Quick for the greatest tasting chocolate milk and those famous Nestle chocolate bars. Hey, gang, do you hear this at your house? Come and get it! Nestle's Quick! Yes, that's the Nestle's Quick Call, music to the ears of every Space Patroller. Quick makes the most delicious chocolate milk ever invented. It's rich, it's smooth, it's super chocolatey. Tastes just like those wonderful Nestle's chocolate bars. And say, you can make your own frosty glass of Nestle's Quick in no time flat, any time you want it. Because after you pour out your glass of milk, yes, I said after, then you just put in two spoonfuls of smooth chocolate quick powder and give it a little stir. And gang, that's all you have to do to make the chocolate milk that's real George. Mom will find Nestle's Quick in the big brown and yellow can, so ask her to get plenty because Quick is so full of vitamin D, it's better than good for you. Come and get it! Nestle's Quick! And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are testing a new spaceship out beyond the Saturn orbit. Suddenly, they find themselves on a collision course with another spaceship. That pilot must be crazy. He suddenly changed vector right toward us. He's not trying evasive action, so it's up to us. Fire starboard rockets. Commander, he's still coming at us. Half that ship is a robot-controlled guided missile. If we don't blow it up, it'll hit us. Stand by to fire space torpedoes. Standing by, sir. Fire one. Commander, the torpedo controls are jammed. We're going to crash! Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Image of Evil. <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Cameron Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston. Produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Deverick. <laughs> Other players were Bela Kovach, Norman Jolly, and Ken Mayer. Dick Tufel speaking. <laughs> Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday for the new exciting Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol was brought to you today by Rice Checks and Wheat Checks, the bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud! Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma brings you the young American actor whose sensational rise to stardom has been unparalleled in recent seasons. Mr. Alan Ladd. The suspense play which stars Alan Ladd and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called The One-Way Ride to Nowhere. So with this play and with the performance of Mr. Ladd as an adventurous young man named Tom Dwyer, Roma Wines again hope to keep you in suspense.
away, ladies and gentlemen, the thrill of a lifetime. It's safe and sensational, and the price is only a dime. A dime ten cents for the fastest and the fanciest ride in Ocean City. It's not a roller coaster, ladies and gentlemen. It's an experience. We give you the breathtaking dip over Moonlight Bay. We give you the tunnel of love. And it's the longest and highest and the very finest scenic railway in the world. How many good looking? Two tickets. Two it is. Now listen, Tom, is this really necessary? What's the matter with you? Come on, you scared? Well, I just don't like these things, that's all. I never have. Don't be silly. It's no worse than riding to a stick up in a prowl car. Yeah? Well, I never liked that either. Go on, go on, get in. Uh oh, no, not in the last seat. That is definitely out. Okay, okay. So we'll ride in the last seat the next time when you're over your stage fright. You'll ride in the last seat the next time. For me, this is strictly a one-shot proposition, and don't expect anything I've got different. Your safety belt, Mac. Everybody got their safety belt buckled? Okay, folks, you're on. Hey, hey, Tom, are we still alive? Well, can't you tell? All oh. right, folks, who's going to ride again? <laughs> what do you say, Benny? Want to try it again? Are you crazy? Come on, come on. It'll do you good. Don't tell me. This thing is a menace to health and sanity. What did I tell you? Look, there's a guy passed hey, out you. back come there. Come on, come on. Yeah? Snap out of it. Hey, come on. Get up, mister. Hey, somebody give me a hand with this guy. Here, here. Come here, I'll help you. Hey, all right, you get his legs. I'll take his head. Oh, I don't know why guys ride this thing if they're going to pull a fade out. Uh-oh. This guy didn't pull any fade out. Yeah, well, he ain't exactly the life of the party. You're right there, pal. He's dead. He, he's what? He's dead. Holy gee. Hey, well, I better call a boss. <laughs> All right, folks. You uh, just have to step outside the gates, please. Uh, wait I'm a sorry. Minute. There's been a little accident here. Everybody out, please. Go on, everybody out. Hey. What's the matter, Johnny? Ah, a guy passed out. The man there says he's dead. Oh, man. Every season, it's something. Please, folks, outside the gate. Yeah, go on. All right, stand stand back there. there. Stand back, everybody. What's the matter, Terry? That guy just died on us. Yeah? How come? I don't know. This man here looked him over. How do you know he's dead? You a doctor? No, officer, but it's uh, not too hard to tell. Where is he? Uh, Back in the last seat. Come on, keep the mob outside, will you, Terry? Sure. Come on, break it up now, will you? Break it up. This the guy? Yeah. Hmm. Looks like it must have been heart failure. It doesn't look to me like heart failure. Say, who are you? Dwyer's the name, Tom Dwyer. Yeah? Well, uh... Hey! I never seen this dead guy. He never bought a ticket for me. That's right, he never had a ticket. You mean he rode for free? How could he? He rode for free, all right. Say, how come you know so much about this? Me? Oh, I'm just kind of nosy. Hey, you. Uh, yeah? Do you remember seeing this man get on the car? How do I know? They get on, they get off. I just work here. Don't you remember that my friend and I were going to get in that last seat, and then we didn't? Hey, that's right. Hey, who's this? Ben Duffy's a friend of mine. Yeah? Yeah. Now, listen. My friend and I were the last ones to get in that car. We were going to take the last seat, and then we didn't. And the car pulled out. And when it pulled out, that last seat was empty. Mm. Hey, that's right. That last seat was empty. This dead guy never even got on the car. Yeah. Now you're getting someplace. All right, Dick Tracy, I'm listening. A roller coaster car starts out from this platform all hunky-dory and rips around the tracks about 90 miles an hour. And when it gets back here, there's a dead guy on it that wasn't on it when it started. How do you think he got on there? Dropped out of the sky? Well, figure it out for yourself, pal. If he wasn't in the car when it started, then someplace along the line he was dumped on it. And guys who have been dumped are generally guys who have been murdered. Murder is a rude and terrible customer always. But seldom indeed has this unwelcome guest intruded more incongruously than on this particular evening when he chose to be the extra passenger on a roller coaster ride. Alan Ladd is our star of suspense in Robert L. Richards' story, The One-Way Ride to Nowhere. You have heard the prologue for tonight's tale of suspense. Before we return to Ocean City, the scene of our drama... Let's take you for a moment to a pleasant spot to the south. Where are we now? Along the Caribbean, looking into a smart cafe. 
Capitan. Capitan. Si, senor. You have a fine port wine? I should like something special. Perhaps you... Uh... Ah, si, senor. Imported from California. A wine... Excellent. Roma, California port. It's true that in many countries of the world, distinguished Roma wines are imported. Red wines, white wines, dessert wines, sparkling wines. Prized and enjoyed by wine lovers of these countries as rare delights. In many parts of the world, it's been discovered that our own California's sun and soil, plus the skill of Roma's vintners, are to be thanked for some of the truly fine wines. Yet to Americans, Roma wines cost little, for we pay no excessive import duty or shipping costs. Yes, you can serve Roma wines often and proudly to your most knowing, most critical guest. For Roma wine is America's largest selling wine. And at only a few cents a glass, why not let Roma wines add their delight to your family meals and your family's enjoyment? Buy wine tomorrow and specify Roma, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that Roma wines bring back to our soundstage Mr. Alan Ladd in the one-way ride to nowhere. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Hey, Tom, where you been? We're all supposed to be waiting in here for the chief of police. Didn't make any phone call, that's all. Anybody I know? Jefferson Hotel. Do you know him? Huh? Hey, what's this all about? Oh, about $400,000 and a lot of people's lives. Uh Uh-oh, here comes the chief now. All right, quiet, everybody. Chief Haynes wants to say something to you. A man died under peculiar circumstances on the Ocean City roller coaster tonight. And all of you here were either on the car in which the body was found or in the immediate vicinity, like on the platform. Now, cause of death has not yet been determined. But all of you might be needed as witnesses. So we want to know where to get a hold of you. Have all these people been identified and left locations where they can be reached? Yes, sir. Well, then that's all. You can go now. Oh, uh, Chief Haynes. Well? I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Are these the two fellows you told me about, Johnson? Yes, sir. You're a pretty inquisitive young fellow, aren't you? Well, that's my business. By the way, Chief Haynes, haven't we met somewhere before? Not that I know of. What did you want to ask about? Well, for one thing, you said just now that the cause of death had not yet been determined. That's right. The man was blue in the face and apoplectic, but there were no marks of violence on the body. The coroner's working on it now. Maybe the coroner should look at the man's neck. At what? At his neck. Listen, you're no doctor, and neither am I. The coroner of this city knows his business. Okay, Haynes, okay. I just thought I might save him a little time. Well, you're wasting my time. If you think I'm going to give you an inside track so that you can go to this poor man's family with some sales talk that you can help him get some kind of a legal action. Oh, he's got a family, has he? Yeah, he's got a family. Now get out of here. Mm -hmm. And his name is Richard Elliston Brighton, and he's a professor of psychology, and he comes from Chicago, right? So you went through his pockets before my men got there. Now, did I say that? Listen to me, young fella. You know entirely too much about this case for your own good. You're from Chicago, too, aren't you? That's right. What are you doing here? On a vacation, visiting my friend here. Well, you better take it. Oh, hello, Doc. What about it? Uh, murder. He was strangled. Strangled? Mm-hmm. We got a good look at him. We found a thin red mark around his neck. He was strangled with something like, uh, picture wire. Now, isn't that a funny way for a middle-aged professor to be knocked off? Yeah, funny way for anybody to be knocked off. And isn't it a funny thing for a professor of psychology with a, with a family and all to be way out here all alone, so far from home, hanging around an amusement park? No funnier than what you're doing, hanging around here. And that's quite a coincidence, by the way, Mr. Tom Dwyer of Chicago. Chicago's a big place, Chief Haynes. Lots of people live there. Uh, say, Chief, what I think of it, here's the stuff we took out of his pockets. and Nothing much, wallet and a few things and... Uh, oop, dropped something there. I got it. Hand that over, Dwyer. Well, well, well. A souvenir postcard. Sheila Kennedy, Ocean City. Hey, she's quite a cutie, too. I said hand it over. It's material evidence. Sure, sure, sure. Here you are. One of the local tent show girls, I take it. Know anything about her, Chief? Now, listen, Dwyer. I got enough on you already to hold you on suspicion. Take my advice and keep your nose out of this. Come on, Tom. This isn't doing you any good. Yeah, that's right, Ben. And anyway, we got a date with a lady. (laughs) 
They're lovely. They're luscious. They're delightful and they're dairy. The most gorgeous girls. The hey, uh, Bud, can we go in now? Yeah, what did she say? What's that? I said, can we go in now? Oh, yeah. Okay, fellas, down there, the second door. I tell her about you and she says it's okay. Thanks. Make it snappy. She goes out in a couple of minutes. They're lovely. They're lovely. Ah, they're room of her own. Sheila must be all right. Hey, I thought you said this was business. It is. Wait out here, will you, Ben? Oh, so when it's dames, I wait outside. I said this was business. I don't know you. Well, maybe we've both been missing something. How did you know I came from Chicago? You'd never have got in if you hadn't pulled out. It was a good guess, wasn't it? Well, I don't know you and I don't want to know you, so beat it. Now, look, Sheila. I didn't come here to cause you any trouble. My name's Tom Dwyer, and I... Are you going to leave, or do I call the bouncer? Sheila, a man was murdered in the amusement park tonight. Murdered? Well, hadn't you heard? Everybody has, but I didn't know it was... He was from Chicago, too. And Sheila, he... He had your picture in his pocket. My picture? That's right. So... So what? There must be 50,000 old goats from one end of this country to the other with my picture in their pockets. They sell them at the show. How do you know how old he was? I... I don't. I, I was only... Professor Brighton didn't come around in the last two or three days to talk to you about, uh, about anything, did he, Sheila? No. I don't even know what you're talking about. You got no right to question me. You know what I think, Sheila? I don't know, and I don't care. I think you're in a tough spot, and you'd like to be out of it. Only you, uh, don't know quite how. Well, what if I am? Well, maybe I can help you. Nobody can help me. This is murder, Sheila. That's not so good. What's your angle in all this? I wouldn't kid you. I'm a private detective. I make my living in things like this. Aside from that, and as a general rule, I... I just don't like murder. Listen, mister. What'd you say your name was? Dwyer. Tom, to you. All right. I don't know why, but... You seem like a nice guy. Mm, I am. Well, you know me better. Might have been nice at that. Keep out of this. It's for your own good. You'll get nothing but grief. Uh, what kind of grief? The worst kind there is. You saw what happened to the professor. Poor guy. Get out of the amusement park. Get out of Ocean City and stay out. Thanks, Sheila. Maybe you're right. I know I'm right. But I'm in kind of deep already. Is there, uh, is there anything particular I should look out for? Come on, Sheila. You're on. Okay. Listen, Tom, just remember, that roller coaster isn't the only one-way ride to nowhere around here. One-way ride to nowhere. Yeah, what did she mean by that? It was a tip-off, man. Maybe. Yeah, one way right to nowhere, huh? That's what the professor got all right for free, but how? He was dumped on. I still say how. Well, that little problem doesn't bother me, but... Hey, listen. Did you hear that? Yeah. One way ride to nowhere. Come on. Hey, I think it's around there to the right. Yeah. Bulletproof automobile. Huh? Where? That tent show next to the roller coaster. Take it easy now. <laughs> okay, but I... Then you worry me sometimes. Did you know this thing was here? Well, it wasn't here last week. How am I supposed to know what you want? If you'd tell a guy something once in a while, it wouldn't... Suppose you never heard of Wires McGuire either. No? Give it. That guy's going into his routine again. Ladies and gentlemen, step right up. Inside you will see the actual bulletproof automobile in which the famous Jarvis gang sped from the scene of the $400,000 Springfield mail robbery, the most daring holdup in modern times. Now, this is the very limousine in which they were pursued for 50 miles. Three of them died. The fourth became a raving maniac on that last fatal one-way ride to nowhere. Step right in, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go. Benny. Benny, now I know I'm right. Is this what you came down here for? Not exactly, but there's been some funny talk lately about this mail robbery job in some funny places. I still don't get it. There were four guys in on that. Three of them dead and the others in the bug house. That kind of closes the books, don't it? I'll give you a little tip, Benny. They never found the money. Huh? And the insurance company's got a standing offer of a 10% reward. <laughs> 40,000 bucks. Step right over, gents. The original bulletproof automobile. Okay, yeah. maybe we'll at that. How much? Two bits. A piece. Yeah, yeah. Step right inside, gentlemen. Now the car that you see before you... You, uh, you gen- don't have much business, do you? Hey, what are you, a couple of public accountants? No offense. It just seems too bad. It's a small exhibit. Oh, you're telling me. Ah, these hicks down here, they don't appreciate nothing. Ah, it must be pretty hard, judging what the public would go for. Yeah, 
I thought this murder automobile would be a sensation, something modern, you know. And my brother found in a junkyard in Indiana. Cops must have sold it at auction or something. Look, uh, would you really like to get rid of this heap? Like to? Don't worry, I already have. Yeah? Listen, brother, the minute I found out that I had a turkey, I went out and found me a sucker, but quick. Well, how did you find him? Uh, well, I, I didn't exactly find him. He, he come by, you see. He's making some sort of a collection for some cop's museum. Uh, Capone's bulletproof car, Dillinger's artillery. You know, I got my price, though. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, it's not too bad, Benny. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure it is. Uh, what's too bad about it? Well, to tell you the truth, we're making sort of a collection ourselves for a big New York exhibitor. And sure. I, I thought maybe we could do a little business. Oh, I'm sorry, mister. I just closed the deal tonight. If you'd only come around just a couple hours sooner, you... Well, do you suppose this man you sold, sold the car to would be reinterested in selling at, at the right price? You know, I don't know. It'd it cost you plenty, though. Confidentially, he paid me a thousand bucks cash. Hmm. Well, where could we find this guy? Well, he should be here any minute. He, he's going to pick up the papers and things. Hey, so, so you want to come out and in back and wait from there? I was just going to knock off anyway. Well, thanks. I know, but he's not the You know, I had a hunch maybe I should have held on. How's a guy supposed to know in this crazy business? Well, here you are. Well, quite a cozy little place you got here. That's all right. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Hey. Hey, what's that? Huh? Oh, them roller coasters. The tunnel goes right under the floor here. It's enough to drive you nuts. Yeah, I can imagine. That door over there must open up right where the tunnel comes out, huh? Yeah, I guess it does at that. I never looked. It's all nailed up. Hey, there used to be another wing on this building in the old days, wasn't there? That was the door to it. It might have been. Yeah, I guess it was. Say, does this Mr. Uh, uh, the guy uh, I sold a car to, uh, McGuire. McGuire. Yeah. Oh, does he have a, sort of a business manager with him or anybody like that? Well, he's had a couple of guys with him once in a while. I really didn't pay no attention. I suppose he's been hanging around here fairly steady the last few days, huh? Well, in and out, you know. He ought to be here anyway. Oh, here he is now. What's the matter? Yeah, I don't. Hello, Mr. McGuire. We was just talking about you. Yeah? Who was? Uh, me and these two gentlemen. They want to see you about... Uh... Was this the guy that came to see you, Sheila? I, I don't know. Sure I am, Sheila. Come on, tell him. Well, I guess that's him. Okay. You can run along to the hotel, honey. Ed, listen, please don't. Do like I tell you. Harry, you stay here with me. Okay, Ed. I got all your papers and things, Mr. McGuire. Everything's here in this envelope. Thanks. And what you two fellas want to see me about? Just a little business proposition. My name's Tom Dwyer, and this is Ben Duffy. Hiya, Mr. McGuire. Ed McGuire. Pleased to meet you. You can beat it now, Ferreira. We'll take care of everything. Okay. Well, uh, so long. So long. Uh... Watch the door, Harry. Now, what's your proposition? Well, I understand you bought Ferrara's car. That's right. You interested in uh, used cars? Some used cars. How interested? Enough to make an offer. Your, uh, your friend here in on the deal? No, he just came along for the ride. Well, uh, I got a partner. Well, where do we find him? We don't. He'd have to come here. And we'd have to send somebody after him. Somebody like... Uh, like your friend. Okay. Now, listen, Tom, I don't... What's his name and how does my uh, my friend find him? Name is Johnson. George Johnson. He's at 2854 Drexel Boulevard. Just tell him I sent you. Uh, Tom, I don't think I ought to leave. Take the... it easy. The... And while you're out, I... I wish you'd do something for me. First. What? Take up my mail. It won't be out of your way. Your mail? Yeah, that's right. Do that first. I'm expecting a very important special delivery. And I want you to stop by the Jefferson Hotel where I'm staying. And as for a bellhop named uh, Ted Martin, he takes care of all my stuff. The Jefferson? That's right. And be sure to see Ted Martin. He's the only one who can help you, so I'll ask the clerk for him and hurry back then. Ted Martin and Jefferson. Well, okay. You want me to go, Ed? No, you stay here. Now that he's out of the way, what do you know? Enough. You're a pretty bright boy, aren't you? You gonna talk? Why not? I know, for instance, why he bought that car. I think he knows too much. Let yet. me handle this. Keep talking, bright boy. Well, after that Springfield nail job, nobody ever found the money. 400,000 bucks is a lot of letters. And you think it's still somewhere in that car. Did you figure that all by yourself, or did you get a tip when you were in the federal pen, yeah. along with Duke Jarvis? <laughs> you know any more cute answers, bright boy? Sure. I come from Chicago. 
I know that around there you got a nickname and they call you Wire. I told you you knew too much. Mm-hmm. On account, you got a reputation for being very handy at disposing of troublesome guys with a length of picture wire twisted around the neck. Have you any idea what you've just talked yourself in for, bright boy? I know what I'll talk you in for if you don't play ball. Well, now, what do you think of that? I think we're wasting time. Listen, McGuire. I not only know how you killed Professor Bright, and I know why. Sure you do, bright boy. Sure you do. You think I'm kidding, huh? Professor Brighton was a psychiatrist. They used to call him into the federal pen to examine guys who were wacky. Hmm. They called him in to examine Duke Jarvis. Duke was the last of the Jarvis gang. The rest were all killed in the holdup. He was wacky, all right. So wacky, he let slip about the money being still hidden in the car. So when the professor heard about the car showing up, he thought he could pick up a piece of change. The poor guy, only you caught up with him first, huh? You got it all figured out, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, all but one thing. I don't think you're smart enough to pull this all by yourself. I think you do have a partner. I tell you, we're wasting time. No, no, we're not. Now, listen, bright boy. Who are you working for? What difference does that make? Palanty. Don't you think I want to know who else is in on this? What do you say, bright boy? There's nobody. I'm working on... Cover him, Harry. Okay. You'd better talk, bright boy. There's nothing to say. Uh, Who else knows about this? Nobody. This ain't gonna do your face any good, bright boy. Talk, go to talk. Watch him, Harry. I think he's coming out of it again. Yeah, this ain't getting us no place. Suppose his pal comes back. He'll never come back. By the time he finds out, there ain't no such guy as George Johnson. Take a look, Harry. Yes, me. Uh, it's Chief Haynes, Ed. Okay, open up. Hey, I thought I told you. How did he get here? He walked in. He knows plenty. How much? The work. We've been trying to sweat out of him who he's working for. Haynes. I know where I've seen you before. Your picture. You were a guard at the federal pen when Jarvis and McGuire were there. That's how you heard about the money. When McGuire came down here, he... You had to play ball because you were chief of police here. He's got to go, McGuire. Sure, I know. So we give him the business and dump him out of the side store there into the roller coaster like we did the prop. Are you crazy? You can't get away with two jobs like that the same night. So what do we do? Anything. Dump him in the bay. Make it look like an accident. Anything. Hey, there's an idea. And don't try to get fancy about it this time. But you just gave me quite an idea, Hayne. Quite a good idea. <laughs> Keep that hat down over his face and hold him up straight. Yeah, I got him. What seat do we want? What's the difference? Car's almost empty anyway. Get him in. Take the middle one. All right. Buckle your safety valve. Keep that belt loose. Okay, everybody. You're off. Here we go. Going into the tunnel now. Tie his hands and feet while we're in the dark. Yeah, I'm doing it now. Got the sash weights on him? Yeah, around him. We're out now. Watch him. Hey, what was that? What's the difference? Hang on, and we're starting up. We're coming to the top. You know what to do, Harry? Yeah. When you hit the bottom of the zip over the bay. Okay. I'll yell, and we both heave together. He'll go down into that bay and sink like okay, a... Okay, McGuire, put up your hands, both of you. Put them up. Huh? Ben. Ben, you made it. Tommy, you okay? Yeah, sure. What do you think you're doing here? The federal pinch, McGuire. I'm Ted Martin, Department of Justice. Staying at the Jefferson Hotel. Get it, McGuire? Hey, Tom, you ought to get to a dock. No, no, I gotta get down to the police. Hey, Ted. Ted, listen, never mind about these guys. Get Haynes, chief of police. I got a couple of men down there already, Tom. When you phoned, I figured you might get mixed up with him. We've had our eye on the chief for quite a while. Well, I'll see you later. So long. Thanks, Ted. Uh, hey, you were taking an awful chance, Tom, playing so cagey. Well, I had to be sure first. If that dame hadn't stuck around and tipped us off, we just about made it when the car went through the tunnel. That, uh, Sheila Dame, huh? Uh-huh. Say, Ben, I, uh, I think I got a date with a lady. Oh? So what do I do? Well, I'll tell you. Here's a dime advance out of your $20,000 reward. Go take a ride on the roller coaster. And 
and so closes The One Way Ride to Nowhere, starring Alan Ladd. Tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we'll hear again from Mr. Ladd. First, though, may I pass along this thought. Spotted about the globe, wherever wine grapes grow, there are a few wineries whose products are made for world enjoyment. Among such wineries, right here in California, are those of Roma. And we who live in America have the pleasure of enjoying Roma wine at exceptionally low cost. For we buy it free of duty and free of excessive shipping costs. Try, for instance, Roma California Sherry. Here is the queen of appetizer wines. And not only that, a wine so delicious, it is suitable to serve at any time, cool or chilled. But no matter what your preference may be, you will find a Roma wine costing far less than you would expect to pay for such distinguished wine. So, if you have not already tried Roma wine, tomorrow make your first purchase. Select the type of wine you love best then you too will know why Roma wines have a universal appeal. Why they are America's largest selling wine. But remember, before you buy wine, buy war bonds and stamps. This is Alan Ladd. I can't tell you I enjoyed working on suspense this evening. And next week, I know you'll want to be listening, as I certainly will, to Lucille Ball in a very exciting story called Dime a Dance. Tonight. Thank you, Mr. Ladd. Alan Ladd is currently working in the Paramount picture, and now tomorrow. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time for Lucille Ball in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Smart Boy. Fifteen minutes after Verna had called him on the phone, Steve Carson was walking into the entrance of her apartment. Inside, he was raging at her. Outside, he looked cool as a piece of ice. Ten years as a private detective had given him that. The nonchalance outside 
in spite of the burn-up underneath. Yes, Steve was a top-notch detective. A smart boy. Smart enough to see when Verna came along five years ago that investigation fees were chicken feed. What with Verna's beauty and his ability, there was real money on the other side of the line, in blackmail. It had turned out to be a great thing, an unbeatable combination. And as he left the automatic elevator at the end of the corridor and walked down to her apartment, he thought what a shame it was that Verna could be so naive as to think she could change it with a simple phone call. Oh, it's you, Stevie. Hello, darling. Come in. We've been expecting you. Oh? I could tell by your attitude on the telephone that you were unhappy, dear. You know Randy Summers, of course. Well, Mr. Carson, nice of you to drop in. Vern, I want to talk to you alone. Sit down, won't you? Randy, darling, fix him a drink. Of course. Looks like he could use one. <laughs> you are irritated, aren't you, Stevie? I can always tell. The corners of your mouth sort of twitch and your jaw muscles bulge. Are you going to get that guy out of here? No. I like having him around. You think I'm going to hold still for this? I think so. Well, that's a bad guess. If he stays, I go. Are we going through all that again? I'm not playing second horn, baby. If you want a new stooge, that's your business. If I want to quit, that's mine. Oh, darling, you sound positively jealous. Oh, you couldn't have picked a better partner. He even looks like a heel. I should have known better than to get mixed up in the rotten mess anyway. Oh, Stevie, dear, I'm surprised at you. You didn't think it was so rotten when you were getting your share of the profit. I'm washed up, Vernon. I'm a private eye, not an errand boy. Get that through your head. Or would you rather I put it down in writing? In writing? My dear fella, surely you should know by now never to put anything in writing that concerns Verna. Stay out of this, Summers. Sit down, Stevie. Oh, I'm afraid our Mr. Carson isn't going to be the least bit cooperative tonight. Is he, darling? Uh, here's your drink, old man. Uh, uh, see here, Carson, I can take just so much okay, of you. Okay, in that case... Stop it, both of you. You're acting like Let go of him, Steve. Uh, All right. Now look here. This sort of thing isn't going to get you anywhere. I told you once before how things stand. Randy and I are running the show from now on, and we'll let you know when we need you. Is that clear? Yeah, it's all right. If it works. Randy and I are satisfied with it, aren't we, dear? Of course. (laughs) Summers, old man, did it ever occur to you that one of these days Verna would slip you the same fast shuffle she gave me? I uh, have a feeling she won't. You see, Stevie? (laughs) We trust each other. Okay, Verna... This is your round. Meaning there might be others? Could be. Uh, What about our dear friend Charles W. Ralston? Hmm. Charles W. Ralston. Suppose I were to tell him about the letters. Why, you wouldn't stoop to that, would you, Stevie? What do you suppose Ralston would do if he found out he'd been paying for letters that were burned up three months ago? What? Is that true, Verna? Well, what if it is? What happened? A little fire, Summers. An accident at Verna's cabin. She kept the letters there. Oh, the cabin, eh? Wasn't that the one he built for you as a uh, contribution to the cause? (laughs) Yes. It was nice of him, wasn't it, Stevie? Oh, you'll love it, Randy. Way off in the mountains overlooking Lake Tahoe. Quiet and peaceful. Miles from anyone. Wonderful. It was lucky we were there at the time, so it wasn't a total loss. You know, Steve, I think I'll have to have that old-fashioned ceiling lamp removed. It's too dangerous. The same thing could happen again, Get and... back to the point, Verna. What about the letters? Well, since you brought it up, Stevie, with some nasty little insinuations that you might possibly tell Mr. Ross... What makes you think I won't? Well, let's see. There's the McCrae case, and that swindle on the Falstrom woman, mm-hmm. and a few other enterprises you wouldn't want the DA to know about. Oh, a skeleton in the private investigator's closet, eh? They could put you away for years and years, Stevie. And I know how you feel about short haircuts. No, darling, I don't think you're going to tell Mr. Ralston anything. You're going to go right on doing little favors for me, without the usual percentage. You'll do it just for, shall we say, old times' sake? In memory of... Well, let's let it go at that. In memory. Very touching, darling. I had no idea Mr. Carson was so uh, sentimental. What do you say, Steve? Okay, Verna. Really, it's the only sensible way to look at it. Uh, Come on, let's have a drink on it. Oh, by all means. And this time, old man, shall we try not to spill it? It's awfully good scotch. Randy, Uh, uh, please. Oh, certainly. Steve, there are a few little things I'd like to discuss with you. Yeah? Randy's flying down to Los Angeles tonight, and when he gets back, he'll join me at the cabin. The cabin? 
I'm going up alone tomorrow afternoon. Why don't you come up for the weekend and we'll talk things over? I don't know, Verna. I... It'll do you a lot of good. Mountain air, you know. Well, I could let you know in the morning. Good. Well, I guess I'd better be sliding along. Stevie. Yeah? You do understand, don't you? About Randy and me? Everything's going to work out all right. Hmm? Sure, Verna. Sure. With the prologue of Smart Boy, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Miller. Isn't it time for tonight's big news? Oh, you mean about Signal Premium, the amazing new motor oil that actually keeps motors six times cleaner, reduces cylinder wear one-third? You can say that again. It's a fact. New Signal Premium motor oil actually keeps motors six times cleaner, reduces cylinder wear one-third. And you want to know the reason? Compounding does it. You see, into today's finest 100% pure paraffin base oil, Signal now blends five scientific new compounds that makes Signal Premium Motor Oil far outperform today's finest uncompounded oils. You mean compounds are added to new Signal Premium Motor Oil like vitamins and minerals are added to foods to make them more beneficial? Right. Compound number one actually cleanses the motor of old carbon. Compound two prevents harmful varnish, gum, and sludge. Compound three improves oil circulation to vital engine parts. Compound four keeps oil from thinning out when your motor's hot. And compound five protects costly bearings from corrosion. No wonder new Signal Premium Motor Oil outperforms all uncompounded oil. Check. And no wonder drivers who want their motors to run smoother, last longer, are switching fast. Switching to the new Signal Motor Oil. The oil that keeps motors six times cleaner. Reduces cylinder wear one-third. New Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Steve. You're a smart boy. Smart enough to know there's only one way to handle Verna now. Five prosperous years as her partner in the rather hazardous enterprise of blackmail have given you a healthy respect for her intelligence. And you're too smart to force a showdown yet. The corners of your mouth are twitching again as you think about her. It's too bad in a way that she thought she could force you to stooge for Randy Summers, the new boy. She was a nice kid. That's funny, isn't it, Steve? You're thinking about her in the past tense already, only ten minutes after you left her at the apartment. Your mouth is still twitching as you stop in front of another apartment and walk up to a door with a brass plate on it in the name of Charles W. Ralston. I don't think you know me, Mr. Ralston. I'm afraid I don't. Steve Carson, private investigator. Oh? I came to see you about a, a Miss Verna Sheldon. I'm sorry I don't. I have a proposition, Mr. Ralston. Very well. You know all about the letters, of course. Mr. Ralston, you're a pretty influential businessman in the city, and also a man, shall we say, uh, not without enemies. A man in my position is bound to have a few. Exactly. Now, let's suppose Miss Sheldon's letters were to fall into the hands of the wrong people. She's assured me they won't. Ah, oh, you don't know her. Suppose she were to sell those letters to a group of individuals for a sum much greater than you could afford to pay. She wouldn't. Oh, but she would, and is. I've been able to find out that much and a little more. Shall I go on? Of course. She's going up to her cabin tomorrow. Over the weekend, someone will contact her there to make the transaction. You'll have to work fast if you want the letters. What's your proposition? I think I can break up that little meeting before it ever takes place. You can get the letters for me? Yes. How much? My fees run a little high for this sort of thing. How much, I... Carson? $25,000. I can't possibly get it. You don't think it's worth it, considering your position? I, I couldn't, Carson. 25000 Well, think it over. And do make up your mind soon, Ralston. I'll call you sometime tomorrow morning. Oh, by the way, do you still own that cabin? I sold it. I, uh, 
I thought it was a gift. It's on the records as a sale to Miss Sheldon. Okay. I guess I'll run along. Uh, just a moment. You're quite certain she's planning to sell those letters? Quite certain. How do I know this isn't another one of her tricks? And how do I know you're not in league with her? That's just a chance you'll have to take, Mr. Ralston. Hmm. Good night. The next move is the big one, isn't it, Steve? There's the matter of the defective kerosene lamp in Verna's cabin at Lake Tahoe. The same lamp that exploded once before and caused the fire that burned Mr. Ralston's letters. A thing like that is liable to happen again, isn't it, Steve? Particularly since you arrive at the cabin five hours later, equipped with five gallons of high-test gasoline, and proceed to change the possibility into a certainty. It takes you a half hour to set it up in a way you can't possibly miss. And when you're through, you carefully raise the huge lamp again on its creaking chains, lock the cabin door, and leave. You can see Vernon now arriving at the cabin, pulling the lamp down. as the flick of a match, an explosion, and a fire to remove any trace of your visit. By 8 o'clock, you're back in town to call on Verna, as you promised, to regret that you can't accompany her and to make sure her visit is coming off on schedule. Well, if it isn't smart, boy. O'Hara. Right. I don't get it. You will. Come in. I'm standing by. Lieutenant just left on an errand. Yeah? What errand? You. Come on, O'Hara. What's the pitch? What are the police doing here? I was just going to ask you what you're doing here. Yeah? Suppose you tell me first, huh? I was calling on Verna. Any particular reason? Business. I see. She's over there, if you want to. Where? Under the blanket. What are you talking about? Slight case of homicide, Steve. A blood instrument, to coin a phrase. Oh. Surprised, Steve? Yeah, I... I wonder. Wait a minute. You don't, you don't think I... You have... and she were in a business together, huh? What kind of business? Investigations. Uh -huh. And she had something you wanted pretty bad and she wouldn't give. That's right, isn't it? Suppose I don't answer that one. Okay. We'll have plenty of time to go into that later. Tell the lieutenant he can reach me at my office. Oh? Going so soon? Yeah. Okay. Just one thing, Steve. I'd stick around pretty close if I were you because, uh, well, I've got a hunch the DA would like a little chat. Uh, when you get the time. That stopped you cold, didn't it, Steve? Alibi, alibi, alibi. Flashing on and off in your brain like a neon sign. Everything you figured on, planned for, set up just like a spring trap and everything gone. Verna's dead. You're the number one suspect. And you were driving on a lonely mountain road on an errand you can't explain at the moment she was killed. That'll sound great in court, won't it? But there's one thing you're sure of. Ralston killed her. There's no question about it. The talk last night. The deadline you tossed up to him. Yes, it was Ralston, all right. It takes you five minutes to get to a phone booth in a corner drugstore. Steve Carson calling. I'd like to speak to Mr. Ralston, please. He hasn't come down yet this morning. May I... I've got to talk to him. This is important. Oh, but, sir, I... I... Listen, whoever you are, you run up to Ralston and tell him Steve Carson's on the phone. He'll talk. Very well, Mr. Carson. I... Oh, here's Mr. Ralston now. Good. Come on, come on, Ralston. What's holding you? Hello, Carson. Listen, Ralston, I've got to see you right away. Something wrong? You know what I'm talking about. Just stay put. I'm on my way over. I'm expected at the office in 20 minutes. I'm afraid You're going to I... stay right where you are. Do you want me to talk to you, or would you rather I did my talking to the police? I'll be here, Mr. Carson. Am 
mind if I sit down, Ralston? Go ahead. I'll sit over here. No, you better close the door first. Oh? Your man, Shermerhorn's got big ears. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Now, Mr. Carson. I guess you know why I'm here, or are you going to give me that I don't know what you're talking about routine? Well, really, Mr. Carson. I'll get right to the point. I'm here for two reasons. The first is that I'm sure you knocked off Verna Sheldon as if I'd been there watching you. Oh, don't look so surprised, Ralston. I had nothing to do with it. Don't give me that. I didn't get any farther into the joint than the entrance hall, and I could see it had been gone over with a fine tooth comb. Maybe someone looking for those letters, huh? Someone who figured tomorrow night might be too late? Why are you so interested? I've been put in a rather awkward position, Ralston. You, uh, have the letters? One thing at a time. My good friend Sergeant O'Hara seems to think I killed her. Unfortunately, it looks like my only defense is to prove you did it. That is, unless... Unless what? Unless I come through with an alibi... I know you killed her, Alston, and I've been in the business long enough to know that all I've got to do to hang you is to flash those letters in the DA's office. You... you have them? I know where to get them. I've got to have them, Carson. I'll do anything... Now, now you're talking. First, there are a few things I'd like to know. Did anyone see you at Verna's apartment last night? I didn't go to her apartment last night. Okay. I'm going to dig up those letters. So long, Ralston. Wait a minute. Okay. I... I did it. I killed her. I had mm-hmm. to. I would have been ruined ah, that's if... that's better. Now, you wouldn't have just hopped a cab and gone over there to knock her off, Ralston. You've got a better head than that. You must have been somewhere else at the time, huh? No one saw me. First, I went down to the yacht harbor. I have a boat there. What time? 10.15. Okay, 45 minutes to go. No one saw me at first, but a short time after I went aboard the boat, the night watchman came by and called out to me from the dock. He'd seen the light on the boat. What time? 10.30. He talked to you? Yes. So as far as he was concerned, you were on the boat between 10.15 and when? He didn't see me again until I'd come back the second time after. After you knocked off Verna. What time? 11.30. Perfect. I couldn't have done much better myself, Ralston. I was lucky. I spoke to the watchman at 11.30 when I was leaving for the night. Anyone else around? Uh... Yes, yes. There were several men a few yards ahead of me. I, I think they came from the club. And the watchman will recall there were others when you spoke to him. Huh? I suppose so. It was rather dark, but I think he must have noticed them. Oh, that's good enough for me. Now, listen, Ralston. No one has any idea you were connected with Verna except me. I think they'll take you at your word. Probably won't even consider you a suspect. What are you getting at? You're my alibi, Ralston. I was with you on the boat all the time, remember? Well, I... You, uh... Aren't holding out on me, are you? No, it's not that. That alibi is worth a lot of money to me, Ralston. I might even be willing to forget about the 25000 The watchman didn't see you go on the boat alone. He didn't see you leave when you went to Verna's apartment, and no one saw you come back. And when you finally checked with them just before going home, there were others around. Now, <laughs> that makes an alibi for both of us. What about the letters? Forget it. Where are they? You won't find them, Ralston. You almost tore the joint to pieces and you couldn't find them. I could have told you they weren't there. You're going to go on bleeding me, aren't you? Just the way she did. (laughs) Still don't trust me, do you? Listen, Carson. Bring the letters here and I'll give you the cash tonight. No, no, let's wait until the investigation's over, huh? It's safer that way. For Stevie... Well, Steve, it's like sitting in on a poker game, isn't it? You're leaning back now, watching each of them play their high cards, knowing all the time you have the topper up your sleeve. Randy Summers, the new boy, is on his way back from Los Angeles. And you know that 30 seconds after he finishes his story of what happened between you and Verna on the evening of the murder, the D.A. will be on the phone asking for the answers. There's nothing to do now but wait. Thursday. Friday. And then, Saturday morning, you open the door of your office. Hello, smart boy. I've been waiting for you. What's on your mind, O'Hara? Oh, just like to have a little talk with you, that's all. About the Sheldon dame. What else? 
You were good friends, weren't you? Sure. I mean, uh, particularly good friends. So what? So, I understand things suddenly went sour. Ah, a little pigeon flew in from L.A. and slipped you that, huh? You denying threatening her because she shook you for this summer's guy? We had a slight disagreement, that's all. You had three beefs with her. The first was a week ago at her apartment. The second was the next day in a downtown bar. Mm -hmm. And don't say you didn't, because Summers says so, and so does the bartender. The third one was on the night she was killed, just after she called you on the phone and told you it was all off. Now, what was the beef? I, uh, disliked the hat she was wearing. Sure. So much you told her you were going to wring her neck. Did I say that? Never mind the stall. I haven't even started yet, chum. That dame had something on you, didn't she? Did she? Why didn't you tell me you were up at her apartment on the night of the murder? You didn't ask me, O'Hara. Summers was there, too, incidentally. He was still there when I left. He caught the 945 plane at the airport. We checked it. Now, you were there at 7.30. Right. The first time. What do you mean, the first time? You didn't go back around 10.30? What are you talking about, O'Hara? It seems the Sheldon dame got a phone call at 9.15, just before Summers left. And, uh, it was from you. Wait a minute. You're all wrong. I didn't make You any... made an appointment to see her at 10.30. That's a lie. Did you keep it, Carson? Someone's been giving you a line. Summers was there when the call came in. She told him it was you. Said you were coming back. He wanted to stick around in case you got rough, but she told him she could handle it. So he took his plane. The guy's lying, O'Hara. Wait a minute. You can work out an answer on the way down to the Hall of Justice. At the moment, you're under arrest. Suspicion of murder. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I wish we had television so you could see the photographs I have here of two pistons taken from two identical motors. The only difference was that one motor used new signal premium motor oil while the other used uncompounded oil. But what a difference in those pistons. After 79,000 miles of driving, the one using new signal premium is relatively clean, unworn, while the other piston using uncompounded motor oil shows six times as much carbon deposit, 50% more cylinder wear. Yes, those five compounds in new signal premium oil really make a difference. Ask your signal dealer to show you his unretouched photos, proving how signal premium oil keeps motors six times cleaner, reduces cylinder wear one-third, my bet is, when you see these photos, you'll want to make your next oil change a change for the better. A change to the new signal oil with five compounds added. Five compounds that make it outperform all uncompounded oils, barring none. New signal premium motor oil. And now, back to the whistler. <laughs> Well, Steve, it's quite a poker hand, isn't it? O'Hara and Summers have played their cards, but you still have the topper up your sleeve. That phone call was a shock. Summers is too stupid to have dreamed that one up all by himself. You try and figure it out as you sit in the ante room, waiting to see District Attorney Skelly. He must have been telling the truth. For some reason or other, Verna didn't want him to know who called and told him it was you. With Ralston, of course, pleading for his letters again. And when she turned him down, he decided to kill her. Good old Ralston. You knew you'd need that top card, didn't you, Steve? But you had no idea you'd need it this badly. Hello, Carson. Hello, D.A. Doesn't look so good, does it? I hate to see you guys make monkeys out of yourselves, Skelly, but if you... Just insist... a minute, Steve. I have a few questions to ask you. Although I don't think it'll make much difference. Got it all figured out, huh? Just about? Good. Now, if you'll stop figuring long enough to ask me where I was at the time of the murder, maybe we'll all have a great big laugh. Okay. The floor is yours. 
I was on a boat at the Yacht Harbor talking over some confidential business with a client of mine. Yeah? Who? He's a pretty important guy, Skelly. I suppose his name's confidential, too. No, not at all. Charles W. Ralston, Vice President of State Savings and Loan. Is that good enough? Ralston? If you don't believe me, get on the phone and call him. You're serious about this? Sure. Go ahead, call him up. You better brace yourself, Carson. Hmm? Ralston was burned to death in a cabin at Lake Tahoe early this morning. Seems a coal oil lamp exploded or something. A couple of rangers saw the flames and... Something wrong, Carson? Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Stranger Than Fiction, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, stains just my stock and trade. If life's twisting you like a tornado and you want out, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, writing this letter is a hideous necessity. But a rival has come into my life, or I should say, this woman has come back into my life, and in such a way as to cause me the kind of humiliation I will not tolerate. You may have read my husband's best-selling novel, The Awakening. Everyone else seemed to have. Well, I must know whether this particular woman is or is not the heroine of this this tale tale of passion. passion. This This should be an easy enough enough assignment for you. Please call me at my home so we can arrange an immediate appointment at your office. Sincerely, Victoria Beasley. Hmm. Now, Brooksy, that's what I call a world-shaking problem. Well, you wouldn't make so light of it, my lad, if you'd read Samuel Beasley's book. It was banned in Boston. Oh. One critic called it an emotional hot foot, 700 pages <laughs> long. Well, I must get to this cultural milestone as soon as I finish the Rover Boys in the Indian country. Right now, I'm going to call Mrs. Beasley. <laughs> Okay, Mrs. Beasley, I'll just sit here and wait until you stop prancing up and down. Mr. Valentine, you don't seem to appreciate the position my husband's placed me in with this this book. Here, Mrs. Beasley, have a chair. Nobody's made you look ridiculous. 
Friends don't snicker and whisper behind their hands every time you pass. Look, please, So lady. you can sit there with that superior smirk on your face. Well, if I'm smirking, it's because I'm trying not to laugh out loud. I didn't come here to... With someone like you, Mrs. B, I've got to say what I mean to make a dent. Oh, Brooksy, you read the society columns. Oh, sure. A girl's got to be improving her staff warfare, you know. All right. Now, how is Victoria Beasley usually described? Uh, this time without the routine. Really, now, Mr. Valentine. Well, without the routine. Victoria Beasley, glacial beauty, wondrous wit, soul of poise. Please. Evoked an almost audible gasp of admiration when she arrived at the Duchess's party, late as usual. I'm leaving. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. Won't you admit this does call for a laugh? A woman with all those assets getting green-eyed over a fictional gal her husband dreamt up in a novel? Sam is a broker, not a writer. Oh, say that about Samuel Beasley on a quiz program and the man will come up with, ah, too bad, better luck next time. I cured him of all his literary pretensions ten years ago when he married me. Lord knows where he found time to write this book. He did it out of sheer malice. You mean you thought you had a colorless milk toast character for a spouse and now he's the pop of a bestseller, stealing all the limelight from you. No. That's not it at all. Then what is it? The Diana in Sam's book actually exists. Everything that happened between her and the hero actually happened. Almost every critic said it has the ring of truth. Oh, well, that doesn't mean that never... The whole situation. A community like our own, Deer Lake Park. The description of Diana. The cold, distant wife who didn't know what was going on. Mm, the glacial beauty, huh? You sound as though you knew the heroine. I think I do. And that's where I need your help, Mr. Valentine. Oh, well, look, haven't I tried to explain... So many that... things are so very clear now. For instance, every Thursday for the last year, Sam's received a telephone call at 5.30. He's always made a point of answering it himself. Well, does it have to be another woman? It could have been his bookie. They're very punctual, too. Once I reached the phone before he did, the party hung up. I'm sure it was a woman. The woman. You recognize the perfume, no doubt. Let me finish. Every Thursday night, he's made an excuse to go into town and never once mentioned what he did. Well, of course, you keep Sam informed of all your movements. That's aside from the point. Your commentary doesn't interest me. I just want you to find out if Diana in Sam's book is or isn't Peggy Wilkerson. And who's that lady? Her family has the estate next to ours at Deer Lake Park. She's always loved Sam. Probably would have married him if I hadn't come along. You mean except for the last year, Peggy's been content to forget, if not forget. Peggy's the kind of girl who's willing to wait things out. She makes a career of being naive, wholesome, and athletic... And you think she's the Diana in The Awakening? You may have seen Miss Wilkinson in the Sunday supplements. She's always carrying not one, but six tennis rackets. Say, tell me, Mrs. Beasley, what's it going to do for your pride to find out if all this is true? Or is it a little feminine mayhem you have in mind? What I have in mind is none of your business. Question is, are you interested in a flat fee? Oh, excuse me, William. Valentine. Oh, yeah, Riley. Well, what's on your mind, Lieutenant? What? Hey, look, start from the beginning, will you? And this time, stop for the red lights. Huh? Huh? Oh, now, wait. I can't answer that. Looks like I'm going to take the case, so I might be violating the confidence of my client. You... O okay, stop yelling, will you? We'll be right out there. Mrs. Beasley? Yes? Do you know a man named Michael Waldron? I do. And you left my telephone number in case he wanted to get in touch with you? That's right. We were supposed to have lunch in town together today. How do you know? Who was that on the phone? Lieutenant Riley. Homicide. What's the tie-up, George? Well, what did he say? Enough to take this out of the class of a family brawl. Mrs. Beasley, somebody tried to kill your husband. Well, while we're waiting for Miss Brooks to get here with Miss Wilkinson, what about some drinks? Oh, Sally. Yes, ma'am. Right away, ma'am. Uh, just a minute here. Uh, yes, Lieutenant? Mrs. Beasley, suppose we forget about the social graces until we get rid of the business at hand, huh? The business being to prove I took a pot shot at Beasley here. Take it easy, Walton. Hey, Lieutenant, Mr. Beasley's been strangely quiet. Would you mind him telling us what happened? Oh, that's going to be just dandy. He'd like nothing better than a pin it on me. Michael, please. Let's face it, Vicky. He resented every moment we've been together. Why should I, Walton? You're five years younger than my wife? Our friends applaud her choice for a companion when I'm occupied. You're handsome, very charming, Okay, and... okay, okay. You guys can knife each other some other time. Are you sure nobody wants anything? What, are you still here? I told you that... No... Uh, no, Sally. Uh, nobody wants anything. I was talking to Mr. Beasley. You can go now, Sally. Just as you say, Mr. Beasley. Mr. Valentine, a moment ago you asked me for my version of what happened here in my study. Yeah, it seems to have been lost in the shuffle. I can be very brief about it. I was sitting there at my desk, typing, 
doing some work on a new story. Suddenly, there was a shot through those French doors. I didn't see anybody, and I assure you, I didn't stop to investigate. I get it. I made a beeline for the drawing room. And strangely enough, a minute later, in walked Waldron. Here we go. Let me ask you something, Beasley. I'll ask the questions if you don't mind, Valentine. And when I'm through, I've got something to ask you. Why you're mixed up in this at all, I... Uh, uh, Mrs. Beasley. I don't think I can be of much help, Lieutenant. When I left Mr. Valentine's office, Sam was here in the study. I decided I wouldn't bother him. Didn't you even tiptoe up and peek in to say goodbye? I told you. He was working. I could hear him at the typewriter. As far as I'm concerned, I was merely dropping by to pick Vicky up for lunch. I didn't even hear a shot. <laughs> Of course, it might have been one of my readers expressing a critical opinion. Please, Mr. Beasley, don't try to be funny. You know, you people rank pretty high socially in our fair city. That's why I'm here. Ordinarily, you'd have to be a corpse before I arrive. Just one minute, Mrs. Beasley. I'll take that. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Whatever it is you're trying to slip into your pocketbook. I'd like to see it. You haven't anything to hide, have you, Mrs. Beasley? Why, no. This is just a... A gold cigarette lighter. Yes. I must have dropped it over there by the doors. Mm. I... Very interesting. Initials, M.W. Uh, Lieutenant, you needn't look at me like that. It's not mine. Well, well, we'll see about that, M.W. And you weren't supposed to have been here in the study. Michael. And that's all right, Vicky. They can think whatever they want, but they'll never prove anything. I'm sure that's a world of consolation to my wife. Isn't it, my dear? Well, suppose we go uh, back downtown together, Waldron. While we check on this lighter, you and I have a few things to talk about. Why not? Oh, Lieutenant. Yeah. I admit this lighter might point very definitely to Waldron, but it doesn't stop there. All right, all right. Where does it stop? I'll be able to tell you better when Brooksy gets here. Now, Miss Wilkinson, as I told you, there's no reason to be nervous. The lieutenant has to ask these questions. But I don't understand. I knew nothing of what happened to Sam until Miss Brooks told me. Oh, but I didn't tell you, Miss Wilkinson. I made it a point not to. I, well, I, I couldn't help guessing something was wrong. Lieutenant, must we drag Peggy into this? You've got Waldron in the other room to take down to headquarters. Why this inquisition? Valentine and your wife dragged this young woman into this mess, not me. Surely, Sam, you can't object to us doing everything we can to find out who tried to kill you. Your concern for me is very touching, Victoria. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Beasley, whether you know it or not... Your wife has a theory that the heroine of your book is modeled after Miss Wilkinson. Mr. Valentine, that was supposed to be a matter of confidence between us. Attempted murder changes all that. Victoria, you really believe that? Me, the Diana in The Awakening, that irresistible creature who unleashed such raging passion in a man? Sam was so carried away, he couldn't help dropping some unmistakable clues. How long has this been going on? Just the last year? For well, the whole time we've been married. Now, Victoria. How many people have known it all along? Laughing at me. Oh, this is ridiculous. Peggy is the last person anybody would picture as the femme fatale. She's the outdoor type. Much too wholesome for that sort of thing. Just, just to look at her, anybody can tell that. Well, why stop there, Sam? You with your marvelous knack with words. Why don't you say I'm just about as glamorous as a dish of cottage cheese? I use Life Boy in my tub instead of perfume bath salt. The direct opposite of the striking and glamorous Victoria. Uh... Just where were you all morning, Miss Wilkinson? I had no airtight alibi, if that's what you mean. I was out horseback riding, all by myself. Ah, oh, look, look, let's stop uh, sparring, huh? Now, look, Valentine, you said you were going to pull some kind of rabbit out of the hat. Well, come on, come on, let's have it. Okay, do you happen to own a cigarette lighter, Margaret? I, well, yes. I didn't know there was any law against that. Could this be it? The initials M.W. could stand for Margaret Wilkinson, as well as Michael Walter. Now, while you were out horseback riding, you might have taken a slight detour. And you might have wanted to kill Beasley because he wouldn't get a divorce and marry you. Well, Miss Wilkinson? Very well. Why shouldn't I admit it? It's all true about this morning. And the book. Well, you know what you're saying, about Peggy. That. Yes, and I don't care. Oh, this will really cause a sensation. The wholesome, colorless Peggy Wilkinson turns out to be the fabulous and much-discussed Diana. Oh, and I'll love it. You heard her, all of you. This twee little thump has been making a fool of me. Me. Well, Miss Wilkinson, I guess we'd better get into town. I'm afraid not, Lieutenant Riley. Huh? Because I'm not going to press charges. What? Uh, George, did you hear the man? Yeah. I came here to make an arrest, and that's what I'm going to do. I refuse to prosecute. As far as I'm concerned, Peggy was out hunting squirrels, and her marksmanship was incredibly bad. I think you're right, Sam, but I don't. 
I want the world to know that you couldn't hold a man, Victoria. <laughs> and of all things, you lost him to me. I think that washes everything up, Lieutenant. Thank you very much for your trouble. If you were anybody else, Beasley, I'd... I, I, I'd... I'd better get out of here before I lose my... Peggy, I'd better take you home. Oh, yes, sir. Victoria, you'd better go and reassure Waldron that he's a free man. I'll do that, Sam. I'll be right back, Mr. Valentine. Yeah. Well, where does that leave us, George? <laughs> I don't see any point in hanging around now. Oh, a very important point, Brooksy. A particularly fat and juicy pill. Oh. Not what she wanted to know. So, sit down at the great author's typewriter and make it out. Okay. What amount shall I make it, George? Oh, I... I beg your pardon. I, I was looking for Mrs. Beasley. Uh, this is my day off. I, I was just leaving. Mm -hmm. Well, so long, Sally. I, uh... I, I was in the next room before. I couldn't help overhearing Mrs. Beasley say Mr. Beasley was using the typewriter when she left this morning. So? Uh... The reason the typewriter man was here was to bring this this new machine. Goodbye, Mr. Valentine. George. Yeah, Brooksy. This is a noiseless machine. Then she couldn't have heard it. With the doors of the study closed. Now, why did she lie? You mean Victoria took a shot at her husband and then came to us? Oh, but why would Peggy... I don't know, Angel, I don't know. But unless I have the proud Victoria sized up all wrong, the lady is still out to do murder. Return to tonight's adventure, George Valentine, in just a moment. You like your car. Probably everybody in your family and most of your friends like it. But there's someone who doesn't like your car. And his name is Old Man Rust. He's most destructive when your car is standing idle for long hours. He sneaks in with condensed moisture and starts nibbling at internal engine parts the moment you cut the ignition. But if you've got RPM motor oil in your car, don't you worry. So when you cut the engine, RPM doesn't drain off vertical parts. It stays on the job and prevents rust from ever getting started. Other compounds in RPM, motor oil, prevent gummy carbon and lacquer formations, put a stop to corrosion and oxidation. It adds up to complete protection, another reason why RPM is first choice in the West. Ask for RPM at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations, where they say, and mean... We take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. A marble cold society beauty, Victoria Beasley, by name, would rather die than be humiliated, hires you to prove that the... Heroine in her broker husband's sensational first book is a former sweetheart of his, Peggy Wilkinson. You don't want any part of a divorce-bound shuffle like this, but then an attempt is made on Sam Beasley's life. Said Peggy takes the blame, and the wife trips herself up with a stupid, needless contradiction, which seems to give the lie to Peggy's confession, all of which sends you, George Valentine, into frantic action to prevent another try at murder. George, what are you going to do? Find Victoria. Okay, Walden, where is she? That's what I'd like to know, Valentine. What did you say to Victoria? She just brushed past me, told me to stay here until she got something cleared up once and for all. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Well, wasn't Mrs. Beasley more specific? Where was she going? What was she going to do? That's all she said. But you've got to stop hounding her, Valentine. Me? Hounding her? You're a little mixed up, Mr. Walden. Victoria came to us. Well, there's no time to go into detail. Why don't you admit it? Her husband hired you to spy on us. You can't do that to the kind of person Victoria is. She's easily upset. And I'm not going to let you. Now, look, Buster, I got places to go in a hurry. You're not going anywhere. You're going to leave Victoria alone. You're a big, well-built lad, Waldron, but don't try to maul me. You're staying right here, even if I have to. Sorry, but you forced me into this corner. I told you I got places to go. Don't keep looking around like that for help, Peggy. I waited till Sam left so I could be alone with you. I'm here to kill you in your own house. Victoria, put that gun away. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. 
In the presence of others, you admitted that you came between me and my husband. It was you who were phoning every Thursday at 5.30. The other details are all there for the whole world to read. In Sam's book. No, Victoria, no. No jury will convict me for trying to protect the sanctity of the American home. Now listen to me, Victoria. Yeah, being a laughingstock, I'll be a heroine, a noble figure. That's something I never could stand for, being laughed at. I'm willing to do anything to put an end to that. You've got to believe me. I lied to that, Lieutenant. I didn't try to kill Sam, and I'm not the Diana in his book. You expect me to believe that? Well, I said it only because I'm human. I'm tired of being the dowdy thing that I am. Can't you understand what it would mean if people thought that I had all the glamour that you have and more? I haven't been waiting around for ten years to get Sam. Sorry, Peggy. I'm all through talking. I'm sorry about this. Oh. Oh. Oh, did Why, you... She... She was going to kill me. It's all right now, Peggy. Your wrist will hurt for a couple of days, Mrs. Beasley. But you're lucky to get away this easy. Well, I get on my knees and thank you most humbly. No. No, and you better not bother picking up that gun either. I'll just take that. Where did you get it, anyway? It's Sam. I took it from the drawer in his shipper over. I see. Okay, come on, Mrs. Beasley. You too, Miss Wilkinson. Where are we going? Right back where we started. Who knows? If I'm lucky, I may come up with another rabbit out of the hat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I I don't like hogging the floor, but the time has come when you're going to have to do the listening. Well, get it over with, Mr. Valentine. I'm sick of this whole thing. I'm sure the ladies, too, are anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, you should be more than anxious, Mrs. Beasley. You should be shaking with fear over what you might have done today. You mean committing murder. I had every intention to. Tori, you can't go on feeling that way about me. I told you, you're all wrong. Stop sniveling, Peggy. You're safe. I doubt if I could work myself up to the same fever pitch again. Oh, now you're just being an old softy, Mrs. Beasley. What I meant to say is that if Miss Wilkinson is right, you would have killed the wrong woman and paid for it with your life. I'm just as sure as ever that she's the Diana Sam wrote about. And about that attempt on your life, Mr. Beasley. Oh, yes, we mustn't forget that. If Miss Wilkinson has recanted her confession and Waldron here is staunch in his denials... I certainly am. That leaves... Only you, Mrs. Beasley. Oh, you placed much too much importance on my hearing Sam's typewriter. I only said that to make my story sound more convincing. I didn't want to be implicated in something I had nothing to do with. Well, it seems we're right back where we started from, with a full-blown mystery on our hands. Maybe it would be best just to forget. I don't know about that. I... Stay where you are, Victoria. No, I'll answer that, Mr. Beasley. Oh, yes, but I... 5.30. Thursday. Same call, same time. Every week. Yeah. The other woman. Hello? Is that you, Sam? No. No, but I've got a question for you, lady. Oh. Oh, dear Lord, what I almost did. Yes, Mrs. Beasley. There is a real-life Diana, and that was she on the phone. Okay. Okay, who is she, Beasley? If a writer learns nothing else, he learns the value of confounding and bewildering the reader. That's the way I choose to leave it now. Oh, Peggy, I couldn't help believing what I did. And if Mr. Valentine hadn't oh, stopped me, I would... Yes, George. Oh. Get on the phone and tell Riley to get back here. Oh, he's going to just love that. Well, it's only right that he should be in on the payoff. Same rabbit in the same hat? No, nope. no. Nope. You've heard about how those long-eared critters increase and multiply. Well, at this point, there's a whole slew of the little beasties. Huh? In other words, Angel, now we've got all the answers. <laughs> Right, all right, Valentine. I get the picture of what happened between Mrs. Beasley and Miss Wilkinson. But I told Valentine. you, Lieutenant, I'm not going to do anything about it. Awakening. Certainly under the circumstances, I'm not going to do anything about it. Oh, oh, oh most certainly. There have been two murder attempts, and we're supposed to just... Laugh it off, huh? Lieutenant, do I still have to hang around here? As far as I'm concerned, you can drop... Surely, Waldron, you don't want to miss the exciting explanation Valentine promises. Yes, why don't you say something, Mr. Valentine? What have you got on your mind? I don't think you can stall much longer, darling. Okay. Okay, I admit I have been stalling. But for a very good reason. Still, if the time has come. Beasley. Hmm? You staged this whole business. Nobody tried to kill you. What? You fired that shot through the French doors. You're going to have trouble proving an obvious absurdity like that. Okay, if someone really wanted to kill you, some person in this room who knew you, he would have walked right up to you and let you have it. Not resort to any hit-or-miss tactics. Hmm. That makes sense, Valentine. Go on. The gun your wife wanted to use on Miss Wilkinson, your gun, has one bullet missing from it. And that's the bullet embedded in the wall over your desk. 
Are you sure of that? Quite sure, Lieutenant. Mr. Beasley was so convinced that suspicion would never fall on him, he was, well, let's say, careless enough to put the gun back in his room where his wife found it. Why would Sam do such a thing? I'll tell you why. He'd make the headlines more publicity for that book of his. Yes, dear, that thought did occur to me. The sensation the awakening caused was beginning to die down. Something like this would have started people talking all over again. Make me seem even more ridiculous. It was fit payment for the ten years you lorded it over me. Making me a laughingstock among our friends. And I was to be the patsy in the deal. I've been waiting for this Beasley, and I was a good point buster. And the lighter, Sam? Are you going to purposely implicate me? No, Peggy. I never thought of you as Margaret when I planted that lighter with the initials M.W. I wanted it to point to Waldron, but I never intended to press charges. Oh, there must be something in the books that applies to a case like this. There's got to be. And I'm going to find it. Look, Beasley, I don't care how big a man you are. Lieutenant, you haven't heard the whole story. I don't think I can take any more. Oh, you don't know about rabbits, Lieutenant, and how they increase and multiply. Miss Brooks, there's an awful lot of things I don't know, but I'm going to find out right now. Oh, Mrs. Beasley, I I didn't know you had company. What, Shelley? I uh, just wanted to tell you I I was back in case you needed me. But, Shelley, this is your night off. I'm sure she'll give you a detailed report some other time, but now... Lieutenant Riley, you should be ashamed of yourself. What's that? That's no way to talk about the almost legendary Diana. You know what you're talking about. You must be out of your mind. I was trying to stall till Sally got here. But how did he find out, Mr. Beasley? I'm sure he's coming to that right now, Sally. You mean my own maid in my own house? Yes, Mrs. Beasley. Those mysterious phone calls every Thursday. Thursday. (laughs) The traditional maid's day off. (laughs) Sam couldn't keep his appointment tonight. I can't help myself, Victoria, but it is funny. But not to me, Michael. You can get out and stay out. Victoria, I'm truly very sorry. Of course. You began tying things up, George, when Sally made those pointed remarks about the new typewriter. Frankly, I'm glad it's all out in the open. Uh, yeah, me too. Victoria, although this must necessarily add to your humiliation, after our divorce, Sally and I are going to be married. Oh, but that's impossible. What? What do you mean, impossible, Sally? Well... I'm already married, but Joe's been in San Quentin for the last two years. Oh, this is wonderful. And this time, Michael, I can laugh with you. Sam, I'm very sorry. You look so hurt. Sally, you you might have told me instead of making such a fool of me. But, Mr. Beasley, we just went to the movies and and dinner every Thursday night. Oh, Oh, brother. And after all, it isn't every girl who has such a beautiful book written about her. Oh, I don't know, Riley. I think the whole thing's pretty understandable. Oh, don't you even talk to me about the business. But the press middle-aged man turns an innocent little affair into a literary heat wave. The book Victoria kept him from writing for ten years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this seems to be the night for laughing jacks. <laughs> what goes with you, pal? Well, Sam's book should have an aftermath. The awakening is complete. How come? Well, I'm betting Victoria is going to feel sorry for her spouse now. And after ten years, they're really going to get together. Yeah. Who cares? Well, that's the beautiful part about marriage, Riley. It really can take a beating and still survive. Oh, you're so right, darling. More people ought to try it. Or am I being too subtle again? Oh. Well, uh... Well, what I really meant, Angel, was that... uh, (laughs) Well, you see... uh... (laughs) Go on. Squirm, pal. Squirm. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. For the first time today, I found something to laugh at. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. If you want to be off to a good start, a fast start, every time you use your car, just make sure it's Chevron Supreme gasoline you've got in the tank. This premium quality gasoline turns the engine over the moment you press the starter. Gives your car faster warm-up, too. More pep in traffic. A new ping-free power that lifts your car over the hills. Try Chevron Supreme and you'll agree it gets the best out of your car. Another thing, it's climate-tailored. In each different temperature and altitude zone of the West, count on Chevron Supreme for your car's best performance the year round. For today's high compression engines, you just can't buy a better gasoline. So why not try it tomorrow? Get Chevron Supreme at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean 
We take better care of your car. Next week, as George Valentine is poking through the tall grass in a vacant lot, we'll hear him saying to Brooksy, Well, looks like we walked into something, Brooksy. What? That looks like part of a man's shirt. The collar of a man's shirt, with blood on it. Golly. Stephen must have torn the collar off so he could cover the wound. And the shirt came from Jonathan's. That's the shop where they look down their noses if your bill runs under $200. Then we better work faster. Yeah, right? because young Steve's life is worth under two cents. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Lee Patrick as Victoria, Frank Martin as Sam, Peter Leeds as Waldron, Mary Schiff as Peggy, and Bernice Barrett as Sally. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Thirteen with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box thirteen, care of Star Times. I know my life is in danger. I think you can help me. I'm desperate and don't dare go to the police. Please, if you want to help, call at the Tivoli Theater box office for the ticket left there. Our handbill will take you. Our handbell will tell you more. Yeah, that's the way it started. The note from the girl, Maria. The theater ticket. And then, murder. And now, back to Box 13. It was Thursday when I received the letter from Maria through Box 13. Some of the letters I get are from cranks. Some from people who are just curious about a reporter-turned-fiction writer who advertises Adventure Wanted. Will go any place, do anything. But with this one, it was just like Susie said. Gee, Mr. Holliday, it doesn't look like one of those crank letters or somebody that's just curious, thinks you're crazy or something. How can you tell, Susie? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just female ignition. There's a dictionary over there, Susie. Look up ignition. Don't you know what it means, Mr. Holliday? Hmm. It's, it's when a woman... Skip it, Susie. Skip it. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to pick up a ticket for tonight's show at the Tivoli. Take a look at this handbell. Torino. The great Torino. Like his look, Susie? Well, hmm, I don't know. That's what I thought. Okay, Susie, close up shop for the day. You're going to follow it up, huh? That's the general idea, yes. I want to see what Maria has on her mind and why she's afraid. This was it. I picked up the ticket at the Tivoli. A big poster told me this was a charity affair with the axe doing a two-night stand. Tickets? Ten dollars a throw. I circled around the lobby, looked at the acts advertised, singers, dancers, a dog act, and then there it was. A big life-size cut out of the great Torino, complete with mustache and goatee. Nice-looking guy, maybe too smooth-looking, 
but it was what he was doing that made me take a better look. He held a rifle to his shoulder and was aiming it across the lobby at another cutout. And this one? This one was a girl. Pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. Big eyes. Maybe a little scared looking. And looking straight across at the great Torino. And right into the barrel of that rifle pointed at her head. Well, if this was Maria, she had a right to have something on her mind. Anybody who stands up and lets a rifle be fired at her is earning a living the hard way. I was thinking about it when the call buzzer zizzed in my ear. I didn't in with a crowd during the overture and took my seat. First row, right on the aisle, easy to get at. An usherette shoved a program in my hands. The great Torino was scheduled next to closing. Okay, that meant I'd have to sit through the rest of the ice. I did. It was skipping. But the great Torino was something different. He had two assistants, a girl and a good-looking young guy. It was a magic act with class, and Torino was clever with his hands. He did a trunk effect that was really great. And the girl who helped was the same girl whose cutout was in the lobby. Torino tied her with a rope, slipped the big canvas bag over her, and locked her in a trunk. He fired a shot, and bang, the girl came running down the aisle. And the trunk she was put in, well, empty. All done in a split second, too. The great Torino took his bow, but I noticed something. When he reached out to take the girl's hand and bow with her, she managed to be busy at something else. Okay. She didn't like him. He gave her a funny look and walked to a rack and picked up a nice nickel-plated rifle. I sat up in my seat because the girl threw a quick look at me and a tiny nod. No one would have noticed it but me. I I looked back at Torino, who was speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to call your attention to my final effect. A most dangerous one. So dangerous that few illusionists will attempt it. The history of the magician's art has recorded several deaths during the feat. My assistant will go into the audience now and select a committee of volunteers who will please come upon the stage. Maria, if you please. So the girl was Maria. I guess my cue was to be selected as one of the committee. I raised my hand. She picked me. I went on the stage with four others from the audience. Stood there while Torino went to the footlights and spoke again. Uh, Please, the music. No music. Please, no music. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall give the gentlemen of the committee this rifle. It may be examined thoroughly. Also, three bullets which they may mark later for identification. Gentlemen, the rifle. And here, the bullets. Uh, Please mark the lead in any way you choose, unmistakably. We took the rifle and the bullets. And the great Torino, well, he had the audience sitting on the edges of their seats. No one knew exactly what was going to happen, and Torino wasn't going to tell them until the right time came. And one of the other men on the committee spoke to me. Uh, bullets look okay to you? As good as any bullets can look. Twenty-twos, huh? Yeah. How do we mark them? Initials? Yeah, yeah, good idea. The three of us cut our initials in the lead. That all right with you, mister? Good. How about the rest of you? Suits me. I've got a knife here. Yeah, let me see the rifle. Yeah, sure, here. Rifle look okay, no gimmicks? Well, not that I can see. All right, my, my initials are cut in the bullet. Uh, you want to cut yours? Oh, yes. I cut my initials, D.H., in one of the bullets. So we had three bullets with initials cut in the lead. No chance for a substitution. Then Torino took the rifle and the bullets. Thank you, gentlemen. Grazie tanto. You are satisfied? Uh, sure, I am. Yes. Good. Now, if you will all watch closely, I shall load the bullets in the rifle. So, and uh, what is your name, sir? Holiday. Good. Then, uh, Mr. Holiday, if you will please hold the loaded rifle until I am ready for it. Oh, sure, sure. In this way, there can be no trickery. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw me load the market bullets, yes. So, and you have the loaded rifle. Good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce once more Maria. Maria? 
The young lady is as courageous as she is a lovely. Maria, you will take your place, please. Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? Oh, no. No, thank you. <laughs> then that leaves it up to me. No. The rifle, please. Oh, here you are. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall ask for complete quiet. <coughs> Thank you. Maria, you are ready? Yes. I'm ready. The great Torino walked to the other side of the stage. He raised the rifle to his shoulder, pointed it at Maria. She was pale as death. Her arms were tense. Tight. Perspiration stood out on her forehead. And on mine. And on everyone in the audience. Then... So help me, this is what happened. A bullet appeared between Maria's teeth. She let it drop to a plate. She held in her hands, then... And two more bullets popped between her teeth and fell to the plate. No one in the audience moved. No applause, just that tense feeling. Torino walked over, took the plate. His hands never touched the bullets. I'll swear to it. He walked to me and the other three men with me and... Gentlemen, you will please to identify the bullets, yes? This one. Initials P.G. Uh, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's mine, all right. Thank you. And uh, this one. K.R. Mine. Thank you. And the third... D-H. That's mine. How did he do it? I don't know. All I know is that when I walked off the stage, Maria managed to get a note into my hands. When I read it later, it asked me to meet her at a little coffee shop about three blocks from the theater. All right, that's what I did. We sat in the booth, back out of the way, and Maria talked. Thank you for coming, Mr. Holliday. That's all right, Maria. I, I saw a great act, but what am I doing in it? You can help me. Please help me. How? Doing what? You can keep Torino from killing me. More coffee? Didn't you hear me? Oh, sure. Sure, but I don't get it. You saw the act. The rifle trick. Yeah, it was great. Then you must see how easy it would be for Torino to kill me while doing it. Slow up a little, Maria. Let's start from the beginning. All right. You saw the other assistant. You mean the good-looking kid? That's Billy. I love him and he loves me. Then what's your problem? Torino. He hates Billy. And he hates me for loving Billy. Jealous? Insanely. Well, quit then. I will. After tomorrow night's performance. But why wait if you're afraid? I won't be afraid if you're there. What could I do? Be on the committee again. If I think any, anything's wrong, I'll signal you. And then? Do anything. Drop the rifle, but don't give it back to Torino. Now, wait a minute. How could he kill you? He'd claim it was an accident. Three magicians or their assistants have been killed accidentally doing the trick. The mechanism of the gun goes wrong. Giving away secrets, Maria? I have to. There's a mechanism in the breech of the gun. It drops the real bullets down into Torino's hand when he closes the breech. Oh, well, then I get an unloaded gun. There are blanks in it. The mechanism substitutes them for the real bullets. Hmm. That's good. And he slips the real bullets to you. Yes, when he takes my hand to introduce me. And you slip them into your mouth. While the audience is watching Torino and the rifle. I see. Maria. Yes? Why don't you go to the police? Torino would know. He'd know. How? He watches me. But aren't you afraid he's watching now? No, not tonight. I slipped away. I don't think I could manage it again. Don't you see, Mr. Holliday? You're my only chance. I saw you had in the paper, Box 13. You mean the police would ask him questions and he'd lay low until he got the chance to... Yes. Will you be there tomorrow night, Mr. Holliday? Look, I have a ticket for you here. The same seat. Please. Please. All right, Maria. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to keep the trick from being trumped by the great Torino. And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. 
Well, it sounded like a great assignment. And from the way the setup looked from where I sat, it gave the great Torino a perfect chance to kill Maria. I checked on Maria's story about the accidental deaths during the trick, and Jonesy at the Star Times verified it. A smart cookie like Torino could fake an accident, and who's going to pin the black ribbon on him? Nobody. Okay, it's up to you, Holiday, to figure it out. Next night, I sat in the same seat and watched Torino go through his act. The trunk thing, still great, knocked the audience off their seats. Me, too. Couldn't figure it. But the big stuff was still to come, the rifle trick. I went on the stage, kept my eyes on Maria. I marked one of the bullets again. Oddly enough, Torino didn't seem to recognize me. That was all right with me. And now, ladies and Torino went through his same spiel, word for word. I kept my eyes on Maria. But it was though she'd never seen me before in her life. She looked... Well, it sounds silly, but she looked hypnotized. Then I heard Torino saying to me... Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? No, thank you. <laughs> Torino looked at me hard. My name and my face together might have tipped him. There was a funny look in his eyes. I stared at Maria. Not a sign from her. Maria, you are ready? Yes, I'm ready. I relaxed a little. She hadn't given me a sign. Everything was all right, and then... Maria! Maria! She dropped. Maria dropped. And right between her eyes was a little round hole. Look, Holiday. Is that straight, that story? Sure it is, Kling. She was afraid she'd be killed. But you say she didn't give you a high sign. No, she didn't even look at me. But she told you if there was anything wrong, she'd tip you. Yes, but she didn't tip me. Okay. Sergeant. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Get Torino over here. Yes, sir. All right, you. Lieutenant Kling wants you. Got any ideas, Holiday? Uh, I'm dry. Bone dry, Kling. And what about this guy, Billy, she told you about? I told you. I okay. Tell you, it was accident. Accident. Something she was go wrong. Please. Quiet. Now look. Accident. She's oh. wrong accident that it happened. You're so, I am an artist. You tell me I do something wrong. No, no, no. It is wrong. Holy accident. Sergeant. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Streak. Put it's this guy in his dressing in Europe, room. Every every room. Every keep him there until he blows off that head of steam. Wrong, you know. But watch his door. Listen to me. window from outside. Yes, sir. Come on, Hootie. It's funny, Clint. I'm hysterical. I don't think. What's funny? The girl Maria. I don't think she knew me tonight. She looked right at me. Didn't give me a tumble. Yeah? So? She told me she'd signal me if anything was wrong. I... I don't get it. But it looks as though she... She what? She deliberately let Torino fire a gun she knew was set to kill her. Uh, that makes great sense. I know. No sense at all. And besides that, there... Get away with it. You're going to let him tell you it's all an accident. Well, don't believe him. He killed her. That's Billy. Kling. What? Let me ask him a couple of things. Now, look, Holiday, I'm in charge of this case. You're in on a rain check. Okay, but I'm in, huh? Yeah, for the one reason that Maria told you about it, and he I... He killed her. It wasn't an accident. Oh, I'd better go help the sergeant. Any objections if I mosey along with you? None. Just keep your mouth closed, that's all. Sure. All right. So I listened while Kling asked questions. But there was something knocking at the back of my head. Asking to be let in. Something I'd seen, heard, remembered. I didn't know. But what bothered me was Maria not giving me a signal. When she said she'd know if Torino was up to something. Billy answered Kling's questions. No, no. All I know is that Torino <laughs> bluffed Maria. He said he'd kill her if he saw me hanging around her. Who loads the rifle with blanks? Maria. Maria. Does she do it tonight? She always does it. Maria loaded the rifle herself. She did. Before the performance. So I got an idea. I left the stage where the investigation was going on. And I walked backstage toward the dressing rooms. I wanted to talk to Torino. But there was a large blue cop sitting at the door. He looked at me and... Well, Holiday. Oh, hi, Murph. I feel lousy. No, oh, that's too bad. Uh, say, I think I could talk to Torino? No. Oh, now, look, you can watch and listen, tell Kling everything that goes on. <laughs> playing detective holiday? Nope, uh, playing a hunch. What about? 
Why not listen and find out? And if you learn anything, tell Clay. And you might learn something good. You mean something that might break the case? Yeah, might. Well, well, uh... What's the matter, Murph? Can't you use a couple of stripes? Aye, sure. Oh, okay. But I'm standing right here, understand? Sure. Right. Hey, you, get up and... Oh, brother. Look. Ain't nobody going to ask him no questions. No, I don't think he's in any shape to answer. A promotion, you say? A promotion? I'll be lucky if I ain't fouled up for good. This guy's been knifed right under my nose. That's right. Somebody stabbed Torino. He was as dead as Maria. And nobody saw anybody go in or out of the dressing room. There was one window. It was open. But the officer outside swore he had his eye on it. Hmm. Nobody in or out. And nobody in the room but Torino. And the knife was in his back, so suicide was out. Clegg and his boys turned the room upside down. Torino's apparatus and trunks were shoved around. Still nobody. And it turned out nobody had a motive for killing Torino except Billy. Me? Me? Are you crazy? I never left the stage. I was talking to you. I was answering questions. I can't be in two places at once, can I? He was so right. Kling was tearing his hair. Then more questions. The rest of the acts were strangers to Torino. Knew nothing about him. I was thinking about it when something hit me. Something Billy had said. While Kling was still firing questions, I got to a phone. Hello? Oh, hiya, Kenny. Still running that private eye? Swell. Do something for me, will you? Hmm? Okay. Put a man on the Tivoli Theater right now. And get him to tail a guy named Billy. Huh? Here's what he looks like. About 5'9". Stocky. Light complexion, wearing gray suit. Good morning, Mr. Holliday. Hiya, Susie. Any messages? Uh-huh. The detective agency called. And what? What's the message? Oh, oh I wrote it down shorthand. Here. Uh, trail Billy in shoe. No, wait a minute. Oh, terrible ink. Uh, oh, I got it. To insurance company this morning. He placed claim for double indemnity policy for his wife, Maria Baker. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Holliday. That's not all. That's enough. I'll see you later, Susie. Torino, Torino. Step on him, Jonesy. Oh, you want hard facts? It takes time to find them. Even in the morgue of the Star Times. Okay, Jonesy, okay. But hurry up, will you? Ah, here we are. Torino, born Italy. Skip that. How long has he been in the country? Uh, six months. Noted magician in Italy and Europe before the war. Only six months. Now, Jonesy, if you were a magician, you wanted assistance. How would you get them? Advertising a billboard. Magazine for show folks. What else? Hmm. Where can I see the last six months' copies of the billboard? Right, I got a local office in town. All the copies you want. Hey, where are you going? Thanks, Jonesy. Be seeing you. I've got a lot of reading to do. Six months' copies of the billboard. I looked through every one of them, and when my eyes were falling out of my head, I saw it. An advertisement. The one I wanted. And the one that tied up with something Billy said. And something I saw during Torino's act. I tried to get Kling on the phone, but no dice. He was out. I left word for him to meet me at the Tivoli, and I went there myself. There was nobody there but the watchman. The five dollar bill got me in. Oh, there's no place gloomier than backstage in an empty theater. I headed for Torino's dressing room. Because I had a good idea how someone got in and stabbed Torino. Then disappeared. I opened the door, stepped inside. It was dark. The shade on the window must have been down. I was fumbling for the light switch when somebody 
pull the shade on me. Got any idea who slugged you, Holiday? Yeah, Kling, I have. All right. Who? Billy, maybe. No dice. He didn't come near this place. We had a tail on him. Do you know about the insurance? Sure. But he couldn't have killed his wife because she loaded the blanks into the gun. Mm Mm-hmm. And the medical examiner's report on the bullet that killed her? What about that? Twenty-two. No initials on it? No, none. So it looks like this Maria deliberately planned her own death. It wasn't an accident. If it had been, the bullet in her head would have been marked. Kling, put out a dragnet. Uh, For who? For the one who slugged me. I'll cut it, Holiday. You know anything, spill it before I lose my temper. Who do you want to pick up? Here's a description. Young woman, about 26. 26. Brown hair. Brown hair. Lovely blue eyes. Blue eyes. About five foot two. Five foot two. Worked as a magician's assistant. Hey, what are you giving me? That's Maria. Uh Uh-huh, Maria. She's dead, you dope. You mean her twin sister's dead, Kling. Twin sister? What are you talking about? The trunk effect Torino work could have only been done with twins. Billy tipped me off on it. Billy? Sure, when he said nobody could be in two places at once. And Torino advertised in the billboard for twins. You are dreaming this. Put out a dragnet for Maria. Who stabbed Torino? Maria. She got her twin sister to take her place in the rifle trick last night. That's why I didn't get a signal from her. The sister didn't know me from Adam. Now look, Holiday, we searched this dressing room. There was nobody in it when Torino was stabbed. Maria was here. Look. False back in this cabinet. Good old magician's gimmick. She was here all the while. Maria and Billy took out an insurance policy on her and planned to make me the patsy. Because I'd testify that she told me Torino hated her, that she was scared. Torino was knifed to keep him from spilling about the twins. Billy was in the clear on that because he had an alibi when Torino was killed. Okay, Clint? I, uh... Okay, We'll put out a dragnet. And they got her, Mr. Holiday? Yeah, Susie. They got her. Gee, sounds just like a story. Uh Uh-huh. Only nobody will believe it. Look, I've got a knot on my forehead to prove it. <laughs> well, does that make you hysterical? No, but I was just thinking. <laughs> Don't be reckless, Susie. What about? I was just thinking, with that bump, you'll have to wear off the face hat for a while. <laughs> You're a great help. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. The National Broadcasting Company brings you Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell in... Dangerous Assignment. The time, midnight. The place, a carnival on the outskirts of Zurich, Switzerland. Two men slip furtively through the shadows near the slowly revolving carousel. They stare intently into the darkness. Triplish must be around here somewhere, Carl. Yeah, handsome. We both saw him enter the carnival grounds. Well, where could he hide? The carnival is almost deserted. You see, there's only one person riding on the carousel and... Carl. Carl, it is he, Triflis, right on the rod nose. Yeah, riding on the carousel. Good. We wait and we will ride right into our arms. He sees us. Come on. Hanson, drag him from the carousel. No, no. Grab him. Grab him. Yeah, yeah, I have him. No, let go of me. Let go. Carl, drag him into the shadows here. Yeah. The American document, Triflis. Where is it? I I don't know what you're talking about. The one they called File 307. You sold it to Brunet, didn't you, Triflis? Didn't you? Yes. 
Sabrina. In that case, you will not live to spend the money. No, no. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah. No, no. Oh, no, no. Not my throat. I, I can't breathe. Yeah, exactly. More pressure, Carl. I, I, a little more, Carl. I cannot squeeze any tighter. It is enough pressure. Just hold it a moment here. So, I think that is enough. Yes, you may let him go now, Carl. You've seen him in such pictures as An American Romance, The Great McGinty, and Command Decision. Now, here's our star, Brian Donlevy, in another two-fisted portrayal as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. Ruth, you've got the worst sense of timing I ever saw. You're always dragging me back here to the office when I'm right in the middle of a big deal. Maybe she was a big deal to you, Steve, but she looked more like a stacked deck to me. You know, some of these gals may start picketing you. What's this all about, anyway? That's what the commissioner is waiting in his office to tell you. Here we are. I have your passport and credentials ready when you are. Okay, thanks, Ruth. Oh, Steve. Hello, commissioner. Well, where am I going this time? Zurich, Switzerland. Switzerland? Look. I can't even yodel. You won't have time to yodel. Steve, ever hear the name Bruner before? Bruner? Sounds vaguely familiar. Who is he, Commissioner? I don't know. Huh? Bruner's always been a very mysterious figure, Steve. None of our agents has ever seen him. Matter of fact, I don't suppose there are more than a handful of people in the entire world who know what he looks like. Yeah, I remember now. Bruner's a sort of an international mystery man who sells information to the highest bidder. We think Bruner has file 307, Steve. File 307? Top secret document containing defense plans. Two weeks ago, it was stolen from this country. Oh, you think it's in Zurich now? We had information it was temporarily in the possession of a seamy little man named Triflis. This morning, his body was discovered near a carnival grounds outside of Zurich. Mm. Needless to say, file 307 wasn't on Triflis's body. No, but Triflis paid a visit to Bruner's villa two hours before he was murdered. We think he sold file 307 to Bruner. Mm. And I'm supposed to get it back from this international secret seller, huh? Great. Well, have we got any contacts in Zurich? One. His name is Max Raber. He runs the carnival over there. Mm. Just uh, one more thing, Steve, as to the danger involved. Yeah, I don't imagine trying to get into Bruner's villa is a habit-forming occupation. There's more than that. Other interests are also trying to get file 307 from Bruner. Naturally, they'll try to stop you permanently. Their agents may be watching you right from the start. Yeah. Well, that's it, Steve. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent after an interview with Bruner. Actually, you ought to find file 307 and bring it back. You've got your assignment. Good luck. Steve Mitchell departed United States for Zurich, apparently on assignment as foreign correspondent. Keep him under surveillance... Find out his real mission. Very well, Mr. Mitchell. We will try to give you a very cordial reception here in Zurich. Taxi cab, sir. Taxi. Oh, okay, driver. Kenny Hotel. Yes, sir. You're an American, sir. Yeah. On a uh, vacation, perhaps? Not exactly. Well, I'm a good guide, sir. I can show you the points of interest here in Zurich. Never mind. I'm afraid I won't have much time for sightseeing. No, wait a minute. Uh, yes, sir? There's a large villa a couple of kilometers outside of the city. Got a high wall around it. You know where it is? Why, I think I can find it, sir. Okay. When you get me to the hotel, wait for me. I'll want you to take me out to that villa. I will be very happy to, sir. (laughs) 
Hello, Carl. This is Hanson speaking. I've just brought Mitchell to the Koenig Hotel from the airport. I'm waiting for him now. <laughs> no. No, he doesn't suspect me. He thinks I'm just a cab driver. He wants me to take him to Buna's villa, so he's after file 307, all right. Now listen, Carl. There is a Max Raber who runs the carnival. They might be working together. If Mitchell tries to contact Raber, you know what to do. might be the villa you are looking for, sir. It is the only one with a high wall near here. Well, that must be it, then. Okay, here you are. Oh, but uh, I can wait for you, sir. Never mind. Very well, sir. If you should need me further, my name is Hanson, and my cab is usually in front of your hotel. Oh? You're quite an obliging guy, aren't you, Hanson? Sir? I'll skip it. Thanks. <laughs> Some joint. Looks like a penitentiary. There ought to be a gatekeeper around here somewhere. Hmm. Who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? One at a time. I'm Steve Mitchell, foreign correspondent from the United States. What do you want? An interview with Brunner. Go away. Now look. You cannot see Brunner. Brunner gives interviews to no one. Go away. Yeah, but is it can. Well, this fellow is getting better looking by the minute. What's the matter, Fritz? This man wants to see Bruna. Oh? I'm Bruna's secretary, Karen. Hello. You're Mr. Mr. Steve Mitchell. You're Bruna's secretary? <laughs> he should be so lucky. You can go, Fritz. I'll take care of this. Very well, Karen. But don't let him get into the gate. Much cozier with just the two of us, isn't it? Just what was it you wanted, Mr. Mitchell? I'm a newspaper correspondent. No. Well, I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, then. Your boss isn't too eager when it comes to giving out interviews, huh, Karen? Bruno sees no one, Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, that's the general impression I've gotten, but I thought he might possibly make an exception in my case. You say you wish a story? That's right. And that's all you wish here? It was before I met you. (sighs) I mean, a a story is all you wish from Bruno. (laughs) What else would I be after? I do not know. Suppose you come back tomorrow, Mr. Mitchell. Tomorrow? Yes. I will tell Bruno about you and ask him if he will see you. Why, thanks. You'd be doing me a big favor, Karen. All right, Mr. Mitchell. I will try to persuade him. Until tomorrow, then. Boss around? The boss? Yeah, the guy who runs this carnival. You mean Max Reba? That his name? I'd like to talk to him. Where is he? Over there, standing at the shooting gallery. The short man with the gun in his hand. Okay. Nice shot. Thank you. I seldom miss. Oh. <laughs> Looks like you know what you're talking about. You, uh, Max Reber? That is correct. I'm Steve Mitchell. You missed. The name mean anything to you? A name is for anyone who cares to use it. That's right. But these credentials aren't. Do you mind squinting down your peep sight at them? Put them away. The commissioner sent you, Mitchell? Yeah. He said you might be able to help me. You're after fire at 307. Yeah. You any information on it? I think the person they call Bruna has it. Yeah, it looks that way. The guy who had it before him turned up dead near your carnival, didn't he? You missed again, Max. Perhaps because you're crowding me, Mitchell. Oh, sorry. Go to 25 Rolichstrasse and wait for me. As soon as I close the carnival for the night, I'll come. We'll talk further. 25 Rolichstrasse. Right. Only six hits out of eight. I am slipping. That's slipping? Look, Ray, but do me a favor. What? Don't ever point that gun at me. (laughs) 21. 23. 
Here it is. 25 Brulichstrasse. Hmm. All dark. Unlocked. Well, Max has to wait here for him. I wonder where the lights are. Hey, who closed the door? What? In just a moment, our star Brian Donlevy returns as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. The United States is now building the largest, best-trained peacetime armed forces in its history. Our United Services, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard are training a new kind of serviceman, training him in the greatest scientific enterprise in the world. Yesterday, he was a man of weapons. Today, to a large degree, he's a man of science. Yes, a brilliant future in technology is available to America's young men in the new armed forces. So remember, the time for the future is now. Find it in the armed forces of the United States. the National Broadcasting Company brings you Act Two of Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell. The time, one hour later. The place, the police station in Zurich, Switzerland. Oh. So, you're coming around at last. What? Oh. The head, it hurts, huh? The head, it hurts, huh? Hey. This looks like a jail. It is. Uh, I am Police Inspector Baumgartner. Police? Jail? Look, I don't get it. Neither do we. When we found you four kilometers west of the city, I... How did I get four kilometers west of the city? Last I remember was walking in a house at 25 Brolichstrasse and getting hit on the head. One of our policemen saw a cab with two men in it traveling at high speed out of the city. He gave chase. The men finally abandoned the cab... When the policeman got to it, he found you lying on the floor, unconscious. Uh, remind me to thank him. Looks like I was getting taken for the well-known ride when he came along. Huh? Skip it. You say there were two men in the cab. Whose cab was it? We are checking that. Why? Well, I was just thinking about a very eager cab driver named Hanson who wanted to show me the sights around Zurich. Now it is my turn to ask the questions. What were you doing at 25 Brolichstrasse? I was sent there by... Hey... By a carnival owner I thought was a friend of mine. Incidentally, is there a telegraph office around here? Down the street. Hey, Mitchell, your credentials are those of a newspaper correspondent. May I inquire what you are really doing here in Zurich? It's very simple, Inspector. I'm trying to get an interview with a mysterious character named Brunner. Brunner? Hey, Mitchell, a word of advice. You are apparently involved with very dangerous people. It might be better for you to give it up. Oh? Well, thanks for the advice. I'd sleep on it, except it's almost morning. Yeah, you sleep on it, Herr Mitchell. Only be sure you're able to wake up. May I inquire what you are really doing here in Zurich? It's very simple, Inspector. I'm trying to get an interview with a mysterious character named Brunner. Brunner? Herr Mitchell, a word of advice. You are apparently involved with very dangerous people. It might be better for you to give it up. Oh? Well, thanks for the advice. I'd sleep on it, except it's almost morning. Yeah, you sleep on it, Herr Mitchell. Only be sure you're able to wake up, huh? It's from Steve, Commissioner. Good. I've been expecting a report from him. Here you are. Thanks, Ruth. File 307, apparently in Brunner's possession. His beautiful secretary, Karen, trying to arrange appointment for interview. Just between us, would rather interview Karen... (laughs) He never changes, does he? Apparently, Max Weber, not such hot friend of ours after all. Still nursing large lump on head, which I collected at a dress Weber sent me to. What? I don't understand, Commissioner. I thought Max Weber could be trusted. I guess in this business, you never know, Ruth. Oh, there's some more coming in. We'll pay Reba another visit this morning when his carnival opens up. In the meantime, I'm going back to Bruner's villa. We'll keep you informed. Well, a 
This is quite an apartment you've got here, Karen. Much better than trying to talk through the bars of that gate outside. Yes, it is a nice apartment. Bruna takes good care of me. You know something? He should. <laughs> you say nice things, Steve. Sometimes it comes easy. I'm afraid it won't do you any good to look out the window, Steve. You won't see Bruna. Oh? He lives in that other wing, across the courtyard. Hmm. Look, uh, what kind of a guy is he, anyway? Mm, a short little man. Very quiet. A short man? A fascinating man to work for. I can imagine. Uh, Steve, mm. I talked to him last evening about you. He doesn't believe you. What do you mean? Well, he doesn't believe it's just an interview you want. Oh? What else would I be after? He's not sure yet. But, uh... Supposing you were after a story. Bruna's interested in knowing just how much you would be willing to pay for it. We're, uh, talking about the story, of course. Of course. Well, that's sort of a tough question to answer, offhand. You see, there are others anxious to, uh, shall we say, write a story about Bruna. They are willing to pay a great deal. Yeah, I'll bet they are. And, uh, well, Bruno knows a lot more about you than you think, Steve. He knows you cannot pay as much for it as others can. I see. Well, if Bruno knows so much about me, maybe he also knows that the story we're talking about used to belong to the people I worked for. Yes, he knows that. But I'm afraid it does not make any difference to him. He says he cannot do business with you. Well, that's that, I guess. I'm sorry, Steve. So am I. Anyway, it was very nice of you to go to the trouble. I was glad to. I don't quite get why you've been so nice to me. Well, I... I guess I... You what? Well, I, I stay here in Bruna's villa most of the time. I don't see many people. And I've never seen anyone like... I mean, you were... Oh, I, I don't know what I mean. Maybe this is what you mean, Karen. Oh, Steve. You, you must leave, Steve. Okay. But I'll be back. No, Steve. They would not let you in. There's a high wall and guards. Look, I said I'd see you later, and I will. With you here, I could grow wings. Mark Sreba's not here. Where is he? I do not know. Oh, he should have been here by now to open up the carnival. Yeah. Where does he live? At 25 Brolikstrasse. What? Max Sreba lives at 25 Brolikstrasse? Yeah. Do you know where it is? Yeah. I've got lumps to prove it. Thanks. Well, Mitchell, here we go again. 25 Rolex Strasse. Hey, sounds like a fight inside. Mitchell, help me. Get these men off me. Mitchell. <laughs> it's the eager cab driver. Kai, let's get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Too late, Hansel. I will take care of this one, Mitchell. Hey, you sure did take care of him, Reba. For a little guy, you sure swing a mean lamp. It's good you arrived when you did, Mitchell. Five minutes more would have been too late. You know... Maybe I was wrong about you, Max. Wrong? What do you mean, Mitchell? I had you pegged as the boy who arranged that hit on the head for me here last night. Oh, I told you to come here and wait for me. When I got here, you disappeared. I got taken for a ride. Maybe by these two guys on the floor here, Hanson and... and what's the other one's name? Hanson called him Carl, I think. Huh. Why'd they jump you just now? They know that we're working together. That we're after File 307. They are also after it. Look, I'm going to need your help. Have you ever seen Brunner? No. But I've been watching his villa carefully the last few days. I think I know a way we can get into the grounds. Good. At one place, in the rear of the villa, there's a tree which overhangs the walls. It looks like a difficult climb, but perhaps we can make it. Okay. We'll tie these two leaps up and leave them here for the present. And after dark, you and I will pay a little call on our friend Brunner. <laughs> Here, Max. Take my hand. I'll put you up to this next branch. Yeah, Steve. Mm, thank you. 
We're almost to the top. There. Now, I'll drop down inside of the wall first. Then you follow, okay? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Come ahead, Max. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Look, Mitchell. The lights in that wing of the building across the courtyard. Yeah, that's where Karen says Bruno lives. We work our way over there and try to get in. Steve, listen. Oh, great. The hound of the Baskervilles. Look, Steve. A giant black dog coming for us. Yeah, I see him. Well, that just about cooks us. No, wait. Get lost, Raven. Huh? Lost? Get into the brushes there. Watch where they take me and try to get to me later. Now get moving. All right, Steve. Hey! Get away from me, you big lug! Hey, will somebody get the black monster off of me? Kitty streets, all against the wall. Hurry up! This dog cuts me on his manual. So, it is the nosy reporter. Get this timber wolf off me. Stop get the dog. Rich, take this man to the room in the cellar and tie him up at once. Who's there? Steve? Karen. They told me you'd been captured in the grounds. How long have you been lying here in the cellar? I don't know. About half an hour, I guess. You should not have tried to come back, Steve. You're sorry I did, Karen? Oh, Steve. I'm afraid for you. Look, just get me untied. I, I cannot do that, Steve. What? Now, look, Angel. Fun is fun. Bruno but... would kill me if I did a thing like that. Look, you let me worry about Bruno. I cannot untie you now. I must get back right away or they will become suspicious. But, well, perhaps I can come back later. Come here. Okay. But make it sooner instead of later. I'll try, Steve. This is a great spot you got yourself in, Mitchell. Steve. Max, how long have you been in the next room? For several minutes. Here, I'll untie you. Good. I would have come in sooner, but from what I could hear, you were not very anxious to be rescued. Uh, yeah. Look, you know your way around this villa pretty well, don't you, Max? What do you mean? Finding these rooms in the cellar without much trouble. I told you I've been watching this villa the last few days. You're pretty short, too, aren't you? I, I do not understand. Karen told me Brunner was short. Don't let your imagination run away with you. I'm trying not to. How did you get in here so easily, anyway? I diverted their attention by setting a fire in the yard. A fire in the... Hey, hey. you believe in doing things up brown, don't you? Yeah. Mm. The last of the knots. Come on, Steve. Yeah. Out of the side door into the hall. Hey, no guards. No, they're probably all fighting the fire out in the yard. Come, up these stairs. We'll try to get over the back wall while their attention is diverted. Over the wall? Look, I came to this villa after file 307, and I'm not leaving until I get it. Steve, that's impossible. We will be lucky to escape with our lives to continue the search for the document. That would mean certain deaths for both of us. Well, you get discouraged too easy. This the door to the yard? Yeah. All clear. Come on. Hey, that really is a fire you started. Come, Mitchell. It's spreading toward the front gate. It's our chance to get over the back wall. Hey, wait a minute, Max. We're not leaving yet. What? Look, that building over there. It's Brunner's wing of the villa. Steve, are you crazy? We cannot get in there. Why not? The door's open. This is our big chance, Reba. But, Steve, I tell you... Look, I came all the way across the Atlantic to find that piece of paper. Come on. Anybody spot us? I don't think so. They're all fighting the flames. Okay, let's get inside. Close the door. Yeah. Bruno must be out at the fire, too, Steve. Yeah. Brother. I thought Karen's apartment was something. This one looks like the Waldorf Astoria. Well, come on, let's go through some of these drawers. But, Steve, if the document's in here, it's probably in a safe. You can't tell. Brunner might figure a safe would be the obvious place. I... Hey, what have you found? Silk stockings and negligee, Steve. Yeah, me too. I don't get it. I would... Wait huh? a minute. Boy, I'm really slipping, Max. Sure took me a long time to catch on. Steve, look. This leather case. Give it to me. Mm. Someone's coming. What? Here, put the case back in that drawer. Hurry. Yeah. Well, Steve. Karen Brunner. Complete with gun. Karen Brunner? I see you've discovered my little secret. I should have figured it. You're not Brunner's secretary. You're Brunner. 
You're lucky, Steve. Lucky that I feel a certain affection for you. Otherwise, your discovery would have cost you your life. Steve, stay away from that drawer. Another step and I'll shoot. Okay, Karen. I lose. That's better. You were... Yes. You were getting very warm, Steve. So close to the right drawer. And yet so far. Yeah. Well, what happens now, Karen? I told you. You were lucky. I'm going to let you go. But you'd better go now. Okay. Well, it was nice while it lasted, baby. Yes, it was. And it would be something to remember when you're back in America. That even though Karen Bruner was a little too clever for you, she almost fell in love with you. Goodbye, Steve. Hi, Commissioner. Ruth said you wanted to see me as soon as I got back. I certainly do, Steve. I got the cable you sent from Zurich before you left. So Karen, the beautiful secretary, turned out to be Bruner. She sure did. Steve, you let me down badly. Huh? Letting a woman razzle-dazzle you like that. But I finally figured out she was Bruner, Commissioner. Yes, but too late. Not quite. I didn't mention it in my cable, but... Here. What's that? File 307. What? That's what you sent me over there to get, isn't it? Why, yeah, yes, but... I... I, I don't understand. <laughs> you see, I'd found the papers and stuck them in my shirt before she walked in. And when I made a pass at the drawer where they'd been, she figured they were still there. I give up, Steve, of all the... <laughs> yeah. Karen was a razzle-dazzle artist, but she forgot the two can play that kind of football. I guess she'd never run into the hidden ball play before. Yeah. So long, Commissioner. <laughs> You have just heard the seventh in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif and directed by Bill Karn, with music by Bruce Ashley. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A man and his wife are found dead in a rooming house. A dead parrot lies on the floor beside them. The killer set fire to the room to cover his tracks. Your job, get him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, 
the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, April 2nd. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the early morning watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from communications, and it was 5.25 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Miss Jones? Yes, who is it? This is Joe Friday. I'm sorry to bother you, Miss Jones. Is Lee there? Oh, yes, Joe. Just a minute. I'll wake him. Lee. Lee, honey. Yes, Lee, it's Joe Friday. He wants to talk to you. Uh, Yeah, Joe. What is it? I'm sorry to wake you. Can you come down right away? What's the trouble? Got a call from fire headquarters a couple minutes ago. Yeah. They had a fire in a rooming house over on 7th Street. They found two dead bodies in one of the rooms. Yeah, they said again. Well, the battalion chief doesn't think so. They found both bodies on the bed. There was evidence of arson in the room. What kind of proof they got? The victims. That's why we called you. And what you got? The fire department thinks they were dead before the fire started. 5.30 a.m. Romero and I drove out to the rooming house on 7th Street. It was a two-story building in the middle of the block between South Grand and Toledo Avenue. On one side of it was a small transient hotel, and the other, a building which housed a bookbinding firm and studios for an acrobatic dancing school. When we got there, the salvage crew was still working. We were directed to the second floor, where we met with a man in charge from the fire department, Battalion Chief Sullivan. It's right down the hall here. Watch your step there. Oh, yeah. You have the names of the victims, Chief? Uh, we think it's Guthrie, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Guthrie. Old couple, lived here for some time, I understand. Here we are. We figure that's where it started, right under the bed over there. Heat must have been terrific. Look at the walls, Joe. Yeah. This is where most of the damage was done, Chief? No, rooms on both sides got it, too. Not as bad as this, though. Guthrie's had two rooms. This and the one adjoining. Through the door there. Mm Mm-hmm. When the fire starts, got any idea? About quarter to five, I'd say. Landlady smelled the smoke about ten to five, put in the alarm. Fire was out three minutes after five. Any other casualties besides the Guthrie's, I mean? No, just the two. Okay. Over on the bed here. Hmm. Yeah. One of the worst I've seen. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Ben, you can see from the position of the two bodies, doesn't look to me like they suffocated. Mm-mm. No evidence that they tried to get out of the room. Both relaxed. Looks like somebody did them in and tried to cover with arson, huh? Oh, gee. Yeah? On the floor there. Oh, yeah, a parrot. Somebody wrung its neck, looks like, to me, and then threw it there on the floor. Mm. There's the empty cage there in the corner and doors open. Chief? Yeah, why? Schubert's still talking to the landlady? He hasn't come back. Clyde like you to meet Friday and Rabello. No. Sorry, Friday and Romero, homicide detail. This is Clyde Wine from the arson squad. Hi, How are you? How are you? You want to show him that setup, Clyde, how it was touched off? I'm yeah, glad to. You can take a look under the bed there. It tells most of the story. You see directly underneath there? Let me see. Mm-hmm. What is that, Wine? It's pretty charred. Rags and papers. Had a good soaking in kerosene before they were touched off. Strung out all under the bed here. Mm-hmm. Couldn't miss, huh? Thorough guy, whoever set it up. Most of the carpeting in the room was doused with kerosene, too. This much you can count on. The man who touched it off knew something about timing devices. Want to show him that rig, Clyde? Uh, Right here. Yeah? Ordinary electric heater. This automatic timer was connected to it, then plugged in. Heater was placed under the bed right next to the rags and papers. Timer was set probably for about 4.45 a.m. Mm-hmm. Timer let go on schedule, heater warmed up, rags and papers caught fire, then the mattress. 
You can see the rest for yourself. That time, a pretty intricate way. The man who put it together was no amateur, as the chief said. He must have known something about clockwork. All right. All right, see you in a minute. Yeah, Mac. Excuse me, I'll be back in a minute. Good man. Thanks very much. You find anything else that might tie in, Chief? Not in this room, no. A dead parrot there. Door of the cage open. Mm. Probably a pet. Might have been out of the cage at the time of the fire. Mm. Is it possible the parrot could have suffocated, Chief? Not from what I can see, no. As I say, it looks to me like somebody wrung the bird's neck. A few green feathers on the floor there. Mm -hmm. That's the adjoining room in there. Okay. I figure the Guthrie's used it as a sitting room. Yeah. You see the fire didn't wipe out everything in here. Mm -hmm. Hey, Joe. Come here, man. Right. This carpet here with the door. Dark stains. Let me see. What do you think? Could be blood. Heavy stains. Sure enough of them. Yeah. Looks like more of them by that desk there. Some on the wall, too. Mm -hmm. Desk drawers open here. Yeah, I see that. That's about it. You know as much as we do so far. Yeah. We know how the fire was touched off. We're satisfied it didn't kill those two people in there. The boys from Larson Squad talking to the other rumors in the building? Right now, you can check with them. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chief. I certainly appreciate it. Not at all. The usual breaks, isn't it? How's that? This is Fire Prevention Week. 5.53 a.m. Lieutenant Lee Jones and the crew from the crime lab arrived. Davis, the photographer, Dean Bergman from Leighton Prince. Pictures were taken of both rooms, which made up Mr. and Mrs. Guthrie's living quarters. Photographs of the bodies were taken. Bergman processed for fingerprints. While Lee Jones continued his investigation, Ben and I went down the hall to the landlady's apartment, where we met with Ray Schubert, one of the men from the arson squad. These men are from Homicide Division. Sergeant Friday, Sergeant Romero, Mrs. Uh, Stedman, that right? Yes, Clara Stedman. How do you do? Yeah. I manage the house here. Would either of you care for a cup of tea? No, thank you. I wouldn't care for it. When did you last see Mr. and Ms. Guthrie, ma'am? Well, now, let me see. Miss Guthrie, I, I saw her just before dinner last night, a little before six. I went in to borrow an egg and a cup of flour. She was all right then. Was there anyone with her? No, no, she was alone. What about Mr. Guthrie? When did you last see him? About 7.30. I, I looked out my window and I saw him closing up the parking lot. Did the Guthrie's have any visitors at all yesterday? Do you remember that? Oh, just what I know of. Jack Marshman. He, he's working for Mr. Guthrie. About a year now. I... When did Marshman visit the Guthrie's, do you know? Around four, yesterday afternoon. Yes, I, I was there too. Mrs. Guthrie and Jack and I had a cup of tea together. Then Jack left to go back to work and then I left. You didn't notice anyone else in or near the Guthrie's rooms after that? Hmm? No. I had my dinner and listened to a radio play, and then I went off to bed. Well, I know you're upset, Mrs. Stedman, but can you think of anybody who might have wanted to do away with the Guthrie's? Anybody who had a reason to do them harm? Oh, as far as I know, Sergeant, they didn't have an enemy in the world. I guess I was wrong. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Yes, ma'am. Now, we'll leave our card here with you. All right. If you want to contact us, don't hesitate to call any time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Miss Stedman. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye. What time you got? Mm, 6.15. It's pretty early. They ought to be able to post the bodies for us this morning. Say, Friday? Oh, yes, Chief. Jones, your crime lab man's looking for you. Thank you. Ben, you called the coroner, didn't you? Yeah, he's on his way over. Right. Lee? Hi. I'm looking for you. Got a few things. Yeah, what's that? This hammer. Found it over in the corner under some of the rubble. Mm -hmm. These stains on the metal handle here on the head. Mm -hmm. Gave it the benzidine test. It's blood. You figure it's a murder weapon? I'll know more when I get the coroner's report. Bergman lifted a lot of nice prints. A lot of them all over everything. Yeah. On the handle of this hammer, on that timing contraption over there, the one that touched off the fire, even left some in the next room on that metal box in the drawer of the desk. How did that? Got good prints from each of them. They match. Come in the next room. There's something else. All right. Yeah? 
No stains on the carpet by the door. The stains on the carpet by the desk. Those on the wall. Blood stains, all of them. Mm-hmm. And you can see here, trail of stains, all leading through the door into the murder room. You figure they were murdered in here, and then the killer took the bodies in the next room and put them on that bed. Huh? Then he set fire to cover up. That's my guess. How about the prints on the box in that desk, Lee? Might have been money in the box. Possible burglary? That's an angle. I'll take scrapings from these stains on a biological precipitant when I get back to the lab. I'll let you know how it comes out. Better start finishing up here. Right, Lee. Thanks very much. Well, that looks like we're in fair shape. A hammer, a couple of fingerprints. Righty. Romero? Yes, Hubert? The fellow that worked for Mr. Guthrie in the parking lot, Jack Marshman, just got here. Did you talk to him? Why am I having one of the empty rooms down the hall? Thanks. Which way? Down here. Seems pretty well broken up. You talked to anyone besides you since he got here? No, I told him the Guthries were dead, that's all. He's taking it pretty hard. Mm-hmm. Which one? Right here. There's <laughs> friends I had, Charlie and Potter. I knew I should have stayed with him. I knew I should have. These men are from homicide, Mr. Marshman. Huh? Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Hello, Mr. Marshman. How are you? I, I, I don't know what I can tell you. I can't understand poor Charlie and what. Paul, what can I do to help? I'd like to have you answer a few questions, if you don't mind, sir. Certainly. Certainly anything, anything to help out of. Please, you... You gotta find out whoever did it. You gotta find out who killed them. We're gonna try, Mr. Marshman. Now, would you tell us the last time you saw the Guthries alive? Sure. Maud, Mrs. Guthrie, about oh four fifteen yesterday afternoon. Me and Mrs. Stedman, she's a line lady. We had tea with her, and I went back to help Mr. Guthrie at the parking lot. Mm-hmm. When's the last time you saw him? Oh, it's about six thirty. That's when I get off duty at the lot. I said goodbye to Charlie. Never dawned on me. It was the last time I'd see him alive. I just can't understand. It's such a vicious thing. Charlie and Martin. It's really terrible. Yes, sir. You want to just sit down there, Mr. Marshman? Oh, right. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Are you sure you're the only one who talked to Marshman since he died? <laughs> That's right. I met him at the door downstairs. Well, the only thing you told him was that the Guthries were dead. That's all he got from us. Any chance he could have been in the room since the fire? Not a chance. Then how do you know somebody killed him? You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. Buy a pack. You'll find Fatima's now cost the same. Light a Fatima. Ah, that's different. What a difference. Yes, friends, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended, to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, plump cigarettes rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality, even to the appearance of the bright, clean yellow package, carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Try comparing Fatima yourself. Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Wednesday, April 2nd, 6.45 a.m. Lee Jones and his men completed their investigation and took their findings back to the crime lab for further examination. The deputy coroner arrived and removed the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Guthrie to the county morgue. Together with Clyde Wyant and Ray Schubert of the arson squad, Ben and I continued questioning the Guthrie's friend and employee, Jack Marshman. His answers got more confused, and he kept contradicting himself. In some ways, he seemed childlike. In others, a good deal more complex. We strung along. In order to keep up the pretense that he was not a suspect, we asked him to come along with us while we checked his living quarters, a two-room basement apartment near Olympic and South Flower. We explained it as a routine check. Marshman was calm and self-assured. 
Well, here it is, officers. You can see for yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice, comfortable place. Oh, I like it. I've been here for about three years. Well, this room's where I do my living. Pull down bed. It's a little gas plate. Oh, that's handy. Compact. Mm -hmm. I see. What do you use this next room for here, Jack? Oh, that's my shop. I like to put it around. You care to see it? Yeah, okay. Mm hmm. It's very nice. What's your hobby? Watchmaking, yeah. Used to be a watchmaker. I haven't worked at it lately, though. Job's pretty hard to find. Yeah. Uh, these parts here on the bench, you making something, Jack? Oh, just fooling around. Old alarm clock there. I'm fixing it up for a friend. All these wires and things. They all go into the works, huh? More or less, yeah. Just something much fooling around. It keeps me busy, you know. I like a hobby. They say it's good for you. That's what they say, yeah. Where does this door go, Marshman? Oh, that's my closet. Just some clothes and stuff in there. Just junk. Don't mind if I look, do you? Well, it's only a closet. They're just clothes and junk. There's nothing to see. Say, Jack, uh, do you usually keep this stuff around? Huh? Oh. It's, uh, it's kerosene, and it's pretty dangerous to store like this. There's no cap on it. Yeah, I'm glad you reminded me. I, I got to get a cap for that. I, I use it to wash up. My hands get dirty working around the bench. Well, this shirt, these trousers. Are you a Jack? Uh, I wish you wouldn't drag that stuff out. It gets my stuff all mixed up. Yeah, yeah they're mine. But I figured. The stains here is quite a few of them. Uh, some kind of paint I was using. I'm pretty sloppy with paint. Mm -hmm. That's not paint, is it, Jack? It's a little like blood to me. Well, what difference does it make to working clothes? I think your reason was in the day. Oh, why don't you lay off? Hmm? Who cares what kind of stain it is? You, you, you come in here snooping around, looking all around. I, I invited you in here. I didn't give you the place. This is my apartment and this is my shop. Now, you, you can get out. You hear me? You, both of you, you can get out. What's the matter, Jack? I said you can get out. All right. You want to tell us before we go? I'll tell you what. Why you killed the Guthries? What do you mean? Why did you kill Mr. and Miss Guthrie? No reason. I just did it. 9 a.m. We put the stained clothing and the materials from the workbench in the car. Together with the suspect, we headed back for the office. On the way, Marshman was quiet. He asked for some breakfast. We stopped and bought him some ham and eggs. We tried to get him to talk. He refused. After breakfast, we dropped the stained clothing and the other things at the crime lab, and then we drove to the city hall. We parked the car in front of the Spring Street entrance and started up the stairs. Hey, wait a minute. What's wrong? I've been thinking. Yeah. It's all a mistake. What is? I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't kill him. 9.47 a.m. Ben and I took the suspect into the interrogation room. We checked him through R&I. He had a record of two petty thefts the year before. We went back to the interrogation room and got on the phone. We called latent fingerprints. We made them, Joe. The prints on the hammer, the timing device, and the metal box on the desk. They all belong to Marshman. 10.03 a.m. I called the county morgue. Bodies identified as Mr. and Mrs. Charles Guthrie. Cause of death, Mrs. Guthrie. Multiple depressed fractures of the skull. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Blunt instrument. Cause of death, Mr. Guthrie. About the same. Compressions of the brain in the occipital area around the brain stem. 10.25 a.m. I put in a call to Lee Jones at the crime lab. The materials from the workbench are the same that went into that automatic timer, Joe. Piece together the cut ends of some of the wires. They match. How about the stains on his clothes? Human blood. 10.45 a.m. We laid it out for the suspect, step by step. Let me rest a while. I'll feel better. Let me think. We stayed with him. We waited. 11.20 a.m. The suspect opened his eyes. Sergeant? Yeah. I want to talk about it. 11.25 a.m. Schubert and Wyatt from the arson squad joined us. We called in one of the stenographers to take Marshman's statement, Eleanor Eastlack. She automatically took down the time, the place, and those present. Jack, this is Miss Eastlack. She's going to record your statement so there'll be no misunderstanding as to what you say at this time. How do you do, ma'am? Hello. Joe, you want to handle the question? All right. Jack, we've got a few preliminaries here for you. Okay. John Everett Marshman, is that your true name? Yeah. Where do you live? 122 and a half Morgan Place, apartment B. What's your age? 37. Occupation? Watchmaker, when I'm working. Now, well, Jack, you've indicated to us in a previous conversation that you're willing to make a statement setting forth the true facts surrounding the deaths of Mr. and Miss Charles Guthrie. That's right, I'll tell you. Were you in their home Tuesday, April 1st? That's yesterday. Yeah, that's right, I was. What time did you get there? First time? About five minutes to four in the afternoon. Mrs. Guthrie was there, and so was landlady Mrs. Stedman. We had some tea. 
Was anybody else present while you were there? No. It's just the three of us. How long did you stay there? Um, I left about 4.15, I guess. I guess I was there about 20 minutes. Where'd you go when you left? Oh, back to the parking lot, as usual. Charlie Guthrie left and went home to dinner. He got back about 6.15. I left at 6.30, quitting time. And where'd you go after you left the parking lot? Went around the block and then back to the Guthrie's place. Why'd you go back there? To get money. Charlie never paid me enough. Picked me up and expected me to work for nothing. All right. Now, in your own words, will you tell us just what happened starting when you entered the Guthrie's apartment the second time? Mm, Mrs. Guthrie opened the door and I went in. She gave me a cup of tea and I told her I wanted some money. She wouldn't give me any. I don't know why, but I was mad. I was sick and tired of both of them. They never gave me enough money. Elmer? I'm getting it, Sergeant. All All right, go ahead, please. Mrs. Guthrie went in the next room and I went over to the desk and got the money from the box that they keep it in. I don't know how much I grabbed all of it and that parrot started squawking. Mrs. Guthrie came running in. She saw me with the money and she says, Jack, I picked up something and hit her. It was the hammer. And I kept hitting her. Can you remember how many times you hit her, Marshman? Oh, I don't know. She fell down. The parrot was still squawking, jumping around the cage. And I went over and opened the door of the cage and pulled the parrot out. It stopped moving finally. I went in the bedroom and threw it on the floor. And then I dragged Mrs. Guthrie in the bedroom and put her on the bed and I left. Where'd you go? No, I don't know. I walked around. Tried to think of something. It was cold. I got a bottle of wine. I drank it. And I I got to thinking about what Charlie did when he got home. I knew he'd be sure I did it. He always blamed me for everything. So I finally went back to the Guthrie's place and found the hammer that I used on her. What'd you intend doing with the hammer? Killed Charlie. If she had it coming, so did he. You you can't blame me if they forced me into it. Anybody would have done the same. What'd you do after you found the hammer again? I picked it up and waited for Charlie to come home. Remember that. Wine made me feel pretty good. I stood there in the dark holding the hammer. Watched out the window for Charlie. It was cold out, I remember that. There's a radio on down the hall and I held on to the hammer and waited for Charlie. Neon light across the street that came through the windows. Old lady was on the bed in there. I could see the parrot on the floor. It was quiet. I had a smoke. Traffic kept going by outside. I could hear that. I held on to the hammer. It's windy out. I, I kept thinking Mrs. Guthrie was looking at me from the bed, but she wasn't. Charlie came home at the usual time, a little after 7.30, and I stood by the door. He came in and closed the door after him. When he reached for the lights, I hit him. He fell down, and I hit him some more. You, you couldn't blame me. Anybody would have done the same. Anybody would have, the way he kicked me around. How many times did you hit him, Marshman? I don't know. Was it twice? Three times? I don't know. I hit him until he quit moving. That's all. I... Took him, dragged him into the bedroom, put him on the bed with his wife. I put him over. Wiped the stains off of me and left. It's the only thing I could do. Where'd you go then? My place. I knew that time where I had to do the trick. I put it in a shopping bag with some stuff and I went back to the Guthrie's. He was still there on the bed. Parrot was on the floor. Uh, would you repeat that last part, Mr. Marshman? Oh, I, I said they were still on the bed, the Guthrie's, and the parrot was on the floor next to the bed. Put the kerosene on the carpet and the rags and paper under the bed and rigged up the electric heater and the automatic timer and set it off. A little slower? Yeah, would you speak up, Jack, and then slow it down just a little bit? Oh, sorry. How did you rig the timer to set off the heater, Marshman? Can you tell us? Oh, it'll take all morning to tell you. you. You got the timer. I'll take it apart and explain it to you if you want. All right. What was your purpose in setting fire to the room? You knew both Mr. and Mrs. Guster were dead, didn't you? Oh, well, sure. Sure they were. They forced me into it. I set the fire to make it look like an accident, like they'd burned it in. Well, what would you do after you set the timer? All left, went down the street and bought a couple of bottles of wine. Talked to the guy a minute. And I walked around a while. It was too cold, so I went home. When did you get home? Um, 2.30 maybe. I don't remember too well. Did you go right to bed? Yeah. Did you go to sleep? No. No. I laid there and read a movie magazine, drank the wine. Finally, I finished up the two bottles and dozed off. What time did you get up? A little before 6 this morning. Went down to the Guthrie's to nose around. That's why I met you guys. Well... You know all the rest because I've been with you ever since. All right, Jack. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I told you everything. All right. Well, this statement was given free and voluntarily, and there's been no promise of immunity or reward extended to you? 
Yeah, that's right. Was any force, violence, or duress used to induce you to make this statement? No. no. Okay. These questions and answers have been recorded by the secretary here. After they've been transcribed, will you be willing to sign it as a true statement? Well, sure, sure, I'll sign it. All right, Elmer. Can you get that out as soon as possible? All right, Sergeant. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that's it, huh? All of it? That's it. Oh, that's good. That's good. I'm tired. It's been a long night, a long one. Get used to it, huh? They're going to get longer. just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 29th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Recently, I've asked you to send me the names of cigarette dealers who are out of Fatimas. You see, the demand for Fatimas is so great that I want to make sure that all of you can buy them. So keep your letters coming. If you find a dealer fresh out of Fatimas... Let me know, and we'll have something done about it. Write your dealer's name and address on a card and mail it to me, Jack Webb, Post Office Box 951, Hollywood 28. And now for you, Mr. Dealer. The coming holiday season will find new thousands insisting on Fatima quality. Step up your order for Fatimas tomorrow. Get in on the increasing demand for the quality long cigarette. John Everett Marshman was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree, two counts, and arson, one count. He is now serving a life term in the state penitentiary without possibility of parole. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Coming up, we the people, then Screen Directors Playhouse on NBC. 